Hi, and welcome. For the people who have not been to any of the workshops before, I'd like to welcome you. Um, it's interesting, whenever I come into a group of people, and this is all the time, because we don't do closed workshops where we say, oh, well, if you haven't been to other ones, you can't come to this one. So I'm always faced with the challenge of trying to get people who have been involved with the work for two years and who have gone through like 20 different tape sets and have read six books or something to people who are just like, hmm, what is this stuff? I might have a little exposure. So in, there, there's a balance that I need to be able to strike. It's a three-way balance. One is to not bore to death the people who come because they've been, you know, they, they're familiar with a lot of things. The other part of the balance is to not lose the people who are just coming into it so they can get up to the point where by the end of it, you guys can understand the same thing the other people are. And the third part of the balance is the material that I'm given to present. Because there's a format of material that's progressively released with our workshops. There, we never do the same workshop. It's not like we have one body of material and then we go and do that and then we go someplace else and do it. Literally every time we give a workshop it's because there's been a new level of information provided to us and it takes us to the next level of understanding of what's happening in our world and how that affects us and how we can affect what is happening in our world. Right now the information um, is going in a direction it's extremely advanced at this point and even for me you know, it's like I run to keep up with you know learning the material sometimes it's advanced for a reason if things were going well let's say in the last five-year period there were certain things that were supposed to take place on this planet that involved other races of beings that have known us from our ancient times coming back slowly making their presence known bringing back our history records so we would begin to understand the truth of our origins and it was supposed to go nice and smooth and it was supposed to be a peaceful time our teachings as representatives of Azerite Temple of the Melchizedek Cloister were supposed to start with the nice and easy stuff tangible structure of the soul where you learn about the connection between physics and consciousness and how that operates in your body. Then we would gradually go to the next level where we'd start to learn about the inner Templar, which are the energy systems as they work through the body, which Cathara healing is a part of, but there's much more to it. We would have liked very much to be able to take everybody step by spe step, spend two years on tangible structures, spend two on the next level. But we're in the middle of a global situation here that has been progressively deteriorating over the last five years. It is a huge drama that we are in the middle of, and 99% of the people on the planet are not aware of that drama for various reasons. Now, in the recent workshop since September of last year, we've been progressively releasing information called the Forbidden History. The Forbidden History information gives us information about things like the ancient civilization of Atlantis and Lemuria and things that were before those things. And it fills in the blanks as to why is it that we don't have any race memory of those times? Why do we not have any relics from those times? Why is it as if those times, if this pre-ancient history really existed, why is there no evidence? We have explained in some of the other workshops the reason we don't have any evidence is because it was perfect, pur purposely taken away. There was a great house cleaning that was done here in 9558 BC where our history records that went back literally 25 million years because humans have been on this planet for 25 million years, they were literally eradicated. There were some horrendous things done to our race and to our DNA that have gotten us to the the place we are right now where when we come into a body we don't remember where we came from we don't remember who we were as a soul before we came there's reasons why these things took place and they weren't because God wanted them to be that way there ha we have been involved on this planet in a drama that goes way back into Atlantean history and at this point in time our Atlantean history is catching up with us because right now we're in the middle of something called a stellar activations cycle. Stellar activation cycle, for the people who haven't heard that word yet, means a stargate opening cycle. Now, we've heard of stargates on you know, TV shows and the sci-fi channel and that kind of thing. In the ancient days, stargates were known and they were used. You didn't need cars in those days because people knew how to teleport. They knew how to use their body mechanics to move through natural portal systems on the planet or off-planet. This knowledge is a heritage 
of the human race. And because of what took place in Atlantis between the years 25,500 BC and 9,558 BC, all of that knowledge has been stripped away. We have been robbed of that knowledge. What used to be our spiritual texts that were immense teachings of the true relationship between a manifest being and source. They didn't require you to call source Jehovah or Allah or any particular name where people could fight over it and kill themselves in the name of it, you know, kill each other in the name of a different God. There were a set of teachings that belonged to humanity and humanity had those teachings because they had a commission. We were called the angelic human race. We had a commission here. We were guardians of the planetary Templar complex, which is the Stargate system. Now, we have huge amounts of data, because if I, I can throw this out at the new, you know, new, new people, and if you haven't heard any of this, it sounds like you're listening to a sci-fi movie. <laughs> we have a lot of information that fills in the blanks from where I would like to be able to start. And if I started there, maybe by like three Tuesdays from the next one, we might get up to where we need to be tonight. So I'm going to have to um, just touch on certain things that will get us up to the point where we can talk about what I'm here to talk about tonight. And I think it's what you're here to know about. I also realize that even if you never heard of this work before and you happen to stumble into one of these workshops because somebody dragged you or something like that, <laughs> there are no accidents in the universe. There truly aren't. There's a reason why you were brought into a situation where you would have the ability to interact with the information that's going to be shared tonight. You may not know why exactly when you leave, but there's a reason why you're here. You were guided here by your own higher parts. The information that we share in these workshops is geared toward, I would say it's multi-level communication. When I speak to you about in, in English about words and concepts that we know here, that's one level where I'm sharing information with you. There is another level above and beyond and underneath that, and that's in the level of frequency. All information is a form of energy. It is a form of frequency that has a vibrational rate. When I speak to you, you get words and your mind understands, but you also get frequencies of information that because I have this information and I know it, I carry that frequency, and when I share it, that frequency goes out randomly into the room, and anybody who has things called, they're actually in Cathara Healing, they're called Aparthi, receivers in your biofield that can pick up that frequency, you'll start to make that information and understanding your own. So there's a multi-level education process going on in our workshops. The reason that we have had to advance the material so quickly, where we haven't had the luxury of being able to do beginner groups, then intermediate groups, and just making it real easy for people to follow, because there is a huge coherence in the information from the smallest amounts where you're just learning about the fact that you have a soul and you have an oversoul and you have an avatar and you have a rishi above that. From that going up into the level of we're dealing right now with masters planetary templar mechanics, masters Merkaba mechanics. These are heavy duty ancient sacred sciences. They are being given to us now because if we don't very, very rapidly learn to utilize them. Even if we don't fully grasp them yet, we can learn enough to where we can use them to make a difference. Because if we don't make a difference, there are certain things that since the Atlantean period were planned for this time period. In Atlantis it was known that the next possible stellar activation cycle or Stargate opening cycle would be between the years 2000 AD and 2017 AD. They knew that in the Atlantean period. There has been a literal history of progressive getting people in the position they wanted them to be in to get to this point in time. It is no accident that in this point in time we have something called a UFO movement and we have something called a New Age movement and then we have kind of mainstream people who drift around and do their thing and don't worry about those fringe movements too much. Well, those fringe movements are part of something called an invasion. The people participating in them don't know that. We are in the middle of something better than you'll ever find on Sci-Fi Channel. If you like sci-fi drama, well, you've got one. We're walking around in one. And the problem is, right now, the Earth is in a position just because of the physics involved with the stellar activation cycle. It's in a position of potential cataclysm. 
Now that's a word we haven't, in fact, <laughs> with the people I work with who are called the Iyani races. They are guardian Maji indigo child race from the inner earth time band, which is a different set of time cycles that runs through ours. Mm. Okay, wait, I'm getting a little direction here to go someplace else with this. All right, I'll go right there. All right, I'll just get to the point of the things I want to talk about tonight. I've been trying to ease, ease this all around into this space, but it's probably the best way to do it when I think about it, is there's one thing that we're all very aware of, and it's very real to every one of us right now, at least if we have a TV it is. <laughs> Something amazing just happened in the United States on September 11th. Something just happened that we all are aware of, and many of us are sitting there going, what does this mean? What is this going to do? What is this a part of? Okay, we know this guy named Ben Laden, a bunch of terrorists have you know, just done this horrendous thing. I mean, the magnitude of this horrendous thing, it's almost numbing. I don't know if it affected any of you that way, but I remember watching, and we happened to come in the door when the stuff was on TV, live, and we got to see the, you know, like the second plane going in. <laughs> what, is, what are my eyes seeing? The, this, no, it's just like a numbing screen goes down where your emotional body just has no idea how to react to what you just saw. Especially in America. Nobody can do that to America. Well, <laughs> you know, at least we were told nobody could do that to America. We're in the middle of a huge drama that when you look at what just happened in the mass drama, people that don't believe in metaphysics, people that don't care about metaphysics or ETs or fallen angels or nice angels, just everyday people. We've all shared this drama. There is a metaphysical cause beneath what happened. What we're going to learn about through this particular workshop is first of all, what really happened there? Now, it's important for us to understand what happened with the World Trade Centers and with the Pentagon. Because it's not important because well, we have to worry about what's going to get blown up next. That's not why it's important. Why it's important is that event took place because of a series of events that began in the 1930s. World War II was a part of those events. They are connected to what is called the 1983 Montauk Project, Montauk, New York. They are connected to what is called the 1943 Philadelphia Experiment. Most people that even actively pursue trying to find out what those New Age buzzwords are, the UFO movement buzzwords are, don't have a whole lot of information. They have a lot of guesswork. To understand the connections between what happened with the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and what was supposed to happen in Philadelphia, but they didn't get the plane there, to understand the connection between that, between Montauk, the Philadelphia Experiment, World War II, the fact that now we're in the new world war against terrorism that's moving us towards something, all of this has to do, believe it or not, with Atlantis and with the plan that was devised in Atlantis called the Luciferian Covenant. It was an invasion plan that was planned and staged incrementally, step by step by step. And there were certain events that were supposed to unfold once the stellar activation cycle of 2000 to 2017 AD came around. Now most people have heard the concept of the word Illuminati. That's a word that gets thrown around all over the, the internet and all over you know, conspiracy theorists. What the heck are they? <laughs> you know, we know they're, they're not nice and they seem to be able to have all this power and there's this like invisible race that walks among us and pulls all these strings where we think we're free and we're not. The Illuminati are a group of beings called the Leviathan races. They were created out of the tribes of Levi, which were a hybrid tribe of Anunnaki human that were part of a hybridization experiment that was done in Atlantis. It was done for good purposes, but it went very, very wrong. There have been race lines nurtured here since Atlantis, family lines, of people who carry the Leviathan race DNA codes who actually, when you look at, if you were going to look at them on the soul level, they are actually a different race of beings than human beings. Human souls incarnate out of a certain soul, set of soul collectives. They have what is called a Christos spark. Now, Christos is a word that we use in reference to the D12, dimension 12, pre-matter template, your divine blueprint that allows you to connect to the higher dimensional fields and directly to source. Illuminati races are born without a Christos spark. 
because the ones who created those races in the Atlantean period were what were called fallen angelic races. Now, if you don't like the spiritual terms and you're more into ET stuff, you could say the same thing, call them intruder ET races, because fallen angelics and intruder ETs are the same beings. They are multidimensional. They have the ability to move through matter density levels, which so do we when our DNA is working the right way. We are in the middle of a final conflict drama that started way before Atlantis. Its last round was during the last attempted stellar activation cycle, which was in 22,326 BC. They almost destroyed Earth and the human race in 22,326 BC. But what we call the Founders Races, the Emerald Covenant Founders Races, which were the genetic line that humans came out of originally, and these were a Christos race. They were literally from dimensions 13, 14, and 15, and then the Christos races started at dimension 12. The Founders Races, these are real beings. They have bodies, not exactly like ours, but you know, they <laughs> they're less dense matter. The Christos Founders race, Races intervened directly on Earth in 22,326 BC. We wouldn't be here talking about it if they hadn't. There was a stalemate in a very ancient conflict that was continually going on and getting worse and worse. The, the more fighting was done, the more fighting became. Fighting did not create peace between the fallen angelic races and the angelic human races. The reasons fallen angelic races have been after human races for so long is because human races were created through using, they were created by God, using the Founder's genetic imprint to serve as the planetary guardian team for the Stargates here, so this place would not be taken over by the fallen angelic legions. They were also commissioned to try to help heal the fallen angelic legions if they could, but not at the expense of getting themselves destroyed. What has happened on this planet, literally, for many, many thousands of years now, if we've been going through what's called a dark cycle of evolution, there were certain frequencies that were no longer available on this planet, D12 frequencies, Christos frequencies. There is, when we think of Christos, most people think of religious and spiritual terms, and that's fine, but there's also a scientific physics equivalent of that spirituality. Spirit is consciousness. Consciousness is a form of energy, and energy does have natural laws of physics to follow. So a very long time ago, before it even got bad in Atlantis, there was a thing, an event called the Fall of Brenaway that took place, and that's when we entered our dark cycle. That was in 208,216 BC. In the fall of Brenaway, it was a stellar activation cycle like this one. We were invaded by a group called the Omicron Draconian races from Alnatak, Orion. Now, Alnatak, if you look on your star charts, is a planet in you know, the Orion system. We were invaded, and our planet's stargates were damaged, and the planetary grids were damaged. So, Stargate 11 and 12 would not open, which means the planet could only run 10 dimensions of frequency. The fallen angelic races have a, a maximum frequency range as far as what they can interfere with, what they can use in their technologies of dimension 11. The Anunnaki races can access 11 dimensional frequency. The Omicron Draconians can access 10 dimensional frequency. The guardian races, the human races, the founders races, could access 12 dimensional frequency and higher. But when this planet had its grids damaged to the point where it could no longer run anything above D10 frequency, we were in trouble. All of a sudden, the frequencies that we used to protect the stargates and the vortices on this planet, we couldn't bring the frequencies through. So progressively, invasions took place. We have a huge history of warring that has taken place on this planet since 208,216 BC. And we, we have begun, actually, in the, uh, the, the, book that, the new book that's coming out, if we ever get done with this stuff, um, it's called The Forbidden uh, Testaments of Revelation. In that book, we actually show you, literally, what, you know, what the history has been, step by step. It's not as if we're just saying this and we think there's some history or we're guessing. The history that I'm talking about comes off records from the Atlantean period called Cloister Doratura Plates. They're holographic disks that hold massive amounts of information. So the history records that I've been, you know, translating come from these plates. When we start to realize the history that's gone on here, 
it's, it's dumbfounding compared to what we have been taught. Here we're taught that, well, maybe we came out of apes and, you know, somewhere around 5,000 years ago we happened. And No, maybe the other theory is we, you know, there's a big bang and, you know, molecules and things collided and then eventually it turned into pond scum and then eventually that grew, you know, grew like flippers and eventually that grew feet and then we started to walk around and somehow we became humans. Some real interesting theories we have out there. Talk about holes in the theories. Ours make a whole lot more sense than those two. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> What's one of the most amazing things as far as if we're going to get a grasp on our reality today on what has taken place in our world today and what we can do to prevent certain things from happening that we'd be much better off without is the, the huge challenge of grasping how large human history is how huge this drama is we're not just dealing with a couple of terrorist groups over in another country that like to run planes into buildings they're just puppets we're dealing with highly, highly sophisticated, what could be considered extraterrestrial races, but they are fallen angelic races. Humans were an angelic race. It's in the precarious balance of finding out whether it's going to be fallen or whether it's going to dust it, pick itself up, dust itself off and say, okay, we've had enough. We're the guardians of this planet. This isn't going to happen anymore. We're in a position that if we don't very rapidly get at least a small grip on the magnitude of what we're dealing with, enough to take it seriously. Because if we take it seriously, we'll do what needs to be done to affect things in a positive way here. If we don't take it seriously, if we think it's more important to find out what's on TV tomorrow night and like, you know, to watch a sitcom or something. Now it's alright to watch sitcoms, <laughs> but there is a crisis at hand. And that crisis is, our planet is going to go through in the next two-year period some major changes in frequency now changes in frequency are normal during stellar activation cycles if the planet and it's what we call the grids which are actually scalar wave templates that hold the matter base of the planet together if the planetary template is in good condition it will naturally pass through stellar activation cycles the stargates will open more frequency will come in through the stargates and the oscillation rhythm of the particles of the planet will pick up and it will just naturally literally the frequency moves up and the planet moves through stellar activation and there's no big bangs or pole shifts or anything messy however if a planet goes through stellar activation cycle and its scalar template is all messed up if its electromagnetic fields are all messed up it creates a very big mess. If we look at some of the things that have managed to survive since Atlantis, like the Bible, which has been highly, highly edited from what it used to be. The things I'm teaching now used to be in the text that were supposed to be the Bible. In the Bible, in the book called Revelation, there's a very colorful picture of events that were to take place at some mysterious unknown times called the end times. And it depicted a certain series of things about angels and seven seals and all sorts of very interesting things people have been trying to figure out what they mean for ages. In that story, that story is encoded. It was encrypted in symbol form. And it was a story about technology. And it was a story about a planned invasion that was going to go down here. And it was a story about a group of Anunnaki races that are called the Anno Elohim, and the Jehovian Anunnaki. Now, before the Jehovian Anunnaki groups wanted to take over this planet, human beings didn't call their God Jehovah, nor did they call it Yahweh. Those were names of collectives, family names, of fallen angelic races that were inserted into our holy texts to hijack our religions, to hijack our stories, and there was a deadline. There was a deadline for when the game would be up here. In Atlantis, we were very aware. We had minimum of 12 strands of DNA. We had huge amounts of awareness. We knew that we were avatars. We knew our commission as planetary guardians. We knew Templar mechanics, the sacred sciences. The sciences. And there were events that took place that we lost a few rounds in some battles with the fallen angelic races. And when I say fallen angelic, remember, 
you can picture the you know the sci-fi channel and use et if you want to to substitute because it's the same thing they're the same beings they came in and they got a few rounds on their side where they messed up the planetary grids so badly that they were able to create something called a scalar sonic pulse that ran through the planetary grids it's a magnetic pulse that messes with the magnetic fields now even our scientists know that the planetary magnetic fields have a whole lot to do with memory and with the function of human consciousness they don't exactly know why yet but the why is because consciousness is connected to the DNA template and the DNA template is made of scalar wave patterns which are electromagnetic wave patterns so if there is a large magnetic disruption in the planetary fields you can do amazing things to the DNA of life forms on that planet the reason we have no memory right now is because of something that was done in Atlantis and the reason it is very important that we begin to try to very quickly grasp as much of ourselves as we can even if we don't know we have our avatar levels of self if we can begin with believing that we do that's how you find them you're not going to be able to integrate your higher parts of self unless you realize they're there but right now we have about two years not even really we have to the end of 2002 to reach a certain level of fixing planetary grids that if it is not accomplished there's going to be something called plan B put in motion now when I talk about plan A and plan B plan A was the founders plan of what they would do when the stellar activation cycle came they had a set of things they wanted to do to get the planetary grids fixed so this place would not go into pole shift plan B happens when plan A doesn't work plan B would be evacuations I've never ever been the doom and gloom type person and I told the Iani when I was working with them the last couple of years say don't start talking to me about pole shift because I don't want to hear it you have all sorts of people out there in the new age movement you know saying all sorts of horrible things are going to happen if it's that bad we can't do anything about it I don't want to know and I certainly don't want to teach it you know and they said all right well actually it's not that bad we focused on solutions all along we have been we've had to very quickly move through helping people to understand cathara healing so they'd understand their body systems tangible structure of the soul so they'd understand how those body systems plug into their spiritual consciousness systems and then very quickly go into planetary grid mechanics so we could begin to work with the planetary grids to create healing and a lot has been done already we've made great accomplishments but at this point our accomplishments have been so well so done so well in healing the planetary grids that the agendas of the fallen angelic races agendas they've held literally since the Atlantean period when they were just going to saunter in here and just take over the place very easily they were going to actually come in and introduce themselves with names like Moses and say hi we created you we're your space brothers you know and and just show us how to run our planet better and there was an objective at the end of it they don't want humans they don't even want surface earth earth is a strategic location for something called the halls of Amente stargates earth has portals that lead directly into the halls of Amente stargates the halls of Amente stargates are a universal stargate system that literally extends into all of the primary stargates in our 15 dimensional time matrix that's what they're after earth is the most vulnerable link in the chain of galaxies that have connection to the halls of Amente stargates so what they had in mind for us way back in Atlantis when they set this plan was make us stupid erase our memories give us some false books and things take the old books and just insert stuff and take out the good stuff have us like little sheep by the time they were ready to come in then set a series of events in motion that would make them able to come in very easily with no resistance now one of the ways to do that would be first of all to have people believing in an externalized God that's outside of themselves that has a certain name in a certain face all right you already got an image to use when you come in to say hi that people will be receptive to one of the plan the part of the plan and this is called the Illuminati master plan the one world order master plan was to set up about a hundred years before subtle contact That's when the channeling movement started subtle contact with their races their races meaning the hybrid races who don't have human souls incarnate in them but who have either Anunnaki or draconian souls incarnate in them the interesting thing is we've all been taught 
since our memory was erased, that we are only one race. We have bodies that are very similar. And because of what's been done to the DNA, right now our DNA appears to be the same. Because certain portions of the DNA are repressed in both races, so the similarities show that the differences don't. About 100 years ago, the channeling movement actually got its seeds planted because it was time. That's when the Anunnaki started to connect with some of their hybrids. Their hybrids don't know their hybrids. They don't. They, they think they're just human like anybody else. They don't know what human is either. You know? <coughs> the hybrid people are not bad people. It's not that they're you know, bad fallen angelic people. They're just people who lost their memory too. And the reason they lost their memory is they were trying to rebel against and get away from the fallen angelic collectives in Atlantis. That was part of the reason. They had their hybrids that were saying, well, we're starting to grow and understand that the, the ways you're doing things and dominion and killing other life forms and things, that's wrong. We don't want to be part of your collective anymore. They were going into what was called the Emerald Covenant Christos contract. And that meant that the fallen angelics hold on the planet was getting less and less. If they lost their hybrid races, they didn't have, they would have a very hard time coming in directly because most of them can't live physically on this planet because of their own biologies. So we have a situation right now where there is progressively, for a hundred years, been an invasion, a very quiet, subtle invasion. The plan for the invasion was created in um, 9,560 BC. It was formalized then. It's been there for a long time, but that's when it got formalized, when a whole group of Anunnaki races, Anunnaki races are races that were created by what is called the fallen Anu Elohim. Okay, they were, you have Elohai and Elohim. They are two different. The Elohai Elohim are the founders races, one set of founders races. The Anu Elohim are ones that were fallen angelics. They chose to sever their connection to source and they started to create dominion agendas and literally started to feed off the rest of the time matrix. So when I talk about Anunnaki, I'm talking about the children of the fallen Anu Elohim. Just like when I talk about humans, I'm talking about the children of the Elohai that came in here as the guardians. There are numerous different groups of Anunnaki. Many of them don't like each other. They've been warring with each other as much as they've been warring with humans or anything else. But in 9560 BC, there was agreement made by several competing groups. They're called the Palladian Nibiruan Anunnaki. That means some of them are from the Pleiades star system. Some of them are from a planet called Nibiru, which used to be our 12th planet until they hijacked its orbit. And now it only circulates in here every 3,600 and some years. With the Luciferian Covenant Agreement, it was a step-by-step -step plan to, first of all, level the playing field, which they did during the Atlantean flood period. In 9558 BC, they used a technology called APIN systems. APIN is a, a physical technology. It's called the Atlantean Pylon Implant Network System. Imagine microchips. Okay, imagine microchips that operate through particularly selenite types of quartz. You know how we use quartz and radios and different things? It's a mineral. It has some certain properties as far as electrical, you know, electrical transmission and, and transduction goes. There's an advanced technology that utilizes what would be considered very advanced microchip technology that can be used on a planetary level where literally grids were laid out all across the planet. The planet was mapped, and it was mapped from, the from above, from spaceships. I mean, it, they, they weren't, you know, just, they weren't foot soldiers like we have been down here. We weren't then either. There were these grids put in to the planet that would receive remote frequency transmissions from other planetary systems. They could use, be used for good things, or they could be used for horrible things. And in Atlantis, they were used for horrible things. They were used, these APIN systems, were used by the Anunnaki and several other competing groups to literally reverse the natural electromagnetic balances of Earth's magnetic fields, which totally messed up the DNA of humans. Now, once that was done, you had a bunch of what used to be angelic humans and a lesser amount of hybrid Illuminati races that really just wanted to be good guys. All of a sudden, they're all running around not knowing who they are, having mutations in their brain waves. Their brain waves aren't working the same way. Their hormones were not working the same way. What used to be an 800-year lifespan went down to about 100. 
because of these electromagnetic changes that were made to happen on the, on, on the planet because of these advanced technologies. Now, these technologies are not just something that were a horrible problem in our past. The APIN systems, these microchip networks that were literally implanted throughout the planetary grids in key positions in relation to stargates, portals, ley lines, and what are called axiotonal lines, which are the main energy vertical running lines that circulate energy through the planet. These systems are a part of what's happening today. World War II had to do with these systems. You don't read that in the history books either. <laughs> there has been something going on here for a very long time. And at the core of it is an ancient Atlantean technology, the APIM systems, that have been here and were implanted in the grids by certain competing Anunnaki and Draconian forces in order to get control of the planetary grids and the planet and the halls of Amente when the next stellar activation cycle came, because that is the only time they can get through to the halls of Amente. We are in that stellar activation cycle. And because our lifespans are so short, and because when we come into a, a fetal body through fetal integration, it's like lights out, we don't remember who we are because the DNA is so damaged, we can't bring in our higher consciousness. It might seem amazing to us to think somewhere between 25,500 years ago and 10,500 years ago, somebody put microchips in the planetary grids and now there's a problem for us? Yeah, it is a problem for us. What happened with the World Trade Center was because of microchip technology. What happened at the Pentagon was for the same reason. Now, as we go through this weekend, there's more detail to this. I'm not going to just like throw the whole thing at you and then expect you to understand it. I'm going to show you maps. I'm going to show you maps that from the air, when you're coming in on a spaceship using a certain type of technology that picks up what's called photoradionics, they actually look like animal shapes. This is where when we go back to the biblical revelations. We find things like the four beasts before the altar of God, and one was a lion, and one was a, an eagle, and one was in the face of a man, one was an ox, right? <laughs> Think, you know, what was this guy tripping on when <laughs> Revelations was written? These were references to APIN systems that were in the planetary grids. The whole biblical revelation story was an encoded um, invasion plan. It was written by the Jehovian Anunnaki. It was not the original revelations. The original revelations had been before Christ's time, because there was a man, Jeshua, Jeshua Melchizedek, the person who was Jesus Christ. He and his group of Essenes translated the CDD plates. They had all this information. Revelations didn't look anything like what it does now. See, in Revelations, they were written by the Essenes and by Jeshua. What was revealed there where there, would, there was going to be an attempt by fallen angelics to come in and take control of the planet. But the Christos races would be here, and they would do certain things with the planetary Templar that would finally, after all these centuries, bring back the D12 Christos frequency that would seal the portals and protect the planet. There was a happy ending to Revelations that didn't involve a whole lot of bloodshed and a whole lot of yucky stuff. If you read B Biblical Re Revelations, and you think, you know, all right, God's going to do this, huh? Is he having a bad day or what? I mean, <laughs> if you were a loving person, if you were a mature person, just think of the mentality it would take to say, okay, well, I created you, so I'm going to go in and judge you now, and there's going to be fire, and there's going to be brimstone, and only the ones who have kissed up to me in a certain way am I not going to torture horribly. I mean, this is what this story tells you. And I'm a very spiritual person, and I have a huge connection to my God, you know, to my God source. And it's the same God source that your God source, too. Everybody has the same one, regardless of what you call it. And that God source is not mean, and it's not wrathful. Those mean, wrathful gods that were piggybacked into what used to be sacred texts, these are fallen angelic godlets that put their own names and their own agendas into our books, into the once holy books. It's happened to the Muslim religion, too. Right now we have a situation building between Christians and Muslims and you have the fanatic Muslims over there, you know, ready to take on the world and kill us because we're evil. Where we're, you know, our presidents over here saying, well, they're evil. Everybody's saying the other one's evil. It's really interesting to watch what's going on here. What has happened is invasion, a progressive step-by-step -step invasion that is now reaching its climax because this is the time when that climax was scheduled to take place. 
If you were in an advanced culture back in Atlantis, which most of us were there, if you were there and you knew how time worked, you actually knew how time travel worked because you were able to use stargate systems and you realized that time was laid out more like space and you could actually move through to different time vectors into different timelines. Right now, there is an Atlantis. Right now. It's alive, it's awake, it's aware, and the people in it are, just like we are. What separates us is angular rotation of particle spin. That's the angle of the axis the particles spin on. They actually take place all in the same space. Now, I won't go heavy into the physics here because it's not that important. But what's important to realize is Atlantis is not a dead place. Atlantis is not a place that's gone, nor are the invasion races that were there. They're in a different space-time coordinate than we are. And they are in a time coordinate where they have huge amounts of scientific knowledge about how time works. They're very well aware that we are here. And they are very well aware of what they have progressively done to make sure at this point in time when they were going to come from their time into ours to make their grand hurrah, that we would be very dumb by then. The planetary guardians, the human races, wouldn't remember that that's what they were. The people who once used to run the Templar, who knew and understood how their DNA templates ran frequency and how that frequency could directly interact with the planetary grids and the planetary scalar template. Those once majestic beings that were entrusted by Source as the guardians would be reduced to nothing more than animals, where the fallen angelics could come in and say, Oh dear, you're all fighting with yourselves and now you're getting advanced enough where you're going to really like blow up your planet or something, so we have to come in to protect you from destroying yourselves. This is the plan. World War III has been part of that plan ever since Atlantis. World War II was something that kind of popped up a little too soon because another invading group kind of crashed in on the Anunnaki's territories. They were the Zeta groups, the little gray guys. They kind of rained on the, uh, on the Anunnaki's parade because they made deals. They came in, they came through the portals here. They broke through seals on the portals. And in the 1930s, made deals with the Illuminati governments here. And all of a sudden, the Illuminati governments that the Anunnaki were planning to have on their side were now making treaties with the Anunnaki's enemies. And all of a sudden, the Anunnaki's lost control of the whole game. So there has been this amazingly bizarre underground game going on. Literally, as we, for 70 years, this has been going on. 1930s, that was 70 years ago. We have been taught that we live in a free country in America. We haven't been taught that for 70 years the Zetas have been telling the governments what to do from MJ-12 on down through the CIA, down through the government. And then, of course, you have a precedent that everybody needs to think they're in a democracy. There have been things going on here like you wouldn't believe. And it's about time we start to face the scary stuff because if we don't it's going to come up and bite us the worst thing that can happen in the next couple of years is it continues to go on with nobody doing anything the illuminati advancing their agenda they're advancing their agenda using something called scalar sonic pulse they're doing lots of sonic pulse testing and even the government's been caught at it at this point where there's like whales washing up dead on the beaches and things they have been using sonics since the 1930s because the Zeta Regalian races from um, several places, mostly Rigel, but ser several places in Orion, they're the ones that came through and made the contracts. The technology that we've been given since the 1930s has been fed to us by the Zeta Regalians and their draconian friends because they're working in a draconian agenda. What is happening right now is there has been so much damage done to Earth's planetary shields. They're called shields, the scalar templates that I've talked about. There's been so many electromagnetic disturbances and sonic disturbances put in the grids that this place is going to roll by 2008 if something isn't done. Something that will fix the electromagnetic blockages in the grids. Now, the Illuminati races know this. The fallen angelics or ET visitor races know this. Both of those groups, the Illuminati hope that if they kiss up enough to the fallen angelics that they're terrified of at this point, because a long time ago, like right after the Zeta treaties were made, the Illuminati races here, which are the ones that look like humans, but they're really not, they think they're humans, but they don't have human souls, they thought they were in control of the game. 
they thought, these little homely gray things, so, you know, all right, we'll make treaties with them. We'll get their technology. You know, they figured they'd be able to take advantage of the little grays. Boy, they learned a lesson. They very quickly lost control of the game, and they started to realize the huge force that they were dealing with, not just with the Zetas, but with the Omicron Draconians, the Adetokron Draconians, the Anunnaki, five different groups. They started to realize that they lost lots of control over the game, and they have been just trying to kiss up to anybody who was going to get them out of this mess because all of the fallen angelics had one thing in common, one agenda in common. They wanted this place to go into pole shift to clear the territories once they were done using us for certain purposes. We have lots of channels in the New Age movement these days talking to everything. Archangel this, Archangel that. You have angels, you have ETs, you have all sorts of things talking from everywhere. Most of these are fallen angelic races. Some people say, oh, well, you channel. No, actually, I don't. What I do is not channeling, and I never, you know, I will not do that. The only thing I will channel is my own higher consciousness. If anybody wants to talk to me telepathically, they have to hang out out here. <laughs> you know? But the information I get is actually taken off disks, uh, physical technology. But right now, people in the New Age movement are getting what's called astral field tagging. It is, again, a technology that uses subtle waveforms to affect one's brainwave patterns, their bio patterns. It affects the DNA template. And it allows them to hear whatever voices the fallen angelics want them to hear. Now, sometimes, some of them are lucky. They actually have enough biofield protection in their fields because they happen to be somebody that came in with, um, usually, if they're indigo children, all right, we talk about indigo children. These are beings that have more than 12 strands in the template. They were what are called the Maji Holy Grail line of the human races that had anywhere from 24 to 48 DNA strands. Okay? Human races have 12 strands of DNA. The Maji races, when they come in to this planet, which, which they have now, wait, all right. You know, I do this sometimes. If, if, I, I will apologize, but I'm not going to apologize. I used to feel embarrassed when that happened. When I'm in a workshop situation, I am not by myself, all right? I have a live telepathic connection. Now, it's not, I'm not channeling, but there is the one I'm, I've been working with. It's Niyani from the Inner Earth Time Cycles, and his name is Ma'a. And sometimes they'll say, you know, can we go over here with information, in, you know, instead of here? So I listen to that, and I've gotten to the point where I'm not so self-conscious that I really care if somebody's going to judge me on it. So I let you know that, yes, I have a telepathic rapport with a being. You can do this, too. In fact, if you use Cathar healing and develop the mentor technique, that gives you a place in your field where you can begin to receive that type of communication from somebody safe, somebody that's not going to try to come in and channel and take your biofield over and your body. All right. Now, the direction I'm, I'm being guided to go with this is to basically, it's funny, I, I, I write up the thing like, okay, we'll cover these points, I don't need to do them. Uh, <laughs> I should know better by now, I don't need to do them. What, what we'll have by tomorrow is we will have graphs, all right, because what I usually use in my presentations, because visually it's a lot easier to understand certain things. We're going to go through, between tomorrow and Sunday, we're going to go through understanding all the little pieces of stuff that I just talked about. We're going to talk about Montauk. We're going to talk about how that's connected to the Philadelphia experiment. We're going to talk about how both of those are connected to something called the Phoenix and the Falcon wormholes. And we're going to talk about something called a black hole universe that is a sub-time distortion cycle. And this is where the problems are coming from. So we're going to get a little bit of history and under so we can get a feel for what is taking place here. If we can understand that there is a place, I'm not just talking about fallen angelics, you know, like angels falling, you know, I mean, you can get some really interesting imagery there. These are beings from places just like we are beings from places. These are beings that have advanced time technologies that used to be our time technologies. Right now, we're in the middle of a situation that we can make a huge, huge difference in what happens in the next five-year period. Right now, if nothing is done, on this planet. And everybody decides, well, I'm just going to, you know, be my sleeping human self and just see what happens and trust it to God. Or if I don't believe in God, just be and just be and let it all happen. It's not my problem. What we're going to see happen if nobody does anything are several things. And they're going to happen in rapid succession. One, you're going to see advancement of the Illuminati One World Order agenda. You're already watching this in America on television. You're watching that one event 
one event. Now, I got to remember, Britain has been being, um, you know, attacked by the IRA for years. Things get blown up there quite frequently. But I've never seen the British government take the whole event and make it a global war issue. All of a sudden, in one event, I watched this in almost like odd horror. I watched how fast this one event that was staged, how this one event was used to literally bipolarize the entire planet. Now we have two groups of people on the planet. The good guys who are fighting the war against terrorism and the bad guys who refuse to be part of the anti-terrorism coalition. There's no middle ground here. <laughs> you just literally, it, it doesn't matter. C countries are being forced, pressed into this. If you're not, Bush has said it, if you're not with us, you're against us. Now, it's not Bush's fault. He's trying to do the best he can to figure out what the heck he is and what he's doing and what he's supposed to do with things. He's not the one pulling strings. It's behind there. The Illuminati that I talk about, these are people that look like people in human bodies. I'm not going to go into what's incarnated in, in Mr. Bush's body or not because it's not important. But Illuminati races are like little puppets on a string just like humans are being used too. Because now you have the channeling movement. It's not just Illuminati that are channeling. It's everybody seems to be channeling in the New Age movement because they've been taught that this is a good thing to do. So we're all being manipulated here, Illuminati included. And the hidden factor is there is several different competing fallen angelic invasion forces. Now, that's been okay to not have to get into heavily in the last few years because there were negotiations going on between the founders' races with the Anunnaki races, trying to get the Anunnaki to give up the One World Order Dominion agenda to enter what is called the Emerald Covenant Coevolution Peace Treaty, the Founders' Peace Treaty, where you know, they would get the assistance they needed because they need DNA repair is what they need. They have, they have some real twisted thinking because their DNA is all messed up in a way worse than what they did to ours. If the Anunnaki groups had agreed to stay in the Emerald Covenant. We wouldn't be having this conversation and we wouldn't have watched that trigger event of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon getting hit. Philadelphia was supposed to get hit too in that, but it didn't. What's interesting about what happened with these, the terrorist attacks, now Bush didn't know about them, he didn't do it. It wasn't an inside job that our, you know, our government didn't do this to its own people. Much bigger than that, much bigger issue than that. Since the 1930s we've had two wormholes sitting off the Atlantic, across out in the Atlantic, off the coast of Florida. One is well, off the coast of Florida, the other is off the coast of South Carolina. Now, you know the Bermuda Triangle? There's a reason ships occasionally disappear there, and planes too. Wormholes are scientific phenomena that literally barrel from one time system into another time system. Since the 1930s, these wormholes they used to have a cap on them. The founders had capped them to prevent something like this from happening. The Zeta races broke through one of the wormhole caps, and that's when they came in and made deals with the Illuminati governments. Ever since this time, there has been some really strange scientific stuff happening here. The Zeta technologies, first of all, begin the process of sonic pulsing. They use what is called subspace sonic pulse, which is not, we don't have the mechanics to detect it here. So they can send them whenever they want, and our governments don't have the technology that can pick up these particular frequencies of subspace sonic pulse. Now, they have been using these progressively to do some very interesting things. This material is very new. It's been given to me in the last week because we're at crisis level at this point. Now it's time to tell the whole story so we can start doing something about this before it gets any worse. The sonic pulses were used for testing of targeted earthquakes and hurricanes since the 1930s. I got a list of just some of them that's being published in the book. Just, I think it's from between like 1930 and uh, 1992. And so this is this long in like 10 point type of the natural disaster events that have occurred here. Unnatural disaster events. There have been ethnic viruses that have been being created and played with because the Zeta knew just like anybody else in the know in the fallen angelic realms, that come the stellar activation cycle, which would start in the year 2000, that's when 
populations needed to be reduced, that's when the invasion plans would begin on the outside. Now, what happened in the World Trade Center has everything to do with those wormholes that are in the Atlantic Ocean. It has everything to do with the fact that in 1943, one of them was connected to a, a grid system in, in the Philadelphia Naval Yard during the Philadelphia experiment. And then in 1983, another one was connected from there into Montauk, New York. These are part of a huge APIN system. Remember those microchip systems I told you about that literally span the globe? And if you look at them from a distance, they look like little dots that make animal shapes. They're following grid lines and ley lines. The reason it was important to the fallen angelics, the terrorists attacked those particular sites on the day that they did, was because if those buildings just so happened to fall down all by themselves, it might make people wonder if something was going on. Because there were sonic pulses used that day to open and put online a couple of the networks that connect into this APIN system that connects into the wormholes. There's a whole history about these. They were open before, and in between 1992 and 1994, the Guardian groups worked with some of the Anunnaki, who were getting invaded by the Drax at this point, who said, okay, we'll play nice, actually capped the wormholes. And so it was, yeah, things were getting better as of then. But then the Anunnaki decided, okay, the Drax aren't so much a problem anymore, so they reopened them again. Now, we're in a situation where Montauk, that was shut down in 92, Technically, the Montauk project couldn't function anymore because its wormhole was closed. Well, in 1998, they began to open it again. They put it on full-scale open in, on August 15th of this year. That started. Now, to open it fully, they have to blow through the cap, the frequency cap that was put on the wormhole and the connecting net networks to it. These networks, yeah, the wormholes in the Atlantic, are connected to these APIN systems that are placed all over the planet. There are several of these systems. One of them is called the Serpent, and it runs right down the East Coast and then down into Central America and down to South America. It's kind of interesting, but did we ever think about why our cities ended up where they did? We all think that Chris Christopher Columbus discovered America? Well, the Atlanteans knew it was there a whole lot longer than that. There were certain APIN systems put in the planetary grids in North America, in Europe, in Atlantis, waiting for this time period. And certain metaphysical groups, like in the case of America, it happened to be the Knights Templar descendants called the Freemasons, founded this country and they put their main areas of commerce, of energy, of power, in the areas of the APIN sites, knowing partially that they were important sites, but the Illuminati never get to know exactly why. That's why they're being jerked around too. You can't, you can point fingers at them, but it's not going to do a lot of good because they're like, they're kind of like the brawn without the brains. The brains are the fallen angelics behind it. There have been metaphysical societies that since the Atlantean time, there's the Toth group ones, there are certain, you know, like the Isis group ones, they came up from Egypt, they came up from Samaria, a whole bunch of different ones that kept some of this knowledge alive within very protected secret societies, which most of our presidents tend to pass through at least one of them on their way to the White House. <laughs> now, the reason that Washington, the Pentagon, in the particular area of the Pentagon that was hit, happened to be down in the ground underneath there, there is one of those Atlantean grid, so what they call them grid spikes. They're implants that if you open them, if you trigger them with sonics, they will create an open link, like a little wormhole, into the big wormhole. So you get a whole network of wormholes, like a tributary system, like a river system, or an underground subway system that connects to the main. They are reactivating this now. And if this continues, it's going to put the place in the pole shift between 2003 and 2008, because it is totally ripping apart the planetary grids during a stellar activation cycle. The Illuminati races, some of them know this, some of them don't. Some of them are hoping that, well, they know the place is going to roll and everybody's going to get killed, but if they're really good and they do what the, you know, the ETs tell them, that maybe the ETs will save them. <laughs> That's what they're hoping. Good luck, guys. <laughs> the reason the terrorists 
happened to take out those two places and happened to miss because the plane went down so they didn't send the pulse to Philly Independence Hall I believe was the, the grid that they were after there so you get an idea of where some of the potential target places may be we're going to have maps and in, in fact I'm in the process of making the maps to show you where these particular API and grid networks are so we have an idea of where what is and where a action is going to be happening the people in the US government didn't do this thing there's a few in MJ-12 that don't even live in the United States they just pull the strings <laughs> they were involved but most of them don't even realize the magnitude of what's taking place even the highest ranks of the worldwide Illuminati that control what's called the world management team these guys control the world banking systems and the pharmaceuticals and the multinational corporations all that stuff has been brought into being through the Illuminati races but the Illuminati races who thought they were on top of the world and had everything by the tail really lost control in the 1930s they're not told by by the ETs they know ETs exist as far as like the one group of people on the planet that really really knows ETs exist MJ-12 and the other guys of the world management team because only their head echelon get to meet them but they have since the 30s had meetings with various groups Hitler had meetings with them he was working with a competing group called the Necromaton Andromis did you ever go to a UFO like workshop or one of those expos where there's lots of people to talk to everybody you have just about every star system represented at these places you have Palladians, you have Niberians, you have Anunnaki, you have Regalians, you have Andromis and Andromis seem to be such cute little cuddly things just the name itself is so cute and cuddly and they're supposed to be these little blue people they're really nice they're called the Necromaton, aka Necromancy, Andromis. Anybody heard of the Necromancy? That used to be considered the Satanic Bible. The Andromis have been pulling a lot of strings here. The Andromis were fighting with the Zetas over getting control of the API and grid systems. And the Anunnaki were fighting with each other and with both of them to get control of the grid system. This was actually a good thing. Because as long as they're all fighting with the, you know, amongst themselves, they're not going to be very effective. But something not good took place on September 12th of 2000. And that's where they all realized that, uh-oh, the indigo children are waking up and they're doing the grid work. We're going to lose it. They're getting the 12 code, the D12 frequency, back into the grids, which is going to seal the portal so they can't access them. That's when they decided, even though we hate each other, why don't we all gang up together and together we can use all of our grid systems to make sure that we have critical mass frequency in the planetary grids by a certain period of time which happens to be August 12th of 2003 a thing called the United Resistance resistance to the Emerald Covenant Founders Peace Treaty was formed on September 12th of 2000 and boy you should have seen the psychic attack that came at me after that with the stuff that I've been because we've been really teaching um, we didn't teach a lot of the conflict drama stuff because the guardian races were trying to work it out through negotiations with the Anunnaki we weren't exposing the Anunnaki at that point and we really weren't too much into worrying about exposing anybody we give you we show you you know there's Montauk and there was this and that but the important thing was how to deal with the stellar activation cycle because that's the big thing I mean you might have fallen angelics and big bad ETs and Illuminati and a bunch of stuff like that we're talking about planets and stargates here going through a cycle where the planet's going to get bombarded by frequencies that it can't hold which is going to cause pole shift bigger problem so we were focusing on what had to be done for that bigger problem because if we were successful in getting enough d12 frequency in the planetary grids to clear these grids and to stabilize it which is a process called it's actually called the christos realignment mission d12 frequency equals pre-matter template equals divine blueprint equals Christos. It's the stuff that Christ was talking about. Okay? The idea is to get the D12 frequency into the planetary grids that will clear out any distortions in the lower frequencies that are there that will allow the planet to pass through a stellar activation cycle naturally. It will also give a permanent seal, frequency seal, protection seal to the planetary stargates and vortices, to the fallen angelics. So you can't come through the wormholes anymore. And bother us here. So that's what we focused on and getting people to realize that they had these levels of identity 
that they had DNA that those levels of identity were connected to, and that by using certain mechanics, by understanding how to use the mind, which generates scalar waves, how to use it to direct frequency, you could activate your DNA to get the rest of your consciousness in your body, and you could also directly affect the planetary grids. The process that we call rainbow round tables are a process of understanding yourself as a bioelectric conductor unit, as well as a spiritual being. Human bodies transduce interdimensional electrical frequency, and they are the only vehicle on this planet that can hold D12 frequency. There's nothing else that you can't invent a machine that will hold D12 frequency. In the old days, we used to be the grid protectors by simply doing certain things with our biofields that would run the frequencies into the planet on a daily basis. These were societies built on love and peace, and people didn't fight with each other, and everybody didn't care what you called your God, because everybody recognized they had the same one. It didn't matter what your name you called it. And we honored each other as all blessed parts of that source. These were our civilizations that we had when we knew how to run the rainbow rounds, when we knew how to work as a group and put our bodies in certain ways and move energy through them in certain ways using advanced Merkaba mechanics, that we would energize ourselves and heal ourselves, and we would also help the planet to heal and stay stable. What was amazing is in those ancient cultures, humans didn't eat. They didn't need to. They were called breatharians. The human body did not need to suck energy off other life forms, which means taking it in and draining a life force to keep its own alive. It would use its own Merkaba field, which is a set of spiraling, counter-rotating fields of electromagnetic energy that run around the body naturally and through the body. They would simply use those on a daily basis, accelerate them to a certain level to pull in more frequency from the atmosphere and from the planetary grids, and it would nourish the planet, because if you pulled it from the planet, the planet would then pull it from the sun, which would then pull it from what it's connected to up higher. It was a circulatory system. This is what the human being really was. And right now, things are in such disarray here, not only does the, uh, the planetary guardian team not even remember who it is and forget remembering how to run round tables, what are they? <laughs> you know, I mean, I had, I had to relearn. I didn't come in with the knowledge of them this time, but I came in with little memory clips of seeing hundreds and hundreds of people, most of them wearing white, they just like white robe things, doing these beautiful synchronized dances and singing these beautiful songs. I would have, I had little flashes of those. Ever since I was a child, I had little pictures of those. I didn't know where they fit. These were round tables. <laughs> these were people that, you didn't, when, when, we're gonna do a round table before we leave, it, and probably sometime Sunday, we're gonna try to figure out where we can do them. But, the ones we do now, these are like the, the kindergarten little baby training courses, because when kids could walk in those days, that's when they'd be doing what we're doing right now. By the time they were grown-ups, they, they knew how to use their bioenergy systems. They had their avatar consciousness in body. They could build standing pillars of sound that could open portals, and they could go through them. This is what the human body has the capacity to become again. Right now, we have to start at the beginning back to, okay, we just learned how to walk, now we can learn how to do the round tables like the grown-ups. <laughs> the grown-ups, ourselves of us, our future, let's say, incarnations that exist now in a future time frame, that are sending this information back to us so we can get ourselves out of this. Because the only thing that's going to prevent what's in biblical revelations from happening is if we get enough D12 frequency in the planetary grids to stop what the Illuminati are trying to do in 2003. In 2003, August 12, 2003, there is something planned called the Dimensional Blend Experiment. <laughs> the Dimensional Blend Experiment has to do with blending the two wormholes into one big one and then sucking the planet into it. <laughs> <laughs> to put it bluntly, this is what the dimensional blend experiment is. I'm sorry, that was, it came out kind of blunt, but that's really what it is. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah there's, a, there's more technical terms of describing that, and I'll probably get into them tomorrow. But <laughs> that's just something just moved through me and it came out that way. I apologize if that offended anyone. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> anyway, this is not something we want to experience. Because what it would mean is if this planet gets um, drawn into <laughs> the, 
<laughs> into the black hole system. It means that there's something interesting that happens in black holes. Now, scientists just trying here is just trying to figure out whether they, they exist. They they theorize that they exist. They're not sure what they might do, but they think there's some out there someplace because things seem to go away <laughs> and go down into something that disappears on the other end. When something goes into a black hole system, a black hole system is something that used to be part of the natural template of what's called a time matrix. Now you have many different galaxies in a time matrix, but it's the core template that holds the structure of universes and galaxies together for the experience of evolution, for things to come in and be able to be on planets. Now, when a black hole is formed, it's as if you, as if the time matrix, we say like a, a stocking, and then there is a hole ripped in the stocking that goes through to someplace else. You could also look at it as cutting a piece of the fabric out of that stocking. That hole that's in it actually becomes another system that's composed of portions of what used to be in the natural time matrix. It is a hole in the fabric of time within a time matrix that when things go through it, they don't just disappear and go poof. They reassemble but not on their original divine blueprint order, their natural order that goes with the natural law of the way energy is supposed to work. They, they order the particles, consciousness, bodies, planets, when they get pulled through a black hole system, they will re-accrete on the other side, which means they will pull back together, but they will not have all of their pieces there to do it with. So they will pull together chaotically arranged. This means the consciousness of the beings will be distorted, that's where we get our fallen angelic buddies. They will not be able to hold coherent thought or Christos consciousness in that condition. A planet that goes through doesn't just go through and goes poof. What happens in the process of going through this level of the planet's matter body and your physical body literally incinerates. So that's gone. But you still have the other portions. In the beginning, when Michael began to talk about the different body systems, you know, we have like our astral body and our, our spiritual bodies, our mental body, we have other levels of our own matter density. This one will not make it through a black hole system. What will happen is we would literally go through spontaneous combustion here. But our consciousness would reassemble itself in a different, lighter astral state of matter density in the black hole system. And what we would find there is we were under the rule and dominion of something called the United Federation of Planets, which is the Anu Elohim Anunnaki Dominion group over in what's called the Phantom Matrix. The Phantom Matrix is a black hole system that resulted from a thing that happened in this time matrix literally 250 billion years ago. That was before the human form was created. This has been a problem in this time matrix for eons and eons, and humans were created to assist the founders in healing that problem. Right now, the problem's in our face, and most of us are asleep here. This isn't a war that you can win with weapons, with guns and cannons and nuclear bombs. They're useless in the face of something like this. If it came into outside war, and this is why guardian races have not come here. They're communicating with those of us who will listen. They came here in the 1930s when the Zetas broke through. And they tried to talk to the Illuminati. And they said, listen, you're in trouble, guys. You don't want to make deals with these guys. Because this is what they're going to try to do to you. And they said, well, will you give us weapons technologies? Because we want to take over like that country over there. Said, no, we're not going to give you weapons technologies. You'll blow yourselves up. But we will help you with this problem that is coming up. You're having a stellar activation cycle. Your planet's going to go into pole shift if something's not done. The governments in the world management team opted for the Zeta treaties, which meant the Zetas had the stronghold here. If the guardian races care about the humans here, which they do, and they attempted to come in to make mass contact with civilians because the governments wouldn't talk to them anymore, what would happen would be instant Star Wars. We would have found sp spaceships throwing beams at each other in our skies because the draconian races, the draconian Omicron, the various Anunnaki races, and the Zeta Regalian races would have all come in. If, if the Guardians let themselves be known, obviously people are going to know there's ETs now, right? So now that the, you know, the game is up, 
there's nothing left to lose. They would have brought war right down on our heads. The last time something like that happened on that scale, on the scale it would be this time if it had happened that way, was 5.5 um, million years ago. It was a period called the Electric Wars, where it literally fried everything in biological form. And what I mean fried is not nuclear. They use technologies that employ sonics, sound, <coughs> invisible, inaudible sound waves. Did you ever see those commercials? Long time ago, some tape company had a commercial out where they'd have an opera singer hit a really high note and hold a crystal glass up, and the glass would go, Ksh! right? Well, sound is the most important, the most powerful force there is. It's more more powerful than light-based technologies. And lasers are pretty powerful. They're light-based technologies. But sound-based technologies are the invisible iron hand. This is the type of technologies that are used by the fallen angelics and by founders. But the founders' races don't use them to destroy things like the fallen angelics do. If we had been caught in a sonic war to that degree, there would have been nothing left. Because what's amazing about sonics, this is part of the thing that's kind of funny, people say, well, if there were so many people here for so many million years, why aren't there any more corpses? There should be more bodies. <coughs> Not if they know how to use sonic technologies. They don't leave their garbage behind, literally. Because they would be, I remember ha uh, having lifetimes in those time frames. You'd have small ha handheld devices. We didn't have garbage <coughs> cans. You didn't need them. If you were done with something, you would simply transmute it. You would simply zap it with sound frequency, and it would take it back. There'd be a little dust left. That would be about all. Because it would take the scalar wave template of the matter form and shatter the template. So the energy in it would release, and anything that couldn't transmute would just become ash. That's how they got rid of a lot of, when I said house cleaning in 9,558 BC, that's how they got rid of a lot of the Atlantean civilizations. Atlantis was already islands by that point. There had been a major catastrophe in 28,000 BC that had, there was a continent called Atlantis once, but by 9,558 BC it was already three island nations. In Florida, where we're living right now, was part of one of them. It was called Brua, Atlantis, in the Bermuda, what they call Bermuda Islands now. That was called Nohasa, Atlantis. And the land mass is called England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, were what's called Lohas, Atlantis. Each one of those places had a major stargate on it. That's why it was real important to make all the things about Atlantis disappear. So the most we'd remember is maybe it was a legendary race that once existed. Because we have a stargate in the US, stargate number two, which is the one that controls number one and number three. It's in Sarasota, Florida off the coast of Siesta Key. Stargate number three is in Bermuda. It's right off the coast of the Bermuda Islands coming toward the mainland. Stargate number one is in the South Pole. There are 12 stargates. We've got the maps down. The people who have taken, who have been working with us in the last year, <coughs> excuse me, we have been given the locations. And now we all, guys, by the way, we have them exact now. Specific, right down to, okay, it's in Tibet. Where in Tibet? All right, we, we've got the specific maps now. Not just of the stargates, but of something called Q sites. They're activation sites. They're activation sites for the stargates. But if you want the stargate to activate and you're going to do it manually, you have to do it from the Q site, which is located someplace else. So there is a huge amount of data that belongs to this race. It is the heritage of us, of humans. It's being brought back to us now in a really big hurry. Because if we can learn enough of it, to at least run some rounds between now and the end of 2002. We have the ability to stop the progression of the invasion that's taking place. If we don't do it, there are several things that are going to happen. First of all, this thing we're seeing on TV right now is going to progress into a world war drama because that's what it was created to do. It's not going to be any one person's fault because they're not the ones who are designing it. They are just following orders. And the reason why Illuminati follow orders is because they're terrified. They are terrified with what they've got themselves into. I don't even think, like, <laughs> most of the presidents don't even know. They've never met an ET. Some of them know that, all right, MJ-12 knows stuff about that. And they know that they better keep their noses clean and out of it because they'll be assassinated if they don't. So you can't even blame the presidents of, of, of countries and things. It, they're just the front people. Now. We can make a difference as to whether we see pole shift. We can make a difference as to whether we see this invasion continue. But there's something that's already been set in motion. 
that is going to become progressively more of a reality. Right now, the American psyche is hugely primed to be very scared. I mean, they had to really make a big deal about the fact that they found three anthrax cases, you know? Four now, oh yes. God forbid, out of like how many billions of people are here? But they, the media is hyping, hyping, hyping. This is working on us. It's first of all, got us mad enough to say, go get them. That was a terrible, horrible thing to do. Definitely. War, all right, you got it. That was an act of war. Well, it really was, but boy, did, was it turned into an act of war. Literally, we're over there flattening people that live in Afghanistan that have, oh, they, would, they would have loved to have run away to America or anybody else years ago because of the creeps that were running their country. These are the people who are getting bombs dropped on their head. But this is just meant as a trigger event. This whole thing is meant to lead us and quickly. It's a quickly that shocked me. I used to think, all right, if they're planning to do this, they want to get us into World War III, and then they know there's going to be earth changes coming up from the sonics that they're using in the grids during the stellar activation cycle. So they get us so desolate and desperate, and everybody's praying for saviors to come because it's such a mess here. Perfect timing! That's a great time to fly in with your spaceship, say, hi, I'm Jesus, Moses, and Joseph. You know, <laughs> you know remember the books? We wrote those. They're the stories about us creating you. Right? This is what they wanted to do to come in. We are being set up for this. And right now, they would like to come in by 2005. But they have to make a whole lot of things happen before they're going to be able to come in here and introduce themselves as another race of beings. They'll put the ones that look most human. That's the front ones. They'll hide as much as possible the ones that look like reptiles because they know they scare us. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but at this point, they're all working together. Before, at least, if you knew somebody... I, I remember one... I went to a UFO conference, and God bless this one lady. Her, her whole presentation was about the joy of astral sex with reptiles. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe this woman, intelligent lady, you know, nice-looking lady, not, not, not crazy. She was having contact, all right. But they were literally using her on the astral level and she was thinking it was great <laughs> oh my god but before if you ran into somebody like that you knew they weren't talking to Palladians and they weren't talking to Niberians because, or Necromaton because the reptilians were doing one thing the draconians which are dragon moth okay when I say draconian Omicron draconian these ha they're, they have dragon like faces but they're not as much reptilian as dragon moth they have the wing things and, and they're like pretty gross looking when you see them and these things are real and what's scary is when you get your fourth strand fully turned on and you can see the fourth dimension prepare yourself because you will start to see in human bodies who really lives there and you may I, the first time I, I, that started to happen with me when my fourth strand was activating somebody came to my door and I opened the door and the first thing I saw was a lizard in a suit <laughs> And I thought, oh my God, I'm losing my mind now. I'm hallucinating, right? And, you know, my guys are like, Shh, we'll talk to you later. Just, just deal with it. Just talk to him. And then it kind of faded back in. We're like, okay, all right, it is a human, okay? And they're saying, no, it's not. Remember what you just saw. We'll talk about it later. It's like, okay. So I dealt with the guy. And they explain that there's a lot of cloaking that's going on around here right now. When you start to get your fourth DNA strand activated, you start to be able to pick up and see fourth dimensional frequency. That's when you start to get, and first it'll be like a ghost image, where you'll see it better if you close your eyes. But eventually it gets to the point where you walk, I, I try to shut it off sometimes, especially if I'm on a crowded street, because it gets really unnerving <laughs> <laughs> I got on a bus at, uh, where were we at, what, it was not a bus, it was one of those old train things yeah. at the airport. We stepped onto it, and all of a sudden I saw this guy looking at me like really weird. Uh, he was like just standing over in the corners, and just like, mm, look on his face. And I closed my eyes, and that's when I got it first, and I opened them, and it was still there. And it, it, he was like one of the lizard people. And there was four more of them behind me. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, we're surrounded. And I, got the, I, I felt the reality that, wow, this, this particular town are full of them. It's like a town that's uh, it's like lizard town. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean, it, it's a rude awakening. When you start to go multidimensional, when you start to get in your higher consciousness, prepare yourself. <laughs> because reality is very much different than what most of us are trained in school to expect. Yeah. Now, we're going into a situation that it is... Uh, if I were to teach things 
in a way that focused on the happy, happy, joy, joy, let's go do this and we'll fix it all. And those are just little problems over here and they'll go away. People weren't going to take it very seriously. And if they don't take it very seriously, then I will be called a liar. And then I will have a lot of people very angry with me and hurt by the fact that I didn't tell them when stuff starts to happen. Because stuff is going to happen if we don't make a difference. It's already happening. The Trade Center and Pentagon thing were a trigger event that was meant to begin the polarization of world governments. Whoa, did it work. I, I mean, literally in a month, it has done it. Totally. That's the beginning of creating a good guy group and a bad guy group. Because of the fallen angelic agendas, what they're planning to do, they want to come in and side with the good guy group get rid of the bad guy group, and then they'll proceed to initiate the good guy group into something called the United Federation of Planets, where the UN becomes the United Planet Federation. It'll be an honor to have Earth accepted into this wonderful Galactic Federation of Planets. Galactic Federation will probably be the group that introduces the whole idea, because they are an Anunnaki group. They're also, they have a huge website. I don't know if anybody has ever seen on the, the internet, the Galactic Federation website. They have literally thousands and thousands of people as their human host greeting teams. They're already... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that person's book. Now, the idea was to get us into the United Federation of Planets, which means we would all do certain types of new energy mechanics that they gave us. This is why we're still breathing on this planet. You think if they wanted us so bad, they just would have got rid of us and we'd be dead now, right? They need humans. Humans have in their DNA template the keys to the planetary grids. That means the frequencies that will allow the planetary ley lines and axiotonal lines and stargates to open are held as scalar wave patterns in the human DNA. Anunnaki can't open the grids. Drax can't open the grids. They need us to do it for them. For them to get control of the grids, they need to reverse the natural electromagnetic fields in them. To do that, they need to get us to open them and have our electromagnetic fields reversed. That's what they've been progressively doing here since Atlantis. This gets into Merkaba mechanics and how right now the planet's Merkaba field, its counter-rotating spirals of electromagnetic energy, are running in reverse to the natural order. This is one of the reasons we die so young when we used to live literally for thousands of years, when the first mess happened, then it was reduced to 800 years. And since 3,470 BC, we have about a 75 year lifespan. This all gets into Merkaba mechanics, and Merkaba mechanics are part of the planetary Templar mechanics, the round tables. That when we begin to learn how to use this, we can do several things that are very important. We can help the planet and help stop this invasion, because it is an invasion at this point. The negotiations did not work, the Anunnaki broke the treaties, and they all sided up together to make sure somebody gets it. Now, Merkaba mechanics are also a very personal thing, because if you learn to do Merkaba the right way, the way where it uses your own D12 frequency, now that that frequency is available on the planet again, this is why, this time, after so many thousands of years, for the first time, in 210,216 years, we have D12 frequency to work with that they can't override. If you learn to run your Merkaba fields on the right rotations with your D12 frequency, it will heal your DNA template progressively, which will make it so you can go through the stellar activation cycle changes without having your body fall apart around you. There can be a lot of people getting sick because the DNA is mutated right now and it won't do what it's normally supposed to do when the frequencies come in from the solar spirals. They'll be getting radiation poisoning. Yeah. When you work with your Merkaba fields, you begin to change that. You begin to build natural immunity because you're getting your system working the way it was supposed to. Every person that gets their own DNA and own Merkaba fields straightened out will create, will, will add to what is called the critical mass potential. If there is enough people that get their DNA and their Merkaba field straightened out. It will become the dominant pattern within the race field. It will trigger everybody's into the right patterns. We're beginning to do that now. So 
we look at the terrorist stuff on TV and, oh dear, you know, I mean, like, literally, we're all sitting here, I, I don't know about you, but I'll go home and turn on the TV, anything, happen, anything blow up yet? You know, I mean, we've literally be con been conditioned to expect this now. Uh, the FBI has already told us in the next several days, like they've got it planned. They know they're going to do something, of course they do, because Illuminati Central sent it down. Tomorrow, either tomorrow or Sunday, I'm not sure which, which place I'm going to put that segment of the history, but I'll tell you a little story about World War II. It's just utterly mind-blowing about what really happened and what we think happened. Because this is the stuff that's going on on our TVs right now. It appears to be this. Of course, America is justified to go over there and, like, you know, blow Afghanistan off the map in order to chase around a bunch of little Taliban who are hiding in caves anyway. There is a plan that's orchestrated that has nothing to do with the apparent battle. The apparent battle is necessary. It's a necessary cover so the particular things, right now there's conquest happening. There are grid sites needing to be opened, APIM sites, and there are territories that the United Resistance Fallen Angelic Forces want to make sure that they have their Illuminati positioned in control of. The Stargate sites, the Q sites, and the main Axia Tunnel and Ley Line sites are very valuable real estate in the stellar activation cycle. So right now, I, I really feel bad for Saddam Hussein, not because I like the man, but um, it ought to be real interesting to see how long he stays there. Because he's sitting on something called Q-Site 10 mm -hmm. that goes with Stargate 10 that's right next door in Iran. Talk about the Persian Gulf War. Guess what that was about. There has been a whole thing going on here beneath the politics, literally, for thousands of years, but most apparently since the 1930s, where why we think we've been in wars was not exactly why we thought. There's been this other element, the hidden element, element three, not just this side and that side, but the side controlling the two of them from behind the scenes. This is the time when we do a really fast rude awakening. And for me, I know I, I didn't want to talk about Illuminati stuff. You know, as a speaker, as a teacher, I wanted to help people keep focused on the solutions, which are Merkaba mechanics and spiritual integration. That's why the New Age movement, the ones who were working with good stuff, were taught the solution to this is spiritual. But the part that was missing was they didn't teach you that there was a technical physics aspect to, to spiritual. They taught you just, open your heart and love everything and la-di-da, you'll fix it that way. You're not going to do much of anything that way except open your astral field so somebody can tag it. We teach you the mechanics so you can learn how to do spiritual integration through the DNA because you're not going to get that consciousness up here into this body down here unless you open up the DNA template to hold it, which will create different chemical reactions in the DNA, which will create different hormonal reactions, which will create different chemical carriers for the, wave, the brainwave patterns. It literally changes the form when you begin working with Merkaba to open the DNA. So at this point, I know I'm going to go home and turn on the TV and say, everything's still there. And I keep thinking, if you were a terrorist, what in the world could you do to top that? I mean, sink the country? <laughs> I mean, that was like you used your best statement for first instead of last. That was the most atrocious, horrible, just awe. I mean, it, I, I, I still almost have to, to laugh in horror uh, out how bizarre that somebody could actually do that, could actually get in there and do that. And then when you know what happened behind it, when you realize, oh, well, that was just staged because the thing was going to probably fall anyway in reaction to the sonic pulse that was being used to get to the thing under it. This is why. They weren't trying to take out those buildings, but they knew that those buildings were sitting on APIN sites, that to activate them, they would have to blow enough sonics through that it would probably affect the immediately surrounding areas. And it would have been really, really strange if within a few minutes of each other, you had part of the Pentagon collapse in Washington and the trade towers fall down up here with nothing hitting them. That would have been a really strange experiment, uh, experience and you'd have all the conspiracy theorists on the internet buzzing about governments using sonic pulses and things, right? So it was important to give a very dramatic example of, well, you know, these buildings came down, look at this terrorist did this, plus it also served to start the war drama. The war drama has a purpose. A, reduce unwanted populations, populations that are unwanted by the ET fallen angelics. To get rid of them. B, to get key Illuminati people 
in position in certain governments who have territories, who have stargates, ley lines, or cue sites that are considered valuable, which all of those, um, all of the above, are considered valuable. The third purpose is because they need to get control of the frequencies on this planet to stop human DNA activating. This is the biggest threat right now, is the fact that humans, their DNA is keyed to activate. It's keyed to activate in response to frequency. The planet is now beginning to receive stellar wave infusions. It comes through the solar, what we call the solar spirals, the energy emanations that are coming off the sun in the solar light spectra. Human DNA is activating now, and because of the work that's been done by guardian groups and by indigo children groups here, and by humans that were working with you know, DNA mechanics, it's actually activating on a 12 code pulse, which means humans are going to activate every 12th subharmonic in every one of their 12 strands. That's a whole lot of human bodies running 12th dimensional frequency. 12th dimensional frequency is the enemy of fallen angelic races because they cannot override it and they cannot move through it. They're always welcome to evolve to the point where they can become a Christos race and be able to enjoy it. But you can't do that and continue to want to dominate everything in your path and rip apart universes. So. Yes, they do. We're in a war of frequency right now. Okay, we win by critical mass. That means whoever gets to generate the most frequency. If you look at two things, frequency and the direction of Merkaba spin whether the Merkaba is going to spin the way it's supposed to or in reverse. These are the two elements that are going to determine who wins this round. And this is the final round. And it was known since 22,326 BC that the founders were coming back as the indigo children to make sure that phantom matrix was sealed permanently because it has grown larger than this time matrix and it will suck this time matrix in. So it's like if there is, I won't even say if the good guys don't win. <laughs> There's not an if, because if things don't go well here, it not only affects this system. This system is connected to the Pleiades, which is connected to the Cirrus star system, which is connected to the Arcturus, to Arcturus, which is connected to Orion, which is connected to Andromeda, all the way up the chain of the 12 universal stargates. That whole mess from D11 on down will get drawn in to the Phantom Matrix. So we have a lot of support, but if we underestimate what we're in the middle of, that's where the problem's going to come in. A lot of people, I, I've, it, this is one thing that just drives me crazy with some of the, the lovely people from the New Age movement that have been studying Anunnaki teachings, where, oh, well, I don't have to worry about protecting my fields. You know, they're safe. Yeah? How do you know? Oh, well, well God is, like, watching them for me, or Archangel Michael is watching them for me. Good luck. There is such an underestimation of the drama. If it was so darn easy, we would have fixed it a long time ago. If there was not a real conflict taking place, we would have been living a peaceful, loving civilization by now on this planet. Literally, the cultural s structure of this civilization since Atlantis fell or was made to fall has been built on the Anunnaki model. It is exploitive. It has small groups exploiting and taking energy from large groups. In the original human civilizations, there was no such thing as a hungry person, even once they did have apparatus to eat with. They were built on love, they were built on understanding, and they were built on peace. They were sharing. You did not have monetary systems that exploited people like you do here. The whole foundations of our culture that we have come to accept as the way it's supposed to be, so it must be okay, because everybody else does it, they are the Anunnaki model. There is a civilization style that is natural for humans and for beings who have the ability to hold an awareness of love within themselves, for themselves, for, other, for each other, for other creatures. That is our heritage. We are at the point right now that for many, many centuries there has been purposely invasion staged here to get this place when it went into star activation. This is why it's taken so long. 
if it was if they didn't need a stellar activation cycle to happen to finish what they're trying to do which is literally take this planet into phantom matrix into the black hole if they could do it any other way they just would have done it already if they didn't need humans and their dna to get to the planetary grids to put them in reverse rotation they would have gotten rid of us a long time ago the reason has taken so long is because stellar activation cycles don't happen every year they're on a uh, 26,556 year cycle i think it is, is that right 26566 <laughs> yeah 26,000, yeah, twat, that's it, I got 26,556 year cycle, all right? It means every 26,556 years, a stellar activation cycle can happen on the planet, but that doesn't mean it will. It will only happen on a planet if the planetary grids are up to a certain level of frequency or vibration. If they're not, the stellar activation cycle will happen in other planets in the local galaxy, but literally those frequencies will pass through the planet and will not go into the planet's grids. Now, it has been literally since 208,000, 208,000, 216 BC, since the last full stellar activation took place here. And boy, was it a mess. We hit pole shift, and we hit invasion, and it was a real mess, and it started the evolutionary dark cycle. That was almost fixed in 22,000, 326 BC. There was the race that are now called the Indigo Children. They're the Iani. They also have incarnations in Inner Earth and several other places had come in to fix this. The Iani Indigo children are the incarnations down here of the Christos Founders races. They came in directly into body form here. They had to because it was getting so out of hand here that the whole time matrix was going to get end up in the black hole system. So when we talk about indigo children, and most people that come to these workshops are indigo children, just so you know. That doesn't mean you know you're an indigo child. It's usually a wake-up process. But it came very close to this problem being fixed in 22,326 BC. But we were invaded again by Anunnaki groups that time. And it was called the Iani Massacre. We were just decimated, literally. The, the race, the Iani race was decimated. And we didn't get to finish what we had come to do. This is where our trump card is. Just like I've talked about the APIM systems, those microchip systems through the grids that the fallen angelics have. Well, the Iani had one too. It was called the Four Faces of Man grid. Now, it is a similar technology, but it's actually more advanced. It was not an APIN, it was an LPIN. It was a Lumerian system, which actually utilized um, higher mechanics of sacred physics than the Atlantean ones did. This is a network that has been dormant since the Atlantean periods, the Atlantean Lumerian periods, that belongs to the Iani races and to the founders. And it goes with two other ones that were here for, I, geez, I have to remember how long they were here. They were here, I think, from the end of seating one, the two older APIM systems. There's something called the Great White Lion, the Golden Eagle, because this is what they look like from the air when you look at the planet and then fold the planet out on a flat surface. They literally look like drawings made of light. They were done that way on purpose. They were done that way to look like the races who created them. So the Great White Lion was made by the Leonine races, which are the Elohai, Elohim races, the original seed races of the human lineage. And the Golden Eagle grids, if you looked at it coming in in a spaceship, it looks like a, a large eagle with its wings spread. That was another one of the founders. APIN systems, but the big one, the LPIN system, that had more power than both of them. <coughs> it was called the Four Faces of Man because it looked like four heads. Four heads that were modeled after what the Iani looked like, which is what humans look like. Now, the closest representation of the Four Faces of Man, or one of those faces, most people have seen the pictures of Easter Island with the big stone heads. They were erected by certain of the Iani descendant groups, not as the grids themselves, but to mark certain important spots on the grids and in commemoration of the mission. The mission that had been started in 22,326 BC was to, to activate this four faces of man grid because the four faces of man grid was connected to two others exactly like it. One was on parallel earth, and the other was an inner earth. 
So there were the twelve faces of men. They were known as the guardians of the twelve pillars because when these frequencies would activate in the planetary grids, they would create standing pillars of sound, inaudible sound, that would link Earth, parallel Earth, and the inner Earth together and allow them to plug into another time matrix where there wasn't this problem. So Earth would have enough frequency so it didn't get sent down into the black hole matrix. So there would be, you could pull Earth up this way, make the two matrices sever enough so a permanent cap could be put on the other matrix. They have tried literally for 250 billion years to rescue this black hole system. But the black hole is getting bigger than the system it was part of. It's eating it. It's like a cancer. And there's nothing they can do at this point but sever this part for now. And there'll be other rescue missions attempted, but it won't be from this time matrix. Right now, our trump card is are, are the guardians of the 12 pillars, which are the three sets of the four faces of man grids that are LPN system, LPIN systems, little microchip, crystalline microchip systems that are set within the planetary grids. I'm going to, by, by Sunday I'll have them drawn. They're, I'm going to have maps. They're also going in the next, the second printing of Voyagers 2. Right, the publisher held it up until we got this new stuff in. <laughs> this book ever gets out. <laughs> but I will do my best to have those drawings done so we can like put them up on here. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to, this is literally new data that's been given in the last week. So it's like, again, hot off the presses as usual. So what I'm going to be doing, I'll be up probably most of the night, getting what I'm, I'm going to try to do, a chart pack, what I call chart packs, where you get some written material and like there'll be the diagrams and those kind of things. I will do my best to have uh, as much as I can in writing for you, but I will at least get those drawings done by Sunday. So when I talk about these different APIN systems, you can start to see where they are. You can also start to see something, and this is going to be one of the most valuable things to know. There's something we're going to talk about that gets back into the biblical revelation story. It gets into something called the two sets of seals, actually. There's something called the 12 natural planetary star crystal seals. These are configurations, certain points in the planetary grid, that allow frequencies between different ley lines and axiotonal lines to blend to make you know, very intense frequencies, which is a natural process that Earth would go through going through a stellar activation cycle. Now, if those seals, the natural seals, don't work right, that's when big problems happen. The seals are opening now. Um, I believe three of them are open. Four of them are open now. Four of the natural seals are open. The natural seals aren't the big problem. Something called the seven seals are the big problem. In the book of Revelation, which was, remember, written by the Jehovian Anunnaki, which are the bipedial dolphin people from Cirrus A and Arcturus. All right, they, they were the uh, ones who inspired St. John, who was a woman, to um, write <laughs> Revelation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, there are seven what are called Jehovian seals. These are not little paper stickers on books that God holds. Okay? You might get that, that impression by reading Revelation. These are frequency implants, unnatural seals, that were placed in conjunction with seven out of our twelve natural seals. So they would do something awful every time one of our natural seals activated. We'll get into the story of the horsemen, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah, the Jehovians knew the apocalypse was coming. You know why? Because they were going to create it. That's why. They were going to, they knew they had these grid implants. And they're more powerful than most of the other ones, most of the other APIN systems. But there are seven powerful seals, unnatural frequency patterns, dormant, held in crystalline rods that have been implanted at very specific, at a very specific place in Earth's grids that will activate in relation to our seals. Now, our seals number one, two, and three activated. Each one of those had a Jehovian counterpart. Our seal four did not. I think it's seal eight is the next one of ours that has seal four of the Jehovian one. The four seals, the first four Jehovian seals are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The horses are the frequencies that are transmitted by the normal natural seals. 
and the horsemen that ride upon them are the ones in the biblical revelation story that have the power and were given the power to create this, that, and the other thing. And boy, they were given the power to do some nasty things. When a seal, a Jehovian seal, activates in the planetary grids, it has between three months and 12 months before its effects start to be seen. In May, the first two were released. And that's why we were sent to Kauai to try to balance those frequencies before they did something very drastic as they were releasing. In July, the third one was released. If anybody's familiar with Revelations, that's, behold a white horse, he's gone. Behold a red horse, that one's gone too. And interestingly, the red horse, he who rides on him, was given the power to take peace from the earth, and men would slay each other. Interesting timing. Hmm, yeah. And it was also interesting that when we, when we, after we did the work in Kauai, where the white horse was set free, we ended up going to England to work with Gate 11, and guess where the gate was? It was in, on a place called Milk Hill in, um, what part of England is that? Pusey. Pusey, vale of Pusey, Vale of Pusey, England, where one of the famous England white horses are, these big chalk horses that are etched in to the, like literally the side of the mountain, right? And so there was this big white horse that helped us to identify where we had to get to, to go, and we didn't even know this stuff then. It was kind of like looking back on, oh, okay, you know, somebody has a sense of humor up there. Then we get into the black horse, which has to do, now these colors, the white, the red, the black, and the pale, they have to do with the frequency combinations that are, are released from the natural seals. And we'll have the charts. I, I, have, I have like the chart of what frequencies are carried by what seal and all that, so I'll try to have that type set. So, you know, you'll have that with your information. What it means is, the first three seals, which are the, the more mild of the seals, and then, like, even if everything was going great on the planet, and you didn't have a bunch of maniacs running around with photosonic beaming equipment, these seals are still trouble. But when you combine that with the other mess that's going on with the planetary shields, this is a real problem. When you see that next to seeing what the scalar pulses have done since the 1930s, between 1930 and 1992, there was over, how, how many were on that list, do you think? Yeah. Yeah, there was like 20, 20 plus major earthquakes, and if we only had a small list of the hurricanes because we ran out of paper, we, it, it was enough to get the point across. These were things just the scalar pulses, the sonic pulses were creating. You combine sonic pulses, disharmonic sonic pulses, with Jehovian seals, with stellar activation, we're in for a ride if we don't do something. And the something we need to do is two things. We need to get to the point where, through running round tables, we can activate the four faces of man grid here that will allow it to plug in and start getting frequency from the parallel Earth and inner Earth and plug right into the other time matrix that will feed it and keep it as an anchoring rod. That's one thing we need to do. We need to work with our own biosystems because one of the scary things about the intimate relationship between human bodies and planetary bodies is if there are distortions in the planetary scalar template, these will manifest in your DNA template. The Jehovian seals in the planetary grids also manifest in your body when they activate. They're like dormant time bombs. When the DNA starts to activate, in, once they're activated on the planet, they won't do anything to you until they, they activate on the planet. There are things we need to do with our bodies to clear this stuff so it doesn't make us sick. And it's not just sick. There are most of the Jehovian seals, or it's interesting, all of the Jehovian seals on the planet body are positioned on what on the vertical line that's called axiotonal line seven. Now I'll show you, yeah, you know, I'll have the maps to show you more what that is. It's actually at um, I think it's seventy degrees west longitude. Yeah. Seventy degrees west. Every one of them are positioned at different latitudes, but on that vertical in the human body, you have an axiotonal line 7 that runs vertically through the left side of the body. These are where those same Jehovian seals are. And some of them are up by the heart, some of them are up by the thyroid, some of them are down in the leg, and a couple of them are in the brain, where they literally block the natural function of the chemical hormonal systems in the body, and they literally begin the process of reversing the natural particle spin on your body. So when we go through, the plan was when we would go through the stellar activation under Jehovian control, 
what would happen was our physical bodies would fry. The molecular compaction creates spontaneous combustion of the body form. But our astral bodies would be hijacked along with the planet into the black hole matrix. They're trying to take us too. And if we're aware of it, we don't have to be scared. Ignorance might be bliss, but it's what's going to get you right into the black hole matrix. This is what the whole story about hell and Hades and the pit and the, the beast coming out of the pit and all this stuff in Revelations was about. And it was interesting because the names kind of, um, there are two names, Satan and uh, Lucifer. They got kind of rolled up into one. But some traditions teach you that, no, they were too different. They were too different. They're two family names. The, Sat the Satan Marduk family line of Anunnaki, that's our Satan. And the Luciferian name came from the Lulatan, Toth Enki Lulatan family line, and the different types of hybrids that were made from that line. They are both associated with the Phantom Matrix, a.k.a. Hades, a.k.a. Hell the Pit. This is what this whole story was about, telling us about this staged invasion. We're getting smart at this point. And I give you guys credit, because I just, you know, usually I'll try to walk people ever so carefully into this stuff, because this is touchy stuff. You know, we love our holy books. We love our Bible. If, if you happen to be Islamic, you love your Koran. If you happen to be Christian, you love your Bible. And you can get really, really upset if somebody starts saying, wait a minute, that's not what they taught me in Sunday school. <laughs> you know? The thing is, those books were holy. They were built on very sacred text. They were built on the Emerald Covenant CDD plate, text translations, the 12 major religions of the planet that all agreed with each other. They each had a part of the teachings that they were entrusted to hold for the generations to come. They've been raped. Our religions have been gutted. And it's, our, it's up to us whether we're going to worship books or allow the presence of our own connection to God to move us. And that's what this is about. So I'm at a point where I get, I, you know, there's a lot of people like my family I don't even try to talk to. They're, my uncle's a very good priest. And uh, <laughs> he probably thinks I should be shot by now. It takes a lot of courage to face what's going on here. I give you guys a lot of credit because, you know, the per people, there's some of you that have heard me before, so you're used to all this, and yeah, like, okay. And you know what makes sense. You guys know you've seen enough of the progression. We'll explain the science to you. We'll explain the history to you. We'll explain the spiritual connection, where they all fit. This is the most coherent body of teachings that exists on this planet, and I know that. I mean, I've looked at other stuff. This doesn't touch. I mean, what's in the Bible? What's in the Koran? What's in the, the metaphysical text? This stuff shows you where it all fits together, how it works together, and it has a happy God at the end of the trail, which is nice to know too, instead of a vengeful, wrathful one that wants to come in and throw everybody in the pit. You know? So I give you credit for, I could feel it, in the, it just in the group energy, that I would just kind of give you a roundup on what the more of the things we're going to be talking about. Instead of ever so carefully, well, I'll tell you about this, and I won't tell them about that until I get them to hear. Sometimes I have to work with a group that way. Because if you get people that are really attached to their dogma or really attached to this book or, or that, they can get really upset. I mean, I know some people got really upset when we were just recording the records off the CDD plates. Jesus didn't get crucified. That was one of the things that all sorts of people, they love the teachings, but oh, they couldn't deal with that. Why? You should be glad. You think you'd be happy that the person that, you know, what he stood for and what the, he ascended. He said, well, can't do anything more here, but we did what we could and we left the books behind. It's time to go. He went out through the Ark of the Covenant, which is one of the gates. But this story of crucifixion was created and contrived by the Anunnaki, almost like a tongue-in-cheek, very sick joke. Because what was crucified was the Christos D12 frequency in the human body. And we have a diagram that we showed, we, we, we got that one out in Kauai, that shows the axiotonal lines in the human body. And it shows where the blockages are that have been created by certain technologies the Anunnaki have been using. You have your crown of thorns, you have your nails in the palms, you have your nails in the feet, and you have the sword wound. I mean, it's almost like a sick joke, some of it. Yeah. So, if we can be, and, and you guys can, I can feel it can be mature enough to say, you know, all right, so, you know, we always knew there was a truth behind these books. <laughs> Didn't quite know it was that one, but <laughs> there's a technology that's going with this. We find symbols there. Symbols called, in Revelations you'll hear about, after all this mess happens with the seven seals, as if that wasn't bad enough, 
shows you how merciful this God is. Well, after the seven seals basically rip apart the planet because you get, um, I think on the fourth seal is when the big earthquake comes. It's the fourth or the fifth where the big earthquake com wake comes and no, and no mountain or island is left in its place, right? This is seal four or five. We're already on three. <laughs> so this is why we're really hoping to get the round tables going. But after all of that stuff, right? After the seven seals, how much can you do to a planet, all right? <laughs> because after that, you end up with the seven angels and the seven trumpets. Now we find, as we go through the technological translation of what angels and trumpets and doves and all these kind of things in Revelations are, these are referring to technologies. The trumpets are a very specific type of waveform, of, of remote broadcast waveform technology that works through the, the APIN systems, and it creates even more mess than the smaller systems that, they, that the Jehovian implants did. So what, there's this whole process of learning to read what is really being said in the book of Revelation. Once we understand that we are dealing with, we're not dealing with the God that's wrathful here. This, should, this is a relief, actually. Because if you think about it, if there is a God that because you guys were bad, I'm going to do this to you. I mean, that's like a parent that says, because you didn't clean your room, I'm going to skin you alive. You know what I mean? I'm going to break you know, your, your arm and two of your legs because you didn't put your clothes away. This, this is the mentality that's demonstrated in the way that, that that book is written. Wrathful gods are not mature gods. And honestly, there is a God that we're all a part of and all connected to. That is much, that those wrathful gods live within too. They're like baby godlets that haven't figured out how it works yet. But if we can realize the truth that's been hidden in Revelations, in the Bible stories, and there's truths that are hid hidden in other ones too. But the big ones were the big surprise they had in store for us during the stellar activation cycle. We already are getting the information out there on the fact that these Jehovian implants exist. And there are technologies of the body and mind and spirit. If you know how to run frequency with your body, which is what we're teaching, you can override the effects they will have on your personal body. And it's not always easy. We've been both processing <laughs> one of them. He's got the one that went in the leg, and I've been having the one that goes in the back of the left. And they create pain in the body when they go. So if you start to get strange effects, on the left side of your body, all right, like that feel uncomfortable. You make it strange effects on the right side, but not painful ones, because there's other things activating that are good on the right side of your body. They're called the inner halls of Amorea. These are conduits of energy that will allow your avatar, your D12 level avatar self, to come in faster. So you might get tingling and funny feelings on this side, but if you start to get pain on this side, in the head, or in the ear, in the jaw, down in the neck here, down in the back of the shoulder, down here, right at the buttocks, running down, kind of like the out, not the outside here, but this part of the leg, and down and through here. These are all the locations of, that are blocked by the Jehovian seals. And there's going to be processes that we're going to learn using, using Merkaba and using what are called the VECA codes that we just started to get information on in the last workshop in Sarasota. We're, before we leave on Sunday, we're going to be given, they're going to give me one more technique to use that we can all begin to use. <laughs> Thank God. <Right? laughs> we've, been, we've been walking around like we're 90 years old. <laughs> ow, ow. <laughs> you know, <laughs> really. You know, and, and, you know, we know Cathar healing. We, we you know, we know how to run D12 frequency. We can even run like the, the higher frequencies, and we just can't make these things move. So <laughs> there's something to these. So we'll have, there's gonna, they told me they're going to give me an exercise that we can begin to use. We couldn't use it before because it wasn't activated in the planetary grids. What we'll find as we explore the <laughs> as we explore the this information about the planetary templar, we'll find that everything that's on the outside, we also have one on the inside. So, if there's a four faces of man grid that will heal this problem in the planetary grids, that means there's one within the body systems as well. So we're going to be activating those systems within our own body to give us enough frequency support where we can clear the Jehovian implants. And we're going to do it on a planetary level. What, what's really interesting, is there any, there's, was there a lot of people that were down in the Florida one here tonight? Okay, in the Florida workshop? We had, oh yeah, we had utter chaos in that last workshop. We got hit with a psychotronic pulse that was on its way over to Axiotonal Line 7, to cruise up Axiotonal Line 7, to hold at Bermuda. This is the pulse that was used to amplify the sonics that were used to take out 
the Pentagon and the Trade Center. We got hit with that thing when it came through on September 3rd. And that was, I mean, literally, everybody was like, hey, you're going through emotional processing. We did. I mean, it was just like, what the heck hit us that night? We thought it was like, you know, that we got personally, psychotronically attacked, but it wasn't. We got this pulse that was coming through that had to do with what was going to happen, what was scheduled to happen on the 11th of uh, September. There was actually a set of pulses that were released beho beforehand, and they would build in the grids and get to a certain point by a certain time. So there's, there's a lot of things that we're going we're gonna to have to learn fast. I'm learning with you. All right? I'm not some big expert you know, that like floated down on a cloud. I'm learning this stuff with you. I have a lot of cellular memory of understanding it from other times, but I'm still, you know, a piece will be given to me, and, and I have to say, okay, what was that? Okay, I'm, oh yeah, all right, all right, I have a memory on that somewhere. So I'm right here with you. This, when I first got this, I, I go through this like emotional numb space, where when I get hit with a certain level of stun factor, I just don't react at all. <laughs> I'm just going to go, oh, <laughs> okay. And my mind understands, but it just doesn't, it, it makes me numb for a while. Some of this information has done that with me, where it just seems so big and so profound, and oh my God, we're in the middle of an invasion and hardly anybody knows it, and all this stuff. If you go into that numb space, that, that's okay. That's like the same numb space you go into when you see planes run into the World Trade Center, where your brain goes, no. There must be stage in that. No, that no, that couldn't really happen. Just like with this, you know, that must be science fiction. That couldn't really, could it? Yeah. This is as real as what we saw happen on the TV screen with those planes going into the Trade Center. And it's just as stunning, just as, oh my God, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, okay, you wouldn't want to ask a question. Any? Okay. Mm -hmm. from outer space no, from no, they came from in the Earth's crust. I'll sh I'm going to have a map that shows you where the pulses were sent from. Okay, I, have, I already have it, but it's like scribbled all over. I have to put it on where I can make a mile out of it. <laughs> well, all right, there's a system that's set up. We talked about those wormholes mm -hmm. that are off the coast of the, in the Atlantic Ocean, right? Mm -hmm. There's a whole network of something I didn't talk about yet here, but I have in other workshops. The crystal, um, the Niberian crystal temple networks, one of which is the thing they just found in Chihuahua, New Mexico. That's one of the smaller transmission stations. These are all connected. The pulse that we got hit with that night that went over to combine with another one to amplify, to become the pulses that took out the trade centers and the thing in D.C. was actually sent from the Chihuahua area. That one, the, the, there's an axiotonal line that comes over this way, or not an axiotonal, a, a ley line, they're the horizontal ones, and an axiotonal seven came up this way. So I'll show you the, the paths of projection that were used, you know, they're in that. Activated all planets? Hmm? They're activated from all planets? No, they're actually activated through frequencies that are sent from the, uh, they're called phantom pulses, because they come from the black hole matrix. And they're sub, they're the uh, subspace pulsing that are actually being amplified by certain mechanical bases that are physically, you know, subterranean bases that are on the planet. We have things like the heart network. This is all, all part of that. It's like kind of, kind of one of the, one of the titles in the, the book, like the chapter headings is, uh, um, it's not a chapter heading, but it said, you know, angels, angels play these harps and they play trumpets too. I mean, we've got a band going here. These are technologies, right? So I will explain more. Yeah, but the, the harp that they know that's up in Alaska is really the least powerful of all the stations. There's a whole bunch more of them that connect with ones that are on a place called Phantom Earth, which is a part of Earth's grids that got sucked down into the phantom in 5.5 uh, million years ago. And that's been a part that they, the founders races have been trying to get back out of that matrix. But at this point, they're going to pull Earth in if we don't sever the connection. Yeah, and that's what the Yanni have been here to do. How, what am I doing on time? I, I lose... Is it? Okay. Because I can just keep going and going, but... Okay. Yeah, and what I'm trying to track right now is what is the, n the next ones in line. I know what they're trying to do, and they want to do it when, when we're doing the Titicaca trip in December, end of December, going into January. There's going to be a whole bunch of stuff happening then. That's when um, the fourth seal, the fourth Jehovian seal is going. We're not doing it, but we're going to be trying to stabilize the grids with the round tables. 
they're going to try to unite the Phoenix and the Falcon wormholes. They haven't fully integrated them into one big one yet. And they're going to try to do this during that period. So there may be some wild stuff happening off the coast of Florida at that point in the water, depending on how it goes. We'll be warned, you know, if, there, if anything like that is, is going down. They kind of got us on sneak surprise this time because I said, did you guys know that they were going to do that to the, to, to the trade centers? And they said, actually, no. They would lost track of them for a couple of weeks because they've been using jamming frequencies. Then before, when the Anunnaki were helping the Guardian races, which I'll talk about tomorrow in the history, had to do with the Palladian Syrian agreements. They had been helping them. They would allow them to use the networks, the, in the control grid networks, that the Anunnaki had control of since Atlantis. Well, as soon as the Anunnaki joined the United Resistance, they shut all of them down. The Guardians couldn't access them. So it literally blocked it out, where they were able to track things before. They had to find new ways to get in, and they didn't even know. They knew they were up to something. They were able to track the pulse that was coming, but they didn't know where it was headed. And they didn't realize they were setting the, the literally setting the trigger event of the One World Order advancement in motion. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into the bodies. At this, I'm already releasing so much that if, if I'm still in a body <laughs> over the next couple of years, I'll know I'm really important because they'll probably want to really kill me. But I'm not going to go into that. That's a very sensitive subject, and I know there's some things on that that um, would probably hit no it's not going to serve a, a need to understand it's not going to help anybody to understand certain things but it has to do actually with um i could simply refer you to an article in nexus magazine do you remember what month that was um, no, not exactly. okay in the last it was the last couple of months one right well the, the in, in one of the recent book, Nexus magazines, we just got like three of them sent because they messed up our subscription, so we got them all sent at once, and I don't remember what one it is. There is a story about a woman who survived uh, Hurricane Andrew. All right? And there was, she had talked about some things that had to do with how many people actually were there and how many people were actually accounted for. What is, I was simply to say, anybody that's curious about you know the bodies and how come there's only this many and that kind of thing I would suggest reading that article and you can probably find a reference to it it had to do with Hurricane Andrew right right it's that lady's article though because she said it and if she wants to get in that space with the Illuminati she can but right now it wouldn't serve for me to even like to put it on film or even to, to worry about that because it's a very, very sensitive issue. And I have a private conversation with you tonight because I was there at the Trade Center a couple of days before. Um, uh, tonight, and yeah, because what I have to do tonight tomorrow is whatever we're doing tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like literally, I just got this new material done, sent it out to the publisher today, have to go through that manuscript and pull you know, the most pertinent pieces to try to get it into a chart pack for you guys for tomorrow. And I'll probably do the same tomorrow night for Sundays. You know, it's one of those immediate things, madam. Yeah, yeah, and the maps. I have to do. I will do my best to get to a point where we can. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, I threw a lot at you guys tonight. I didn't gently take you through. Yeah. Is there a problem now with that? Mean that we have to somehow uh, fix or heal or something that have to do with frequency At this point, they're activated, and it would take. It would take a waste a lot of our energy to try to go after those smaller things because there's whole networks of them that are activating now. What we can do, the most important thing we can do, is to begin the process of activating those four faces of man grids because they will have the power to literally, they will start overriding all of the others and they will close those wormholes. Because what's really happening is all of those APIN points that are all over the planet, when they're linked into the wormhole, they create another small wormhole. So they're literally creating wormholes, little black holes, all through the planetary grids. And that will just literally take the place down in as it progresses. So if we get that grid activated, and I'll show you like the drawing of it on the map where it fits and where it's like, you know, epicenter is and how we're going to you know, how we can use round tables to begin activating these things. These are this this is the solution. This is how you build enough frequency rather than going after like one little part of it where you can waste a lot of energy trying to do something, then they'll just redo it 
as soon as you, you know, as soon as you stop putting energy into it, they'll flip it over the wrong way. If you get the big grid activated, that will take care of and clear out all of the distortion grids. That's where you can best apply your energy. And that's what they're, you know, that was, that was recent. They just told us, in fact, they just told me about the four faces of man grid and the guardians of the 12 pillars in the last, like, four days, three, four days. So, um, oh, God, <laughs> i got hands all over. Okay, she has a first. A couple years ago, I heard that supposedly there's an Atlantean crystal in South Mountain, right, right outside of Allentown here, and okay. another one not too far north of here in the Poconos. Mm -hmm. Is that part of one of the grids? Yeah. The yeah. They're, they're all, the whole area up and through here is laced with them, and this isn't the only area. They have been running frequency fence, small ones, here in northeastern Pennsylvania for a very long time. I was, um, I was born in, in Carbondale, Pennsylvania, which is in northeastern Pennsylvania, but not too far from here. And this whole area in Pennsylvania also crosses over into Jersey, like Newark and, and that part of New Jersey, going up into New York and into Montauk and through Philadelphia. It's all been wired through these crystal implants, all right, these Atlantean crystals. Just because it's Atlantean, don't be seduced by that word, oh, wow, this must be good, because most of them aren't. Some of them are, if they had been put in earlier by the founders' races that were here as communication and broadcasting stations. But most of them have been used because they've been, t even the founders' ones have been taken over in the Atlantean period by the negative groups. What has been going on in Pennsylvania has been literally um, a localized frequency fence. It affects Pennsylvania. It extends somewhat into like the New York State and New Jersey and into like, um, I think it goes into Connecticut a little bit and Vermont area. So it's like it's been a test for what they've been trying to do, what they're planning to do on the global level. And if you work with the D12 frequencies, you progressively become immune to it. What it does though is it literally works with the hormonal systems to repress the, the brainwave patterns. So literally, I, I can feel it now when I come back in to Pennsylvania compared to um, being in Florida. It's like, you get tired. Yeah. Yeah, it keeps the mind stuck right here. It's, and I've watched this. I watched my family because they didn't move, and I did. And they're like, you know, 75. They could, they could be 75 years back in time, and they get along just as well there because they're not open to any new ideas. It's like really, really uh, nervous about anything new, and it's a, it's a fear pattern, and it's been a test area. And this has also been a, a very intense UFO area. Uh, two blocks away from the house I lived in, in Carbondale, Pennsylvania, was where the Carbondale UFO incident took place, where something crashed in the silt pond. And they had divers up and all sorts of things, and uh, this big cover-up, and then supposedly it was a lantern somebody threw in. Yeah, right? <laughs> a lantern. That's why it glowed for like nine hours, and they had like video film of it, eight millimeter film of it, that happened to disappear when the police got a hold of it. I mean, <laughs> there was a whole stink. This place has been... You know, like Pennsylvania has been one of those quiet little control experiments, and I'm I'm amazed that I survived it. Like once you get out of it, and you realize what's been going on here, that's when you f you tell the difference because you can't tell the difference when you're in it. But once you get out of it for a while, work with frequencies, and even even if you're in it, work with frequencies, work with D12 frequency. You can begin to stop that from affecting you, and you can stay here and be happy here, but not be affected by those kind of frequencies that will dull your brainwave patterns and, you know, like mess up your hormones and those kind of things, because that's what it does. You know, those frequency fences are meant to do lots of things, and they affect the function of the body. They can literally target them. They can make people have heart attacks. They've done this with people on the UFO circuit who knew too much, where just before a major conference, and they were going to release some information, just so happened the poor guy dropped dead of a heart attack. You know, another one got cancer, like really rapid one that happened to like get her in three and a half weeks before she was due to release a bunch of information at a UFO conference. Hmm? Was that Carla? I forget who it was. I remember reading the article a while ago. It was quite a while ago because I don't really follow that stuff. I'm not really worried about it. You know, I figure, well, you know, I wouldn't get that lucky to get off planet that fast. <laughs> so, um, okay. If the pulse was already being sent to Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Why didn't it do what it was supposed to do? It didn't get sent. Plane. That's the thing. It didn't get sent. When I, when I get the maps, I'll show you how this worked. There was what they call uh, ULF, ultra-low frequency. It's actual, actually micro-ultra-low frequency. It's below the usual low frequency wave spectra. They're slow pulses. They were released starting August 15th. It took them until September 3rd, the one to hit in Sarasota. Then there was the other one coming up from Lake Titicaca 
because Lake Titicaca, Peru, is right on uh, Axiotona Line 7. Okay? Those two intercepted and then traveled up and went into Axiotona Line 3, Bermuda. They linked it into there. They have bases at Bermuda, photosonic transmitting bases, that f they've had them there from, since the 30s. And these are on this side of the planet. They're not just in phantom. They're, they're here. And they held that pulse as the amplifier there. Then they would use their trumpets, this trumpet technology that I'll try to describe more of. It's written well in the book because it came down exactly off the place of you know what this technology is. It's a waveform technology that kind of creates a trumpet-shaped wave that destroys things at the other end of it. But anyway, um, they held them at Bermuda. So you had somewhere between the 3rd and the 7th of September these two pulses coming together, being held at the Bermuda holding station, and then the trumpet technologies that work through Bermuda, blasting them one at a time. So they waited till the planes hit before they... Yeah, they had it synchronized. Yeah. yeah. Like and those guys were supposed to hit the... Pla in, in they, didn't, they didn't... They couldn't blow that trumpet. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, so... And they also said that there was a test of this that had been done before and set up a similar way, almost like a test run. Guess who? Poor Timothy, uh, he kind of got the rap for something that was much bigger than him. Oklahoma City is on another one of the particular ley lines that run through a main grid line. So it was a <laughs> test run to see if you could get away with something like that. That was the Beca second explosion. Hmm? That was the second. There was two okay. seismic events. Was there? Because I haven't studied that yet. Yeah, there, there was, they had, the University of Oklahoma had two seismic events. One, his, his truck going off, okay. but then there was the other one that did the major damage. Okay, right. That's interesting. They, I didn't realize they, they'd they recorded was, that. Yeah, they thought it was explosives tied to columns. That was a second event or, you know, right. uh, drug enforcement agents having bombs in, in uh -huh. the building or something, but that's probably right. why. Um, yeah, that, that, that's, I didn't even know that they had detected that there were two different. I wonder if anything like that has been detected with either of these. It would be really interesting. To, I, I don't know if they, if like, because I don't really follow too much of the media stuff. I get my information from the Iani and, you know, and from the Guardian, so I don't really research I mean, on I that get, level. I didn't get this from the media. I got it from, like, a, a little guy in Columbus, the Transdimensional Times, okay. who, who had people bringing it up, and some of the people that wouldn't accept the Timothy McVeigh right. uh, explanation, right. you know, bringing this up, but they're, they're ostracized, or they're not being considered. Yeah. Was, um, yeah. Anybody that tends to tell the truth in the mainstream kind of finds yeah, themselves right. on the periphery. There was a yes. phenomenon that I noticed when I was living in England, and early morning news would often have a... would often... early morning news in the, U, in the UK would often contain a piece of controversial information, if you're being attentive. Usually appear at the six, six o'clock bulletin. And it's significant that those news releases that were controversial never appeared during the day subsequently or in the news press, okay, in the papers. I find one particular thing about the coverage in New York City very interesting. In the very earliest coverage, in the first half an hour, there was a remark that the engineer who designed those twin towers said it would withstand the impact of a 747 jet, and it was never ever revisited, and no one ever asked a question about it afterwards. Oh, so, so it was bigger. <laughs> yeah. About okay. When I came here yesterday, I got really nauseous and I didn't know why. Uh -huh. Lila and Jay were asking in, in the background asking what it was, and I really didn't know. But last night, I saw this huge grid around me that I didn't really understand what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. but when you ex when you talked about it, I realized what I was looking at. I was looking at a, a grid of this area, mm -hmm. and they were broken into squares. And when they would open up. It, it looked like a, a, a hole or a, a flat thing that held, held it, and above it was a line. It was like a pin. Mm -hmm. So when it would activate, the I don't know all the mechanics. I just know what I was looking yeah. at. It would open up, and then it would disappear, and there would be another one over here that opened up. Mm -hmm. But the lines would stay there. So, so yeah. you were seeing it with the inner vision, right? Yeah, well, yeah. yeah the D4 up, vision. All this stuff that I was Sometimes you'll see literal runways coming in that look like like they're um, like plane runways mapped out in light that are actually 
there, there are four ships actually coming in. So there are these things he was talking about grid lines that you know he was able he's able to see with you know with a higher dimensional perception that he could see them in this area and he, they were making him feel sick when he first came here. Yeah, these are these are things that we're not seeing because our fourth DNA strand has been blocked. All right, the natural we would naturally be able to see the fourth dimensional frequencies and higher. We'd be able to see 12 dimensions of frequency if we had our 12 strands plugged in. As we work with the techniques, this is what's, one of the things about what we teach. We don't teach be afraid. You don't have to be if you know what to do. Now, what's the biggest thing of, of, of fear is to be in total denial. Where all these people, oh, we're not going to think about that because that's negative and that's scary stuff. I'm not going to lower myself spiritually to scary stuff. They don't want to deal with it because they're terrified of it. Now, we don't teach you have to be afraid. We say, hmm, well, here's some problems. Here's what we need to do to fix the problems. You have the ability to do it. You have the ability to help if you want to. And if you don't want to help us, nobody's going to, you know, like, you know, you know, drop an APN on your head or anything. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's for people who care, whatever level you care on. If for nothing else from what you can get from these workshops is at least learn enough Merkaba mechanics of how to use your own embodied Merkabas to get your natural Merkaba spinning the right way so you'll have protection from these psychotronic fields that are coming through and so you'll be able to clear those Jehovian implants that manifest inside the body literally as blockages of energy because of the body's DNA template connection to the planetary grids. If you're not interested in planetary healing, nobody's going to you know, hate you for it. Nobody's going to try to make you feel guilty. Oh, you should be doing this. These workshops are meant to be empowering, not disempowering. That's why I don't even want to tell you scary stuff. Scary stuff can do two things. It can make people go, oh, well, that's too much. That's too much for me. Or it can say, oh, that wasn't nice. Let's do something to fix this. And that's what the attitude that I'm trying to help people find with this. Because one way or the other, we're going to find ourselves in confrontation with some events that we'd all rather not see. You know, right now, we're bombing a country with, that's mostly orphans. And this is going to lead to something else. And I know there's several countries that are on the hit list because they have prime real estate when it comes to Stargates. So we're going to be watching this manifest in front of our faces in the political arena. It appears to be for this reason, but it's really the reason back here that nobody's showing you that's going on. If we know this and we realize that you can get angry and hate if you let yourself get trapped in things like that. And that is a trap because what you, what you hurt most when you get angry and allow it to be there, and if you hate something, you're hurting you more than the thing that you're hating. If we can realize a level of compassion where we've been jerked around as humans, Illuminati races have been jerked around too. Now they've done stupid things that have not been fair to us, but that's because they're getting jerked around too. So if we could at least realize that, you know, wacky groups like Bin Laden's that are going to take what used to be once upon a time a holy book and use it as an excuse to murder people, um, realize the sickness that it takes to do that. So instead of going into the hate, because there's a lot of... Hmm? But he did. He's a sleeper. His group is a sleeper. He didn't do the, the sonic pulse, but he was the sleeper cover group that was triggered into awakening to go do their cover act. So you'll see a lot of this. He wasn't innocent. He wasn't some poor guy that's getting taken the fall for this. Neither was Timothy McVeigh. All right. These people did participate in these events, but they didn't participate with them the way that we think they did. They were meant to get our, our attentions over here on this part of the event where we didn't see the hidden part. All right. So I'm not like I'm not exonifying Ben Laden. You know, the Taliban people. I mean, you know, it's funny. You, you should try this sometime when they have the Taliban leaders on, like how they do the little films where they used to talk to us. Just try to see what it looks like lives in there. It's really interesting. It's really enlightening when we were talking about before where just because something has a human body, it doesn't always have a human soul. It's really interesting what, what you see when you look behind the face of the people that were on TV saying that they were Taliban. I almost got the image of those little, um, there's one movie, and I can never remember the name of it. What was that one? Mary tried to tell you about the skeletons. Like armies. Jason and the yeah, like Jason and the Argonauts, there was the, they, they had the warrior skeletons that had swords and they were like living dead skeletons that came out. I don't know why, but I keep getting this image of these guys inside of them, like whole bands of them coming on horses like the little skeleton riders did. Literally, you know, so I don't have anything against them if they wanted to join the Emerald Covenant and be nice and stop killing people and stop abusing women and doing all the things they're doing, that would be fine with me. 
because you don't we, we don't teach hate we teach you to see where there are differences between souls between people but we all came from the same source so if some of us got really messed up along the way and became something that now lives in the black hole system that doesn't mean it's hateable but it also doesn't mean you love it so much you let it flatten you and we're at the position right now where that's what's going to happen so we'll go through tomorrow I will have more of I'm gonna I want to see what will be the best way because there's several elements I want to cover I want to cover information that will help you just on a personal level to be able to go home and say oh well I have this just to work with me anyway right where you don't have to worry about the big heavy stuff techniques that will help you begin to get more of your avatar self in body and to begin to build your protection field in your body because right now they're throwing psychotronics around all over the place psychotronics are the sonic pulses and what they do is they, they interact with the human DNA template they create chemical changes in the body and they create changes in the brainwave patterns they can make it so you can't access your higher dimensional consciousness so as your DNA is starting to activate naturally because the planetary grids are you'd naturally start to have expanding awareness they're trying to cap this if you work with the basic personal techniques it will give you progressive protection it will also help to build your immune system which if we're living in America we're probably going to need a nice strong one before the next year or so because I was told in 1998 I think no it was in, no end of 1999 October 1999 that it might get this bad and they weren't worried about it. Well, I wasn't supposed to teach about it then because it was still an if that hopefully would be avoided. But that if it got into the final the trigger events that were setting in motion the One World Order agenda, that the water systems were actually one of the targets. And you know, they warned me about that then. If we take, you know, take the time now to work with our Merkaba, you don't need. I mean, it, I, w would I go out and get like water cleaning tablets if I was worried about it? Yep, I do that too. Praise God, tie up your camel, do the spiritual stuff, and do the stuff on the outside. <laughs> you know, but work with. If you work with your Merkaba, your DNA, integrating your spiritual self, which is building frequency in your body, you'll progressively be able to not be affected by the type of things that might pop up in our environment that we really don't want there, and. It's like, we can go home and we can see if like anybody else died of anthrax or, or if anything else blew up yet. There, there's one thing I would like people to be able to leave this whole workshop with, is an understanding of the big picture. And it's going to be a good one. This is data that nobody else has got yet. They just released this information. And the Guardians pulled their information from literally the primal sound fields. This is, they, they have the highest access to the founders' races. They have all of the records. They haven't been able to communicate with most people here because most people were hijacked. What I would like you to be able to do is leave with a sense of humor about the whole thing. <laughs> Scary thought, isn't it? There is a point. There is a point of overwhelm. There's a point of overwhelm where it becomes a funny thing because a part of you goes up here into your avatar space and you're like, jeez, look at this. Still going on. God, this was going on for, like, you know, started 200,000 years ago. And, two, you know, 22,326 BC, it got wiped out. Look at this mess. It's still going on. There, there is a level where you can look what would be terrifying in the face and find enough feeling of the presence of your own higher self and your own whole self to know you're going to be okay. And you're going to be able to make a difference. So the fear, fight or flight, starts to do something else. You know, that fight or flight instinct, ah, I want to run away from it, or I'm going to fight with it and kill it. You know, that's, <laughs> that's a program that's been put in our DNA that's not natural to humans, but it triggers chemically when we have fear responses. And they're trying to do this to our bodies right now with the programming that we're getting. If we can get to the point we just kind of sit there with that same awe, awe like, it, it's, it's a combination between awe, a strange sense of humor that goes with it, and be like, what do they call it? Dark humor, I think, where you're just like, oh my God. <laughs> you know? But if you can find a part of yourself that doesn't get, oh my God, we got to fix it. This is really bad. Yes, it is. I'm not going to lie to you. It is not a good situation in the planetary grids right now. It is not hopeless. We can do roundtables. We can do our personal work. It will protect us. And if we care enough, we can try to work with the roundtables as groups to help the planet. We may or may not get enough D12 frequency in the grids by the end of 2002. If not, the dimensional blend experiment will occur in 2003, which is linking of those two wormholes. 
then we find out what evacuation plans look like. Okay? And they will be portal evacuation, not ships coming down and picking up friends. It's not going to work that way. They would be secret. They would be covert. They would only be people whose DNA could pass through the portals that could even go. So we don't need to worry about that now. But it's really helpful if you can, un if, if you can appreciate what I'm trying to say about... You know how you can look adversity in the face and not let it get you? And say, hmm, yeah, I could really get freaked out about that, but I'm not going to. Trust that you have a part of you. Okay? You're Christo self. And if you're not Christian, that's okay. You can call it your Maharata self. Because it means the same thing. You can call it whatever you want. It's D12. It's your pre-matter template. It's the part of you that connects to the even higher parts of you that are connected directly to source. You're not alone here. You have what it takes. If, you never, if, if something horrible happened tonight and we never got to finish this workshop, you know enough right now to go and to know you have automatic guidance system with you. Okay? You would be able to trust and that you would be moved where you needed to be to get you in the best place where you need it to be. You have to understand it for it to work. That's right. It, it helps, it though. Work. It, it works it, better it if you understand it. It's much better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, here's the stand back of this. You know what the fundamental frequency for that sonic pulse is? The is fundamental it? frequency yeah. for that? Like 50 kilohertz? Or they didn't give me that, but I could try to ask and see if it's on that particular is it, scale. Is it above audible frequency but below radio? Uh, I'll ask. Oh, they didn't give me a specific, but I'll ask. What I've been trying to get now, there's a translation chart that goes with the 15-dimensional spectrum that we've been using. All right, now, the 15-dimensional spectrum is a much larger frequency spectra than what contemporary science is using right now. All right, what I've been wanting to get off the, the what are called the CDD plates, there is a translation chart that shows the frequencies that are identified here by science are like maybe about this big. They span dimension 1, 2, and 3 and a little bit into 4. All right, so you still have this huge amount of frequency range up here. They don't even measure them in the same words <laughs> that they use here. So I will try to see if there is an identifiable also pulse. Travel slow. Yeah. Right. Right. I think we're on different, I, I, what I'm just getting, but I'll ask to be sure, because there may be a direct answer that in the terms you're looking for, it would actually be in that I would learn something on it. Um, I'm getting the feeling it's below what is considered the lowest right now. And speed of pulse has to do with several things. A, what it's moving through. B, angle of projection and force of original project, projection. How much thrust was behind it what angle it was projected at, whether it was projected to do this or to do this, will all change. It'll actually, I'm actually getting that it's a cycling frequency on it, where they're actually, create, they create a wave form. All right, I'll get more on that if you want. But that, that stuff that I, like a level of detail, that I haven't had time to even get into, but I will because he asked. I'll see what they say. <laughs> you know? I may have to go read a book on what the regular frequency spectra is here because I've been taught by the guardians. You know, what I teach you is what you know, was taught on the 15-dimensional physics and those kind of things. That's one of the things I'm looking for, though, is the, the plug-in chart that shows where, you know, what we call a gamma ray. Where does that fit in here? And I know it's there. I just haven't had the time you know, to do it because we've been doing roundtables. Hmm? There should be up the top of our Okay. Gamma. The gamma rays would be on the top of our charts. Yeah, and I'm... All right, I'll see if I can do that. There's been something that I wanted to know. Okay, where does our light sound spectra that we know plug into this bigger one? Okay, so I'll see if I can find that. It's a good prompt. Okay, yes? Along the same lines, I'm working with some healers, and I'm finding that there is a, a, a continual... I know it's an orange county, very southern part of New York, so okay. part of this bombardment, um, between Okay. There, there is something to it, and I think the reason I haven't looked for answers to small things is because there's a big problem with, there's certain things that are registered as the natural pulse of the earth core right now that are considered normal that aren't. So it's like we're looking, it's just like the human DNA right now. What we're looking at and calling normal 
isn't the normal imprint, but we're saying this is what human DNA looks like. Right now, there's a frequency specter that's happening. There's certain pulses that are identified as natural pulses, like the Earth's core pulse, and that goes on hertz and those kind of things. I forget what it is, seven point something hertz? Yeah. But these are all twisted and distorted from their natural. So I haven't really looked because I'm, I, I get the feeling that over here there's going to be a piece of information that shows, that almost not nullifies this, but shows where it was all twisted. So I haven't even been given the plugins, but I'll see if I see what I can find on it because I have been curious about those things. Okay, if we were going to say this in Hertz, what, what would it be? If we we're going to look at the regular, you know, light spectra, sound spectra, where do we fit? So I'll, I'll see what I can get on, on the, that information. Um, hmm, okay. Anyway. <laughs> are they sending pulses through? Um, are they sending it through um, uh, just a wave, or does it go through the, the rocks, the minerals, the crystals? It depends what it is, what type of pulse, what dimensional frequency it's composed of. So if we change and we, we direct the Merkaba in the crystals and in the mineral forms, mm -hmm. um, in the radionics, I, I keep thinking of the radioactivity in some of these minerals and mm -hmm. the rocks, can we reverse that for whatever their, for whatever the frequencies are that they're putting out to... Can we reverse it in the rock and in the crystal, even that makes mm -hmm. up the, the planetary base? Yeah. Yeah. The pulsation rate, I mean, we can you may probably like think it in our mind to direct it that way. Couldn't we? If we... Um, I don't know if we can yeah, that's part of what we're doing is recoding those those Nibiruan um, crystal temple networks because these are massive frequency holding networks. So if you go over and you try to, say, clear this area of crystal or of stone, right, by running a, a round table there or something, if there's more energy running through that Nibiruan temple on a reverse, it'll still reverse before your round table even takes. So what we're doing is being guided to the sites that are the control sites that control huge amounts of the grids, and that's where you can make the biggest difference. You can temporarily, just like you can temporarily fix something in somebody's body, but if you don't go to the core that's holding it in there, the core will come back up with its own pattern, and if it's reversed, it'll reverse it again. But you, you can get in, like, you can temporarily change by using the D12 frequency and, and your Merkaba, the correct Merkaba spin. You can change the coating in water, in a crystal, I mean, I suggest running the D12 frequency through a glass of water before you drink it because it actually puts the right Merkaba spin back on the water molecules and makes the water more healthy for your body. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of things you can do with that. But right now, what, what we have to do, because it's such a big problem and because there's so little time to solve it in, the information that I'm being given is specifically to get to the places that are holding the most power and get those places fixed and also getting our bodies strong enough to where this stuff running through the grids isn't going to mess us up. Because it's going to, you're going to start finding people out there are going to be having a problem. And there's going to be like increases in rates of disease rates, and they're not going to know why. And there's going to be some interesting, um, let's say, visitors from the microorganism kingdoms that are going to cause some problems too. But the, the key is bringing it back home. We just kind of like went out here into this massive picture. And there's detail all over the place in this picture. But what's most important is not getting ourselves lost in the picture, because you can. You can go, oh my god, we're in the middle of an alien invasion. We really are. And, uh-oh. <laughs> they didn't teach me what to do about that in, like, you know, in military class or in, in, you know, in my school classes. Nobody, is there a book out there? What do I do about this? You can go to the bookstore or the New Age section, and they'll tell you how to get abducted by Anunnaki or by, <laughs> by Zeta. There's a place in each of us that holds, huge amount, holds a huge amount of knowledge. All right, there's a place of each of, uh, in each of us that knows about the 15-dimensional time matrix, for instance. Like, you know who would be even better at answering your question? You know, your question that you'd asked about the frequency spectra? Because you're familiar with, with the, this side, right? The science side here. The 15-dimensional spectra that we teach is not that hard. You could figure it out. But I'll do it because you asked me. I'll find it. But, yeah. Um, I just point into to Cathara, the Cathara manual. It teaches you some things about the structure of templates, the structure of the cosmic template. It teaches you about flash line sequences and scalar waves that turn on and off in units called particle, particle, and particum. Those things, <laughs> I think that if you took 
with the knowledge of science that you have here and begin to play with that with the attitude okay let's say this is the way it is how does what I know plug into this I think you'd be able to answer lots of questions probably more than I could because you have more of a science background here I was an artist <laughs> okay this is going to be a copy of these several sheets that are who are the fallen angelic intruder races and Illuminati so we start to understand who when we're talking about Illuminati talking about these guys running pulses through the grids who are we talking about basically so you'll have that list so you can refer back to it because it's confusing because there's a lot of different groups so you have that there's also another one that I got finished that was longer I think it's like seven pages long that we're, we're gonna we're in the process of getting it copied so you get a copy of that too that one is crucial and that's the one that I didn't want to come in without it lists from 1916 up to the present time including the Trade Center Pentagon um, terrorist attack what the events were that have led up to this point and I thought those those two things who are we dealing with and what has led us up to this point in recent history were the most important things that if we're going to understand and really really start to grasp that oh my god this is what's been going on like literally as we were little kids growing up you know through you know, I mean I was you know this started before I was born this started in the 1930s here it actually started in 1916 so we're gonna go through this afternoon some of that recent history because I would like us to be able to get to the point where we understand what just took place with the World Trade Center and the Pentagon and more importantly what their next plan of action is because there's something that they have in mind to do that I talked a little bit about yesterday which is combining and opening together those two wormholes the Falcon wormhole and the Phoenix wormhole that are off the coast of Florida and South Carolina now they're planning to in um, January the first week of January of 2002 there are certain natural seals are releasing it's going to create a release of Jehovian seal 4 the pale horse and in the revelation story it's the pale horse and the writer's name upon him was death and hell followed close behind all right this yeah this the events that are going to be happening between the end of December of this year and beginning of January of next year are absolutely crucial they're going to mean the difference between whether the guardian races are working agenda a which is fix things or B get out before the sky falls down all right this is going to be this period of time is going to it is crucial to whether or not things revelations is going to be able to be prevented from unfolding here because it's during that period of time that they're going to try to link the two wormholes if using sonic pulses now if they do this this is going to decimate the east coast seaboard all the way up and down because um, longitude line 70 west runs right down the eastern like right off the eastern seaboard coast that is axiotonal line 7 that's where all the seals are and that's where the two wormholes are so it's right down by the coast of Florida and South Carolina that the double wormhole will become one big one now yeah okay it's a little hard to see on these maps what I'm gonna have for tomorrow is you'll have it won't be detailed maps like this with all the places all the world all over the world named on them but you'll see where the seals are where the wormholes are and where the main um, axiotonal lines are that are, are that are of an issue in what we're doing if they're successful in this this world is <laughs> going to face something that it hasn't faced in since 22,326 BC when a similar set of events took place but this time it will be worse because there were not wormholes opened during that period of time a pole shift happened but they were the guardian races were able to prevent the stellar activation cycle from fully commencing so it didn't get into a situation that would be as bad as this time this is why the information that I've got on this stuff and the really detailed maps and everything just came through literally in the last week and it was like about 150 page transmission of data small print so this is why it was taking me some time to analyze this data really fast try to pull the major important points for you so when you go home even if you don't have one of the big Templar manuals I mean I suggest getting getting one for anybody that wants to work with this stuff we give them the free we could afford it but we can't afford to give them to everybody they tell you all sorts of stuff I mean it touches the spiritual stuff but also tells you exactly like the detailed history the history that we're taking it from there in this workshop and it also tells you how to do round tables and it tells you all you need to know to become part of the uh, Masters Templar Stewardship Initiative and that's what this program is we are the what we're teaching is the opportunity 
to participate in a very effective way that could literally change the events in the next three to ten year period. And if they're not changed, it's not a whole shift happened, but they were, the Guardian races were able to prevent the stellar activation cycle from fully commencing, so it didn't get into a situation that would be as bad as this time. This is why the information that I've got on this stuff and the really detailed maps and everything just came through literally in the last week. And it was like about 150 page transmission of data, small print. So this is why it was taking me some time to analyze this data really fast, try to pull the major important points for you. So when you go home, even if you don't have one of the big Templar manuals, I mean, I suggest getting, getting one for anybody that wants to work with this stuff. We give them to you free, we can afford it, but we can't afford to give them to everybody. They tell you all sorts of stuff. I mean, it touches the spiritual stuff, but also tells you exactly like the detailed history, the history that we're taking it from there in this workshop. And it also tells you how to do round tables, and it tells you all you need to know to become part of the uh, Master's Templar Stewardship Initiative, and that's what this program is. We are the, what we're teaching is the opportunity to participate in a very effective way that could literally change the events in the next three to ten year period. And if they're not changed, it's not going to be a pretty picture here. Things were going better five years ago when there were certain agreements being made with the Anunnaki races where they would cooperate. But ever since September 12th of 2000, when all of the competing fallen angelic races decided they were going to get together, combined their technologies, open the two wormholes together in order to defeat the guardian races, in order to get this place, that's when we got in trouble. And at this point, we can make a difference. We don't have to be terrified of it. But to underestimate the seriousness of the conditions will lead to kind of a, another set of shocking events that would very quickly unfold. That's what's interesting about this. What is taking place would happen so fast once it was set in motion, just like we watched, you know, two, two buildings go down because planes hit them, and all of a sudden, we're bombing Afghanistan and going after Iraq now. I mean, within a month's time. The whole political landscape of the planet changed with one event. This is how fast, that was a shock, that was shock therapy for me. Because they told me it could go this way, and if certain things go this way, you know, the, the Illuminati will advance. You're like, well, okay, make a mental note, you know. And then all of a sudden, bang, phew, and it happened. There's other plans that go with this, such as martial law and evoking FEMA and the, World, and the War Powers Act in the United States. We got a taste of what that might mean when the trade centers went down because they literally sealed all the entrances and exit, exits to New York City. Nobody could get in or out. The planes were all grounded. Nobody could fly. The buses stopped and the railways stopped. All of a sudden, Americans who are used to being able to go anywhere they want whenever they want found themselves quarantined in their own neighborhoods. That could happen like that. And it's part of the plan, but not quite yet. They're getting closer. They need a few more staged terrorist attacks and a couple natural disasters thrown in before they can get away with that without having rebellion on their hands. What we're being set up for right now, politically, is a situation where we get so scared of the big bad world out there that when our president says he has to enact the, world, the War Powers Act and has to say for our protection, all of this martial law has to come down because we're not safe without it, we'll go, okay, that's good. We'll let it happen. There'll be a few little rebel groups that say, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, like the Patriots and those guys, wait a minute, <laughs> you know, this is unconstitutional. So what? They've been doing unconstitutional stuff since the 1920s, you know? <laughs> Why should they care now if we care? All right. <coughs> Sorry. So <clears throat> what I'd like to do is in this, like today, I want to cover the, the real issues, how we got here, who it is that's running these agendas, what their plan is, their immediate plan. Now, if we had them off at the pass, which we're going to attempt to do, that's why we're all going, like the whole bunch of us are going to Peru, um, the end of December going into January, and we're going in direct combat, not in the whole Peru trip, but there's one part of this trip where we're going to an island. What is the name of the island, Marianne? Where are you? Amitani. Amitani. I keep wanting to say Amente. <laughs> and I think there must be a connection. I didn't ask, but that island is where combat is going to take place. I don't even know what it's going to look like. It's going to be psychic combat. I know that. It's going to be psychotronic combat. I know that, too. So going, going to Peru is safe. We're going to get round tables done, and Machu Picchu is under Guardian control. There's some other bases there, but the Guardians have the main grids. So it's a very, very special place. Picchu is a very special place, and it's very safe, and we're very safe while we're there. We can get a lot of work done. To, and what we're going to try to do at Machu Picchu is to counterbalance and recode 
the um, the natural seals as they're releasing because I told you that we're going to have our number our seal number eight is going to release and it's going to release Jehovian seal four so it's from P2 that we're going to set the grids that will begin the harmonization process of these frequencies as they go but when we get to Titicaca after we go to P2 that's when we're going to be working on continuing clearing these frequencies and this is when they're going to try to once we have the grids open try to use the grids we've opened to um, run their pulses through in order to put those two wormholes together. And this is going to be the deciding game. It's going to take place on that island. And the deciding game is going to be if they manage to get that pulse through, if our group isn't strong enough to run enough D12 and higher frequency, which will be taught progressively before then how to amplify the roundtables that we're running. If we're not able to block that and recode their pulses as they come through, because see, if their pulses, we have a strong D12 and higher field, and their pulses come through, hits that, hits our field, and it'll harmonize their pulses, so they won't cause any harm. But if our D12 field isn't strong enough, it will start to erode our D12 field, and at that point, their pulse will get through. And at that point, we have about three months' time, because it takes anywhere from three to 12 months before when a seal releases. Now, this is not just seals releasing. This is seals releasing and having them amplified and having, uh, and having sonic pulses thrown through them to amplify them very, very strongly, because they need to, if you look at, if you can picture the two wormholes, which are over here, okay, the two wormholes are over there. Now, they have to be linked to become one big one. So what they need to do is hit the spot in between them with a very intense pulse that will literally rip a hole in what you could call the fabric of time, which is a frequency wall between here and the phantom. If they do that, it's all over. We can't stop it. The guardians can't stop it. Nobody can stop it. So at that point, it wouldn't happen immediately. We're not just going to and like, you know, right then get sucked into a wormhole. It won't go like that. It's going to be a long, drawn-out process between now and 2008 that would unfold if they're successful. It would involve progressively escalating earth changes, first localized that would get stronger and stronger and stronger. It would involve progressive acceleration of the World War III drama to get rid of populations. And eventually, it would involve Space Brothers coming in to say, oh, you guys are really messing up your planet. We're going to show you how to run it now. And they would get their physical presence on planet. And from there, they would use us to set up a couple little things that they still need built which are literal plants, like you know, buildings with particular types of frequency generation machines in them. So they could use those machines with the HARP network that's already here, which they helped us to build to make sure it was on planet because it was going to be needed in their plan. They will use us and our ability to build this technology for them to, by the year 2008, have the stuff on planet, have the physical, their physical presence and the physical machinery on planet so where they can transmit the hyper pulses, I mean hyper, hyper intense sonic pulses that they need to break through the force fields that are on the inner earth portals. So this is their plan and guess what? After they do that, they don't need us anymore. And what happens after they do that in a stellar activation cycle is pole shift, rapid pole shift. Within about three months it starts to go and within three years it completely flips literally. And that is just decimation on a planetary level. There have been those times on this planet before, and it was like hitting the restart button, because everything has to be reseeded here when that happens. So, if they get their way, that is what the people who stay here would see. If it goes that bad, what we will be guided to do is to, first of all, they will give us hyper-advanced DNA activation techniques so we can definitely get through and sustain DNA activation where we could be in inner earth and deal with the frequencies there because inner earth is in a timeline that's a little bit ahead of ours which means it's faster which means it oscillates the particles oscillate faster if we have a slower oscillation rhythm in our body molecules and we try to go through a stargate into a place that has a faster frequency and our bodies can't hold it, it creates molecular compaction, it's called, on the inside, on the atomic level. What this creates is spontaneous combustion of the physical form. Now, that they won't take us through gates if that's going to happen because when that happens, we end up, the consciousness fragments. It, it's not like you, you can just like get out of your body and your body can like spontaneously combust. It, you, you go with it. You literally have your consciousness fragmented. And that's a whole other start evolution all over again to get yourself out of here. So they won't take you through you know, with, the, with the chance of losing your body. Some people who can't make the transition, who their bodies just need too much work and there's not enough time, will actually choose other ways to leave, such as the people that were in the, the accidents recently. 
They had agreements to leave at a certain time. We all make agreements to when we're going to come in and be born in a system. And when, depending on how things go, we give ourselves several options for our death experience or ascension experience. If we're going to go through stargates and take our bodies with us, then we don't choose a death experience. But the people who are leaving planet right now, and there's going to be progressively more of them, if we can... There's the sadness part where you think, oh, these, some of them will be victimized. Some of them are agree agreeing to play that role. Not here. They, their personalities don't know it. But their souls know it. They're trying to get them out before they end up in Phantom Matrix. So if they can't take their bodies through, they'll opt for being in a place where a natural disaster happens or where a terrorist attack happens, where their bodies go. But their consciousness gets to get out of that body and up out of the density one time cycles so it doesn't have to reincarnate and get sucked down into the Phantom Matrix. This has literally been something that there, for thousands and thousands of years, what has been happening when people die here since 10,500 BC? Most of them get hijacked. As soon as the body, as soon, as soon as you die, your consciousness starts to raise in frequency and your body starts to drop in frequency until they separate and sever. What normally happens is your consciousness keeps raising in frequency and then it will go up and connect to your D5 level of self. That's where you see the light at the end of the tunnel in your death experiences. That's when you're connecting with the center of your soul matrix in D5. What these wormholes and the people who run them have been doing is they have been literally sealing off the ability to make that transition out of this planetary system into the next density level. They have been siphoning off people when they die and dragging them into Phantom Matrix. There's a whole bunch of them there that know this is the time they can get out. And after this time, that matrix is going to be closed. It's going to be literally probably millions of years before anybody tries to go back in there because it's a place that almost took this matrix down, trying to save it. So right now, there's a whole bunch of people, and people that aren't in bodies anymore, that are trying to get the heck out. So if we start to see tragedies and things happening, which we are going to happen, they're already happening. If you happen to live in Afghanistan now, do you think it's the end of the world? Because every time you look, there's bombs dropping and everything you know is blowing up around you. And things like that could come here. And if the Illuminati One World Order agenda unfolds the way they want it, they will come here. Because this was supposed to be, America was supposed to be the final chessboard for whoever was left standing on the field. This was going to be the final chessboard where the rest of the drama would be unfolded. And it's not going to be unfolded tomorrow. The drama they have planned, if they can get things to 2003 where they want them, they're not going to fully unfold the whole drama right then. They have till 2008 if they can do their dimensional blend experiment in 2003. That's the time when they will link our planetary grids through those APIM systems directly into the grids of phantom matrix planets. And if that link is made, we can't pull them apart in time with it without completely causing pole shift all over the place. So they are trying to scramble for 2003 to make sure they have critical mass frequency dominance in the planetary grids. And that's what our guys are doing too. Whoever has this critical mass by August 12, 2003, are going to be the ones who win the territory, basically. Now, where Peru fits in, whoever wins that round, that will be the determining factor whether or not you'll have critical mass in 2003. If we can head them off at the pass and have a really good experience as far as getting the frequencies in the grids that we need in Peru, we will be able to change the game where they won't be able to do the 2003 dimensional blend experiment. That doesn't mean they'll go away real fast. What it means is they're going to be really mad. And they're probably going to because they realize their plan isn't going to work. They're probably just going to go into vengeance mode, which means they'll still try to run at least the outer aspects of the One World Order agenda just to antagonize us, which would mean continue the World War III drama and eventually have the final conflict drama come down where they let us know we're there and just do things to antagonize us. But they won't be able to fulfill their mission which is to get a hold of Earth so they can get into inner Earth to get the halls of Amente, Stargates. They will not be able to do that if they don't do the dimensional blend experiment in 2003. And they cannot do that if it goes well in, in the Peru thing because our grids will begin to hold too much D12 frequency and they will not be able to link them in. So right now we're in a crucial period. It's literally going to determine what the destiny of this race and this planet is going to be. And not just this race and this planet, but also 
this time matrix. Because if Earth goes down, it starts to take the Pleiades at D5, then Cirrus, the Cirrus system at D6, the Arcturus system at D7, the Orion system at D8. It progressively creates a chain reaction effect that will drag all of them down in to the phantom matrix subtime cycle. So, we have a job <laughs> before us, and, and I'm, I'm really glad that all of you seem to like be right here with me. Some people say, I don't want to hear this. You know, I just, <laughs> there are some people who really just don't want to deal with it. This is not the baby's group. This information is the master's level teachings, and I mean master's level, because this is, if anybody's going to pull us out of this, it's going to be the people that learn these techniques fast enough to make a difference. We don't have time to take them through. Tw it used to be every level of this data, you get 12 years of training, right? And then you go to the next level, and then you might learn about like Templar Mechanics 101 and then maybe 12 years later you get on to the middle group. We're getting literally the top end of the information to start with because there's no time for the rest. Yes? Um, is, what can we do to help you? Yes. Yeah, we're going to go, they haven't given us the linking techniques yet because there's still, there's two techniques they said they can't give us yet because you can't use them in the grids yet because there's certain things that need to be activated in the planetary grids that they could give us the technique but it's not going to do any good and they're on security release which means they give them to us as close to when we need to use them as possible so the other guys don't intercept it and try to do something with it because we're using Templar mechanics that are above the level of the Illuminati's knowledge. They don't have the maps. We've got them. They have partial maps. And it drives them nuts because they're trying to figure out where certain things are and they're guessing and they're trying to do like sacred geometries and making triangles and stars all over papers and maps and trying to figure out where they are. You need the Cathara grid, which is, I'll, I'll show you that in the, I don't know if I have that in this one. The, all right, this little diagram here, I'll just hold this up for now, we'll go over it later. That is what I'm talking about when I say a Cathara grid. <laughs> hey, cool, you got a multi-dimensional one there, somebody built one back there. All right, that is the key to understanding maps here and throughout the galactic universes because it is the core template that stargates are aligned on. So these are the things that the Illuminati, this is why there's going to be a lot of Illuminati people coming over for redemption contracts on this one because they've been scared. They didn't know, what, I mean, they made deals with some ETs, found out these ETs are bad guys and they're bigger and they're stronger and they're tougher and they totally underestimated them and they're scared they don't know what else to do so they try to you know kiss up to them literally just to hopefully save save their own skin at this point when they see the information that we're putting out they're going to know that we know certain things that they know some of their higher levels have some of but they won't tell them so they're going to be coming over because of the information we have now it's really to have this information this the information from what is called the book of maps and keys which was one of the books that uh, Jeshua Melchizedek translated off of the CDD plates in the Essene period. Um, this hasn't been on the planet since that time, and the full set of maps and keys books hasn't been here for since 10,500 BC. These were the keys to learning to work with Earth's Templar. It showed you where the real axiotonal lines were and the real ley lines were. Because what we have right now is a lot of stuff coming up from the Toth groups and from the Enoch groups and from a bunch of other groups who have their little APIN systems. They're telling you, oh, ley lines are here, so you need to activate this. They're having people activate their APIN systems. They're not showing them where the real grid lines are. They're showing them where the grid lines for the APIN systems are. So they can go out there, do sacred ceremony, and activate grids for them. So what we have now are the grids that are underneath all of those grids. There's, there's going to be a lot of information given. There's two um, emergency, what we call Regents Consulate meetings. These are for people who really want to, you know, that really feel like they want to participate in, on, the, you know, on the world level with this. There, uh, one's going to be October, what is it? 27th. 27th? October 27th in New York City and the other November 10th in Florida. So we're doing one up north and one you know, down in the, in the south. <coughs> These are the meetings that we're going to be given the techniques because by then the things are going to be activating in the grids that will allow us to use this next level of technique that has to do with using round tables and what they call the VECA codes. There's a series of mathematical codings that have been very, very protected for a very long time that will give you the ability to reach into literally three other time matrices to draw power, not only to get your own fields fortified, but to anchor it here in the planetary grids. So we'll be talking more about that as we go along, getting closer to the Peru time, and there'll be updates and everything given. But for now, what I wanted to do 
for today's workshop. It's, I wanted to really bring this home for you to help, help it make sense to you as far as who are we dealing with, how did it get here? Because all of a sudden, like you, you didn't know any of this yesterday, you come into a workshop and all of a sudden, it's like, God, wormholes, and, and I've heard of Montauk, didn't know exactly what that was, heard of Philadelphia Experiment, I just hit you with a lot of information. It will help if you could see the progression. It'll also help when you see the progression through the period of time that we know as World War II. The underlying things that were going on behind that, because this is exactly what's going to be going on in the dramas we're watching now. We're going to go after Iraq, I know that, because Iraq right now is being run behind the scenes by a group of Illuminati who are from the Omicron Draconian rebelling, rebelling matrix. They don't want to do the United Resistance. The United Resistance happens to need what's called Q-Site 10, the activation site for Stargate 10 for the Peru time when we're going to Peru. So it ought to be interesting to see how fast either Saddam Hussein begins to cooperate or how fast he's removed because they need to get the territories down in the Persian Gulf because that's where Stargate 10 and its Q-Site are located. Iran is already cooperating and it will probably stay that way. We're going to watch political things happen here and kind of scratch our heads. They'll give us one reason why they're happening. But if you start to look at it, some of the reasons they're given and the reactions we're taking for those reasons seem a little bit not quite coherent with each other. Yes. I heard someplace on the news. Wasn't there something on the news from this morning that they, they already started bombing yeah, something over there? Yeah, they, they had a control and command center today. Yeah, they bombed a control and command no, center in Iraq today. That's what, it was on the news. He heard it on the news this morning. It had to do with the violation of the airspace issue. He said, so we've already started. I'm watching how fast this is moving and not going, oh my God. <laughs> They're in a big rush. Why? They had this all planned out, step by step. They were going to start it in the end of 2002, and then they were going to move it through 2003, and by 2005 they'd have everybody ready for contact, right? Well, we threw some cogs in their wheels there because we started to get D12 frequency activated on the planet, which has the ability to literally seal them out of the portals and the grids. So they kind of, th their big move was in... Uh, September, um, no, August, August 12th of uh, 2001. That's when they realized the one thing that they dreaded happening. You see, for centuries they've been culting, cultivating us. Go forth and multiply. Make millions of babies. that are little bodies with DNA that if you run it in reverse, puts more frequency into the planetary grids. They were counting on humans having their DNA in reversal. And what has happened because of the groups of indigos all over the planet that are working in one form or another with activating DNA on the proper spin, using the proper Merkaba spin, we've hit critical mass in the grids, and it's now clearing the DNA templates of people who don't even want to hear about this stuff all over the planet. All of a sudden, who they plan to be their little army that would actually get things done for them, are actually sending D12 frequency into the grids now, which is their enemy. So. They're going on a campaign of, first of all, they have to move forward very quickly or they're going to lose complete control of the game. And part of this campaign is going to be to reduce the number of human population. Because right now, human population that they have been planning on is one of their trump cards to get the reverse uh, coatings going into the grids is now going to send the right coatings into the grids. So you're going to see political events contrived in a way and areas that you see where real messes are happening, where there's people really being killed, particularly for political reasons, but also natural disaster reasons. These are areas that have heavy concentration of humans and or indigo children, because they want to get rid of as many of them as possible, have just enough to open the grids, because they can't get rid of them all. If they get rid of all of us, then they can't access the core template, the planetary grids, because only human and indigo DNA is keyed to the template. So, but they need to reduce the populations. So you're going to see put under the guise of necessary political maneuvering a human genocide program and that's what it is right now the people in Afghanistan are part of that the rulers of Afghanistan in truth aren't human but most of the Afghani people around them are and there is a huge concentration over there of Maji Grey Line indigos that aren't awake yet they're still stuck in the Muslim trap of what they've been taught in their culture but their DNA is going to be activating and they would start to get an understanding of greater things because when your DNA activates even if you never heard of metaphysics before you start to have perceptions 
you start to have perceptions of higher dimensional things. You start to have understandings come to you from your own soul level and higher. They're trying to get rid of groups of Maji that they don't need, because they need certain indigos because they hold the key codes to the grids, the final level of security codes on the planetary grids, which means if you want to get into the planetary grids to do something to them, first they have to open. And there's several layers of security keys, frequencies, that are in those grids that only certain races carry. The Maji Grail line races, which are the indigo children, carry the final set that if they don't put their keys in the grids to open the grids, A, the planet goes into pole shift because the grids will not open to allow any more of the Stargate frequencies to come in. That's why we're always on planet when it's time for a stellar activation to simply run our codes so the gates open the right way. But <coughs> if they were to wipe us out, they couldn't get the grid lines open and they need the grid lines open if they're going to bond the core template of our planet to one in the phantom matrix. They have to have the grids open. So it's, it's a very interesting game of strategy. It's like a cat and mouse game, sort of. It's like tit for tat. Okay, you do this. Well, we have to do this. And we're right smack in the middle of it. It's going to be unfolding very quickly. So one, one of the things that I wanted to start with, with this, was just getting familiar with who are these people anyway? You know, we've talked about Illuminati races. Yes, Jay? Quick question. Uh -huh. I've heard you say there's 550,000 indigos here on the planet. Mm -hmm. Is there a critical mass of, that has to, of those that have to wake between Actually, the way it's structured, is the, there's three types of indigos, indigos one, two, and three. Indigo type ones have um, the 36 to 48 strand DNA templates. They, have, they can hold the most frequency. If they're triggered in activation first, they will bring so much frequency into the planet and into the tribal shield, which is the, the frequency specter that links anything of, of a race together, that they will trigger activation of the indigo twos and they will trigger the threes and they will trigger the humans. So it works down from the top, the ones that can hold the most frequency. That's why the indigo, most of the people who come to these workshops are indigo one or two. Now, very rarely do we have just a 12-strand human coming to these because the frequency of information that we put these out on is literally D6 and higher, and most humans don't have their 6-strand activated. Indigos come in with their 6-strand activated at birth, but they don't have strands 4 and 5 activated, so they still have to wake up. They still have to get strand 3, which we all have, plugged into strand 4 and 5 to get their wake up where they get their D6 and higher information. So, do you know what that number is? The, the number of... As far as how many we need to wake up, it's already happened. That's why they're in such a... a, a um, <laughs> and there's, there's a saying you use <laughs> that I love. It's an English saying that Michael uses. Uh, got their knickers in a twist. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and they, <laughs> and it, it fits. That's exactly why they've decided to advance as quickly as possible the One World Order agenda, because we've been doing so well, because there's so many, a lot of the Indigo Ones activated, triggered activation of the Indigo Twos, the humans are starting already. They're getting 12 code activations, which means that when I talk about 12 code activations of DNA, a human DNA imprint has 12 strands. Each strand has 12 subharmonics to it, or 12 smaller codes within it. Now, science looks at us and you know, looks at DNA and says, oh, there's two strands of DNA. Actually, they're say, what they're seeing there is one. That's a double helix strand. That would count as one strand. There are 12 double helix strands in a human DNA template. There are more in the indigo DNA template. Right now, science has identified um, four what they call base pairs, which are the chemicals that human DNA, is, well, all DNA, is made out of. Chemical base pairs. It's called a base four genetic alphabet. And supposedly, everything on the planet has a base four genetic alphabet. It's not supposed to. Everything on the planet is supposed to have what's called a variable base genetic alphabet. Right now, scientists look at DNA, and they have this interesting thing that even didn't make a lot of sense to them in the beginning, and I don't think it does still. Why do sometimes cherry trees have more base pairs, more genes, more chromosomes than humans? You'd think more complicated life forms would have more chromosomes. Now, chromosome count is based on count of 
uh, what they call genes. It goes back down into how many base pairs and groupings, large groupings of base pairs that form the genes that form, you know, build up to form chromosomes. Science looks at chromosomes. What they're seeing right now is shredded chromosomes. What they're calling one chromosome is very often just a fragment of one, and they're seeing parts of certain ones that appear a certain way because of the planetary grid distortions. 25,000 years the grid, the grid distortions have been here. What's interesting is because of the planetary grid distortions, you can go back and dig up a dinosaur and take DNA from that and it will read as a base 4 genetic alphabet because the frequencies that allow certain chemical elements to bond and form and stay bonded and formed are literally dissolved because of what's happened in the planetary grids. We have on this planet naturally a, base, a variable base genetic alphabet. That means different sets, different amounts of chromosomes per you know, per different species. Right now, everything on this planet, not just humans, has been genetically mutated because of the reversals, the, the uh, electromagnetic field reversals that have been done to this, these grids. We get into that more in the, in the Templar book. But as far as DNA, one thing is important to understand about it is that we have a dormant 12-strand pattern minimum. If you're in a body that looks like a human, you have a minimum of a dormant 12-strand pattern. Now, if you happen to be an Illuminati that's in, in the body that looks like a human and you don't know the difference because nobody ever told you that you were anything but a human soul, you would have something like that, but you wouldn't have a full 12 strand, but you could get it. That's what we get into Melchizedek ordinations for. It's not that the Illuminati races are damned. It's that they simply need certain types of help with their DNA template to get them where they can do ascension, go through stargates where they can get their like uh, consciousness back where it's working in the right way. But all of us are going to go through, so are the animals, DNA activations because of the frequencies that are coming into the planetary grids right now. When we begin to activate the 12-strand pattern, it doesn't immediately change the look on the, what the chemical DNA looks like. It's a slow process. What we're doing right now is people are getting little pulses, nanosecond bursts. Actually, they're like trillions of nanosecond bursts of frequency that come through. They turn on higher parts of the template until the body cells can't hold any more of that frequency, then they shut it off. So you're not going to have a chemical manifestation in the DNA until that turns on, that particular part of the template turns on, like strand four turns on, and then holds in the body. Now a person who had a full fourth strand sustained continual activation would still, if you looked at their DNA, they would still have two strands. But those strands would have more combinations of sugar and phosphate you know, combinations running down the sides, and they would have more groupings of base pairs. They'd have more genes within the same double strand structure. So literally the strands don't, you don't end up with this starburst inside your gene code. It's actually layering where you get more chemical components, more complex um, information, more complex molecules within the strands of DNA, more complex proteins and amino acids. So there's all these chemical things that are going to happen with our DNA as we go along, but it starts with template activation. That's what we're doing now. Template activation is crucial if you're going to go through a stellar activation cycle, even one that's going well, even if it was just the stellar activation cycle we had to deal with here, the, we, our DNA has been so mutated because of the problems in the grids for the last 25,000 years that we would have di all died of radiation poisoning by the time we got to the opening of the Halls of Amente Stargates in 2012, like it was originally supposed to do, which is accelerated, by the way. I'll get to that in a minute. Right now, we're in a process of the planet is triggering our DNA to activate. It's also triggering certain blockages to come up in our DNA that we're getting right out of the grids that go with the Jehovian seals and several other ones that aren't as nasty but they're just as um, annoying because these block your body's ability to do what it's supposed to be able to do to stay healthy as the frequency increases on the planet. People are going to start getting more heart problems particularly with the Je Jehovian seals activating because they're all, they all run down the left side of the body. They're going to get problems with the legs in here, with the veins, they're going to get problems with the neck. Thyroid is one of the first ones that starts to go wacky because there are Jehovian seals that run down in through here, that manifest in here in the body, and they affect the function of the thyroid gland, which affects the function of um, how your body assimilates food and all sorts of things. It literally, literally turns your chemicals in, into a... It, it, it has them do things that they're not normally supposed to do. When people go through this type of thing, and it, it tends to work a little different between men and women, women have a propensity to start putting on weight because of the Jehovian seals activating in the body. Where I'm watching it happen with my body and going, jeez, you know, like, like, 
it, it makes you feel like you're out of control of your body because your body's doing stuff. You can starve yourself to death and you're still gaining weight. You know, this is, men, it affects in different ways also. So there, we are being affected physically on the inside by these things we, most of us don't know about. DNA templates, they're activating seals that are stuck in the DNA templates. When we work with the techniques that we're going to work, tomorrow's going to be more of the technique day. You got some of it this morning and I'm glad because I heard that you were doing the salutations and what else? Did salutations? Try on feels excellent. Okay, so that's good. I, usually I would go into a, you know, a full explanation of all that and then we get into it, but I'm so glad. And I thank the people who, uh, who helped with that <laughs> this morning. So what I want to do is First, let's anchor it all in the mental body, which means let's make this make rational, logical sense. There was a sequence of events that took place here, obviously, that got us to the point we were, where we are. And if we have this supposable, invisible set of uh, groups of people that consider themselves our enemy, and it's like, well, we don't have to look at them as enemies. They're the ones that want to play enemy. But that doesn't mean we let them flatten us. But we need to know who they are. So I'm going to go through the handouts that you have. You, if you can't read it up here, because it's really like it gets distorted at the bottom, they say the same thing as what's up here. And I'll just go over it a little bit, explain up on the first one we have the Omicron Draconians. All right, they're out of what's called the Fallen Seraphim line. I will tell you a little bit about where they all started from, okay? And this was a long time ago, and I'm not going to go through the whole history because we'll be here till next Tuesday. <laughs> okay, and not the first coming one, the next one after. The Fallen Angelic Collectives started from some events that took place 250 billion years ago, literally, in a place called the Cradle of Lyra. The Cradle of Lyra is the Lyra, when we look up in the sky and we identify the Lyra star system. There are stars that we, what we see as stars there that have, just like all planets do, they have different density levels. Now to get into a density level here, this is called density, um, this is density one down here, heavy density. There is density two, three, four, and five. And they progressively get lighter and lighter. This is the process by which consciousness goes from being primal light and sound into progressively manifesting into density. The place called the Cradle of Lyra, which when we look up and see our Lyra star system, that is the coordinate in our universe that all this started. The Cradle of Lyra had, was a um, pre-matter density system, which means it's the first step in going from being a waveform into taking on solidity where form shapes can be made, where you become part of a three-dimensional system that's not just consciousness in the form of light waves. All right. In the cradle of Lyra, there were three primary founders races that seeded this time matrix. And literally all life forms in this time matrix came out of these three primary races. The three primary races were the Elohai Elohim, the Seraphai Seraphim, and the Braharama. Each one of those was connected to one of three primary consciousness collectives that form the density five primal light fields. The Elohai Elohim are called the blue flame group. The flame refers to the um, D13 level of the primal light fields, which are D13, 14, and 15 are primal light fields. D13 is actually the first individuation into light where sound turns into light. So that actually has the highest coding, D13. They're called the blue flame groups. The Elohai Elohim were the first Christos founders races that came into density and pre-matter in the cradle of Lyra. There's the gold flames, which are the pale light, uh, pale yellow light fields of D14. And there's what they call the violet flame groups, which are the um, pale, it's like a pale magenta color D15 light field. Now these are consciousness fields, not just fields of light, but they're also the fields of energy that all forms of electromagnetic energy that we know in the density systems comes from, which implies energy is conscious, which it is. <laughs> okay. Now, where this whole mess began was with the Christos founders races. There's something that we call code convolution that began to take place. They were three different races of beings that were from three different consciousness collectives that agreed through something called the Emerald Covenant. And the Emerald refers to the blue flames because it's actually blue-green, it's pale turquoise, it's the D15, or D13 color. So the Emerald Covenant was an agreement between these three founders races and their consciousness collectives that they would come in 
and they would have a, this would be a peaceful system. This would be a co-evolution system where they would work together in harmony. It was supposed to be a nice place to live. They all created different types of races. The first um, set of races, the Christos founders races that were created, were the Elohai Elohim, and they were created on a planet called Aramatana, Lyra, in, at D12, dimension 12, in density 4. Now, Lyra Aramatana, when we look up, and our scientists look up, and they identify something called Lyra double-double, they call it the double-double. That is Lyra Aramatana. The ancient word is Aramatana for it. It's its actual tonal vibration put out into sound. That's where you get the words from, from the names of these places. They, that is where the D12 stargate was, the entry point into this particular system. There are 12 primary stargates between density 4 and density 1 that allow consciousness to come in, that allow manifestations to come in to create matter in these systems. So the Elohai Elohim of the Blue Flame Group, the Emerald Order, were appointed as the guardian groups, the Christos founders races, of Lyra Aramatana and Stargate 12. Still in Lyra, there was another place called Lyra Avion, which had the Gate 11, Universal Stargate 11. And this planet was shared by the Elohai Elohim, a group of them, and one of the Braharama groups, which were the Violet Flame groups. And then there was one more planet called Lyra Vega, which is still called Lyra Vega, here in our star charts. That planet was um, given to the Seraphi Seraphim, Stargate 10 was in that planet. Now, these guys got along for literally, this was 950 billion years ago that they were seated there. So they got along for a really long time and things were going well. But something called code convolution started to happen, which you can compare to inbreeding. If you take one genetic line and start combining it with itself too long, you start to get distortions in its natural pattern. It's, it works the same way on templates, even when you're in density four and you're not dealing with chemicals as we know them here. You're still dealing with scalar wave templates. There were certain races that because they were creating new life forms and new combinations of themselves to experience life in the densities, they began to have code convolution, which convoluted their consciousness as well. And warring started to break out between the Vagan ones at Gate 10 and the uh, uh, group of the Elohai Elohim that were stationed at Gate 11. There was a group of the Elohai Elohim that used to be, yeah, they were part, originally part of the good guy Elohim, that decided that they wanted to destroy the Seraphi Seraphim of the Vega system. And they asked the High Council of Lyra Aramatena to, say, you know, to give them permission to go destroy them. And they said, no, you're not going to destroy them because you, you, they were as screwed up as the ones they were trying to destroy. So we'll try to rehabilitate both of you and help both of you. Well, because the particular group of Elohai Elohim on Avion didn't like that answer, they blew up Aramatena at the time, the template for Aramatena. They got rid of the founders, the, the, you know, the High Council, so they could take over, and then they went after the Seraphi Seraphim. Now, the group that, that went into rebellion and decided it was going to be its own little creator god, and it was going to create its own universe by taking over this one, they were called the Anu Elohim. And they are the ones that created later the Anunnaki races. The Anunnaki races were created for one purpose, to get rid of the races that were created by the Christos founders that had been sent in here in order to fix things, the human race was the race that was created to fix things. They were called the Oraphim. And that's what humans are. They're Oraphim Turinisium. And it's a Lyran Syrian race form. So this whole mess and this whole fandom matrix stuff started literally 250 billion years ago in the warring that broke out between the different Elohim races. And we ended up with fallen um, uh, fallen Enu Elohim that came out of the Elohai Elohim originally. And we ended up with fallen seraphim, which were the ones from the, uh, from the Vega system that also ended up going. Literally, they got sucked into a black hole system. And they reassembled themselves there and then progressively have tried to pull in portions of this time matrix and its galaxies into their system to feed off it. And they have come very, very close at certain times to literally taking the whole thing in. They're very close to that right now. It helps a little bit, too, to have a basic understanding of these Christos founders races, what they look like. What types of forms did they create? When we talk about reptilian races, all of the reptilian races came out of the Seraphi races. The Seraphi had a few primary forms. They had reptilian, dragon-like, insectoid, and um, avian bird forms. So those primary forms were set. And like literally things, when we see them run around here, you know, if you see little lizards or birds flying in the air, these are things that have been created through that matrix. They're not all negative. They are good Seraphi that haven't fallen as well. 
And when you look at the old angel texts, they talk about the Elohim and the Seraphim and these guys. What they usually don't tell you is about the trouble back in Lyra. Because usually the ones that have written the angel books here in the last 10,000 years have been the Anu Elohim, which are the ones that are trying to take over. So this whole mess literally started back there. So when we look at who's playing in the game now, and you see the little uh, categorizations of fallen Seraphim of Vega Lyra, that, that first affiliation that's in up here, like in the parentheses, that refers to where they basically started, where that race started. And then the other affiliations as far as where they are and where their primary like cultures and civilizations are, are the ones that are listed outside of the brackets. <coughs> so that's the drama so long ago in linear time that all of this mess has come out of. And this is just like a piece of a mess within a much larger mess. In the uh, Amente book, the Voyagers, Volume 2, Secrets of Amente, the first printing that came out in 99, we were given the information on what was called the fall of Terra. Earth used to be called Terra. In fact, Earth still is called Terra in density 2, which is dimensions 4, 5, and 6. It's the counterpart to this planet in density 2. Terra was almost blown up completely because of the same battle that was going on between the same races. So this is not a new story. But we're in this particular leg of the story where it's the closing act. Because at this point, it's going to go one way or the other. Because the other time matrix, the phantom matrix, has accreted or pulled in so much frequency that it has more frequency right now than this one does. That's why, in order to create enough frequency to literally pull this time matrix and this planet back into its natural order of things, we need to link it to two other time matrices to literally give it anchoring rods, or it will be drawn into the black hole system. That's what we're doing now. There's a whole progression of uh, history that's given in, in uh, the Templar books there that takes you back through Atlantis. It actually takes you back through the whole seating three. We didn't get into seedings one and two in that book. That was in the Secrets of Amente book. So, I mean, if you want history, if you want detail, it's here. <laughs> but what's important now is understanding what the heck has happened to us since 1916. How in the world could our politics, how could, how could this stuff be going on without us even seeing it? That's what amazes me is we're, you know, there's this picture painted for us through media and, you know, through what you get taught in school from the time you're small and you go to school. We're taught to look at the world a certain way. What we're not taught is literally for 70 years there have been ET contracts here that have been controlling everything, including what the media was allowed to release. What we're not told is that certain races are walking among us that aren't even human, and some of them are having a terrible time not showing that because their DNA is activating too and they're starting to morph, where people are literally seeing lizard people. Like, it'll be like a flash on that comes out. I, I, I know one person who's a UFO investigator, a famous one, called me and she says, do you know anything about this? I've had like numbers of calls from people all over the place, like different countries, the United States. One was a senator's daughter. And she said, they're saying that, that well, for example, she said, the senator's daughter was in the room with my dad. I walked in the room, and he had his back to me. And, and um, you know, I said, oh, hi, dad. And he turned around, and she scared the hell out of me. It was, he was a lizard in a suit, you know, literally. She saw her dad morph. And then he like turned back around and morphed back real quick. But she, she literally, she took off, she left, left town, won't let them know where she is. And terrified the daughter, which is going to be even more scared to find out if she has part of those codes. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So we're not told about this when we go to like, you know, world cultures, you know? When we go through civics class and like, you know, in grade school and things where they teach us about who else lives on the planet with us, they leave out a few races that are actually here. So at this point, we need to realize that we have been a multi-species uh, planet, and I'm not just talking about animals and plants and humans. The things that are in human bodies, all humans are not the same. It's not a value judgment of who's good and who's bad. Illuminati races that right now, they, it's really kind of good because most of them don't know that they're anything different than what a human might be, whatever that is. They have an innocence about them because of that, but they're also extremely vulnerable to manipulation because they have those DNA windows that the fallen angelic groups can just go right in with psychotronic pulsing or they can go right in for possession into their biofields. If they can use Maharic seal, Illuminati races can get out of the problem. This is what, we, what the Guardians tried to explain to them in the 1930s when they were making treaties with the Zetas and there was literally physical contact made with some of the Guardian groups and they came in and said, hey guys, you really don't want to do this. You know, they tried to show them about the wormholes because they already knew that the things were happening with the wormholes because the Zetas had popped through them. And they had their own little twists of 
power and conquest, and they didn't want to release their power over the masses, and that's really what blinded them to make some bad decisions. Yes? So, somebody who is a reptile, mm -hmm. by choice, by using the, these seals, can they advance? Yes, they can. Okay, and what about people who are, when you look at their robotic, what about them? The robotic type ones? Usually the, the little Robotrons are more like cloned versions, like the original is usually gone by then. They do clone, they've been cloned, the Zetas have been cloning since the 30s. And there are some political people that fall into that category in different countries. <laughs> and it's kind of like, <laughs> there's one little interesting way that you can sometimes get, get a hint that something like that might have happened. Or either like it's a Robotron person, they have this really dead look in their eyes. Now that can happen with full field infiltration, not just cloning. If somebody gets their body snatched, which is happening all over the place. Like if you look at some of the photos of some of those terrorist people, it's like falling into black holes when you look through those eyes. There's no conscience in there. Now those guys weren't robotons. They weren't um, something created through cloning. They were once Illuminati human beings that didn't know they were Illuminati human beings. They didn't know consciously about ETs or any of that. But they had the genetic code that made it very easy for the dark avatar collectives from dimension, from densities four and three, which are the uh, pre-matter densities and the semi-etheric matter densities. They can move their consciousness into those body forms and use them as a host. And that's what they very often do. When you see that stare where you look like you're you know, falling into to black holes in people's eyes, that is a possession. That is, that is a sign of possession. It's a little different with the Robotrons. They almost have a, they almost look like cutouts. There's something about the way that the, the cloned ones feel. They don't feel like they're quite here. Like their bodies don't feel like the same density as ours, even though they look like it. And there's more of a mechanical thing. It's almost like, they remind me of little cutout, you know how little girls play with cutout paper dolls? They, they have a paper doll feel to them compared to what even a possessed body would. But we're on the planet with all these people. And what's scary is like that one girl found out. It could be your dad. You don't know. We don't know who we are here because that knowledge, that we've been denied that knowledge. So we don't know if we're from a family line that you know, is caught up in this, where if we knew, run our Maharic seals, we don't have to play that game. You know, there's a lot of very good people that I have met that are incarnated out of the fallen angelic matrices. And they don't know that they are, and they get manipulated all over the place, but some of them have developed enough consciousness here where they say, okay, let me learn this Maharic seal thing, and boy does that really upset the fallen angelic matrices, because they're losing their own. They're losing their little um, potential body snatch vehicles down here. So what we try to teach with all of this, it's not a hatred game at all. It's realizing that the Illuminati have been victimized here, and they can do some horrible things to other people when they're being victimized. They can make some really bad decisions, and they can be awful. I mean, when you look at some of the things like, like the Taliban groups do, or other groups that literally torture people and seem to enjoy it, um, Illuminati can do this because they don't know any better, and because they're lacking the 12th strand imprint, which means they can't plug into that Christus consciousness, that feeling of being connected to the rest of the universe. So they honestly, a lot of them just don't feel what we call remorse, what a human would feel as compassion for another being. It isn't there. When people like that get into love relationships, they tend to be the vampires in the love relationships where they feed emotionally off the other person, but it's very shallow, where it's not a real genuine connection, where they look at like women as symbols or women as objects, or the women look at the men as objects. You know, this, this whole type of relationship that's been, become very predominant in our societies on the planet is literally the type of relationships that people that don't have the 12th strand begin to have with each other. And we've started to fall into those patterns because they were all around us in the cultures. Yes? Um, I saw an interview on television months ago and a recent U.S. News and World Report interview of the founder of the Raelian religion who openly states that he's cloning did the Guardians... The Raelians? The Are they the ones up in Canada? Yeah. Yeah. I had a run-in with one of theirs. Yeah. These are Necromaton beetle people. Yeah, but, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Is that going to have anything to do with it? We would be doing to stop this? Or it has nothing to do with all of it? 
there's all sorts of those agendas run, and they all have their, their uh, negative ones all have their own little agendas. I had a run-in with one of the Raelians before I knew who they were <laughs> on a UFO panel. It was my first UFO panel. Yes, yes. Oh, what a nightmare that was. We had, I swear, it was like the United Nations of the fallen angelic realms on that panel. And <laughs> this one Raelian lady is, is she... Oh, and oh, we're with the, the Elohim, and the Elohim, well, we're, they're our creators, and they're so, they're so good because, well, we know they're more superior than us because their sciences are so advanced, and their technologies, and they're going to come in, and they're going to show us how to be, and I'm thinking, oh, gag me, you know, <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm watching this frequency, I could feel it, going into the room, and there, she spoke in a monotone. And it was doing something to the people in the room. I could feel it. There was like a, literally a subliminal frequency going through. And I started to get my hair started to stand on end on my arms. Like, what the hell is that? You know, she may be a sweet, pretty looking little Canadian lady, but what is going on over here? And I closed my eyes and I got this flash of this thing that looked like a hominid beetle. Literally, like the kind of fat beetle bodies and it was gold colored and had a really ugly head on it. I didn't know what they were at the time. That's a necromaton race strain, an Andromi necromaton race strain. There's several different looks that they have, but that was one of them. And they were running this whole program. There was another one that was doing um, toning in a healing session. Same, same uh, expo, but this was the healing panel where she came up and she was doing these tones. And it was really funny because she had a song called The Song of Orion. That was the name of the one I was doing, too. And I thought it was really weird. So, oh, gee, maybe we're on the same team. She starts this song. And I didn't know her. I mean, yeah, nothing against the lady. And I'm listening to these tones. And, again, my hair is, like, standing on end. And I close my eyes to see what's going on in the room. And I saw these Dracos, which are the, one of the reptilian lines coming in, cordon people in the room. So we came after her and did our song of Orion, and we saw the cords drop. <laughs> So there is stuff going on here that is utterly amazing. You start to find it when your fourth strand starts to kick in. And you need to know you're not losing your mind when you start to see it. You're not having hallucinations. But think about it, how the program is set up out here. Okay, a person starts having DNA activation. They start to get weird perceptions. They start to see lizards in suits. They start to see spaceships hanging up there in the sky with their inner vision, not just not their eyes, right? They go to somebody because they're scared. They go to, say, a mental health professional. Where do they go? They get the railroad. They get put on something to make it go away. The system is set up. It's a snare to make sure that we don't activate. And if we do, they'll give us a nice chemical to make sure it goes away. This has all been set up for this time. And at this point, there's not a lot of time to haggle about it. I spent the while when I first started coming out with information. It was mild compared to this. We didn't talk about the scary stuff until it had to be talked about. You know, we talked about some of the conflicts, but we didn't focus on Illuminati stuff. We had better things to do. Teaching about the healing, teaching about the DNA, what to do to prepare ourselves for stellar activation. But from the moment I stepped foot into the speaker's arena, I swear, everybody was out to get me. I came in with an open heart and a loving mind. Oh, you know, we're all on the same team. We're all going to be light workers. Yeah, right? It was like everywhere I turned around. There were people that looked like nice people that were implant, trying to implant stuff into my fields, trying to send frequencies at me. It was amazing. It, it's been a battleground out there for a while now, and I just didn't realize it. You know, so we're all walking through this, and as long as, our, as long as we're stuck in the D3 mindset, they won't bother us directly because we're controllable because we're easy that way. It's when we start to get hip to things that they start to say, ah, you know, got to clamp down on that one. At this point, there's a lot of people waking up, and they haven't been able to clamp down on everybody. We've managed to get a huge amount of information through, and even more than the information, a huge amount of frequency, which means we've gotten enough frequency on planet that the indigos and the humans are starting to wake up on the natural DNA imprint that they're supposed to. They're still going to have problems running with the frequencies running through the grids. They're still going to get sick if they don't learn to run Maharic Seal. However, we can help people by learning to do this ourselves. The more frequency we bring into our bodies, the more we straighten out our DNA and hold that, the more it will be the pattern, the critical mass pattern in the race morphogenetic fields. It's called the race template. So we can literally, by healing ourselves, literally hold a field that the rest won't end up with accelerated cancer and accelerated heart disease and accelerated liver disease, because these are all the things that are going to accelerate because of the blockages that are there. So in the work that we do, we're helping 
all of that. Now, I'm going to get back to this, though. I want to get back to, so we can get through this, so we can get to the fun part. <laughs> the fun part was those seven pages that I just haggled through, and I had to go through the, all, the whole text that I got to get the timeline. I wanted to see the timeline for me, too. Okay, what happened first? What happened next? <laughs> to get us to this point. I, was, I just want to get us familiar with the players, because you'll, you'll hear me talk about them a lot. And you may, at least you have them in your hand if you know, who is that again? <laughs> you basically have Anunnaki agendas, Andromi agendas, uh, draconian agendas, draconian reptilian agendas, several different kinds of Anunnaki agendas. But what honestly has made the whole thing much easier is they finally all decide to stop fighting with each other and join up into the United Resistance. So now we don't have to track 20 different agendas, we just follow the main one. There's a couple little rebel groups. The only other rebel group you really have to worry about are the Omicron Dacronians, because they're trying to fight the United Resistance and everybody else. But it's really made things much simpler. All of these agendas that are like these affiliations that have their own agendas have come together through the United Resistance, put all their technologies together, and are trying to make a stance against the Guardian nations. But it makes it easier to track what they're doing. Because now they don't all go do stuff off on their own where you have to keep track of everybody. Now they have central command, which is the Andromis. Okay, the Necromaton Andromis are basically central command in all of this, with their little leaders in each of the different race groups. So we have the Omicron Draconians. These are bipedal, which means, you know, standing up kind of not quite hominid. They would be hominid if they had anything that resembled human form. The only thing that resembles it is it's bipedal. It has two legs, two arm things and they're dragon moths, all right? <coughs> they look like something you'd see on the sci-fi channel. They're, some of them are tall. They can be you know, eight to nine feet tall. Some of them are shorter. Their little worker drone things are shorter, and they're usually the ones that if anybody has encounter with them, they usually see the, the shorter ones that are about the size of a human, a little bit bigger. Yeah. Then there's little tiny things that they use that are just like clone things. They use like little Zetas and all sorts of other things. Now, these guys are nasty but dumb which is nice. I mean, you know, they have negative agendas, but they're like all brawn and not too much brains because they have a 10-strand DNA potential. They don't have 11-strand potential like the Anunnaki races do. So these are the ones that are pushy. These are much more direct. If they want to go blow something up, they will. They won't manipulate you and kiss up to you and be your best friend while they're, you know, nailing you behind your back. These guys will just be your enemy and at least you know it. So that helps. It makes things easier when you're dealing with these guys because they're pretty much in your face. Now, there's, they're, I don't underestimate them. I mean, they're capable. They're using multidimensional spectrum. They can do a lot of, they can do a lot of damage. They've been tracking me since I was born in this lifetime. <laughs> they haven't got me yet. Um, the Odetochron reptilians. Now, these are a different group. The Omicron draconians are from um, Alnatak and Alnalam Orion in the Phantom Matrix. Okay, they have primary race affiliations. Now, this stuff, the Leviathan race affiliation, when I talk about Leviathans, I talked about it a little bit yesterday. These were the hybrids that started out as a hybridization program, uh, Emerald Covenant hybridization program to help these races back in the Atlantean period. It actually started 155,000 BC was when the hybridization program began. The Leviathan races that came out of the tribe, the hybrid tribe of Levi, were supposed to be a good thing, but they got taken over. So when I make the, when I have this primary Leviathan race infiltration, these are the races that were infiltrated. That if we see a race now that is, you know, is descendant of that, they're the Illuminati versions in these race lines. Now most of the race lines that are listed are angelic human twelve tribes. They they were original human races, but they have certain portions of them that have been infiltrated by a Leviathan race to create uh, an, an Illuminati line. And that Illuminati line is associated with different things. Each one of them have their own kind of certain areas of the globe and areas of the human populations that they infiltrated. So if we look at the Omicron Draconians, we have um, their primary Leviathan affiliations are Middle Eastern races, races, German races, Germany, um, Anglo-Saxons, Italian, Asian. They're called the Hala King Leviathan lines, Hala, Allah. Okay, this is where the distortions on what, what used to be a decent religion before they took it over, Muslim, Islamic religion, the Muslim religion, was actually one of the translations, and it didn't look anything like it does now, was originally one of the translations of the Angelic Human 12 Tribes CDD plates. But they were infiltrated in the Atlantean period before the 9558B flood of Atlantis. And they were, this is called the um, Hala, Le Leviathan King Lines. They were the group of hybrids that were, you know, Illuminati hybrids that were taken into this particular agenda by 
the Omicron Draconian group, and Omicron souls started to incarnate into them. And they are the ones that distorted the teachings that now when you look at Islam, most of it was written by them at this point. You also have the same problem in Christianity, because most of Christianity was written by the Jehovian and the Elohim at this point, because they did the same thing. What has happened here, since it started in Atlantis, and it got really bad after they orchestrated the 9558 BC fall of Atlantis to make it all disappear, literally every race line here of the 12 tribes has been compromised, where there has been an Illuminati Leviathan race sent in that were the incarnates of one of the fallen angelic lines that begin to progressively interbreed and try to take over the race line. They would, in the old days, you didn't believe in the creed they were feeding you, you got killed. Simple as that. You know, they would literally raid and, and they would very often rape the women in order to make them pregnant. So they would be able to further their line and pick up more human coding as they went. We have lived a holocaust since Atlantis. And the scary part is we have no memory that we even did that because it's been such a good con job. So in, basically you'll find this affiliation of the, the uh, Omicron Draconian agendas all over in the Middle Eastern areas, some of them collectives in Germany. Um, in the Anglo-Saxon lines there are some. In the Italian, particularly Roman lines, like the Romans were one, there are actually two groups of Romans. One were a whole group of Leviathans that came in and took over on behalf of the Anunnaki, and the other were the ones that came in and took over on behalf of the Omicron Draconians. The Roman Catholic Church was founded by the Omicron Draconians. The Protestant churches were rebellion against that by the Anunnaki. <laughs> this, and it, it breaks my heart because these are the things, the only little grains of spiritual identification that we have had left to grasp, to, to keep a hold on our concept that we have a God someplace, that we're you know, part of something larger. They have infiltrated the spiritual and the holy teachings. They've put their own names on them and their own agendas. That's why with the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, how they used to go kill everything that didn't agree with it, it was a political machine. They have all been. What they have done with Islam is the same thing. It is a political machine. And boy, do some of them like to play that to the hilt like they're doing right now, like the Taliban. The Taliban are in trouble because they didn't want to join the United Resistance. Because who's incarnated in Taliban bodies are the Omicron Draconians, most of them. And right now they're not very popular because they're not joining the United Resistance. So, United Resistance Illuminati races are going to be motivated to make sure they go away. You're going to find some house cleanings like this happening in other countries, like in Iraq, if Iran doesn't behave itself, they'll go there too. What you're watching is a fighting between races, even fighting between groups within, say, t take Afghan, you know, the Afghanis. They've been fighting with each other. If they don't fight with something else, they're fighting with each other. That's because there's several different groups of Leviathan races there and a bunch of humans thrown in among them. The humans usually get caught in the crossfire because it's usually the Leviathan races that end up in positions of political control. Why? Because they take it. All right. They fight, they kill things until they get themselves in power. And that's how they got in power in our country too. Our country was founded by Leviathan races. And that's unfortunate. But we were founded by the Freemason Illuminati movement. If you look back into records that they have on who George Washington was affiliated with, who Thomas Jefferson was affiliated with, our wonderful founding fathers. Now there were good guys here. They didn't know half of the stuff they were affiliated with. Some of them did, but not to a heavy degree, but they knew they were Freemasons. And they knew that was a mystical society that withheld certain knowledge that they had that had to do with Atlantis, that had to do with ancient Egypt. They withheld it from the general populations and they used it in a lot of little psychic tricks that they picked up along the way to mess with people. They would have a thing where they'd come up and they'd say, hello, how are you? And they'd just tap you on the shoulder. You got implanted. They knew how to do this consciously. All right, there are things in our history that we don't realize America was a good country. It was intended to be a good country. It was going to be a battleground from the start because you had Maji Grey lines here that were holding down the fort since Atlantis. Some of the American Indian lines were Grey line angelic humans and indigos that were here to hold down the fort. That's why everybody tried to get rid of them. Who tried to get rid of them? The two competing lines that came over. You had your Anunnaki Freemason lines that came over from Europe, and you had your Draconian lines that came over from Europe fighting with them. We can take it right into the Civil War. We had the Yankees and the Rebels. At that point, you had the Yankee, the, uh, Yankee Anunnaki and the Rebels down south with the Drac agenda. But these are people that get motivated by certain little groups that are in front of them. Most of them are humans. 
but they end up following Illuminati agendas because Illuminati get themselves positioned through birthing into certain family lines to keep themselves in power positions. So literally all of our political events have been connected to this undercurrent of what's going on in, you know, in, the, uh, in the Illuminati races. So this is some of the stuff that's affiliated with here. I could have gone further on these, but I didn't have time where we could like take it right down into who does the Course in Miracles and who does this and who does that. Because literally everything out there on the bookshelves, particularly the channel stuff, is attached to somebody, to one of these agendas. Some of them are, are decent ones. Some of them used to be good ones until they broke the Palladian Syrian agreements in 1992. Then they decided that they were going to take the in that they had with humans and take it in a different direction. So at this point, you look around and say, gosh, it's not just the, the old holy books that have been compromised, but the stuff that's coming through that we started to trust, oh, the New Age movement, finally, it's going to get us out of the dogmas of the old stuff that we could feel the dogma was not right, right? Then there's this whole line of stuff coming out. UFO movement, New Age movement. That's the new infiltration angles coming from both sides. Total polar opposites meeting in the middle in mainstream. <coughs> now, <coughs> the Adeticon reptilians, these, aren't, these guys aren't as bad as the Amicron draconians. They're more reasonable. Draconians just want to dominate and they will just move through and push through and stomp on anything that's in their way to do it whenever they can. But because they're not, they don't have that 11th strand advantage that their competitors, the Anunnaki, have, they tend to get themselves stepped on a lot because the Anunnaki are strategists. They, can, they think more into how to get things where they'll, they'll wrangle things around and they'll set, you know, set things up where they have like races they don't want in their way take care of themselves and get themselves out of their way. The Draconians are just more direct. They'll go in and invade and try to take you over where the other ones that think, they, they win with their brain and they position things tend to wipe out the Draconian races a lot. You see this, this, this kind of fighting in the Middle East all the time. It's usually between the different factions of the Adedicron and the Omicron and some of the, uh, the uh, Anunnaki groups constantly trying to kill each other. Our whole history of war has been these guys trying to kill each other, dragging human tribes around with them. All right, we have reptilian um, Odetacron. They're different. They're, are, they're an avian reptile strain. They're from Alnalam, Orion. And they, some of the uh, Odetacron, uh, Omicron uh, Draconians live on Alnalam with them also. Some of them get along with each other, some of them don't. So you'll see... Um, alliances between Omicron and Odetacron, and then you also see groups of Omicron and Odetacron that fight each other and try to kill each other. These guys, the associations down here are kind of interesting. You have in the Omicron uh, Draconians, you have the Knights Malta, Knights of Malta, which is an ancient you know, group that came up, and it's still here. I think it's a family line. Um, you have the KKK. Now, there's other ones affiliated with KKK, too, but the Ku Klux Klan guys, these guys are affiliated with those. Roman Catholic. Islamic religion, certain factions. Now, the majority of the Roman Catholic thing has been taken over by Omicron Draconian. They've been running for, for 100 years now, Draconian agenda. And the Anunnaki completely got kind of squeezed out of that whole deal before they had certain holdings within it. The Knights, the Knights uh, Templar used to work with the Roman Catholic Church, but then they got into it, Knights Templar or Anunnaki. So at this point, you have Draconians running the Catholic Church. Now, the poor Pope doesn't know this. He doesn't have access to this information, and they're certainly not going to tell him. Why? Because he's a pope on a string. People are puppets here to these guys, and they, do, they, they follow ancient books, and they praise this God and that God, say a bunch of prayers in different languages that they think they know what they mean. They don't know. When you say tones, you're doing stuff to your DNA. You're activating DNA or implants. They've been having people do prayers, and you know how the is Islamic people have been taught to worship a black cube that's sitting out in Mecca and to do all these sound tones repeatedly. What they're doing is reinforcing the reversed codes that, they pick, that their race has picked up from being infiltrated by the draconians. The people don't realize this, and that's what's so, so sad about it, because Muslims are trying to be good people and to serve God. Christians are trying to be good people and to serve God. Buddhists are trying to be good people and to serve God. They have taken a core human desire and instinct, which is to know the self and to be a part of the universe and know your place within it. And they have abused us with it and they have abused it. That's why it's important that... And I'm really, I, I really like this group because none of you have gone into that... Um, some people get really defensive. Like, I'm not going to listen to anything you have to say unless you tell me that God's name is Jehovah. Or unless you tell me that Christ died on the cross, you're wrong. If, it, if I'm not going to listen to anything you say, you're definitely wrong if you won't tell me Christ died on the cross. 
fine. Have your Savior crucified if it makes you happy. <laughs> but, but, I mean, it takes courage to, get, to, to let go of what we've been programmed to believe and to use our brains, finally, and say, look at what's been done here. How dare anybody come in and take the most sacred aspects, our gene code, our bodies, our planet, and our sacred spiritual teachings, and do what they have done here. It's enough to say, okay, you know, maybe I don't like this, and I'd rather believe in something white, love, and clueless that feels happier. But it creates a core spiritual anger that's not a rage that you'll hurt people with. It's a commitment and a conviction that there is a right and there is a wrong somewhere. And something about this is very wrong. So it gives you a strength where you say, I'm going to find progressively as I go through me, through my connection with Source, what that rightness is. And I am not going to let the wrong run my life anymore. And if that means I'm going to stand up to a bunch of people who are controlling this planet, you're not going to stand up and be a terrorist. You're not going to stand up and go kill people. That's not the way to work it. You stand up and do what humans were here to do, which was run frequency, peacefully, lovingly, because that's what will fix it. But it gives you the commitment when you see how the amazing story. I mean, when we're watching Leave it to Beaver back in the 50s, boy, it wasn't Leave it to Beaver. We had X-Files going on right underneath it in our, in our real life. So we're watching Leave it to Beaver and like the Cleavers and everybody's getting along really nice and hunky-dory, perfect little family, nuclear family program. And meanwhile, we have Zed has taken over the government. You have the government in the United States itself breaking the Constitution progressively using the banking systems, you know, messing with the banking laws, taking over the treasury, making a, a private interest uh, corporation out of what we call the Federal Reserve. This stuff is unconstitutional. Nobody bothered to notice. So is forcing you to pay taxes. Nobody bothered to notice that either. But are these things worth standing up and getting yourself in trouble for, fighting? No. You know why? Because you're taking on a Goliath that you can't take down that way, but it can step on you that way. Some things, it's like choose your battles carefully. If you want to make an issue on not paying taxes, let's say, because you're going to be a patriot, there's a whole movement about doing that. The patriot people are right. The government has broken the Constitution of the United States. Unfortunately, it's the government that upholds the law of the United States. What court are you going to take them to? You know what I mean? And if you aggravate them enough and get enough people behind you to aggravate them more, what are they going to do to you? All of a sudden, you're going to find yourself with a very big tax bill or some... <coughs> Yeah, really. Yeah, so it's like, why bother fighting the little battles? Because you're not. All you're going to do is get your energy drained and put yourself on a hit list. You don't have to fight aggressively in an anti stance. What we need to do is realize we don't have to fight directly. What we need to do is run frequency, and that will accomplish the rest. It's kind of like standing and doing what we're here to do, not worrying about countering every move that the opposition is making, get done what we need to do, and we will be successful here. And that's all it is. That's why we, if we approach it with love, when I look at like, you know, Mr. Bush and the other people that run the governments, I don't have anything against these people, even if they aren't human. You know, some of them are, some of them aren't. You know, I don't really care. They're being played just as well. The people in MJ-12, which was Majestic 12, the first group of contactees in government places that was created in the 1930s. These people got involved with something over their head and ended up terrified. They realized that their treaties were totally nullified and now they were the pawns of a bunch of ETs that literally, literally terrified them. We need to not, not do the hatred thing, to point fingers, to blame. You want to blame somebody, point them this way, up toward these invisible things that have been flying around here for the last several hundred thousand years that are messing with us, because that's where the blame is. And if you want to point blame past that, Go back to gene codes that get messed up, and they weren't messed up on purpose. So you get blame kind of, it's like a, a balloon that loses the air in it. There's no place to put it. It doesn't matter who did it, why they did it, whose fault it is. It helps you to understand so you know how to position yourself, what to look out for. But you need to realize, too, you can love everything in the universe, even the things that are acting horribly. If you look at them, especially like people that are parents, you know how if you have a child, and that child, you love that child to bits, but it does something really, really awful, really, really bad, you learn, and, and sometimes you might have like an Indigo 3 child, and they have lots of challenges with their gene codes, and they may do things all the time to drive you absolutely crazy, you and the teachers and anybody else around you. But you learn as a parent 
to not hate the child, but not condone the behavior. So there's a system that's usually used with children that you devise certain ways of, oh no, this is a boundary, excuse me, you are going to learn this boundary. You don't go killing them because they were bad. You don't lock them in a closet and torture them because they were bad. You realize the limitations of how much can they understand and how much they can't. And you try to devise a way to handle them individually where you can say, all right, these are the behaviors we need, we're trying to help you develop and this is where you are. You try to find, and it's a horribly long process working with even children on that level. This is really the approach. If you're not going to drive yourself crazy and get all sorts of hatred going inside yourself, what's really important is to look at the Illuminati guys and even the fallen angelic guys. They're very intelligent and they used to be saying, forgive them for they know not what they do. Oh, yes they do. They know exactly what they're doing. They're doing it on purpose. But, to do things like they do on purpose requires a sickness. It requires mental illness. And that's what they're dealing with. You can be brilliant and a genius and be psychotic at the same time. And that's what we're dealing with with these guys. So it helps you if you can start out on that level right there, where you don't have to say, I hate these guys, I'm going to blame them, go get them. Mm, that's not the solution. The hate's going to be in you, and it's going to bring more of, that, more of them and their negativity to you. If we can approach it, like realizing we're healers on this planet. Humans were put here as healers, and these were a group of very sick beings. Now, right now, the very sick beings are like the psychos that took over the hospital. And somehow the hospital, or planet Earth, has to be brought back under control, or they're going to blow up the hospital and take it over and use it in their matrix. So you can't just say, oh, well, I'll let them just be and let them walk all over you and give you field implantation and con you every time they open their mouth, because this is the type of stuff you'll get from people who are possessed by them or people who are working with them. So it's a very fine balance. Now, when we go through the other groups we get to, re to get into, it gets really confusing. When you get into the Anunnakis, the Anunnaki are one of the most diversified race groups. They have whole bunches that don't like each other. There's the pure strain ones. We were the first created, and then you guys got mixed with that over there. We don't like you. They're like race supremacists. They think they're better Anunnaki than the other ones because of their gene code. I mean, we get into some of this wild stuff. So we have, I'll go through these a little bit quicker. We have Omicron Draconian. We have Odeticron Reptilian. Okay, the APIN systems they go with, the Dragon APIN system, implant in the grids, little microchip, so, you know, hardware actually, it's more hardware than software, that's put in the grids. They have a matrix called the Dragon, and tomorrow I will have the drawings done that show you some of the main ones on the map as far as where they extend. And if you were coming in from outer space in a spaceship that had um, photoson uh, photoradionic detection, scanning equipment, which is a type of physical equipment, you would be able to see them light up and they would look like the forms, like literally the, the ball of the earth would be stretched out flat like a map and you would see the diagram that literally shows their faces sometimes. All right, so they have the, the dragon and that one has a st very strong influence all through China and going through Japan and Mongolia and it always has. These are these were put in in the Atlantean periods, anywhere from 25,500 BC up to 10,500. Okay, so BC. So, okay, down here the the uh, Odetokron reptilians they tend to work with the uh, Zeta races that are down below, them, and they use the Falcon APIN system, which is primarily the Zetas. The Zetas created it, but the Odetokron reptilians tend to use that one. Sometimes they'll work with the Omicrons and use the Draconian, but they more so like to work with the Zetas. Now the uh, the Odetokron reptilians are avian reptile. Think kind of like gargoyle. You know, the gargoyle things, kind of like reptiles with these wingy things. Think about bats with longer legs, you know, things like that. <laughs> Reptile bats with long legs. <laughs> yeah. What's really funny is you can start to see these things. When you go, UFO conferences are the greatest places to do it. If you want to try out your D4 vision, put up your Maharic seal and go to one of these places and just hang out in a lobby where you see the different speakers roaming around and stuff. And close your eyes and see if you can see better. You will be amazed. It is literally like the United Federation of Planets right there. You, you see things that you never thought a thing could look like that. There's little short things. There's fat squat things. There's big tall things. Some look like dragons. Some look like insects. Some look like beetles. It's amazing what you start to see. And you also start to see some that look like very tall, lean humans. They're the Iani. They hang around with some of us too, but you won't find them hanging in people's fields like possession. You might find them hanging out over their shoulder, like over standing over here, which means you have a guardian crew with you. I do that a lot. I've had people say, I saw them behind you, because I wouldn't doubt it. Because you know? <laughs> they hang out there sometimes. So now when you get into if you if you start seeing something that looks like an upright dragon moth, 
you'll know you're dealing with a, somebody who has an Omicron draconian with them. If you're dealing with Odetocron reptilian, you would see something that was more short and squat. They kind of do this. They have this, this posture that's kind of weird. Their bu little butt sticks out, and they have little tails, and they bounce. Right? They, they do. I mean, I, I've seen these things. I've seen people, like, seen them inside people that they possessed, and they're the weirdest looking little things. They, they're some kind of mutant reptile with wings that bounces. They're really interesting. <laughs> and they have kind of like, oh, what was that movie? Um, Gremlins. Remember the Gremlin movie? Anybody remember that, that, those kind of like <laughs> faces? They, were, they have faces kind of like that. I mean, these are the shapes they have. Not everything in the universe looks like us, you know? In fact, even we don't look like us when our DNA is working the right way. Humans are much taller. They're much leaner, like just a, a general lean type thing. There's less division in difference between male and female. We have difference, but it's not as pronounced as it is right now. And there's just a lot of things we look different when our DNA goes back to where it's supposed to be. Right now, we look more animal-like than we were supposed to because there are certain things that are being repressed in the DNA template that create chemical combinations that aren't natural because there are certain pieces of the template missing that create one chemical instead of another. So they've literally chemically altered us from the inside out. Right now, we resemble what's called Homo sapien 2, which is a mutation of Homo sapien 1, which came out of the uh, Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon lines that were the original lines that were used. They were Anunnaki slave race that was used to create the hybridization program. So people who are of Illuminati descent actually did come out of the Neanderthal to Cro-Magnon to Homo sapien lineup, but humans didn't. So there's all these affiliations. We start to understand who the heck we are. And then we sit there and figure out, okay, who am I? Am I an Illuminati? Am I a human? What am I? It leaves a whole bunch of new questions. And the important thing to realize is it doesn't matter. It matters to know, but it doesn't matter. It's not a wrong versus right. You're not a bad person if you happen to have an Illuminati gene code. What it means is there are, there's certain support you need for that gene code so the fallen angelics don't mess with you and you can get what you need to be able to go into a Christos ascension pattern. It takes a little longer because you have to regenerate strand 12 where a human would come in with that imprint. But it doesn't mean that you're a lost cause, that you're a bad person, that you should feel guilty or lowly or pathetic because you're not. You have the, you have the ability to become Christed too. Now, I know the people that come to these workshops. I don't think, the only Illuminati I've ever seen come to these workshops came specifically for spying purposes. They were not there to learn, and you could tell very easily. They weren't there to learn. They're just there watching me. All right? They weren't interested in the material. I've not had anybody interested in the material who actually said, hmm, I could do something with this. I haven't had any Illuminati do that yet. But they have told me that because of the game getting so close to the end of it and the Illuminati are realizing that they're in big trouble, that they're just going to be, they're expendable, and they're going to be, they're going to kill them too at the end of this if they help them win it. There's a bunch of people of Illuminati descent who are going to be guided to, you know, to, to this work in order to, their, what's happening is their, their avatar levels are deciding they want to stay on this side of the phantom matrix. They're petitioning for redemption contracts. So they're going to guide their people into us. So people working with this, we need to understand that we have to, that we need to be able to hold love in our hearts for the Illuminati people because they're trying to, a lot of them are trying to get out too. And if we go in all Illuminati or bad, we're going to, you know, we just have like this shut them out vibe. That's, we're not going to help ourselves heal and we're not going to help them either. <coughs> now, when we get to the, uh, um, let's see, do I need to do this? No, okay. I'll go down here to the Zeta Regalians. Now, there, the Zephelium word after that is called Zephelium, Z-E-P-H-E-L-I-U-M. That is the original race that what we call the little Zetas, you know, those gray things came out of. The gray things are a mutated version of it. It was created by cloning because a long, long time ago, the Zephelium race, which were big blue things, they had big blue kind of squared off heads and strange looking things. They had the equivalent of a nuclear war to the point where their whole race line was genetically wiped out. And what they did was they tried to continue their race line through cloning and it progressively got more messed up and more messed up and reduced the form and it mutated the heck out of them where they ended up being what we call the Zetas. And there's different types, those little gray things with the kind of funny looking heads and the slanty eyes. They didn't originally start out looking like that. But the Zeta Regalians, there's various types of Zetas. Whole bunches of Zetas decided they didn't want to get involved 
with this big superpowers war that was building here in 1983, and they entered amnesty contracts and redemption contracts. They just wanted out. So the one group that was left is the largest group. They're called the Zeta Regalians. They're the most militant of the whole bunch. They run a draconian agenda. They're buddies with the Omicrons and the Odeticrons, and they're, <coughs> they're the ones that made treaties with our governments in the 1930s. Okay, and really have been running things since the 1930s until the 1970s came up when the, uh, the Anunnaki started giving them a run for their money again. Okay, let's say they, um, the Zetas had created in, I think, 10,500 BC, they created the Falcon APIN system. And they, are the one, they created the Falcon wormhole, and then they created the Falcon APIM, APIN system to work from the Falcon uh, wormhole. That was created in the period that's called the Luciferian Conquest of 10,500 BC that was still Atlantis before they made Atlantis disappear. Okay? These guys, some of the things they're affiliated with, it's interesting, their associations, place a thing called the Thule Society, which is still a society, that runs here, all right? Thule Society, anything affiliated with the Al Alistair Crowley metaphysical teachings, um, the, anything affiliated with the Black Sun mystical schools, um, Golden Dawn mystical schools, the Enochian Watchtowers mystical schools, the Nazi movement, metaphysical pagan ideology distortions. They got into a bunch of the different, like some Wiccans and different pagan movements. They infiltrated different versions of them. So not all the pagan movements are just associated with them, but they are one of the things they infiltrated. Um, they were closely with the Necromaton and Dramis and with some of the uh, Omicron Draconian and Odetochron reptilian groups. So they work with these guys and also the, ne the Necromaton that we'll get into down here. These were those, uh, what was the name of that group, Florence, that, that we're talking about from Canada? Raelians, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, pay at the gate, I guess. You know? <laughs> I could do without that heaven, thank you. <laughs> yeah, these guys are, are really out there, but they're they're so like wacky that they're they're easier to spot than some of the others because they don't act normal and they don't look normal and they speak in a monotone voice like they're on Thorazine. You know? <laughs> okay, but. All right, so when we get down here, there's another group here. And it's funny, I won't, I won't name names because it's, it's useless to really do that to a big degree. But I could literally tell you, if you look at the speakers' rosters in New Age conferences and in UFO conferences, I could tell you which group each of those speakers was involved with. And I have been very disheartened to find that in the two years I've been on the circuit, I haven't found one of ours yet. There were two that were supposed to be affiliated with us that were already taken over by one of them was Draconian, one of them was an Anunnaki group. So that's where I figured, like, can I get out of here now? When I started to see what was happening here, teams I knew were supposed to be backup, where we were supposed to work together, Anunnaki teams went south, and they were standing, you know, working agendas counter to what we were working. So I haven't found anybody, but if I find any major movement out there that's doing the same thing we are, I will be very relieved. But at the moment, we're the movement. <laughs> you know? So, yeah. But there's a lot of us. I mean, they've, they've already told us indigos. There are 550,000 indigos on planet. And they're not, you know, most of them are not children. They're, they, this is the wave of, like, the pre-wave of indigos. And we're getting a whole bunch more of the babies in right now. So there's a lot that go with this group. We're not alone here. They just didn't wake up yet. So I imagine we'll have bigger workshops in two years if the place is still here. <laughs> you know? Yes. How could, we, how could we be born in that uh, soup of uh, different, uh, different races like this? How could, how could, the, uh, uh, how could the, the indigos be born out of parents that would carry the necessary code for the necessary code for the for uh, for us for, for we what we how what indigos do to get their template just like these family lines have been going for thousands of years since Atlantis and before Atlantis so have the Maji Grey lines the indigo lines all right so we literally when we're coming in as indigos we choose our parents very carefully not by because we liked you in the last incarnation but by who has what codes and they were you know they, these gene lines were kept alive since to let the, the last um, let's say upgrade to the indigo gene code was done in 22,500 BC. And that's when the Iani, that was, they were called the Iani uh, indigos. They were the next upgrade, the, the highest upgrade of them. From that point on, even though most of them got massacred during the thing called the Iani massacre, they were still certain groups that survived. And those groups 
would have children, and there are certain members of those groups who understood and who held the history. They had it in verbal tradition, and they weren't allowed to speak it because they get killed, but they knew who they were, and they, pr they protected their family lines and their race lines. There's a line that came up through the Celtics and Druidics. There's a line that came up through uh, the Egyptians. There's a line that came up through the, a big line that came up through the Essenes. There's a line that came through certain um, of the Anglo-Saxon ones, actually, that literally purged out through having enough, like uh, interbreeding with enough of the right coding, literally got rid of the distortions that were in certain race lines. So they're here. That's how we can get born as indigos now into this, this alphabet soup of a mess that we call the human gene code. There are still specific family lines. The, uh, the uh, Illuminati do that too. There are Anunnaki lines here that have been kept pretty clear. There are uh, draconian lines that have been kept pretty clear. One, one of the biggest invasion spots was the people of what are called the Hiberu race. Now, they're different from Hebrew. Hebrew and Hiberu are two different things. A Hebrew person is an angelic human. It was an angelic human cloister race line, which meant it combined two different angelic human races. One were called the Hiberu, and they were uh, a root race strain. And they combined them with what was called the Melchizedek cloister race line. That became the Hebrew race line. They had extra coding. They're like an advanced race line. Now the Hiberu races were infiltrated by just about anybody that could get their hands on them. So you have these really interesting things happening with the people who call themselves Jewish because th there's various forms of what that means. Jewish is a faith but most people that are, that are taking their faith seriously, they realize that there's a real strong protection of the gene lines involved with the teachings of the Jewish faith. This is because those, they were supposed to be to keep certain race lines clear. And those weren't the teachings from the Emerald Covenant. They were the teachings of both the infiltration on the Anunnaki and the Draconian side. They were actually trying to keep the Hebrew people, they, they blended everybody into the Hebrew race, human race, overtook the identity and the teachings of the Hebrew peoples called themselves Hebrews, but really you have Hiberu and Hyksos. And they're all calling themselves Jewish people right now. So this has happened in a lot of different things. I just wanted to, I just wanted to point out to you what, it's an alphabet soup. So there have been angelics and fallen angelics incarnating on this planet all along through their specified gene lines. And what's kind of interesting, if we can look at this whole drama, forget the word human, because right now it's a very misleading word. It's a word that's meant to cover up all sorts of truths so we can't figure stuff out. Let's go back to the word angels, because what is happening here is we have basically two divisions of races, with lots of little divisions among them. One, angelics, and two, fallen angelics. They are basic categories of people that are here because we were all angelic races of one sort or another which means we came from other levels of density that were not always physically solid and right now you have the guys working to do the Christos realignment mission which is the mission of restoring the natural uh, D12 pre-matter blueprint to the planet so it will stop being raided by the Phantom Matrix people and you have the ones representing Phantom Matrix within that symbol classification of angelics and fallen angelics as far as who's inhabiting the planet you have all of these different race strains. What's interesting to know is angelics and fallen angelics also incarnate as different types of plants, as different types of animals, as different types of minerals and chemical combinations. Yes. Right now, we are like a zoo on this planet. We have Anunnaki plants and animals. We have draconian plants and animals. Hmm? Within the same species? Yeah. Yeah, like take birds, for example. All right? Bad birds and good birds. Yeah, but they're not really bad birds. They're genetically disadvantaged. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to find the politically correct term for that. You know what I mean? Challenge. Challenge. Yeah, and that's what it is. I mean, you can't say that's a bad bird and that's a good bird. Yeah, but that bird that has a challenge in its genetic code and in its consciousness may do things like you know, like attack other birds or like have a real um, carnivorous appetite, whereas the other types won't. You know, there's a, you can sense in animals. If you think about it, take even dogs or take cats, basic everyday animals that people deal with a lot. You can take 10, line them up, go out and pet each one, and you will get a different feeling off each one. Some of them you'll find, oh, that feels like a lovely, sweet, little cuddly one that's nice 
mm, that one feels kind of mean, or that one feels scared. You know, you'll be able to feel these differences. And what you're feeling very often, you can get the same thing. You can look into a certain type of dog's eyes and you will find that same blank stare that you get from the terrorist's eyes. You ever look in a shark's eyes? You know those pictures they take underwater? They're not angelic human incarnates, that's for sure. They have one thing in mind, eat. <laughs> Anything that crosses their path, that is a draconian form. The consciousness that forms most sharks is draconian. There have been a couple little upgrades put in there to try to help the sharks evolve into something higher. Dolphins, everybody thinks they're great, right? Everybody thinks, oh, the nice old dolphins, you can swim with humans. Well, half the reason most of the dolphins want to swim with humans these days is because the Anunnaki who live in them have been impulsing them to swim near humans, to be near them, so they can sonically mess with their DNA. Not all dolphins are like that. Some of the dolphins are out of the Founders Christos races. So you have to tell by feel, not by look, not by species. But it applies to everything. Think about the stuff you eat. About what plant, animal, derivatives you eat. You are taking into yourself, into your scalar template, a scalar template from something else. You are either going to help yourself be more human or more draconian or more Anunnaki by the substances you choose to eat and to use. Any what? Any what? I didn't hear that. <laughs> I think there are. Yeah, I, you know, I, I get really, I can feel it with organic forms, right? But when it comes to these, these, these amalgamated chemical monstrosity foods that we've come to call just basic food and junk food and stuff, it's very hard to tell who the heck it belongs to because it's like it mutated into its own form of something that wasn't before. And it's very hard to trace its original signatures. It doesn't mean you can't eat things like that. It means that when you're eating, it's very good to activate your D12 frequency, use your palm chakras, and be mad it for a little bit before you put it in. Because it'll straighten out any distortions in the template. Then you're okay. But there's these things that people don't usually think about. You don't even think about, am I eating something draconian or am I eating something out of Naki, you know? <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. They're doing all sorts of things right now that are like, it's like the Atlantean um, horrors revisited, what's happening in the science community right now. They're doing the same things, combining stuff that they don't know, even things that help, that look like they're good, even things that save our lives, like organ transplants. You know, we're not against them. We don't take a stance against stuff in Azurite Temple. We point out what we know about it and whether it works in your system well or not, but we say it's up to you to do what you want with it. Organ transplants, for instance, is really, it can do, it's the same kind of concept as genetic engineering, where you're taking a piece of one thing, putting it in with a piece of another. You're combining two scalar templates that were not originally part of each other. They may or may not be compatible. Science plays with the outside, so they have no idea what they're doing with the scalar templates. Now, when it comes to organ transplants, they will, they can save lives. But what you've done is you've taken on literally a part of the template of another person, which will include its karmic pattern, which will create a mutation in your DNA template, which may mean you have to incarnate over here, down here to clear this in several other lifetimes. Most people don't realize that. We're so afraid of dying that we'll do anything to keep our bodies alive because we forget where we go when we get out of them. God, if we remembered, we'd all be dead. We'd have run. <laughs> be out of here. <laughs> <laughs> that was my question. Blood friend, yeah. They do the same thing. But what if we as we're doing our work and we give blood and it goes into the body of the ones that don't have the Yeah, That helps. All right, but it's still it, you can do it with energy. There's something about, and I'm not sure because I haven't opened the text files on it, but there was always a sacred thing about keeping your blood to yourself. And I don't mean to, like, take a stance. Because I, I watch, like, when, ho when horrible disasters happen, like we had at the Trade Center. And a lot of people would have died if they didn't receive blood transfusions. That's why I don't take a personal stance on it. I would, in any given moment, knowing that, okay, this is going to, let's say I'm supposed to keep my blood to myself, and let's say that I might even have something in there that may be not compatible with that person. I would still ha want to have, as an individual, the right to decide for that particular case in that moment whether I was going to take the chance 
with that because sometimes rules are meant to be broken or bent. Well, I, you know what I mean? Excellent. Yeah. Now that is good. No. We could actually help by doing that, but there's something about reducing the amount of uh, something to do with the blood crystals. There's a certain level of blood crystallization that's needed to do ascension. All right. To and when you give portions of your blood away, it takes the body uh, quite a bit of time to make more of that. So it, it's more of, I think that's why, there, I know there was an ancient rule of basically just how things work. It wasn't somebody made you do this, but if you wanted to keep your systems intact, you kept what was inside on the inside. You know what I mean? As much as possible. But I would say in this particular situation, especially since we're going into a, a time frame when we may have more terrorist, terrorist activity, we may have natural disasters popping up left, right, and sideways, where there are going to be people that are going to die. If you feel like you want to give blood, we don't say don't. We do highly recommend certain things that for your own safety are, you're, you're better off without. But I wouldn't say if you get in an accident or you're in one of these you know, terrorist attacks and you're bleeding to death, it's still your choice whether you're going to accept blood or not. Sometimes you can. If you have knowledge of the Maharic seal, fine, accept it if your body needs to have the blood replenished. However, run the Maharic seal through it. All right. You know, when you're laying there getting your transfusion, just right, see it going silver, pale silver light running through. So there's not a concrete rule where, oh, do this and don't do that. That's one thing I like about these teachings. Everything belongs in these teachings, and you have huge freedom of how you want to interact with it or what you want to do with it. There are certain things that are detrimental to your health, particularly if we're facing a situation where rapid DNA activation and having the body being able to hold frequency is important. Like if you want to get, if we happen to go into Plan B evacs and you want to be able to get through with your body through a Stargate, there are certain things you're better off not doing. One of them would be receiving an organ transplant. Now, now It can do a couple of things. It may, it, if it's a person that has enough of a human imprint in the strands, like a high, even if it's an Illuminati that has a hybrid imprint, if there's enough of the human part of that hybrid left in the template, it can actually help to stimulate it. However, if it's completely a reversed matrix, which would be completely Illuminati, they don't have any of the human element left in it, it would actually create a reaction to the blood, where it, you know, the blood could kill them, literally. So that goes back to their business. Yeah, it's like you know, whatever. If you decide to have a blood transfusion, um, you're not going to blame the person who gave you the blood if something goes wrong. You made the choice. You accepted the responsibility. Them too. Okay. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I go on these tangents. You know, One, two, three. One thing that was used uh, a lot in the in the twenties and the thirties. It was salt water. Mm -hmm. A certain amount, uh, uh, to a, uh, salted to a certain amount, right. injected in the in the body. Within 20 minutes, it becomes new blood. Ooh, and it's very inexpensive. Yeah. That sounds a lot healthier, actually. Yeah. It's healthier. Yeah. Uh, 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 of course, uh, the, the only drawback is that you must not lose too much blood. Right. But you can replace blood by uh, by this combination of salt water. Right. Within 20 minutes, you have new blood. Huh. You know, it's interesting, too. If we get really good at cathara healing, and I'm not that good at it yet, this has the potential to literally regenerate limbs. In the ancient Atlantean times, when we had more knowledge and more DNA to work with, we were able to do amazing healing things with the cathara healing, using light and sound frequencies. We could regenerate limbs. You could bring organs back if something happened to an organ. You could bring it back to its original divine blueprint you know, very, very quickly. So there are healing things. You could, you could make blood grow. If you could make like arms and legs grow, you could make blood grow. So there, these, are, these are almost like technologies we have to deal with in this middle zone right now where we're going from being a mutated cultural society on this planet back into the advancements that we used to have once upon a time. So I, I just always recommend, you need to feel it out personally, how, what level you want to participate. If you, if you, you know, have a liver that's going and you're going to die and not get to stick around and see how this all comes out in your body, you may just decide to have a liver transplant. What the heck? Realize when you do it, you're taking on part of somebody else's pattern and it, maybe it's a good part. Maybe there's not a lot of stuff that will have to be processed. It doesn't hurt to run pale silver frequency through it. <laughs> Clear it first, just like when you eat, you know? So, anyway, yeah. <laughs> okay, you had it up before. Um, when I was reading...
thing about um, the 1930s, how they made treaties with the U.S. government, we're 99% asleep. Why would they even try to deal with us since they think we're so compelled in a sense? They need us. They need us to get to a certain level. First of all, we're intelligent enough to, if they just tried over, take over, and there's more of us and less of them, even though they have big bad weapons, there's still enough of us to be a real nuisance. Plus, they need us on planet. So they couldn't get rid of us and, and just like, you know, why do they have to even make treaties with us? Because they need to position us in certain places to get this done the way they want to. So it was a needing us factor. And that's a good thing that they have because we're still alive since Atlantis. They would have got rid of us a long time ago if they didn't need us. You think I'd be talking about this stuff openly? You know, I mean, gosh, in the old days you have to, used to have to like hide in people's basements where they had these specially built rooms that nobody knew were there to talk about this kind of, any kind of information like this. Right now I'm in their faces, literally. I mean, we sell the product to anybody who wants them. I'm sure their Illuminati spotters have a nice collection of our material. <laughs> but I, it, it's, it's all right at this point to let the information go out and we need to begin doing it. There is a protection factor. If they didn't need me, they would have shut me up the minute I started to speak. They need me. They need you. They need all of the indigos that have the highest coding. That 50,000, there's 50,000 level one indigos. They're the ones that have the top security codes that go with the last set of frequencies and the grids that have to be released. If they want those grids open, they need to be nice to them. Not necessarily nice, but they need to keep their bodies alive on the planet. So they can't do too much to us. Now humans, humans are the ones that right now, they have created too many. And I say they created humans, they did it by seeding twists and lies into our religious doctrines that told us to go forth and multiply, that told us that birth control was, it, it was wrong, it was a sin. What this has done was create, we're, we've been like rabbits <laughs> since Atlantis. They're just, we're just popping up all over the place because they wanted to create more bodies, more Illuminati bodies and more human bodies. Because if you got the humans on a reverse DNA matrix, you would get the reverse coding in the planetary grids. They'd open it on a reverse, just what you want them to do. So now they've got all these extra little bodies running around all over with human souls and some of them with Anunnaki souls, some of them with draconian souls. And now they're activating on a 12 code. The humans are activating on a 12 code and there's too many of them. They'll hit critical mass and they won't be able to get through the gates anymore because we'll have the Templar back. So now this is why we're going into war because they're in a real rush to start reducing human populations. Indigos have a safety valve because they have certain levels of coding that and there's not as many of them. You know, there's only 550,000, uh, 500, yeah, 550,000 indigos on the planet now where there's, you know, billions of other people. So they have to get rid of some of those billions if they expect to keep the, the, the grids available for, you know, lower than D, D12 manipulation. And they can't do D12 manipulation. Okay, let me, I want to try to get through these because I want to get to the other section, but I don't want to miss any on these because it's important to get an idea of who we're, who we're facing because these are the people, these are the beings you're going to see behind the eyes of a lot of people. People you might know right now, people you might meet on the street. It, it's one of the, bless you, it's one of the least fun parts of the whole thing. It, I, I felt very, I, I must say, when I first really was given the information to see what's really going on, my first reaction was I felt raped of my innocence. That's what I felt. All of a sudden, I had this huge pain inside where I, once you know a certain level of stuff, you can't go backwards and pretend you don't, even if you'd like to. You can say, I won't believe it, I refuse to. It will not at you. You'll start to see stuff. Now. You know it goes with that. So denial doesn't work. But there was a huge sadness in me when I realized that I couldn't just go into any situation with humans any place on the planet and just love them to bits and trust them and, and, and think that, oh, well, well, they're humans, so they'll, you know, they'll have some degree of compassion and they'll treat me nice too, right? Well, if it's a human that doesn't have a human inside of it, it may not treat you nice no matter how much you love it or how nice you are. It may lie to your face. It may kill you when you turn your back on it. This was the part that, that the part of the teachings that were very hard for me, because that innocence where you just want to like people and, and you know spread love and healing around, or at least be just a good person and treat other people like good people. All of a sudden, you have to start looking and see what lives in there, and realizing that sometimes what lives in there, no matter how nice you want to be, it may smile in your face, but will do something to cause harm to you. This is the hard part. The, one of the biggest tricks with this is, and I have seen this so many times, you get somebody that has field possession. 
even if it's not all the way in. Sometimes they'll just hang out in the fields and use them when they want to. When it's a regular person, most of the time. But then something will come through and move through them. And they'll usually act out of character when that happens. They'll do something nasty. or they'll do, They do this with kids a lot. Indigo type threes, they do this with them a lot to, you know, to trigger them to do wacky stuff like shoot kids in schoolyards. But one of the hardest things is when you realize there's this dual presence happening where there's still a portion of this person as a person so you can't react to it with total I'm not going to get involved there with defense because you feel bad for the person but then there's this other thing that works through them and it'll talk through their mouth and it'll look through their eyes and it'll mess with your field if, it gets, if you get close enough so there's this real maturity level that has to happen when you come into realizing the, the nature of this game and it's not that you just start hiding in your closet and don't let anybody come to your door you know what I mean like go away all of you you know if I can't tell who you are I don't want to talk to any of you it's, it becomes, it comes right back to the self. If you're using your Maharic seal, if you're doing what you need to do to keep your biofields clear and make your connection with your higher parts and try to bring your avatar level of understanding in, and you can do this, you have this with you. It's about mechanics of how to run energy in your body and open your DNA to get more of that, oh, I get it, yeah, I am an avatar, huh? You know, where that level comes to you. From that level, you can be safe. You can walk where angels fear to, tr to, fear to tread. You can go into situations, have relationships with people that have this problem and help them. But until you know how to utterly secure your biofields, and right now it's horribly hard because there's so many psychotronics being thrown at us and everything else, but you can help people that are in that condition. It's not about rejecting them, or it's not about saying, okay, I'm sitting on a bus and that one's a drag and that one's an Anunnaki, and oh, that one's okay. You know, it's, it's almost like a party has to do that just to be aware. Okay, and then go like, okay, and I wonder, you know, if what their avatar is up to. I wonder if their avatar is doing Emerald Covenant. So that's where it neutralizes it, where you don't start to get into like categorizing and, you know, breaking people up and saying they're the good ones and they're not the good ones. Where you realize the ones that we would consider genetically challenged are very often ready to do Emerald Covenant and to be nice guys, but they have a vulnerability that if it's brought to their attention in certain ways, usually they're not open to this level of material, but we can help them with healing, bringing the D12 frequency in to surround them with that and help them to get to the point where they can become, they, they will never become human. If they didn't start out that way, they're not going to become human, but they will have hominid form. They will, have, they will be a human hybrid form, but they will still have the consciousness from where they came from originally, just like we'll have human consciousness or indigo consciousness. Mm -hmm. I understand that you said that indigo children cannot come through any of these races. Mm -hmm. um, the parent, if the parents or any of these races. They, they can, if, they're, if they're the pure strain Illuminati ones of these, they can't. What happens a lot of times, because the um, Maji races here were targets, okay, they were targets for infiltration. They would take an Illuminati race line and tried to marry it off with a Maji line to create a child out of that that would have Maji and Illuminati codes. So if it would depend on which template was stronger, be it the mother or the father's, whether the child line would come out as a primarily indigo with Illuminati overlays, which are like frequencies that are over the DNA codes, but the core code is still, you know, a, a Maji or, or a human. Or if it goes the other way, it depended literally on at conception whether the mother's template or the father's template had a higher frequency, and whichever one had the higher frequency would set the dominant pattern for the core template. So you can have people now for indigos to come in, like full indigos to come in. They're coming in. The indigos incarnate from either the uh, the reshik levels of uh, the primal sound, uh, primal light fields of den uh, density 5, dimensions 13, 14, 15, or they come in from the Ascendant Masters level, which is beyond the time matrix in the primal sound fields. <coughs> For ones and twos, level one and twos to come in, they have to find somebody that has the core Maji DNA template. It can have overlays that they, they might have picked up from the parents, picking up from their parents kind of thing. As long as it wasn't the codes themselves were Illuminati codes. So all of the indigos, one, level one and two, now in this, in this time frame, they have pure strain templates, most of them having some overlays, which are like their distortions in the template that they pick up from the, the parent gene line, you know, since the father and the mother get passed down, but they can clear them much more easily because they have a core template 
of the, the Maji line. So they're, they're at the core, their template is not compromised, which means they have the ability to their chemical DNA will manifest certain things after it clears off some of the earlier stuff. And a lot of times they'll clear that during childhood and adolescence. So by the time they go into adulthood, early 20s, and then into the 30s, they're back to their, their pure strain you know, template. Okay, so that, I think that answers the question. Yes? Sure. Really? So he, right? And it was written in thirty-seven. Yeah, yeah. Because all through the thirties, the, the the Zeta groups were doing the abductions on behalf of the Draconian agenda. Yeah. <laughs> right. That probably gave you some insight into why they had been, you know, after you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm gonna. I, I gotta get off this mylar. <laughs> okay. All right. Dracos. We're down here on Dracos. Okay, Dracos are a reptile-human hybrid. They were actually created on Earth by one of the raiding, raiding periods before Atlantis. They were created about a million years ago. And they were raids before certain things were done to the human template that wouldn't allow procreation between other strange race forms that weren't human and humans. There was this race called the Dracos that was created with a little help from genetic engineering. They look like... Um, uh, they're hominid, and they kind of have like little bodybuilders type, you know, male bodybuilder type bodies, but they're scaly. They're like kind of greenish, some of them are brownish, scaly. And they have very big, kind of like dinosaur face head things, reptile dinosaur things. And there's a couple people that I know, that there's one guy, his name is Brian, I won't, I, um, I won't go into his last name, but he works directly with them in the, on the, the <laughs> UFO circuit. And you can see them crouching around them when, in like in the, like they'll, they'll do their, what they're able to do is they can go into density too, which means they can look like do the ghost thing, where they're there but you can't see them unless you switch to D4 perception. So these guys are, they, they're hanging around a lot. Some of them are small. Most of them are large. They, they'd probably be about seven, seven feet tall and they're, they're large. They'd be scary looking to humans because they're like big li lizards. Like some of the stuff you see on Sci-Fi Channel. I think there was one show they did a while back. Was it V? I think it was called a number of years ago. Where they had a, you know, there's big nasty things. They look like humans when in the daytime. You know? <laughs> well, they're kind of like those things. In fact, I think they based that show on what was really going on. <laughs> so they kind of hang out with. They'll, they'll hang out with the Odetochron reptilians. They'll hang out with some of them. Hang out with the Omicron draconians. Some of them hang out with the Andromies. They're kind of one of those. Well, whoever seems to be winning will we'll stick with those. And there's factions among them. They're not one of the main players themselves. They're more like the gophers or the foot soldiers that the others who are in command will send out to do something and, and to do things. Down here, we get into the command central people. This one, the, Necromi, uh, the Necromaton and Dramis. These are the little masterminds behind the United Resistance and a whole bunch of other things. These are the things that people like, bless them, Alice, Alex Collier and, and a lot of those guys on the New York circuit are dealing with. They're Andromis, their beloved Andromis. Their Andromis are Necromaton, Andromis. And there are several strains. Some are the beetle people. All of them come out of the original uh, Necromaton Andromi strain, which is insectoid beetle people, which means they're kind of like hominid insectoid beetle coating. All right, like if you took the template, genetic template of a beetle, and you took it of certain other types of insectoid strains and of a hominid form, and you kind of put them all together and came out with a new thing, you get one of those. Okay. <laughs> These are the ones that were the Raelians were, were these guys, where I saw the big beetle thing inside this pretty little French lady. It was amazing. I said, what is that? I've never saw one of those. What is it? Well, I, I know now what they are. Okay. Um, they also have created their own Illuminati hybrid line, which are called the Men in Black. You know, the classic Men in Black syndrome the thing that, <laughs> that you, they even made the movie about. That they look more human. That's because they combine them with some of the Leviathan races. But they're also very, very... Um, their, their health doesn't handle the light that's on, on surface Earth very well. So their, the men in black guys tend to do the underground bases and hang out, you know, like in subterranean areas. So do the Dracos, because both of them don't react well 
to the type of solar light spectra that we have here. They'll come up and be around sometimes, but they have a tolerance level where it would start making them sick if they tried to live on surface. So the Necromaton guys have a bunch of underground bases all over the place. So do the Zeta Regalians. And recently they've all been joining all their bases up and using all their technologies and putting them together to try to make sure they get these wormholes put together so they can defeat the Guardian races. Okay, now the Necromaton and Dramit races for a long time have had their own agenda, but then they pair up with some of the others, but they have really run their own show. And they're the smart they're about the smartest of all of the races, even the Anunnaki. They're part Anunnaki, originally they start out with part Anunnaki and part certain types of draconian races, like the insectoid level of the draconian races, the fallen seraphim. So they have the D eleven strand. So they're not, they're not as uh, like as far as the D ten draconian races, they have more on the ball genetically and intellectually, mentally, because of that. And they're, they're very, they're masterminds. They're like st uh, strategi strategies, however you say that. They're very good at strategic planning. <laughs> we'll go there. Okay. Now, they come from various parts of the Andromeda system, also in, in Phantom, Phantom Matrix, and Alpha Centauri and Omega Centauri. All right. They have taken over something that used to be one of the founders' the grids. When I, when I talked about the original founders' races, the Christos founders' races, we had the Seraphi. They were one of them, Ser Seraphi Seraphim. They had put a, an uh, APIN system here that was called the Golden Eagle. And it was a particular grid, and that was really the one that they were supposed to be the ones that were trying to found this country, and the like American Indians were supposed to be helping them when it got taken over. Now, the grid that's called the Golden Eagle APIN system was taken over by the Andromi Necromaton races, and I forget when that was, I think it was around the 10,500, no, it was before 10,500 BC, before they even opened the wormholes. So the Golden Eagle grid became what's called the White Eagle. Now, anybody that's familiar with the Templar Melchizedek movement or Melchizedek priesthoods that don't bother telling you that they're Anunnaki Melchizedek priesthoods, they have the symbol of the White Eagle as their, that's the Melchizedek White Eagle. Well, it's not our White Eagle. And we're the Melchizedek Cloister, which were the ones that supposedly were the High Council that all the other Melchizedek priesthood worked with. Well, this particular group of Andromis hijacked the Golden Eagle APIN system. Call it, they, they, to put it in our faces and kind of thumb their nose at us, they call it the White Eagle, as if it was the Christos Eagle. These are the guys that run the false Melchizedek priesthood here. Now, at certain points, they've worked with the true Melchizedek priesthood, where they were entrusted with certain levels of knowledge that they wouldn't have got otherwise. And then they would leave and they would break the treaties, they'd break the Emerald Covenant, and they'd take that knowledge and they'd use it against us. That's exactly what is happening in the Melchizedek movement here. When, this, <laughs> the, the, when the stuff in Voyager's Volume 2 comes out, because we're just doing the second reprinting on Voyager's Volume 2, and just got in on time, I was going, getting to go to press, and the, the Trade Center thing happened, so my publisher said, well, can you do something little on that? Yeah, right, 150 pages later. We're exposing all of this, and we're exposing the difference between Melchizedek Priesthood and Melchizedek Cloister, because they're not going to hide under our skirts anymore, pretending that they're running good agendas. This is going to enrage a lot of people that are out there in the New Age movement. Because most of the people in the New Age movement that call themselves Melchizedeks have been trained by either Toth, the Nibiru and Egyptian Anunnaki, or these guys, the Necromantan Andromis, who are running Luciferian Antichristos agendas, trying to hijack bodies. So at this point, there's, this is, when, when this material gets out, and I can just see it like going like a virus through the internet, there's going to be a war among the Melchizedek races, and they're all going to try to beat up on me, and I don't really care because somebody has got to tell the truth at this point. You don't have to believe my truth, but I know my truth, and I'll speak it. And anybody that wants to listen is welcome. <laughs> yeah. So these guys are running. These are one of the primary forces behind the, uh, the false Melchizedek movement that's going on out there. And they have all sorts of, usually star children with very sweet names that do all sorts of different metaphysical wah-wah stuff. And a lot of it's like the light, love, and clueless movement where they teach you this much, but they don't teach you the rest, or the pieces that fill in those pieces so you can get what that much means. One of the groups love the toast groups. Bless them. They love to keep your mind excited. They will give you sacred geometries and complicated all sorts of things to keep your mental body doing all sorts of neat things, and you think you figured it out. But when you really stop and think about, okay, what can I do with this to change my life? 
Well, I know the numbers on a golden mean triangle or a golden mean spiral. Okay, what are you going to do with it? Hmm. I don't know, they didn't teach me that yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? There are things that we're being taught to do just enough so we get to mess with the grids. They're teaching us just enough Templar mechanics to get the Merkabas running very strongly on the reverse rotation so we can run, they're going to teach their groups, or try to, to run reverse round tables, but we beat them to it. We got the round table stuff down in its original form and it's already been, you know, going out there. So already there's something they have to prove us wrong and they're not going to do it. So they just have to beat up on us and call us names. But anyway, these guys, the Andromis, Necromaton, they're behind that. There's a bunch of them that side with the Anunnaki groups. They're primarily the ones behind the Melchizedek groups. There's another group of the Andromis that like each other, but they have a disagreement of opinion, whether they like Anunnaki's better or Draconian's better, because they really don't like either of them very much. So you will have Necromaton and Andromis work on both sides of the game. You'll have some of them helping the Draconian agenda races, which are those guys up there, and you'll have some helping the Anunnaki races, which are the ones down the bottom. And now at least everybody got together and they're all just working against us, so at least it's easy to keep track of them. <laughs> so these guys come from uh, the Alpha Omega Centauri. That's why they call themselves, we are the Alpha and the Omega. We are the Alpha Omega Order Melchizedek Priesthood. Yeah, they forgot the word Centauri. <laughs> okay, it's planet reference that they're talking about, not the beginning and the ending like they're trying to make it look like. Yes? <laughs> There's a couple clues, I'll tell you right now. You can't tell them by what they look like or what they wear, unless you're really good at sensing energy and you can see stuff in the fields, because they have stuff activated too, and it's hard to tell if it's reverse or not. You can tell by what they teach. Do they teach the Christ story? Do they tell you Jesus was crucified? Because if they do, they're teaching Templar Melchizedek stuff, which is the lie version. All right. Do they, let's see, that's another clue, that's one of the big ones, if they endorse the Christian story, if they endorse the whole Mother Maryism stuff, all right, that was about their hybrid that they had here. There were, there's, they actually birthed a hybrid in at the same time that Jeshua had come in. Within a couple of years, he was younger than Jeshua. Jeshua actually baptized him. And they named him Jeshua too. And they made up their story and put it in the biblical thing. And, you know, Jeshua just did his thing and did the CDD play translations. And, the, you know, um, Jeshua wrote the books of the Bible along with John the Baptist and Miriam and a bunch of Essenes where this other guy was put in. And they have used him. Now, the Templar Melchizedek will use the symbology of Jesus having crucified and now he's coming back. Right? They will use, hmm, let me see. That's one of the biggest. What's some of the others? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. They'll teach things. Right. They will teach... There's a concept here that the word was worship there. Okay. They will teach you to worship this Lord, that Lord, Lord Melchizedek, as if it's a being that's floating around up there in the cosmos that you're supposed to pay homage to and it will take care of you. They will teach you to worship things like Archangel Michael. They will teach you to surrender your power to... All sorts of different things, Maitreya, all of these things, are, all of these things that are coming out in the New Age movement are associated with these guys' teachings. Templar Melchizedek will teach you to give your power to somebody else. They will teach you nine-dimensional sciences only. They will not teach you 12-dimensional sciences. They will not teach you, in fact, some of them will teach you to be afraid of the D12 pale silver frequency. Some of them will teach you to run it on a 13 code which is actually you try to run the Christos frequency but you can only get half of it. You get about 11.5 and you can reverse it. They're trying to teach you to do it on a reverse current. They will teach you Merkaba mechanics to get you to spin your Merkaba the wrong way. They will use increments in Merkaba mechanics such as the, what is it, the 20... 34-21 ratios. Alright, these are reverse 11, base 11 mechanics actually that go with 11 strand reverse DNA. They will teach you um, Oh, when they teach you about 12-strand DNA and they give you a diagram, you will see 12 strands that form six double helixes, not 12 double helixes. Because they're teaching you just to integrate to D5 level on a reverse matrix. And they're calling that ascension. So there are little clues that if you know the metaphysical movement, you can start to be aware of, of what they're doing with that. But the big one is, the, the, the big one that's like, like a knife that just cuts right down between us. Do they endorse the Christ story? Do they tell you what's in the Bible is true? Because if they do, they're not representing 
Melchizedek cloister and they're not telling you the truth of your history. Do they tell you that Anunnaki created you? That's another part of what some of them will lead you to believe, that the Anunnaki were the superior race that were here before and they genetically engineered humans from this particular primate form that was here. They will teach you these things. Mm -hmm. They teach you the structure and function of oneness. What oneness is. Oh, yeah, the heart thing, that's a good one. They don't teach about the oneness of what's based on what the mechanics that hold it all together. Right. And the guardianship. They don't tell you what you're doing. The heart thing is a good one. Another classic, just like Christ story, this one's perfect. (laughs) Just open your heart. Right? Right, love clueless. There is some real interesting coding in here. Open your heart means what you're giving yourself the suggestion is open your fourth chakra that's connected to your astral field. Now they tell you to do this without teaching you how to run D12 Christos current so you can't steal your fields. They're telling you to go around with your heart open and let everything move through you so anything it wants can attach to you. These are some of the clues of how to tell a a Melchizedek Templar Melchizedek from a cloister Melchizedek. The cloister, the the word cloister was meant, it referred to the group of the Melchizedek ascended masters that at different times would come into this time matrix if things got too out of hand where teachings were being twisted and everybody was getting lost and messes were being made. They would come in as a group unto themselves. They very rarely, they didn't get highly involved with genetic uh, intermixing with other races. They would carry the codes and keep the codes so they would be able to bring the knowledge in from the Ascendant Master level so they could keep the information here and bring it back whenever it was needed in its pure form. And they've done that repeatedly and then the other guys go and grab it, take what the good stuff is and see what they can use, you know, how they can use it to manipulate people and then they edit the history and they put in a false history. So the little clues are though, the crucifixion story because Jeshua was not crucified. I mean, people that have been to my workshops before know that um, we, you know, we all have incarnations in different places right now. And I was affiliated with that group. He was my half brother. I was Miriam, and so nobody's going to tell me he's crucified. I don't care if it's Pope. You know what I mean? Who appointed you anyway? You know what I mean? That's how I look at this stuff. We're taught to, you know, worship the Pope and look down to, you know, up to all these people, and they can look down at us. Who are these guys anyway? Who put them in these positions? Who said God said? What God is that? Is it Anunnaki? Is it Drac? Or is it the real one? You know, you have to get to the point where you have to realize you are no less than any of these other pompous people out there saying they're so much more important than you. You have other places that you're manifesting right now. You don't remember because your DNA is not turned on. But you have other places, people that may be one of the Essenes, that may be one of the Egyptians. So you don't need to have, you know, do that subservient thing. I never ever ask. I know who I am and I know a lot of where I've been. And I've been in lowly places and I've been in high places. Will be. But I don't ask people to give me their power. I don't say to you, oh, I'm so much more important, so you have to listen to me. I'll get you ascended. I don't do that stuff. Anybody that does that, that's another little clue. If they'll get you ascended, but you can't do it all by yourself, they're not telling you something. Okay? So these are some of that. Was in, all that was in response to the question of how do you tell a Melchizedek from a Melchizedek cloister? And it's in what they teach. It's not in how they look so much, but it's in what they teach. What are they teaching you to do with your power? And are they teaching you that you have right now in you an avatar that you can fully embody? Are they teaching you that you have to karmically earn it or that maybe someday you'll get to that but you're not there yet? Because if they're doing little tricks like that, they're misleading you. Because right now you have the ability, if you were taught the right mechanics, to open up your DNA and progressively get more of yourself in. And they won't teach you that. You can also tell them by what they won't teach. <laughs> okay. What's anyway. What's that acronym? A E O N. Is that it? Oh, I was going to look into that one. I don't know that one yet. A E O N. Somebody uh, uses Ryan that. Ryan who, who? Who uses that one? The A E O N. I see it all the time. Uh, is that this? That's not Galactic Federation stuff, is it? A E O N. I'm not sure. Is it? No, it's Crowley. Crowley. Okay. Because of the Galactic Federation, there's something like okay. it. Okay. People keep. That. I've seen so I've seen that na- that acronym used some, and I, I never asked what it was, but it's it's something it's, it's like, like a coalition yeah, group thing, like, and they teach you it's you one thing, but it's actually something else. Forgot. I forgot it. I think yeah, it probably came through when I was on a roll. <laughs> yeah, sometimes yeah. stuff will come through, and then I forget it too, unless I hear it on you know back yeah. on the tape because it comes through so yeah, fast. <laughs> okay, but anyway, 
All right, these guys are the ones that are causing so much trouble right now. They run the White Eagle program, the false Melchizedek program that everybody is just buying into right now. We even have Drax running Melchizedek programs now, which is like historically a miracle because they never liked to deal with them. But like even the Omicrons are saying, hmm, that works, doesn't it? That's a way to get into people's fields. Let's try that. There is one movement that the Drax created themselves in order to get into people's fields. They created the Reiki movement. I figured I'd get gasps. I figured I'd get gasps on this one because there's so many people that learned Reiki healing. And these people just want to learn how to do Reiki. Now, Reiki's great. All you do is run it with a D12 frequency with you, and it'll work for the good. But it was given to be able to allow certain things to get into people's biofields. The, the healers became... <laughs> the healers became... Uh, you would actually be implanting people with their signatures. When you get your Reiki Mastership, you're getting zapped by somebody who has already been zapped by one of them or one of the ones that, you know, they pass on the zap. And the zap is a set of frequencies that go into your biofield and create overlays on your DNA template, which create implants in your biofield that make it very easy for Omicron or, or, uh, or Dedicron Central to send their lines of communication in. And they can come in and say, hi, I'm your higher self. Hi, I'm God. You know, and they can call themselves anything they want once they get into your inner communication systems. Now, Reiki isn't a bad thing. It was based on twisting of a system of healing that used to be part of the Cathara healing program. So, if you use it with running the right currents, the D12 frequency, it will clear out the distortions. You'll also find, like with the hand, when you move your hands with them, your hands will want to do something different when you're running D12. Your hands themselves, when you're starting to work with it, you'll feel that it doesn't want to do that movement. It's telling you something. If you run the D12 frequency, in those ten, when that frequency is in your body, your body's going to know what goes with D12 and what doesn't. So it's going to want to move a little different. That's where you take Reiki and you let it go into um, kind of avant-garde, where you let your own Christos move with it. But you can still do good with Reiki. But Reiki can't go to the core template like Cathara does. All right, you, like Cathara healing, you can use any healing system with Cathara and it'll amplify the good parts of that system and it'll clear out the negative. So we're not anti-Reiki either. Say, use everything. Use everything with the D12 frequency. And then you can enjoy the whole world. You can listen to all sorts of music, even if it's saying the Lord's Prayer backwards and it's still not going to affect you. All right? <laughs> yes. Not that I recommend that. Okay, the symbols. <laughs> a lot of people have. I do the D12 and teach the class all of this. Would that mean that Yeah, you know what would be good for people that are, are Reiki teachers? Because there's a whole lot to explain here to people that you may not want to get into in a simple Reiki healing class because like, you have to get a whole class before you can get to that Reiki class. What the easiest thing to do is, you can use Reiki and you can teach Reiki, but teach them one very important part of Reiki and never, ever, ever use it without it is the Maharic seal. Teach them how to do that and teach them the Cathar healing running of the higher currents and they'll actually get better effects from Reiki because all Reiki is using is three-dimensional currents. It's telling you it's using other ones, but it's not because it's not releasing the seals in the body that allow the higher level currents, the, the, what we call the, uh, what are they called? <laughs> the triadic phase currents to come through. They're the higher dimensional currents. Okay, So you can, you can actually hybridize Reiki, Cathar Reiki. <laughs> well, that's good. It's wonderful because you've now you've learned a system that's being abused, and now you've learned that it's being abused and how that that system can be healed. So you can actually help, just like there's people that can help the Bible by knowing that Christ wasn't crucified. They can help take the good stuff out of something and put it in its right context where it can be helpful again. So we don't tell you to, oh, burn those books. I've heard some of them say, oh, don't go to that, burn that book. You know, it'll like the frequency coming off, it'll get you. Like, well, if you're using your D12 frequency, you're not going to have to worry about hiding from everything because it'll transmute it and balance it. Yes? Yeah, that would work with that. So, uh, like, I haven't taken Reiki. I just somehow that got edited out of my education, and I didn't do that this time. <laughs> yeah. I, they, they teach you to hook up with one of a Reiki guide on the other side? Yeah. Right there, some change teach, it. Some teachers do. Okay, if they teach you to do that, that means get yourself assigned an Omicron. Okay? <laughs> it's more like getting an overlord than a guide. When it comes to that part, 
you can redirect them not to another guide not to a guardian alliance guide you don't need to to their own Christos level their own D12 level get it across to them they have this level of a Christ itself right in them and you can teach, teach them to use the Maharata frequency D12 frequency and they don't need a Reiki guide they've already got a Reiki guide the Christos self okay yep we've, ju we've just created a new form of Reiki it's Have we? called Maharak Reiki hey Maharak Reiki there we go that's it. Okay. He's registering trade name Yeah, they probably get us for the similarity in spelling. But see, there's a lot of things that can be resurrected and turned into good things. If we know, first of all, why they're not working as good things, because if we think they're good things and they're actually doing damage, we're just going to keep getting overrun by them. But if you realize where something's being compromised, learn enough about, okay, that's compromised there. What could we do to take the good from this, to use the good, but to get rid of the stuff that's messing it up? Just like with all the religions. Take every holy book. Find the stuff that really helps you feel closer to God, right? That helps you to feel closer. It doesn't tell you to give your power away. It's going to be hard to find in some of those books. <laughs> but take the good stuff. Take the stuff that teaches you to love and to turn the other cheek and all this stuff in the Bible. Take the stuff in Reiki that actually can work. Just don't have people assign power to something outside of their own Christo self and teach them how to seal the channel to their Christo self with the Maharak seal. You can do it with Reiki. You can do it with any of the other programs out there unless they're ones that tell you you have to have people plug into something. That's a warning sign right there. Like you have uh, another bunch of other groups like the Arantia book. Okay, the people that do the Arantia movement, they're another Anunnaki, Jehovian Anunnaki hijack program. All right, the people that do the Course in Miracles. That was actually mostly influenced by Archangel Michael. These guys, Nephilim, the Nephilim out of the Andromi matrix. Okay, see down here, there's several different kinds of races that are affiliated with the human Anunnaki hybrid Nephilim. Now that's where the Archangel Michael matrix fits in. They run the Necromaton agenda, and the Archangel Michael matrix is kind of partial to both. They'll run Anunnaki and they'll run Draconian, and they'll run them right into each other sometimes and turn them into something else. But hmm? what? Archangel Michael? No, it's a personification. There's not a, a nice person that used to be an angel that had some problems. And I hate to think that, like, you know, Raphael and Ariel and Gabriel and the rest of them probably come from the same crew, you know? Because <laughs> I used to have an angel that I talked to that was called Raphael. I mean, you know? <laughs> right. same transmission station. So, but after a while, you start to realize, like, even Toth. Now, there is a Toth, and he does happen to be an immortal because he's been running on a, a, a twisted um, D11.5 Antichristos current since he broke the Emerald Covenant, and they figured, how to do that, how, figured out how to do that with biologies. There is an individual called Toth, but Toth is part of the toth Ankyzephalium collective. It's, there's a whole Anunnaki collective that are, you know, that is the Toth matrix, you know. They're... With the Archangel Michael one, it was a little different. There wasn't exactly one Archangel Michael. There was a collective that decided if it were going to be one, what, would it, what image would it want to portray to manipulate humans? So it came up with the Archangel Michael and a whole matrix of angels to play with. You know, there's a whole bunch of them attached to that. Enoch is the same way. Now, Enoch was an individual, still is an individual. Hmm? Um, did I get down? The, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. It, yeah, you can go to the next page. Yeah, I tend to do this. See, the, I could probably go through a week with a pile of five of these. <laughs> uh, on, on the Reiki symbol, yeah. before you go on, this, um, one of those codes are F to Harka, the key that you gave here. Okay. Antankarana? Yeah. yeah. That's a, a Reiki code. The Antankarana? Well, the Antankarana is a word that refer. it's not just a code, it's a word that refers to, in fact, I think it originally was a Sanskrit translation of one of the old Emerald Covenant languages texts. It refers to the nine-dimensional Kundalini currents, the, kundal the currents of energy from D1, D1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and they're the ones that would plug into the Maharata currents, the Christos currents of D10, 11, 12, and they'd plug into the ones higher up that, the Kirishay and the Kundalini. So when we use, I mean, they might use the word Antankarana, I don't know what the heck they're passing off as that, but what the Anton Karana is, is the word that's referring to that nine-dimensional pillar of kundalini energy that plugs into the higher dimensional pillars. Okay, when we're doing the exercises that, like, she, she was referring to a, read, a type of reading that we've just started giving in the last, like, year, where, um, 
there are certain codes given, symbol codes, that or your avatar would give to me. I literally get them out of your bio field and draw them for you. And you use these codes in a certain way to progressively build your Anten Karana. It releases in the right sequence, and the only person that knows the right sequence is your own body and your own avatar. You would release in the right sequence the Anten Karana, which is the progressive release and building of the currents of Kundalini energy, which are the life force currents that run up the middle of your body. And as you build them, they actually expand out this way until eventually you, have a, you become a pillar of light. Like your Maharak seal, your Maharak seal is D12 frequency that you're actually activating and make and come down here. But for that to go all the way through your system, which will be a 12 strand activation, you have to have all the frequencies between D1 and D11 before you can plug D12 in to make it stay. You can create a field around you, but it's going to be temporary as long as your thought form is holding it there. But it's still going to go down. Your body won't hold it. With these type of exercises in the word, Anton Karana, is referring to that nine dimen those smaller currents of Kundalini energies that allow, eventually, your Maharata, your D12 frequency, to plug in permanently and to stay in. And you would literally be surrounded at that point and permeated. You, would, you start to feel this really neat thing when you start to make the connection between the Anton Karana currents, because they built enough, and the higher currents coming in, the Maharata. It feels like, I've only experienced this once or twice for a day. It happened like a full day I had of it. I felt the wind blow through the spaces in between my cells. It's a very neat feeling. You start to really feel difference in how your body matter operates when you do this. So if you see the word Anten Karana, I mean, I didn't even know that Reiki talked about it. It might be interesting to explore what they say about it. But Anten Karana, the, the real meaning of that word is referring to the nine-dimensional currents. So if they're using a code, I don't know what they're using for it. But when it, with any of the Reiki codes, two things with Reiki that, I've, that I see that are the only adjustments you have to make. One is whenever you're using any of the symbols, you could... Um, you need to run your D12 frequency. You could also, I'm just getting this here, you could also try reversing the symbols. That would all, they, I just got that, that that would help if you, if you reversed the symbols. Like if a symbol, if it's one that's not totally symmetrical, where it will look the same either way, you can actually just reverse it. No, sure. but yeah, like not up to down, not, not, not vertically, but yeah. this way, yeah. And use the opposite. Well, the, way that, the easiest way to do that with Reiki, you'd like take the code on a piece of paper, right? Flip the paper over and literally trace it on the back and use this one on the back as the way you would do it. So you'll get more, they're saying you'll get more benefit out of it, but even if you don't reverse it, you can still get some benefit as long as you use the D12 frequency. But what you're doing is implanting people and not knowing it and amplifying your own implants when you're doing it without using the D12 frequency. These are the tricks that have been run on us. It's yeah, amazing. The other point is that any, <laughs> any of the Reiki teachers, as and when they choose to become ordained as Melchizedek ministers mm -hmm. and then reach regent level, mm -hmm. they can incorporate ordination effectively in the attunements they do. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, 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 that's a good uh, idea. I'll let you talk about that later. That needs more. Yeah, we'll be able to talk about ordination anyway. So I don't want to get there yet. Right. I don't want to go into ordination now. That's tomorrow. <laughs> if I go there now, we'll no, never get no, 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 through no. those my arts. Okay, how are we doing on time? Well, I figure if we break it six for something. Break it six for supper. For okay. Hour, hour, okay. Minutes. Okay. How about this? How about we break at six thirty for supper and take a ten minute stretch? Does anybody want to stretch? Because I'm noticing yeah. Yeah. <coughs> happening, and I, the stuff we're getting into now is gonna. This is the stuff I, I'd like you to still be awake for. Because at the end of one of these workshops, most people are just walking around. Oh. <laughs> you know, because so much data is given. So we could take about a ten minute break just to you know stretch. Yeah, okay. Do you want me to hear it? Oh, cool. Um, I'm just asking. Sit down and leave them there. When I start talking about that stuff, we can get, like, just, like, yeah, get them around. But let me get past this stuff and start talking about this. Actually, you can now because we're going to go right into that. Go for it. Save time. Why not? Okay. You've got another uh, little, little um, insert of paper coming around. This is the timeline of things. This is what, as soon as we get through with who's who, we're going to go into what happened to get us here since 1916. So you get a sneak peek <laughs> as you're getting the, uh, the pages here for this. Now, anybody that has the Templar manual, these are, um, they're all hole punched, so you can just slip these in, take the staple out, and put them in the back of your book if you want. If you don't have the Templar manual, that's okay. You just, at least you have these, you know, the updated material from this workshop. <laughs> Okay, now, because I want to get to the stuff that's being handed out now even more than I want to get to this, because this is important, but the other stuff is what's going to really get us up to where we know where we, what, how we got to where we are, so what we need to do with it. 
Um, I'm going to go through these pretty quick as far as the rest of who's who. Okay. We had the, the, the draconian and reptilian team primarily on the other page, and then we got introduced to the necromaton and dramis, who are like the, the brains behind the brawn. Now we're going to go into some of the other collectives. These collectives at this point have all unified themselves into what's called the United Resistance. Resistance refers to resistance to the Founders and the Emerald Covenant. So they are races that are representing what is considered an anti-Christos agenda because the Christos agenda, Christos is always what it originally meant, was referring to the D12 pre-matter divine blueprint that allows you to connect your frequencies to the primal light fields and primal sound fields and source. So you have an endless eternal supply of energy, so you have eternal life and ascension and all those kind of things. They're just like natural things that are supposed to come with a package. So, but the other guys won't teach you that because they cut it off, usually at D9, some of them at D11. So literally when you're dealing with training that comes from any of these other matrices, the, the highest they will allow your energies to go will be to be 11.5. Now these are the real shrewd ones that are trying to figure out how to run a partial D12 current on a reverse matrix. And this is what the, uh, some of the Melchizedeks are doing because they've had enough, they have enough knowledge about the sacred sciences, they have more than the Drax do, that they've, they're, they're trying to run it on, in fact, they use the uh, mutated version of the Fibonacci spiral to, to begin running it on a reverse current. They can't run a whole D12 on reverse because it'll automatically put itself back if you run anything more than the six sub-frequency band in D12. Every, every frequency, every dimensional frequency band has 12 sub-frequency bands within it. So what, what the uh, negative groups are doing is they're trying to run on a reverse current Current, which means the natural scalar wave patterns and their sequences for every little dimension and every little um, subharmonic in the dimension. They're trying to reverse the way the fire letters work so they can break the current off at the D12 level. So they can use as much of that life force current as they can get, but they do not have to plug it in to source. So they don't have to learn to be cooperative with the other races. They want to create, they want to be gods themselves and create their own little matrix and if anything doesn't agree with them, they kill it. And that's yeah, basically their orientation. Now, the other races that are involved with the Phantom Matrix, these are races that at various different times in their evolution, since the creation of Phantom Matrix in uh, 250 billion years ago, at different times, some of these races are older than human races. They're not older than the founders, but they're older than human races. They, their planets have ended up in the Phantom Matrix, or their race has ended up on a planet in the Phantom Matrix. Now, all of these guys that are considered fallen angelics are from that phantom matrix black hole subtime distortion system. All right, some of them have escaped at different times and actually are like in density two of this time matrix. They have they have civilizations and cultures there, but most of the places that they come from are the phantom because they can't live in this time matrix too long because their bodies start to deteriorate because it runs on the right current and it's too strong of a current for their, their mutated reverse current bodies. So most of them have their primary bases, even though they can visit and pop in here on any of the densities, they have, you know, they live in that time distortion system. It reminds me of an episode of Star Trek or something. A long time ago, I saw one thing where there, it was Star Trek Next Generation, I think, because I remember Captain Picard in it. <laughs> there was this one scene where something had happened and they'd gone through some type of time warp. And they ended up with, like, the way they filmed it, where they showed, like, there was a version of him, of Captain Picard, stuck over in this other thing that looked just like the system he was in, but it operated different. And he was over here, stuck, and they were both stuck. It's like he got split in half, and half of him was in this, this sub-time cycle that was distorted. And they're trying to figure out how to get him back together without having the whole thing explode, you know, which was their problem on that show. But it's kind of like that, where if you could see it, it literally looks like this other version of this universe that's a bit different but enough similarities because it's built on the same original pattern where literally we keep each other stuck in time because we can't fully evolve while we have an open connection to them. They're trying to suck energy from us to literally suck this system in and we're trying to pull away from that so we don't get sucked into the system because eventually that system will implode. That's the difference between a living time matrix and what's considered a dead matrix or a black hole matrix. If a black hole matrix doesn't have all of the matter that fell into it pulled back out and reassembled into its original divine blueprint, eventually it will keep pulling energy in 
from whatever it's connected to. And if it becomes where it's not connected to anything, any live energy system that it can feed off of, it starts to feed off of itself. And it literally starts to consume its own energy and break up its own patterns where it implodes. So like the life forms, the body forms are like holograms that eventually, if you don't suck energy off a living force, like a living life force that has its natural currents, its, its Maharata current, and its primal light and sound field currents, if you, if you're in a, in a time, in a sub matrix like that one, they can't access those higher eternal currents. You literally, the, the systems implode and the planets will eventually implode and they go back to literally space dust and they, that's what they have to look forward to. They call it ascension. Well, the only way they can stay alive in their eternal finite bodies is by vampiring energy off living systems. So we're, this is what we're dealing with when we deal with the, the phantom matrix. Earth became involved with this 5.5 million years ago. In, it was the end of human seeding one on this planet. Human seeding one started on Earth 25 million years ago on um, parallel Earth 250 million years ago. Now, 25 million years ago, seeding one came here, and we were to pa repair the, regri the, the grids on planet Earth. So far, Earth didn't have its equivalent in Phantom Matrix. There was a huge, massive war that took place then, where other wormholes that are different than these that would have been closed since were created, and part of Earth's grids literally got siphoned into the black hole matrix. Now, in order to try to assist the, the life forms, the, the, the humans and the uh, Anunnaki and the Draconians, that ended up on that Earth in that matrix, so they didn't just shut them off so they could never get out again. The founders created something called a wall in time. It was a frequency barrier between Earth's grids here in this time matrix and the grids of the portions of Earth that had gone into the phantom. They could have severed those grids where there would not have been a connection anymore. But the people and the beings and the consciousness in the part of Earth's body that had gone into phantom would be in a, in on a, in a finite implosion cycle where eventually you, know, you couldn't rescue it. It would go down in frequency too far where you couldn't plug it back in. So they kept a wall in time, a frequency barrier, to allow those two places to still be open to each other but not like an open door without a lock on it. Because the, the, the risk in doing this was that the other phantom matrix systems there with the fallen angelics would, if they could get through that wall in time, they could invade here. And that's exactly what has happened. Now, the wall in time is 5.5 million years old. This is why with some of the Templar Melchizedek teachings, there's another little clue about their teachings. Most of them can't access anything before 5.5 million years ago. They say, gee, there's this like block in the, 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 the planetary memory banks and you can't you know, find any information on history before that. Yeah, right. Well, if you're, you know, your consciousness is running on a reverse matrix and all you can draw information from is the phantom side, you won't be able to go past that block in time. So the, I know one of the, the very popular Melchizedek teachers talks about the wall in time that you can hardly get any information back on the other side of. And that's because they're coming from the phantom matrix location. Now, <laughs> various times in seating one and, and seating two, there were the wars over, you know, making rips in the wall in time and things trying to come through. This has been an ongoing mess. In Atlantis, in the third seating, it got really bad. That's where the two wormholes that are the major problem that we're having right now were created. The races that we're dealing with, there are a lot of them. It's not just cut and dry like, okay, you're the good guys and we're the bad guys, you know, this kind of thing. It's not like that. There are all sorts of races with all sorts of agendas, but they still come in two basic categories. Ones that are working the Christos agenda from the living time matrix and those that are working the anti-Christos agenda from the fallen time matrix. Now, the ones in the fallen time matrix, there's a lot of them that want to get out. They've evolved enough by raiding here, they've gotten themselves into human bodies here, but they started to pick up some of what that means. So they started to grow more than the ones that they came out of in the first place. So they started to rebel against their overlords and things that were in the Phantom Matrix. They didn't want to just be the little puppet soldiers that were going to be used to destroy this place. They decided they wanted to do what the humans were doing. They wanted to get a redemption contract. They wanted to get their DNA healed so they didn't have to be dragged around by the fallen angelics anymore. It was like fallen angelics, uh, imagine yourself as a big avatar collective saying, okay, I'm going to make like 50 million of myself in this race form down here, and then I'm going to make them do what I want them to do. Well, the ones down here become conscious, but they don't remember the whole, just like it's hard for us to fully know that, you know, our avatar is up there someplace. And they got tired that once they realized they were being run around like little puppets, like, you know, a child playing with dolls, the doll got tired of being a puppet. The puppet got tired of having the strings pulled, and they decided that there was a better way and they wanted to live peacefully. So there are a lot of them, just because they originated from there, doesn't mean that 
they're going to get sealed back up in there when it comes time for the Christos realignment here. That's why right now, this is the big rush. Talk about lines <laughs> waiting to get to, like, you know how you get, go into a bank and you have, like, huge lines on Friday sometimes. <laughs> you should see the line over on the phantom side for the ones who want to come over, that they're willing to do anything, because they know it's going to be a permanent sever this time. It was decided in 22,326 B.C. that the critical mass over there had reached too much mass compared to here and that they had to close they had to close the wall in time completely they had to sever the two planetary fields because if they didn't this this whole matrix and you know the other density levels of it were going to get sucked in that's when all hell broke loose literally because you have fallen angelics over there that well they don't want to uh uh, you know, be nice. They want to be able to still do their Dominion campaigns and, you know, raid things and, and work with Antichristos ideas. But they also don't want to be sealed off in their own time matrix where all they have to, f to feed on is themselves. So they have been trying to prevent the Christos realignment mission here because they, have, they are confronted with a very black and white choice. You either stay in the Phantom Matrix, and you know what that means. You'll evolve. You might even have another billion years to evolve in there. But that's it. Once that system starts to implode, you're with it. You go back to space dust. You're still part of God because God is literally the energy and consciousness field that all of this is taking place within. So you can't be separate from God. But to be able to evolve enough to remember and have the mastery level of mastering of density where you can come and go as you want to and have freedom, those kind of things come with evolving and ascending through the full matrix. If you implode, you go back to square one where your space dust where something else is going to use you, you know, what you used to be as just raw units of consciousness to form other things. So they're being faced with a very difficult choice. It's kind of like either be nice, and if you're be nice, here's the Emerald Covenant. Enter a redemption contract, you get DNA biogenesis that will allow you to hold the frequencies of the living matrix, and you will progressively learn to lose some of your bad manners that you've been using because they have some atrocious ways of looking at other life forms. Exploit vampire energy off it, gimme, gimme, gimme. That is what their whole consciousness is oriented toward because they feel cut off from their own life force currents because they are. So they have to feed off other things. So everything they do, the mentality is all about that. If you look at how our societies are built, it's scary. When you look at the business world, particularly American style, there's something real scary about what that's turned into. Once upon a time, it was built on at least an idea that sounded good, like people were going to kind of, you know, everybody was going to be able to try to have the, you know, the American dream of a nice life and be able to have money and things. At this point, it's cutthroat. It's whoever you have to step on to get where you want to get, to get the power you want to get. This is coming from the mentality set that comes from a, a life field, wherever it is. A life field that feels, does not feel, it's living currents connecting at the source. It will feel fear, a very deep primordial fear of its own finite nature. And it will try to compensate for that fear by acquiring power from outside of itself because it feels powerless inside of itself. So the mentality and the horrible ideas and lack of ethical systems that consciousness like that comes up with all goes down to a very deep core pain of feeling finite and feeling that if you don't take that the universe is finite, the universe is limited, there is not enough energy for you, there's not enough power, you have to grab it from somebody. This is where their whole competitive dominion thing comes from. They could be healed, but to try to convince them of that, it's like, good luck. They've been trying to convince them for 25, you know, 250 billion years, and they're still choosing. They're choosing, most of them. The overlord ones, the dark avatar groups, they are choosing to stay in that condition. But when some of them incarnate, and then they get that individuality thing happening, where, yeah, the avatar is up here, but now it has its little foot soldier. The foot soldier still has a bit of free will, and it will, the avatar will try to drag it around and try to say, no, you don't have free will. You're just a face of me. You have to listen to me. But once the being gets out here, it's like a part of it wants to have its own consciousness. It doesn't say, okay, I'm just you. It doesn't identify with that one. That's why they're rebelling. So this is why there has been with the, the uh, hybrid races that I've talked about, the Leviathan races. One of the reasons that the fallen angelics made a big deal about coming in here and getting everybody's DNA messed up wasn't just to suppress the humans. It was because all of their Leviathan races, who used to be incarnates out of their matrix that agreed to be Antichristos, got here, started to evolve, and decided they wouldn't, didn't want to be Antichristos anymore. And they were all petitioning for Emerald Covenant and wanted to get out and get away from the Phantom Matrix and their overlords. And that's when the overlords realized they were losing their energy feeding ground 
that they were losing their foot soldiers and they were losing their access to earth and the potential of getting to the halls of Amente. So they went after them as well. This is why I have a lot of compassion. I do feel compassion for the Illuminati races because they may do really icky things here, and they do. Some of them don't do anything icky. They don't even realize they're a part of that. But others do know to some degree that they're a part of stuff that's not being fair to other people. But they don't know any better. But these races came out of lines of Illuminati that didn't want to be Illuminati anymore, that were trying to break free. And because of that, it was like the great axe from the Phantom Matrix came down and they messed with the DNA so they would continue, be able to continue to manipulate them. So it's like the bad guys that really, really decided they wanted to be good guys and were siding with the good guys and trying to get away from them, but they got dragged back in because of it. So this is why I, I feel a compassion. I try to teach that don't hold our hostility. If we feel anger, there will be a point where rage comes up. That's healthy. You just don't want it to stay there. You know, you have to move it into something more positive. But it's not the Illuminati that are to blame. Who is to blame for the mess here are these guys, these various groups. But if you want to blame them, yeah, it's their fault. But why is it their fault? Because they got code convolution way, way back a long time ago. They twisted their DNA and their minds up in knots. And it made them very sick mentally. Very intelligent, some of them, but still psychotic. Now, are you going to hate a person because they're psychotic? It's kind of useless. That's why I try to say, when we get into these races, let's find enough compassion to realize if there are ones that want to come over, if there are ones that are interested in, in the material, you might not trust them as far as you can see them because you have to be careful with that because a lot of times they'll... You know, they'll get the urge down here that, okay, I want to be good, I'm going to do the, the right thing. And then, if they have field attachments, the other thing they're connected to will come in, get itself in position as somebody you trust and, like, you know, in a situation where you trust, and then the other thing will come in and try to sabotage you. I've had that happen a lot. A couple workshops I've had that happen in and those kind of things. So it's a real precarious game, and there's a lot of game players. When I talk about the possibility of field possession, all these guys you're seeing on these lists are potential candidates for who might be living in there. So it's not, it's not just cut and dry, okay, is it, a, is it a lizard or is it an Anunnaki? There's a lot of them. Now, we have something called the Blue Centaurs. These guys, had, a long time ago, raided the, uh, the Hindu cultures, which were an angelic human Maji, grail line. They took the sacred texts of the Hindu texts and they twisted them and put all sorts of weird stuff about the way karma works. They took out the teachings of simultaneous time, so they created a belief system there that wasn't an actual belief system, it wasn't part of the true teachings, that you you know, if you're born in a lowly station of life, then you have to, I mean, they literally treat people that are born, you know, they have that uh, caste system where they'll treat people horribly because they were born into a certain line. This was never the, the true Hindu teachings. Sanskrit teachings were originally one of the, the sacred teachings, just like what was, what became Christianity or what was supposed to become Christianity was too. So the centaurs, the blue centaurs, this is where they get if you look at uh, some of the Hindu art from different periods, you'll see like all sorts of wild things like blue people and blue oxes and, and things like that. Now, they have a lot of affiliation with the blues. All right? Some blues are good blues. You have your blue human Maharajis of Cirrus B, who are one of the primary guardian fleet protectors here. They're the guardians of Stargate 6. They're called the Council of Azerlene. They're the ones that if it gets into live combat here with spaceships flying, it's their spaceships that come in first because they're closest and they can get here fastest. They intervened on behalf of the Hindu races at different periods of time. One, I think, was, I think it was like 5,900 B.C. And there's still records in some of the texts of those times when the spaceships came in to break up the Atlantean you know, wars. Yeah. 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 So these are the Maji Grail lines from the, actually, they're, they're a line of humans that um, interbred with a race called the Azurites, which were one of the universal guardian, like, yeah, universal Templar guardian teams. And they were, they were very blue. They were very blue hominid and they had kind of like feathered heads. <laughs> so the, the blue humans are a combination of regular human, which is an oropheme, combined with the Azurite races that are blue people. There's a whole group of them that were hijacked by one of the draconian agendas, and they're actually negative. So just because it's a blue person doesn't mean it's a nice blue person. This is how complicated this drama is, but it helps to understand some of those references, because you know, you can say, okay, well, all right, that's a blue person if you happen to meet a blue person, which we might in the next 10 years, you never know. <laughs> um, in fact, we probably will if it goes well. Uh, 
you can meet a blue person and you can realize that okay it might be this race or it might be that race which means it might be a part of this agenda or it might be part of that agenda then you still need to learn to feel to sense what type of feeling it feels like that person has because just because it's blue doesn't mean it's nice or doesn't mean it's negative now the centaur races are they're blue but they're like half hominid on top and actually half like cow like thing on the bottom and they're different than the there's another group called the Marduk Centaurians which are part Anunnaki and they're like kind of flesh colored hominid on top they're not blue and then they have kind of like a, I think it's a goat type like a large goat type thing horse goat on the bottom so there's these, these things from mythological you know in the old myths that they talked about the centaurs and all those they weren't hidden these people are real people and they come in sometimes like they have been on planet visiting at times so there were races you know in the ancient time periods that are going on now that know that these types of, of beings are alive you know not everything is hominid and bipedial like we are so these guys they tend to the, the blue centaurs don't come in too much on their own they work with they, they kind of impulse from afar their uh, Le the Leviathan races that they infiltrated. Their primary areas of um, Illuminati infiltration are in India, in the Middle East, and various different island nations. So they went for like the, the small groups of islands here and there where they could get you know primary infiltration. Um, <coughs> They're associated with the, the uh, Hindu and Sanskrit text distortions. I have it spelled wrong, distortions. <laughs> yeah. If there's any misspellings here, by the way, forgive me, please. I was in a hurry. <laughs> so we will be cleaning this up for the final copy at some point. Okay. They are involved with some of the Wiccan schools, the, you know, the religion of witchcraft, Wiccan schools. Not all of them. They work closely with the Andromi Necromaton and with Draconian Agenda. Omicron dragon moths. So they have, they're basically a draconian agenda. They're not a draconian reptilian race, but they honor the, that particular agenda. And they work most closely with the Andromis, the Andromi Necromaton races, the ones that like the, the uh, draconians better than the Anunnaki. All right, then we have these guys. Oh, these guys are real sweet. The Jehovian Anunnaki. These are the classics. These were the first Anunnaki races. All right. They were created by the fallen Anno Elohim as the Avenger race that was meant to destroy the human races and the founders so they could take over the time matrix on behalf of the fallen Anno Elohim. Now the Anunnaki races have they, they have been hybridized with just about everything else that, that walks, speaks, or thinks in this time matrix. So there are many, many different strains of Anunnaki. But what the ones that consider themselves the pure strains were the bipedial dolphin people of Cirrus A and Arcturus and uh, what do they call it? Uh, Trapezium Orion. That's where these guys come out of. Uh, these are all fallen matrix systems. These guys run the APN system called the Dove. I don't know if anybody has heard about the Dove, anybody that studied the Keys of Enoch. Now, in 1983, Enoch entered the Emerald Covenant after he had broken it in 10,500 B.C. to join the Luciferian Covenant. When he joined the Luciferian Covenant in 10,500 B.C., they tricked him. He was a representative of the Jehovian Anunnaki. He had once been entrusted as one of the guardians over that particular hybridization program that was trying to help them. And he went bad, but Toth went bad first. Both of them had been entrusted guardians. They had done bioregenesis. They had gotten themselves to the point where they could have been Christos beings. They were appointed as guardians over large groups of the hybrid races in order to lead them into Christos evolution. And in 22,326 BC, Toth decided to side with the Anunnaki and go for the takeover agenda because deep down he really felt that Anunnaki were still superior to humans so they should be running things. That's a real strong imprint in the Anunnaki races. And Enoch felt cornered into the whole thing. He didn't think the Guardians were going to win things because the other guys were getting so far, the Anunnaki races. So he figured, well, all right, we'll side with you guys. Bad decision because as soon as they did, they tricked his whole group and a whole bunch of them were exterminated because they wanted them exterminated. They didn't like the bi bipedal dolphin people groups. The Toth groups didn't like them. So <coughs> Enoch kind of um, went for his first redemption contract right after that. He became a CDD plate speaker and he did some books of Enoch that were translations 
from the, the cloister door tour plates that I'm receiving the history information and things off. Now, he was one of the Emerald Covenant speakers for a time, and then he got hung up with another agenda, this time on behalf of the Jehovian agenda. He felt that the human races, when, when uh, what was really bothering a lot of them was the realization that the founders were going to close the Phantom Matrix. You either got out or you didn't. It wasn't that you were uh, not offered opportunity to get out, because there were, and there were like constant extensions. Okay, we were supposed to close it in 22,003, 26 BC. You guys messed that up. We didn't. Okay, well, we're going to close it here. You have from this point in time to this point in time to get your groups evolved to a certain level where they're ready to, you know, behave themselves and not attack every guardian race that comes across their path so they can stay out of the phantom matrix. We will help them out. These were the deals that were offered to Toth and to Enoch. Enoch felt that at the point in time where it, after his downfall with the 10,500 BC issue where he joined the Luciferians and they betrayed him, he came back with our guys, worked them for a while, and there was this whole chaos that went down during what's called the Christ period. And it was like between um, 12, 12 BC and 27 AD was the main time frame in that. And there was a whole big mess that went around during there where Enoch's groups were part, part of the Emerald Covenant and they started to follow the Toth groups instead of Enoch. And because of that, there had been, this happened about maybe 300 years before the Christ period happened. By the time the Christ period happened, his races that he'd been, his Jehovian races that he'd been trying to evolve had de-evolved to the point where he didn't think there was going to be enough time between then and 2000 to 2017 AD where they would be ready to be able to be taken out of Phantom Matrix when it was going to be closed. He was told that he, there were ways that could have been worked, and there were, but out of fear for his own race, and also out of disgust over a lot of things. He was being pulled in a lot of different directions. He finally said, forget it. Forget the founders. I'm an Anunnaki. I'm a Jehovian Anunnaki, and uh, you know, I'm just going to be true blue till I die, and I'm sick of this whole thing. So he decided he would break the Emerald Covenant. He did that in, I believe it was 10 AD, that decision was made. And he has worked an Antichristos, Jehovian Anunnaki World Dominion agenda, primarily run through the Hiberu faith, not Hebrew, but the Hiberu line, calling themselves Hebrews. And in 1983, he realized what a bad decision that was. And he realized how bad this drama was going to get. And he petitioned again for him and his groups to have what's called a host matrix out which means because their fields are such a mess, they'll never be able to sustain the frequency of going into the frequencies that are going to be needed to create this separation. So he asked for a host matrix for him and the groups of his people that would accept it. Now, before that, in 1972, he began to write certain things to get grid mechanics done. This is where certain books that I don't need to name, because anybody who's involved with the Enoch work knows the name of the book, and I don't need it on film. That particular agenda that's known as the Enoch Agenda in this time frame was written, I think, between 1972, uh, right around in that time frame. This was still the Jehovian One World Order Dominion Agenda. And what's happening now is they're still using Enoch's name. And Enoch is out of it. He's not the person dealing with his contacts here that are writing his books and things. It's not even Enoch. He's also wavering. They don't know. The Guardians don't know if he's going to be able to maintain his commitment. He has so far. He did not join the United Resistance, and he is still Emerald Covenant. But it, he's under so much pressure, and his groups, by the Anunnaki groups. He's not a, he used to work sometimes with me. They assigned him to me to find information for me if I needed information on certain things, particularly from the Jehovian Matrix. If I needed to find out, like, okay, what are they up to with that? He would be a gopher, and that was part of his redemption contract. <laughs> you know, I never had a relationship with Enoch like some people do. Oh, hey, Enoch, you know, I was like, hi, guy, you again? You're gonna make a better decision this time. <laughs> but so far, he's been he's been doing really well. But he's not he's not permitted to be an official Emerald Covenant speaker until we get through this to see if indeed he stays on that side. But at least that collective and a lot of the Jehovian uh, Illuminati people are being guided to us because of their affiliation with Enoch, where then you have the other movement that's running the matrix of the Dove. This is where you get into the Dove APIN system. This is one of those implant systems in the grids. It's one of the smallest, but one of the nastiest. This is the one that will rip the grids apart because of the seven seals. This is the one that we're starting to have the effects 
we're going to be because we just released three of those seals released because three of our natural seals released. These are the ones that the Jehovian seals in the planetary grids are what we need to do round tables to balance and clear because if not, we're going to see a, a mess here within the next two or three year period. It's going to start. We're going to have major climatic problems and they're going to go into to earthquake problems and they're going to go into even worse problems. So the dove matrix, it seems so sweet. And like the teachings, I, I remember when I first, somebody gave me one of the, the you know, the Enoch book and I said, oh, this is neat. And I, I like Enoch. You know, I deal with Enoch, so this must be good. You know, and I'm reading some of this stuff, and some of it's, you know, brilliant stuff. And I said, yeah, I like this. And there's certain parts that I had some real problems with the sound tones in the names of God that are given. So wait a minute. This doesn't sound right. And then I was thinking, there's a part, oh, return of the Nephites. The Nephites are coming back. Again. I know that name from somewhere. Hmm. I didn't find out who the Nephites were exactly until they gave us the history going from the uh, Neanderthal to the Cro-Magnon to the hybridization um, thing that had been done, the, the hybridization plan. The Nephites were a group of the Illuminati infiltrated hybrids that had been um, taken over by the Jehovian fallen angelic matrix, the Jehovian Anu Elohim. And they had taken them off planet, a whole group of them, and they had accelerated their DNA in certain ways, combining the... Um, eighth axiotonal line and eighth DNA strand with the fifth to create a 13 strand which like a, like a 13 code which is like a, what it comes out to be is a mutated reverse 11.5 frequency capacity so that is the their eternal bodies that they're working on now when I found out who the Nephites were it was like oh my god it says right in that book that you know hail the return of the Nephites this is a good thing this isn't a good thing and I was thinking, what's going on? Because, well, I know Enoch's worked with me since 83, and I know he's a good guy. I mean, the, you know, the guardians send him to me. And then I started, I, I started to get scared. I was like, oh, you know, like, uh-oh, somebody messing with me. And they, that's when they started to explain about the redemption contract, that Enoch was on a redemption contract and all of that. So the Nephites are a kind of like souped-up version of Jehovian Illuminati that came out of the Hibiru race not even the Hebrew race, but all of the Hiberu race and the Hyksos race, are, which are both Illuminati-based races, have literally overtaken and moved themselves into power positions all along they have since Atlantis, into power positions within the Hiberu race, not even the Hebrew race, but all of the Hiberu race and the Hyksos race, are, which are both Illuminati-based races, have literally overtaken and moved themselves into power positions all along they have since Atlantis into power positions within the Hebrew human race and they've literally taken over the identity of them by telling the Hebrews that they're this, this, this and this they're having the Hebrews worship Anunnaki gods when they don't know they're doing that he, you know, Hebrew people, Jewish people were angelic human it was an angelic human magi line so there's been all this confusion going on. It's really important that just because doves are sweet and pretty and seem to represent peace, we start to realize that some of these teachings, some of our favorite teachings in the New Age, were not done for the purposes we think they were. Now, they got us certain frequencies. They did bring frequencies to us as we read these things. Frequencies activated. That's good. Because even if they activated to begin with on a reverse, which most of those things, if they're doing DNA activation or any of that, it will be activating your DNA by having the fire letters or little scalar patterns actually activate in reverse sequence which creates a reversal in your whole body template but once you learn if you go up to an 11 strand reverse matrix if you learn how to use your Merkaba the right way and to use D12 frequency you can take all that activation and then start running it the right way so they actually did you a favor even though it wasn't meant as a favor originally <laughs> okay now the Jehovian Anunnaki are they for a long time ran their own agenda didn't want to deal with anybody else and they started making deals as we moved into the, the time frame we're going to talk about when we get into the list that I just handed out to you where the, the list of events they had to make deals because there were certain groups that were getting too powerful so they had to counterbalance that it has been ridiculous what has happened since 1916 up to this point it's like, change your partner, do -si do Everybody's doing a square dance here, and they're literally, first they're, first they're on their own, then they're going to side with this guy. No, then they go over here, then they're going to you know, make this deal. No, they're going to break that deal. It's been crazy, and our politics have actually reflected it. Our global politics have always been a reflection. 
of what's going on with these behind-the-scene world management team forces. <coughs> now, another group that's a riot, the Toth Enki Zephelium Anunnaki. Okay? Now, the Toth Enki Anunnaki are affiliated with the guy Toth, you know, and all those teachings, the paracletes are affiliated with that. There's all sorts of different groups that are teaching Toth stuff. Drunvalo is teaching Toth stuff. Altan Melchizedek is teaching Toth stuff. Now, it doesn't mean Drunvalo or Altan are negative people. It means they're, they should aim higher with their teachers. Because right now, the Toth group has gone into the United Resistance. And I'm sure they haven't told the people they're working with anything about any of that. Now, some of them know more about it than, than uh, you might want to know. And I won't get into how much the teachers know about what's really going on. But what's important is to realize that these are the groups that are, when we go to workshops in the New Age movement, when we're adopting new healing systems, when we're playing with this New Age stuff that's teaching us how to do spiritual development, or when we're going back to our old traditional religious stuff, every one of those paradigms comes from one of these matrices or one of the good ones. Okay? They don't just happen to come. They don't just evolve out of human consciousness and plop, there's a book and all of a sudden people are following it and it's a movement. These all have agendas behind them and they're either Christos agendas or they're anti-Christos agendas. And it's very difficult because they all use sweet language. In fact, a lot of people pick on us because, well, where's the love? You know, and talk about, oh, beloveds, it's so good to see you today. Did you ever read Galactic Federation stuff? Gag me. I mean, it's so sweet. <laughs> you know, just, oh, and you are beloveds. You know, and they, they just, they, they give you this flowery, poetic, we just love you so much. Whack. You know, it's like, watch that knee because the knee is coming as they're patting you on the head. You know? Ours has always been very direct and it you know I mean the love is obviously there somebody loves us enough to bring this information back here we love people enough to stick our, our head on the line and come out and teach it but these guys will use the Jehovah and Anak you're very good at the the light love love open the heart just love you to death thing but so are the Toth Enki groups now we get into the names you'll find as we go to the Anunnaki races we have Enki Enlil and Marduk now those names if anybody knows anything about Sumerian history these were the Sumerian gods. Yes. Well, the Sumerians thought they were gods because they had their memory wiped out. That was after the flood period, after the DNA messes had been done. So they had come in and presented themselves. The different groups had come in and presented themselves as their gods. And because they had scrambled the DNA, they'd scrambled the language patterns. So they taught them reverse matrix languages, like the one we're using right now. Um, <laughs> but right now, if we tried to speak in a, front, in a, in a normal, a natural founder's language, it wouldn't make any sense. In fact, the bodies that we have right now would have a very difficult time making the sound tones. Literally, we've been put back together upside down and reversed compared to what we're supposed to be. But we'll progressively be able to heal that and incorporate what we have but into the Christos pattern. Like we'll start to understand the founders' languages, which means we'll start to be able to pick up those frequencies as they're coming down you know, through, through the atmosphere, literally. So we'll be able to hear our own souls a little more clearly and our own avatars a little more clearly. The Toth Enki groups, <coughs> have, they, they're they, they tend to, they're like the, the cosmic network team. They get along with just about anybody if it could serve them to do so. And then when they don't need you anymore, they kind of go and do something else. Well, the Toth Enki group, they work with, they have some very, they're part of the group that has a very, very powerful system that was put in before most of these other APIN systems. The system is called the NDC grid, which is the Nibiru and Dyotic Crystal Grid. That we got into this in the Kauai workshop, and that Templar book has an explanation of it in more detail. It involves a thing called the Nibiru and Battle Star, which is called Wormwood. <laughs> Another Bible reference. Yeah, a wormwood comes and crashes down on the rivers of the earth and makes them bitter. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there's a battle star that's an artificial, it's a piece of a planet that was hijacked and put into a, a strange reverse orbit with a planet that used to be in our galaxy called Nibiru. Nibiru's orbit was literally ripped out of its natural orbit with the rest of our planets and it dips in and out of Phantom Matrix every... 3,657.8 years, I believe. I think that number is right. It's 3,600 something. I think it's 30, yeah, what I just said. <laughs> Sometimes the facts will come real fast. They're all written down, though. This stuff is in that book, and there's more of it going to be in some of the other books that are coming. But the Nibirian Dotic Crystal Grid has, this is given this particular group of Anunnaki, the Tothenki group, the Enlil Odetokron group, and the Marduk um, 
Luciferian group, not this one, but the one that's on the next page. These are the Luciferian Anunnaki that did the Luciferian Covenant. There's also the Palladian Samjaze Luciferian group that's also on the other page. These guys got this technology in here. It used to be a set of these huge pylon crystals that were like kind of like on the picture in the front of this book. You can see the... This is a picture Leela brought to us. She actually went here to see these things. If anybody doesn't have this, see that big white streak going up there? And that little kind of person-shaped thing below it? That gives you an idea of what these massive crystal rods look like. This was one that was found, a cave of them that was found in the Chihuahua, New Mexico, er, or Mexico area. And these were always part of the ancient technologies, the crystalline technologies. So the Nibirian Dotic crystal grid was put in, it was linked into Earth's grids, into parallel Earth's grids, and it was a, a complex system of sa sonics. It created a standing scalar sonic wave form that linked into Wormwood, the artificial planet, which linked into Nibiru in the Phantom Matrix. It was the galactic patrol. They would come through every 3,600 and some years, and that's when they would usually come to visit. And what they would do with this was they would control and program the Earth's grids. This is how our DNA got ripped apart. Because what they did was block out certain parts of the frequencies that would naturally run through each level of the planet. We have what we call axiotonal lines in the planet. They're the main energy run lines that come off stargates. When we're not in a stellar activation cycle, they run the subharmonics of, like I say, if you have gate five, gate five is not open, but axiotonal line will run subharmonic five of dimension one, two, and three. So there's this correspondence with literally every dimensional frequency has its corresponding anchoring place in the planetary grids. What they did with the, the Nibirian dotted crystal grid was they created something called the checkerboard matrix. They turned some of them off and they left some of them on. They reversed some other ones. This did the same thing in our body templates and shredded the heck out of our DNA. This is how we went from being a variable base species on this planet to everybody having a base four chemical genetic you know, gene code to where we had once upon a time 12 strands that were activated chemically. We had literally a base 12. Humans had a base 12. Some of the indigos had a base 48 gene code. Okay, so there what they did with these technologies, these are why when, you know, there's like fantasy books out there that kind of speculate about Atlantean technologies and what they might have been like. These were mega technologies. These were technologies. It would be like somebody from Earth being able to control what happens on, say, uh, planets two, two billion light years away without even ever visiting them by sending waveforms. It's controlled waveform technology. And it, what we do with electromagnetics here is just the beginning. They're dealing with something called myon, dion, and trion fields. These are words, this is the level of understanding the physics of this that we were just given in the uh, Sarasota workshop recently. These are the level, these myons, dions, and trions are ultra micro subatomic particle things that form subatomic particles. Like what makes a quark? You know, they talk about these little tiny, mini, mini new things called quarks in physics. Well, there's something that forms a quark, something smaller than a quark that forms a quark. These things are myons, dions, and trions. They're a stage between. The template stuff that we've talked about in Cathara, we talk about it, the uh, Particae, Particae, and Particum waveforms, the you know, standing scalar waves that form the templates of matter. Then it goes through up to this myon, dion, and trion level. This is where we get a type of technology that has the ability to control the way protons, electrons, neutrons, and all those other things our science has identified, a way to control how they behave with each other. How, how, um, what their angular rotation of particle spin is, what's contained in the nucleus of cells, what's contained outside, how many electrons to how many protons. When you get into this level of technology, it's just mind-blowing compared to what our technologies down here are based on. <coughs> the Nibirian dotted crystal grid was used to, create, to turn this into a slave planet since 25,500 BC, and that's precisely what it's been. There were still enough of us functional in the Atlantean period where we were rebelling against it and the founders were trying to get in here, working with the indigos, working with the humans to get rid of this monstrosity installment that was in the area we call Stonehenge now. The Stonehenge rocks, the original set of them, were put in after the, after the Guardian groups got these towers, these towering selenite crystal rods out, but they were put in to block the same positions, that's why Stonehenge is round, 
it was a little different shape when it was originally done. Now, the, the stones with the crossbars served to do something. They weren't able to get the installation, the matching installation, out of parallel earth. So they were still, the Niberians were still controlling here through parallel earth. They were sending it up through the grids from the connection of earth here up into, you know, to par the connection between earth and parallel. What Stonehenge, as we know it, emerged from was taking large rocks and making conduits that would send the energy, it would come up in the grids and it would send it back down over the crossbar and down back in so it would go back to where it came from so it didn't program the grids here but there was constantly fighting and mooring one of our guy one of our groups would put them up put the stones up and the other guys would come in and knock them down or take the crossbars off them because if they don't have the crossbars they still run the frequency into this you know into earth's template here so the Niberian dotted crystal grid just gave the Anunnaki races a hold on here that progressively, they were progressively able to block out guardian race, like um, being able to come in and intervene. Yes? Okay. Okay. It's reminding me it's quarter to seven. Since it's quarter to seven, we can do dinner at seven. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, Niberian dotted crystal grid, 25,500 BC, beginning of major problems. Okay? Then, with the Niberian dotted crystal grid, they created something. Anunnaki created something called the net. Now, the net, think about internet, because it's kind of like that, but it's a little different. The net is, the net, uh, what do they say? Niberian electrostatic transduction field. That's where they get net, N E T. When you translate it into English, net is a good word to call it, because it's the Niberian electrostatic transduction field. It's another one of these nasty little technologies that you could use nicely if you wanted to. They've literally been able to seal the frequencies, put it, literally put us in a frequency bubble, where guardian races progressively could not get through the net to communicate here or to get their ships in here. This net has been a nemesis to our planet for since 25,500 BC. It's also how they broadcast stuff. The net is linked through the Niberian dotted crystal grid into natural configurations called um, crystal temple networks that are there's 24 primary crystal temple networks in the planetary grids that were always there way back in seeding one millions of years ago there when Nibiru at the time was under Emerald Covenant protection and they were trying to work with the Anunnaki races who were trying to be supposedly nice at the time there were something called Nibiru and crystal rods put into these 24 primary areas of crystalline caverns. They created a communication system, and it was used for interplanetary communication, and it was used you know, to generate certain types of energy, and it made a link to Nibiru. Well, when they put the Nibiran dotted crystal grid in in the third seeding, in 25,500 BC, they wired it in to this old communication network, and they got control of the 24 primary um, bases. They're literally temp crystal temples, like in those, like in the picture that's on the front of that. I don't have the, the other pictures of it that Leela had, but they're gorgeous. These are massive crystalline caves filled with selenite rods and some others. Once they had control of those, they had control of Earth's planetary templar grids, which means they could control what frequency was going to run in, you know, in, in the grids, and they would also be able to control what the stargates did once a star activation cycle happened. What they planned to do, that was 25,500 BC when they got all this mess set up. What they planned to do, the next stellar activation cycle from that point was supposed to be in 22,326 BC. They were going to do their final takeover then and bring the whole thing down into Phantom Matrix then. But our guys stopped it. They were able to do, I don't know what they did, but they did something with the gates, with Cirrus B, Gate 6, that shut down the stellar activation cycle before it fully commenced. Because once it, once it starts to commence and you get one of the gates fully open, you can't stop it or it'll cause, it'll like, it can actually rip the grids apart, not just create pole shift. There was a partial pole shift at, during that period of time and because we got attacked. I mean, we were, we were coming in to do the Christos mission to get that finalized. They were coming in to make sure we got sucked down into the Phantom Matrix. And the whole thing got put on hold and it created a stalemate. There was, the, you know, this would all be resolved during the next stellar activation cycle next dollar activation cycle that was, would come due is now 2000 to 2017. So we've had these messes to deal with. Then in 10,500 BC, various other ones started to put in the APIN systems, which would tap in. They made the wormholes in 10,500 BC. This is when they literally made wormholes or, um, let's say, made doorways 
through that wall in time that I talked about. They ripped holes in the wall in time, wormholes, so they could start, you know, so the different groups could start coming back and forth. They made the two wormholes. That's when the Nibiru and crystal grid system in the net became just one of the problems. Once the wormholes were in, all these APIN systems were put in. And they were like little landmines waiting to go off during, in the next stellar activation cycle. These are literally planted in our grids and they are starting to activate because we're in a stellar activation cycle. What we've seen in the last, <coughs> since 1916, has been a progressive covert war over whose APIN system was going to activate, therefore who was going to control the planetary grids when the stargates started to open. Okay, the Toth Enki group is, the, these guys are interesting. They're part of the Anu Seraphim. Now, we talked about Anu Elohim, which are the, La, Jeho, the, the Jehovian Anunnakis, are pure strain Anu Elohim. Anu Seraphim means they were Anunnaki that hybridized with some of the draconian races from the fallen Seraphim group. So they're part Anu Elohim and part Anu Seraphim. So they call them Anu, uh, and part fallen Seraphim. So they call them Anu Seraphim. The Anunnaki races that are affiliated with this line were their, their natural body form was an aquatic ape. That means they could breathe land, they, they were like a land or water ape. They could breathe water as well. The Toth, one, the Toth group, the Toth Enki group, were hybridized with the Zeta, which are the Zeta regalian insectoid reptilian things. They're, it's like when you look at a, a regalian, they're basically insectoid reptilian serpent template, that's what that race is, if you're going to try to describe what it is. So the Tothenki groups are the aquatic ape plus that Zeta insectoid reptilian serpent thing. They had their IPN system that was called the serpent that runs literally down the East Coast and down Central America and down into South America. All right, these guys were totally, they were involved with all sorts of stuff. If we go back in Egyptian history, they, these were the guys who did the Cirrus, Isis, Horus Egyptian lines. Most of our Egyptian history isn't human history. This is about the Leviathan races being controlled by the, you know, the uh, fallen angelic races who came in and took over the non-dynastic kings because the whole dynasty system, the way it was structured in Egypt, was a total Anunnaki construct. There had been people, the Maji king lines, that were there before, and Imhotep was actually like one of the last ones that actually had a name that you might recognize from somewhere. He was that. He was not just an architect. He was actually uh, he was a king, and he was taken over by Zosher. That's when the invasions really started to pick up. So when you look at our wonderful, you know, everybody goes, "Oh, we need Egyptian history," and you know, because we all have a feel that we might have a part of ourselves there. And there's just like this romanticism about it. If we only knew, <laughs> it's not, it's not heck, half as romantic as we might think. When we think about, oh, good old, or, you know, Osiris and Isis and Horus, and we study maybe the ancient mystical teachings of Isis and the girls of Isis, who are these people? They're Anunnaki. <laughs> okay, these guys are associated with the Toth schools, the Paracletes, the Atlanteans, um, the Alpha Omega Order, uh, Melchizedek. There's a whole bunch of them that are, you know, that are actually working with the other Alpha Omega guys that are from Alpha Omega Centauri, the Necromaton, these guys work with the Necromaton. They also work with just about anybody that it's convenient to work with at the time to get them where they want to. Now, there's another group called the Enlil Odetokron Anunnaki. The Toth group are from Nibiru, so are the Enlil Odetokron Anunnaki. The Enlil Odetokron Anunnaki are different shaped. They have the aquatic ape Anunnaki base, but they also have the avian reptile. Form. So their coating is a little bit different. It's not the Zeta form. It's the Odetokron avian reptile form. Um, these guys are from Ni Nibiru and also Tiamat. Okay, if we're going to go, most of these are located on Nibiru now. And Nibiru is the one that dips in and out of the phantom matrix because they have it on an artificial orbit. Um, there's also a planet called Tiamat that was a piece of Tara. Tara, our density two level of Earth that got blown off 550 million years ago and they hijacked it and took it into Phantom and they named it Tiamat. This is why they like to tell us, oh, well, Earth used to be part of our, you know, part of our planet Tiamat. It's like, not exactly. Tiamat used to be part of our planet Tara in density too. <laughs> yeah. So that if you read any of the stuff that comes out from the Pleiadian, Nibiru, and Anunnaki, they'll give you this whole line of nonsense and they'll use words like this, but they'll tell you that they created you. It's not the truth. All right, so these guys work together most of the time. The Tothenki group and the Enlil um, Odetokron group, they're associated with Nibiru, Tiamat, and a place called Avion Lyra. 
they were the ones that had been involved 250 billion years ago where their original founders groups had gotten twisted and they were from uh, the Gate 11 planet, Avion in Lyra and they're the ones that blew up uh, Stargate 12 and it almost took this whole time matrix down five, 250 billion years ago okay this was this these are these guys that that Avion Lyra Association is their highest level of D11 frequency where they're they're attached to gate 11 they have some of the gate 11 codes this is what they're trying to do they're trying to take over this time matrix in the phantom on reverse from gate 11 on down where they control the Templar but it won't have 12 Stargates, it will only have 11. That's where they're trying to sever the natural creation currents. Okay, you have Toth, Enki, Zephalium, Enki, uh, Enlil, Odetokron. These guys used to fight with each other over Egypt, and there were certain periods of time they raided Egypt, and they were trying to mine gold here. And they used to get in fights with each other because nobody wanted to work as the slaves in the mines. That's where they came up with the idea of making the Neanderthals. But then we have another group called the Marduk Satane. Draman Anunnaki. Now, Marduk Anunnaki are another group that originally started from Nibiru. They have the aquatic ape base, which is where all of these Nibiru and Anunnaki groups have the base aquatic ape, but then they're combined with other things. These guys combine with the Omicron Draconians, the dragon moths. They run a draconian agenda as opposed to an Anunnaki agenda. The Satan is a family line. That's where we got the concept of Satan. That's where that comes from. And Lucifer came from the same place, and they're not the same people. Then <laughs> no. there's some teachings. The Toth teachings will teach you that Lucifer and Satan were two different people. Yeah, they'll still put them in the context of the mythology, but they tend to make a difference, a distinction, where Satan was one, you know, one person or nasty angel, and Lucifer was another one that was actually better, but then did some things that got in trouble for. <laughs> so there are teachings that are actually out there that actually do show you that they're two different people. The Marduk Satan Draman family lines are affiliated with something. They used to be affiliated with the crocodile cults in Egypt, you know, where they were worshiping the crocodiles and all that kind of stuff. Um, they were very popular in Sumeria. Native Americans were infiltrated by these groups, the Akkadians and the Russians. That's their primarily affiliation with the you know, Russian family lines. They're associated with something called Draman the Dragon Queen. And this stuff has been surfacing on the internet recently because these guys are making contact with people. And most of it, unfortunately, is coming through the Native Americans, where they don't realize anymore, they don't have the history anymore either, who they're looking forward to. Because there's a bunch of them sitting there waiting for the Dragon Queen to come back, for Draman the Dragon Queen to come back. Well, this is the head honchos of this group. These are not nice people. These are the ones that they created the Set School in Egypt, where there's this, this different group of mystical teachings in Egypt, the Set School. They did that in competition with the other Anunnaki groups, the Osiris and all those guys. Then they also did something called the ne ne Necromancy. This is a book that's referred to as the Satanic Bible. It gives all sorts of interesting incantations and things that you can do to evoke things that you really don't want to evoke and really get yourself tied into full possession if you really work with the necromancy. It's the book of the dead or the book of the living dead. It can teach you how to rise things from the dead when you're not supposed to. All sorts of things. And the other guys that work with necromancy are the necromaton. That's where the name actually comes from. It was like a, a set of teachings that the necromaton and Drami and the, one, the, the ones that like the Drax um, made with the Marduk Satane Draman Anunnaki lines who are Drac Agenda. Real good. Well, I'm almost done. There's two more on here. Now, then I'll let you escape <laughs> for dinner. Yeah, and then we'll hit the fun stuff because I'm gonna we're gonna have fun when we start to when I, I I'm looking forward to the connections being made. When you're oh my God, that's what that's how we got here. It makes perfect sense when you start to see the events and how they unfolded. So we'll do that after dinner. But before we go, there's two more we can get to know. All right. One is the Marduk Luciferian Anunnaki. Now, again, that's out of that Marduk, particularly Marduk family line of the Nibiru and Anunnaki originally. They're the aquatic apes. Now, they're crossed with the Toth Enki Lulatan family line. Okay? So remember, the Toth Enki groups were the ones that had Zeta gene codes in with them. So they were like had a reptilian line in with them. So these guys are crossed with only one specific version of the Toth Enki group. It was called the Lulatan family line. That name Lilitan is where we get the Lucifer associations. Okay, this the, the Luciferians were anything that came out that was combined with or came out of the Lilitan family line of the Toth Enki collective. We also have another group over in the Pleiades called the Samjaze 
groups. They used the Palladian, Samjazi, Luciferian, Anunnaki. They are Luciferian because originally they came out of combining with the Lilitan family line of the Tothenki group. So these are just really like family genealogies when you start seeing the relationships. But it helps to realize that these names, we've got Satan, we have Lucifer, who are these people? They're, they're family line references. They have to do with gene codes and race groups. They have to do with Nibiru. Now, the Marduk Luciferians, ha they have primary uh, focus at this point. They started with Nibiru, but now they're in like Alpha and Omega Centauri, mainly Alpha Centauri. Um, they're affiliated with Tiamat and a bit with Nibiru, but not as much. These guys assisted in putting the Nibiru and Dotic crystal grid in the net, 25,500 BC. So all of these Anunnaki groups are affiliated with Nibiru and with Tiamat and with Alpha and Omega Centauri. These are the ones that were responsible for raiding the place 25,500 BC, where they put in the Nibiru and Dotic crystal grid. Then they have been progressively raided by other things that came in after when the wormholes were made in 10,500 BC. The last group, this is the Palladians. Do you ever look at the New Age section in a bookstore? There are Palladians everywhere. There are Palladian channels popping up everywhere, and they have been for at least 10, 15 years, some longer. The Palladians are not just that. I mean, you could call us Earthians, and it's not going to tell you a lot about us, right? We're Earthlings. What does that mean? Well, we probably come from Earth, okay? There's a lot of different groups here. It doesn't tell you anything. <laughs> the word Palladian is most often used just so we don't worry about who they might be. They're an Anunnaki strain. They're called the Palladian Samjaze Luciferian Anunnaki because Samjaze is a personification. It's actually part of their family name that they take on. And they, <laughs> there's this female that presents herself as Samjaze. And I, I met her once and I said, don't even talk to me. I remember you from about 25,000 years ago and I don't like it now either. <laughs> but she looks like a Barbie doll, okay? I mean, the long blonde hair and the overdeveloped upper half and, um, and the little shiny spacesuits and... You know, this type of thing, because she's presenting herself in the image she thinks will respond to. Yeah. I feel bad for the man called Billy Meyer, because he was having things with this person. And they, what they do is, these guys, these are the tricksters. The Palladians are the tricksters. And in some of their channeling stuff, they'll even tell you that. You know, but you think it's, oh, well, you seem nice, and you're talking to us about all sorts of really neat stuff. Now you're telling us you're tricksters, but, well, that must be okay then, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> they're really tricking you, because what they're doing is they're trying to take over like everybody else is. The Palladian Samjazi Luciferian groups are affiliated with Alcyone. What we identify as the star Alcyone in Pleiades here. <laughs> I might as well drop this one here. When we get to density two... When we get to density two, and I talk about that place called Tara, that's Earth's counterpart planet, what we see as Alcyon from density one is Tara in density two. In density three, we have a counterpart planet called Gaia. And that's etheric matter density. Density two is semi-etheric matter. Gaia, when we look up in our skies, is the star we identify as Polaris. All right. <laughs> So these places are a lot closer than we thought. <laughs> yeah, at least we get to see them. <laughs> so anyway, the, the Pleiadian Samjaz de Luciferians are at this point from Alcyone, a.k.a. Terra, because they took over half of the place. They took over part of Terra. That was part of the reason why the whole Earth missions had to be done. Because 550 million years ago, they decimated Terra and almost blew it up. And half of it ended up down here where it had to re-evolve. That's how we got back down here. Um, these guys work with something called, they work with the Niberian dotted crystal grid and the net, but they have something called the Phoenix APIM system. Now this is a, attached later when they, when they put the wormhole in. The Phoenix APIM system is attached to the Phoenix wormhole. And these guys tend to work a lot with, uh, they'll work with the White Eagle guys. Okay, remember the White Eagle APIN, APIN system is the one hijacked by the Necromaton and Drami. It used to be ours. It was a Gold Eagle then. And they hijacked it, and Necromi, Necromaton and Dramis have that. These guys usually work with them. So you have the White Eagle and the Phoenix tend to work together, unless they're having disputes. What we have, interesting, there's a song that, who, I forget who, who, who wrote that song, who sang that. There's a road, <laughs> if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. Season There's scale. a line in there, and the eagle flies with the dove. Yeah. This was a coded song, and the guy who wrote it didn't know that. Steve Stills, huh? Yeah, okay, Steve Stills, yeah. This, what this meant 
was the fact that the eagle, all right, usually the eagle and the, the phoenix were hooking up together. This is when there were deals being made by the Jehovian Anunnaki dolphin people, right? with the Necromaton and Dramis. The Necromaton and Dramis had the eagle, I mean, yeah, yeah, the eagle grid, and the dove grid belonged to the other one. So this stuff comes out in people. It comes out in our societies, and we don't realize the coding. But when we go into the, into the history from 1916 up, and it's not going to be a long, laborious thing, it's just a major key points to get the message across, we're going to see how all these creatures we're siding with each other and who is siding on which side. It helps if we can begin to remember each one of these collectives. I mean, the names are long. I mean, Plating and Nibiru and I don't know. Who is that again? The easiest way to remember them is by the APIN system that they use. We have doves. We have falcons. We have eagles. We actually have lions in there. That one's ours. <laughs> okay, we have the, the great lion that the Sphinx was actually modeled after. It's original. So when we get into APIN systems, tomorrow I'm going to have the maps ready for those. That's going to be a long night. But... <laughs> But I will have those ready. This is where it starts to be easier to remember who's who. If you can remember some of the basics, there'll be a chart that I'll have ready by tomorrow to show you, okay, you now you know who the groups are, and we'll show you just what the system is and name the name. So it'll be easy, quick reference. You have a visual reference to it. So we, what we're doing is we're having like a zoological uh, fight at the moment. We're having all sorts of animals going after each other. And, <laughs> and our guys are waking up too. We have the great white lion grid, which was the Elohai Elohim grid that's connected to Lyra Aramatena, D12. That one's been down for over 200,000 years. It's been, that was one of the very ancient ones, put in about 3 million years ago or more, uh, and actually probably about 5 million years ago. Our grids were put in to hold the planet together during stellar activation cycles after the electric wars 5.5 million years ago. Our grids weren't put in to manipulate them. They were put in to hold the planetary grid stable when they went through stellar activations. So we have these grids. We have that, the four faces of man that I talked about yesterday. These are systems. The four faces of man is called a, an LPIN system. It's not Atlantean, it's Lumerian. And the A in the APIN stands for Atlantean. Okay, they were Atlantean pylon implant networks. Okay, so what it's going to come down to is understanding where these animals live and understanding who belongs to which ones. And when it comes down to how we're going to fix the mess that we're moving into, that we're going to find out at the end of tonight when we come back from dinner, we're going to find out by the end of this history line, and it's not too long of a history line, we're going to sh find out what it is that has to be done to stop what by what, because uh, it, we're going to get into when there's going to be change, earth changes if we don't get this work done before the you know, before the beginning of next year, really. So we're going to just find out how to do it by activating our grids. All right. Now I, I'm going to let you go for for dinner. <laughs> yeah. And um, what, what's up? But right now, since we've been talking all of this talk about Atlantis, a lot of you guys that have the Templar manual, what? Can you hold off, please? Okay. Oh, there's a whole. I thought it looked kind of barren in here. There's a whole bunch of people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> to counteract the fourth Jehovian seal release and to counteract the pulses they're going to send through to make the two wormholes open up into one. If we're successful, it should be all right. We may get some hurricane activity, but it shouldn't be a problem. If not, it's going to be a big problem. And they just, re this is literally, they told me this yesterday. They gave this level of it yesterday. So I'll talk about that when we get through the timeline to bring us up to the present and yeah, what we're going to be doing. Um, so Peru is very important. Yeah. <laughs> Peru is very important. Yeah. Yeah, they're all important, but this one is like, it was like wh which way? It's, this is like the turnstile one. However, this goes. Yeah, what, January 1st? Yeah, January 1st. Yeah. That was oh, that was a riot. We didn't know how important it was either. <laughs> You know, we probably would have been terrified that we'd do it wrong or something. We'd never have missed that one. Right. Right. And yes. Peru looks like oh. that too. So we've got to go to Peru. Whoever can get there, we're going. <laughs> okay. Can I go yet? <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm ready when you are. Yeah. But the whole okay. thing that you are making <laughs> okay. this weekend yes. leads to that, no? 
Yeah, and then once that's done, we still have those 24 temples that we're recoding that we talked about in Kauai. Okay, but this is a big one. Like, we don't have any more to worry about if this doesn't go well. <laughs> okay, anyway. All right, now that we're back, and I'm going to try not to keep us here till like midnight, we're all snoring in our seats, <laughs> especially me, because when I go home, I have to get the other uh, diagrams and things ready for tomorrow. And because tomorrow we can't run real late, we could, but a lot of people have to get back on buses and things. So I'm going to try to wrap it up tomorrow for around 6 or 6.30, whatever the time is. Yeah, I think it, Mary said it was about 6.30. People had to catch buses. So I'm going to have to start at, you know, between 10.30 and 11 tomorrow and maybe just have a short lunch break and not, um, you know, we could do a picnic. Can we possibly do that? It will save, like, time running around for restaurants and everything tomorrow. So we can take a lunch break, you know, in here if we have to. But if it's nice weather, you know, just if we could bring a sandwich or something from, you know, one of the local convenience stores or something, it'll save time. Because I'm going to be out. I, I'm ready to fall asleep on my feet now. I won't be in about five minutes when I get going. But by the time I go home, I'm going to have to sleep a little bit, which is going to leave me probably maybe seven hours to get probably about 15 hours worth of work done to have this in here so you have something to take home with you. I'd like to have the diagrams done of the animals so you can see where these grids are and a couple other charts that will be very useful to go with the handouts that you have. Now I still encourage anybody that doesn't have the Templar manual, that is a compilation of about three or four different workshops. Like each level of data, it is worth getting if you don't have it, if you're interested in you know, really doing this work. But even if you don't have it, the stuff that you're getting, these, these little pieces of handouts that you're getting, that will give you the, the main focus of what you learned here in a condensed form so at least you have it. So tomorrow if we can try to, you know, we're going to probably try to keep the breaks short and just keep like maybe maybe an hour for lunch but really an hour, you know, like not an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes like they tend to go when everybody is running all over. And I will do my best to be here between 10.30 and 11. I will say that if I'm not here at 10.30, somebody else will be to start, you know, the work like they were today. Okay, yes? You have to leave at five. Oh, right. Well, I will try to keep that in mind and try to make it so you don't miss a lot in the last two hours. Okay. Is there anybody that has to leave before five? Oh, good. <laughs> I will do my best to get, you know, the most important stuff done before five. Yeah. Okay. An hour, an hour, an hour. <laughs> okay. Now, anyway, for tonight, since we probably was about quarter of nine now. It's, uh, ten after nine. Ten after nine? Yeah. Me and time and myself have an interesting relationship. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's ten after nine. All right. I'm going to try to be done here by ten thirty, quarter of eleven ish. So you guys get a chance to go to sleep, and so I get a chance to go to sleep before I have to wake up at about midnight to get back to working on this. So I want to cover a lot of ground quickly to get us to the end of what I wanted to cover today. All right. When I, we were talking about the races, and we talked a lot about, I talked a lot, about the races that are involved with the Illuminati, with the fallen angelics. And we've talked about Atlantis, and everything seems to be coming out of Atlantis, and these problems we have with these wormholes are coming from Atlantis. And for the people who haven't had any of the other courses before, I just wanted to show you this map. It is one of the ones out of that book. Um, this is the map of what the continents looked like before the cataclysm of 28,000 BC when the Atlantean continent got broken down into three island groups. All right, in through here, up here, this little thing, it actually looks like kind of like the profile of a sea turtle. And they, like this would be the flipper coming down, this would be the shell, that would be its tail, and this would be its head. And it actually used to be called Turtle Island. They referred to it as the turtle. This is why there's a lot of Native American legends that talk about life started on the back of a turtle, right, and this kind of thing. That there is a lot of the turtle affiliation with that. Over here, there was the other continent that was, uh, they call it Lumeria, but it was actually uh, Maharavi. It was what it was called. And that got shortened to Mu, <laughs> but it was Maharavi. And these two continents existed until this one went down in 50,000 BC. And it was because this one has something on it called Q-Site 12, which is the activation site for Stargate 12. Stargate 12 is in France at Mont Segur. And there, when the, in 50,000 BC, one of the Jehovian races tried to invade, and they literally did certain things to blow up 
this land mass, so they would shred the, the gate connections so you couldn't activate gate 12, and they were successful at the time. Gate 12 has been repaired since then, but it's not been activated because the grids couldn't run D12 frequency. So over here, what we have left of what was Lemuria is um, we end up with the, the islands, the Hawaiian islands, and then some of the, south, the you know, more in the South um, Pacific islands. Right here is, this one is, I think I have to say, I can't read these too good because they're fuzzy. This down here was Easter Island. That is another important Q site. I believe it's Q site 2 that goes with Stargate 2. Stargate 2 is off the coast of Siesta Key, Florida. Now when we come over here where this landmass used to be, this was here until 28,000 BC when another attempted attack ended up in creating the really photosonic pulses that they were using at that time. It's a combination of sound and light frequencies that were, it was a crystal based technology. And there were certain attempts to take over gates that were made by running ley lines from here over into what's now Giza, Egypt area. Because Giza, Egypt holds Stargate 4. And that's always been a prime area because that's the Stargate 4 connects to the solar gate okay, in the sun, which is the one that goes from D3 into dimension 4. It's the crossover point from this harmonic universe into the next density level. So it's always been a prime target. Because they were playing with frequency the wrong way through the horizontal ley lines here, they ended up creating a disaster. They created it on purpose, where there are ley lines, that, I mean, axiotonal lines that run vertically through here. There's one somewhere right about here, axiotonal 1. Then axiotonal 7 comes down here. That's the one at 70 degrees west longitude. All right. They ended up literally sinking parts of the continent. And it didn't just sink below the ocean. It sunk into the phantom earth matrix that was already there from 5.5 million years ago. This is why there's hardly anything left under the ocean of what Atlantis is. It didn't only go underwater. It went down into the phantom matrix. It was literally sucked, the landmass was sucked into a black hole, which means it went up in a ball of fire, the waters came in over it, and then literally it's the, part of its, the parts of the matter base here that couldn't transmute turned into ash, and the rest of it went down and reassembled into the grids of Phantom Earth. So right now, Atl where is Atlantis? Atlantis is alive and well in Phantom Earth, and that's in the Phantom Matrix. This is where these guys are coming from, a lot of them. They're still they're trying to come back up. Atlantis rising, you know how they're, that's kind of like a catchphrase in the New Age movement. That's what it's about. It's about them, the Atlanteans, and the whole thing coming back up. It's, we're going to start seeing Atlantis again. Why? Because they're planning to pull the rest of us down in there with it, where it'll be visible again. You know? <laughs> so it's more like Earth sinking rather than Atlantis rising. Right? <coughs> what was left after, these after the set of explosions that took place in 28,000 BC were these areas up here. They're called Lojas Atlantis. Down in here, which is now the Bermuda areas, they're called Nohasa Atlantis. And down in here was called Rua Atlantis. And there was literally like a land bridge that connected here and connected down and through here. That that was lost later. Even after these were island nations, the Bermuda Islands were a lot bigger than they are now too. Because in 9558 BC, when they purposely orchestrated again another cataclysm in order to bring more of it down in through the Phantom Matrix, these, uh, these areas got much smaller than they had been after the 28,000 BC thing. So, this at least shows you that once upon a time, our maps looked like this. In these times, this wasn't very far away. This is where North America is now. Columbus didn't discover America. They knew it was there all along. And a lot of the races, the Illuminati races, there'd be little... The Illuminati were always structured in a way where one or two of them had had, like, people out of each group would have contact with either... They'd either have channeling contact or they'd have direct physical contact with one of the fallen angelic groups, they'd be given information and told how much of it they were allowed to give to the next circle out. And then they would be told they could only give this much to the next circle out, to the point where, to, where you got like out here in the circles, where these guys had no idea, and they were just being directed by creeds they didn't even know what was at the center of. So <coughs> the Illuminati races, they have come up out of here. They knew about, the ones at the top echelon knew that Atlantis existed. They had the, they in fact, once in a while, they'd even get a chance to see one of the real maps that showed where it was and this kind of things. But for the rest of people, it became legend, it became mythology. Th these were real places. At the same time, 
these, it wasn't just Atlantis that was inhabited. This place has been inhabited literally for millions of years, and there's been a number of cataclysms, several house cleanings. There was a period of time, I believe it went from like 70,000 BC, 75,000 BC, up to, was it? It's in the, the timelines. I don't have the, these charts out. I won't even go back into that history now because I want to do current. But there was a period, a long period of time, many thousands of years, where the angelic human 12 tribes were actually in exile, hiding, because the Anunnaki races from Nibiru had come in and taken over the planet. They hadn't got full control of the grids, and they hadn't got rid of humans, but they had come in and dominated the surface Earth, where humans literally had gone into underground civilizations, not an inner Earth, but literally beneath the, you know, in caverns beneath the surface earth. And there were long periods of time where just to keep our races alive on the planet, that we lived in those type of conditions while they were running around on surface, taking over everything. There were, over in this area, was what we would call the U Empire. That was one of the, there were five primary races, the they were called Palladia Urtite Cloister races, that started seeding three of the angelic human lineage. And the first, they had these, these groups, the names here, go with them. This one was the U Empire, and they were over in this area that's now like China and everything. Down here, it was called the Rama Empire. That's down in through India and spreading into some of the, you know, the Middle East. Um, he, over here, we had two of the races. They were called the Ur and the Brenoa races. And down in through here, up in through here, and over in the Lumerian area, you had the Iani and the Mua, which were the Mauravi. They were the primary five races. The Iani were the High Council. They were the ones that came from Inner Earth, the Indigo High Council, that came in and helped to set, set everything up here. They helped to reseed for seeding three. So this was really what the world looked like in those days. So the information that we're, we're um, giving you now, as far as wormholes, you know, and Atlantis and everything, these were real places that we're talking about. There were real maps that showed what we have now, where it goes with that. So now that I showed you this, a lot of you have already seen it from Kauai and things, but for the people who hadn't seen it yet, these are the beginnings of the Atlantean maps so at least show relationships of where were these continents. We know what happened to them now. Part of them got literally sucked down into the black hole matrix. The other parts, they're still going to find some things. There are going to be some things surfacing because of shifting that's going to be going down frequency-wise as, as more of the planetary grids activate if things go well here. There will be things found beneath the oceans that right now literally aren't there to find yet. As we move into higher frequency, there's literally going to be more manifestation taking place. So we have, there's a lot of discoveries that are going to be found if things progress well and it doesn't go in a cataclysm. It's going to be a very interesting period of 20 years past this point because it will take us in, it will literally change all of the things we were taught about how reality is because there will be things that are becoming apparent that show where what we were taught about reality was erroneous. It wasn't true. So we have things to look forward to is finding parts of the evidence of these civilizations. Part of that's already happening. I've talked about in Kauai, we talked a lot about the uh, crystal, the Nibirian crystal temple networks. These are those things with the huge, massive selenite rods in them. And, and Leela actually got this lady here. It was so funny the way it was arranged. She came to one of our workshops, and right after that she got, she got invited to this expedition in Mexico. And they were they had just discovered these this huge cavern with these awesome massive like skyscraper height almost selenite crystal rods and she brought pictures back real pictures that she was there she's standing underneath them you know what i mean and then she brought them to the Kauai workshop and it was interesting because she didn't know that i was going to teach about the crystal caverns all right the crystal networks that are the Nibirian crystal temple networks connect to an organic feature of Earth's body, which are called the crystal caverns. These are actually deep within the ground, particularly beneath a lot of the oceans and deep within the continents. There are crystalline tunnels and caverns that in certain parts of them, they have frequency modulation zones, which are portal passageways. If you have the right frequency in your DNA, you will be able to see where they are and be able to pass through them if you have the pass keys in your DNA. The crystal caverns, we started to, you know, we had been given the information on them. We're doing a workshop on it. It wasn't even known that that was going to be part of it. She shows up at the workshop to attend the workshop with this whole book full of pictures of the crystals. It was like perfect synchronization. So the things are starting to be found. They said there's going to be two more. I think they said it was by... 
2002 or three, there was going to be two more large networks, like the ones that were just found in Chihuahua, uh, Mexico, in other regions. They didn't say where they were going to be found, but they said there would be two more. And there's one of them that's amethyst, that actually, they're not all selenite rods. So there's going to be some interesting discoveries as we move along, as long as things stay stable enough where we have a chance to enjoy the discoveries. <laughs> okay? So this is Atlantis, or this was Atlantis. That was Lumeria. That was us, South America, Asia. And at least we still have, and it's kind of funny because in the Atlantean period, in my lifetimes there, in our simultaneous time, I have spent a lot of time in Lojas. That was kind of where I spent a lot of time as far as many of my simultaneous incarnations were in that area. And also over here in what had been Lumeria before it became islands. At least we have England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales left because they are a part of Atlantis. They are the part that remained visible. And there has been a whole big important thing of hiding things on maps. That as soon as they did the 9,558 BC house cleaning here, literally things like maps that showed where parts of things were, were confiscated. And then false maps were evolved. And we were gently guided into creating this illusion of what we think was our history. We were helped all along to create the false history by having people having contact. Most of our history and our religious books were channeled. All right, that's the easiest way for them to communicate with people here from the Phantom Matrix. If they can get into your field, they can move part of their energy field, like pretend you're, you have your astral body, it's like your ghost body, and you can move it over to the side where you can put it in somebody else's body if you wanted to. This is how the distortions came most of the time in our history records, in our uh, in the religious records, how they twisted books. They, the whole thing, <laughs> there was at one point released some of the story, and it's going to be released in not this book that's coming out, but the next one. The story of Moses in all of that. This was a riot. Galactic Federation was at the center of that one. I mean, part in the Red Sea and all this. Well, you could say God did it, if you want to call God Galactic Federation. All right? The things that have been attributed to God in our, in our Bibles and in our holy books were not acts of God. That was in, except, well, I guess they were. There was a truth to that. The Anunnaki groups are calling themselves our gods. And in that sense, yes, they were acts of those gods, but they're not our gods. When the walls of Jericho came tumbling down and Babylon was flattened and all those things, these were photosonic technologies that were used. These were things that actually had almost like ray guns, okay? They were physical technologies. They weren't some god saying, you were bad, so we're going to get rid of you. This was part of the war games. So at this point, we're faced with this huge revelation of history, the kind of it, when, it, when it started to come through, and they were giving me layer after layer of this, I was just numbed, like watching the, the trade tower things, just numb. I was, yeah, and I had enough incarnational memory open to know they were right, because I remembered being in those times, and I could never figure out how come I had these memories. How did they fit with this history that we're telling us? Because it didn't seem to fit. It made sense with what I knew inside. All of us have these memory banks. They're not active yet, but the more we work with DNA activation, the more we will get our memory of these times back. There's a part of each of us now in the Atlantean period, in the Lumerian period. If we're here, it implies that we're also there because it's simultaneous. When we incarnate, we come in simultaneously into 1,728 different time vectors. So we have 1,728 different selves, and that's if, you have, that's if you're just human. That's if you have a you 12-strand know, pattern. If you're an indigo, you have lots more than that. Indigos you can look at, they have, some have a, a 12 strand and another 12 strand, some have 12, 12, and 12, and some have 12, 12, 12, and 12, <laughs> with 1,728 that go with each one, <laughs> right? So <clears throat> those other selves of you exist right now with you. They're alive in their time frames, like you are, and they're a part of your avatar consciousness. When you get to be fully an embodied avatar, you will know yourselves as all of those selves. Your concept of self expands. You'll realize that, yeah, I had that body form there, or I'm manifesting in that body form there, and I have these purposes in this part of my life. You all of a sudden have, you realize yourself as beyond body form that has the ability to put yourself into multiple body forms at the same time. So it's a whole new level of revelation of self when you start to get into this space. What's good about this, the fact that we're connected to our other time selves, is we can help each other in times like this. They know some of them are in more advanced cycles where they're not as repressed as they are here. In the inner earth, we have incarnations in those time cycles. It's a different time matrix, literally, that interfaces with our own, that creates the inner earth time cycles. There are selves of us there. 
they're the ones that are sending the information to us here to help us to get out of this predicament because if we get stuck they get stuck so there's this huge support system we can get scared sometimes if we look around and think god we're all alone with this and you know we're just learning this knowledge and it's a tiny little group and there's a whole bunch of groups that are not going to want to deal with this stuff particularly if they're dealing with any anybody on that that list that i had up first <laughs> you know if you start to realize that you're not alone here and you never were it's really helpful because you have a support team with you they're in other time frames but times aren't far away they're actually taking place in the same space the only thing making you separate from your other time selves is the axis on which your particles are rotating that is it all right angular rotation of particle spin allows multiple different reality fields and matter fields to take place in exactly the same space but be imperceivable and invisible to each other where they literally pass through each other so yourselves are very close and it can help to know that it can help to draw on that or if you realize that you're here as part of a team what would look like a team if you got all of yourselves into this time continuum you'd have quite the party you would have at least 1728 and possibly four times that and that would just be you Interesting. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I remember, but my first thought was, oh God, I wouldn't want to have to figure out what to wear in the morning. <laughs> it's hard enough with one body. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so now, okay, I'm going to go into this is the stuff that. Th this is the stuff. When I saw how this unfolded, I was going to shake my head and say, oh Lordy. <laughs> well, I'm going to try the show. Yeah, we can get that a right shot. Now. Yeah. Okay. The recent timeline of events from 1916 yeah. to 2001. I'm going to go through some of it fast because if I go through this as slowly as I did the first part, <laughs> we'll be here until probably next Friday. All right. 1916, the Zetas. That's the Zeta Regalian races. They are the ones that have the, uh, the Zeta Draconian agenda. All right. The Zeta races of Phantom Earth opened the Atlantean Falcon wormhole. All right, we had the falcon wormhole and the phoenix wormhole. All right, the, they opened the falcon wormhole off the eastern coast of South Carolina, and it's right down there, like close to the border of Florida, and then the phoenix is right below that, like across from out, out on the coast of like St. Augustine, Jacksonville, that area of Florida. Okay, so they opened the wormhole. That was, the worm, both of these wormholes were located in lower Nohasa, Atlantis. Hmm? Sonics from their side. Okay. And they've been trying to do it for a long time. It took them a long time to get through the cap, the frequency cap that the Guardians had put on it. Excuse me a minute. It's getting hot. Here we go again. You can feel the energy coming in. This is where I was drooping before and I was tired while we were having dinner. Now I'm getting the energy coming back in. I can feel it. I'll probably start talking fast. Uh, if I don't, we're not going to get out of here in time. <laughs> okay. All right. They, they came in and they began speculating for invasion. Now, this is a situation where they came in to our time frame. The Anunnaki had been dominating everything here since Atlantis. The Anunnaki are the ones who orchestrated the fall of Atlantis. They're the ones, they had the Niberian Dyadic Crystal Grid already operational here. They had the net operational here. They had control over most of the Illuminati hybrid races here. So it was um, Anunnaki dominated predominantly for most of the time from Atlantis all the way through. There were always these competing groups of fallen angelic races that were trying to get in to work with their Illuminati, where you had the Draconian races coming up and competing with them, and some of the Centaur races coming up, you know, through their through their Illuminati races here, competing. That's why we had a huge history of fighting since the Atlantean period, because you had these various different Illuminati groups that were taken over human tribes, and then they were fighting with each other because they represented different fallen angelics. But when when we entered this century, the Anunnaki races figured they had it aced. All right, they, you know, 100 years before, you know, the year 2000, were, they, they had a ace. They were in control of most of the Illuminati races. They had the territories mostly under their control as far as gate territories and all that kind of stuff. So they figured they were just going to run their little agenda and come in here as our space brothers and get it all done nice and neat and just get rid of the other, you know, the competitors. Well, they had quite a surprise. In 1916, the Zetas from Phantom Earth managed to break through the wall in time and started to invade here. And what they did was they made treaties with certain members of the uh, 
the Illuminati races. Now, remember, the Illuminati were pretty much controlled already through mystical schools that had come up literally from Atlantis. They were controlled by Anunnaki. All of a sudden, you have these little gray guys coming in and saying, hey, you're being positioned for an invasion. These Anunnaki races are trying to come in here and, and invade you. Talk about Pat calling the kettle black. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So the Illuminati are like, oh, they are. They're trying to invade, aren't they? The Zetas convinced the Illuminati that the Anunnaki were trying to invade, which was true. They forgot to tell them that they were too. So the Zeta treaties came down in the early 1930s. Actually, in, they started in the 1920s. The 1930s is when they began to make official treaties where a group called MJ-12 or Majestic 12 was formed that had to do with certain members of the Illuminati in America and in several other countries. It became the foundation of what later became the CIA in, in America, but it's connected with a bunch of other groups. Now, most of the people in the CIA don't know anything about MJ-12. The highest, the, even in the highest ranks of most of our government and our services on the outside, they really don't know, and they honestly think most of this is just controversial, uh, like, you know, made-up stuff. They don't even realize there's ETs. Some of them do, but most of them don't. The ones who know that ETs have been here are literally on death oaths, where literally they have signed contracts before they get to see or know anything, that if they reveal this information, they will be killed, but not only them, their families will be hunted. And that's what keeps them quiet. They're quiet because they're afraid. And most of them didn't get in on it because they wanted to see ETs. They were usually in a level of service that had top security clearance to begin with. And certain things were going down, and one of their Illuminati bosses, because see, the Illuminati guys are positioned in very, very specific little places. You don't have Illuminati controlling any one government. They're just certain people put in the right places in power positions where they get to pull strings on the lower ranks below them. So the Illuminati people get kind of suckered into this stuff. They, they really do. People, when we look at our external governments, these guys have been messed with just like the rest of the humans here. Except the only difference was they had some knowledge something was going on and they trusted the wrong groups. They got played because of their own greed. Because there was a greed factor that played right into the Zetas plan where the Illuminati guys wanted power. They wanted dominion over territories here. They didn't know about Stargates. That was a new surprise because they didn't remember from Atlantis either. But <coughs> the Zetas come in and say, okay, this invasion is coming. We can stop this invasion. And then we can get you in any position of power you want. We'll give you this technology. We'll give you weapons technology. They, and they did. They gave them certain types of weapons technology. So in the 1930s, you had the Zeta Regalian Treaties and Majestic 12. And what happened from that point on was a very rapid organization of something called the World Management Team. It was already a not quite as formalized organization of Illuminati um, covert governing. But it was more like tribes that were governing things from behind the scenes that were being motivated by the Anunnaki races. When the Drax came in, the, you know, the Zeta Regalians on behalf of the Drax, they homogenized everything into, it was like the beginning of our corporate structure. They pulled it all together and, you know, did like time efficiency and got everybody really organized so they'd function well. They created the world management team, which later moved into like the, what they call it, the, the like World Banking Commission stuff and, and the multinational corporations. All of this stuff came out of the activities of the world management team, Bilderberg Commission, all of this stuff. This started, and we actually have the Zetas and the Drax to thank for that. The Anunnaki hadn't quite got that far. They were still playing with religions and had their, like, nice Templar groups and various mystical societies, but they hadn't quite pulled the political organizations together. The Drax did that through the Zetas when they came in. Now, in the, also in the 1930s, the, when the, once the Zetas got in here, they began to activate the old Falcon APIN system. That was the one that was connected to the Falcon Matrix. And the Falcon literally spread its wings across the planet. So these were these little um, microchip-like implant grids that ran through the planet. What these grids do is they allow for communication, they allow for frequency transmission and broadcasting, but they also allow, they can fire, which means they'll pop and create little black holes along the whole grid that would connect See, the, they, these were put in with the purpose of when the stellar activation cycle came to activate and fire them all, which would create a whole series of little black holes, kind of like, you know how when a needle runs across a piece of fabric from a, like a sewing machine needle, it leaves all those little 
holes. Well, if you do enough of those holes, that whole piece will fall right into the Phantom Matrix. That's what they were created for. The ones that the uh, Guardian races created were meant to work differently. They were meant to create pillars of sound that would anchor our grids into the grids of inner Earth, parallel Earth, and another time matrix called the, uh, the Miage Zone System, which is another one that interfaces here only sometimes, to give us pillars of energy that would allow us to not get pulled down into Phantom. So, they begin to activate. The Zetas begin to activate in the 1930s, their um, Falcon APIN, uh, APIN system, also in the 30s. They begin to assist to more fully organize Hitler's Nazi movement. They had a vested interest. They could do some interesting things with the Hitler guys. Well, one of the first things they wanted to do was to get rid of certain races that were com com competing. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting tired. The races they were most interested in getting rid of were a certain group that had been very loyal to the Anunnaki Illuminati and that they wouldn't go into the Zeta contracts. And these guys were Hebrew. They, they, were, they were passed off as Hebrew, but they weren't Hebrew people. They were Hibiru. They were the Hibiru race lines. Now, hiding under the guise of Hebrew, you have real Hebrew people, which were angelic humans. You have Hyksos, false Hebrew people, which were one of the hybrid lines from the Anunnaki side. And you have Hibiru that has both Anunnaki and Drak family lines in it. What the, what the Zetas wanted done was to get rid of a whole bunch of the Hibiru and the Hyksos lines of what appeared to be the Jewish population, but to leave the ones that were the draconian lines. And for a while, that was going on. As we moved through the, you know, this period, we're going into, into World War and everything. I'll go, I'll go down to here, because we have stuff to do in here that's, that just blew my mind when I found out about what, what the whole Japanese thing was really about. But down here, but at first we had in the 30s, the Zetas and the Drac agendas were assisting Hitler. Down here, by the time we crest, you know, kind of moved into the 40s, Hitler started to make double deals because the Necromaton and Dramis approached him. And they started to promise him that they would, show him, they would lead him to ancient relics, the Templar prizes. And they did. They showed him some stuff. They gave him some stuff, and that's still buried out there someplace. You know, the Nazis actually had some of the ancient relics from Atlantis because they, you, the um, Necromaton and Dramis used them for barter to convince Hitler and his group to do some double dealing for them. And what the Andromis wanted was, from, since you're getting rid of all these people, why don't you get rid of those Drac families too, the ones that the Zetas wanted protected? So Hitler started to do that on behalf of the Andromis because the Andromedes were pay paying them with some knowledge, mystical knowledge, and some of the relics from Atlantis. So <coughs> this didn't settle really well with the Zetas. They got very upset, in fact. So they worked with the Allies to make sure Hitler was taken down. What was interesting before that, when the Drax were assisting Hitler, one of the ways they were assisting him was having the Illuminati in the Allied countries finance the Hitler movement. <laughs> Literally, the United States Illuminati, the European Illuminati. While we're fighting these guys, the Illuminati guys are taking money from us and giving them to them to keep their movement going. So this is some of the sleight of hand that's been going on you know, with our politics. What was really bizarre was what happened with the whole, um, you know, the Pearl Harbor leading to Hiroshima and all of that thing. What happened with this was the, as, at the points where in the 1930s the Zetas were expanding and activating their Falcon APIN system. Now this APIN system had some major sites that were more important than others, that had primary links that were stronger and larger than some of the smaller ones. One of the biggest ones, and most important ones, if they were going to completely spread, their, you know, activate their matrix around the globe, was located in Nagasaki, Japan. Interestingly, not Hiroshima, Nagasaki. And because the Necromaton and Dramis were getting a little nervous at this point because the Drax had come in, you know, the, the Zetas on behalf of the Drax had come in, they'd literally gotten control of the Illuminati world management team and they were starting to get control of the grids. And the Andromis didn't like that too much. It was becoming a nuisance and a problem. So the Necromis were, the Necromaton were going to build bases. One of them was going to be beneath, like in, in the waters around and beneath Nagasaki, so they could set up their own sonic system and block the Zetas from further activating the full Falcon grid. That didn't settle very well with the, with the Zetas. They were also, the Necromaton were also going to put a base over 
in Hawaii, in the Hawaiian waters, and they were going to control certain networks on the Falcon through the ley line grids by having these bases here. They were going to stop the Falcon from fully spreading its wings. Well, that was the agenda the Necromaton had at the moment anyway. So what was done was a little interesting little deal where the Zeta groups approached their Illuminati races because they had collectives here, they had collectives in Japan, they have them all over the place. It's not one nationality, you know, has Zeta races and another has an Anunnaki. There are dominant ones, but really they're scattered throughout. So the Zetas approached both the Japanese Illuminati and the United States Illuminati. They told them what was going to go down. They told Japan to invade, to give us an excuse to go into the war. We knew, certain levels of our Illuminati knew that was coming. In fact, there were even messages sent when those fleets were coming in. They were spotted, they were seen by U.S. troops, and the information was sent back. But it was, it was received, but it was never acknowledged having been received. So we got a surprise attack. Hmm? In the case of New York City. I mean, there were nine messages. Oh, nine yeah. Messages. Yeah, I didn't even talk about that yet. So, we had this situation, this drama created. The purpose of the drama was the Zetas, who were in power at the time, under, for the DRAC agenda, mobilized their Illuminati on both sides of the game to create a war game so they could, at one point, first of all, they stopped the Necromaton from building a base over in the Hawaiian area, because there was so much scrutiny at that point and so much military presence in that point, they weren't going to be able to quietly build an underground base without getting spotted. So they weren't able to build their, the Necromaton weren't able to build their base off the coast of Hawaii. And that led to, after some other fancy dealings with other countries like Hitler and things like that, it led to this was what they really wanted to do. The Necromaton had succeeded to some degree in sealing off the Nagasaki port interface that went with the Falcon Matrix. They didn't fully have a base there yet, but they'd started to build one and they had what's like a frequency fence or um, a uh, cloaking shield. Now if that cloaking shield was on there, the Zetas couldn't activate it. So they had to get something big enough and powerful enough and they didn't have the grids fully activated yet to do the sonics the way they do now. If they were going to get that sonic power in the grids, they had to have all of these online. But if you drop a nuclear bomb on top of one of them, it tends to leave a weakness in those kind of fields that will allow mild sonics, which they did have access to, to shatter it. So they went after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Hiroshima was very interesting. It had a whole little collective of Necromaton and Drami Illuminati hybrid races. But the majority of the populations of Hiroshima were of the U-race descent. They were Maji Grail Line Indigos that were grid guardians. And they wanted to get rid of those and get rid of the you know, competing Illuminati while they were at it. So they took out Hiroshima, but what they were really after was Nagasaki. Because they needed to get that bomb dropped on those sites to weaken the force field that was over their, you know, over their port interface system. So they could then use the mild sonics they had available to completely flatten the force field so they could activate that site and get their supersonic waves available. What they've done by activating the full matrix of the, uh, the Falcon, they were harnessing the power of being able to create targeted um, unnatural disasters, earthquakes. I mean, <laughs> Alaska has been since the 30s and like moving especially up into the 40s, 50s, and 60s. This was like testing ground. They were using all sorts of sonics up there to see if they could target earthquakes, how far they could get. If you ever look at the information, like just, you know, that's on record as far as the earthquakes up in the Alaska area. There was Alaska, they went for certain desert areas, then they started to go for, for, go for population areas when it became time to start reducing populations. Because they knew that for the year 2000 to 2008, when their invasion was scheduled to go, if the Stargates were going to open, which they didn't know until 1998, nobody was absolutely certain if the frequencies in the grids would be enough to actually trigger what's called grounding of the stellar bridge. That is when certain frequencies start to come down from the higher dimensional gates. And if there's a compatible frequency in Earth's core, they will latch together, and that's what starts the cycle, the stellar activation cycle. It wasn't until 1998 that anybody knew for sure if it was actually going to go into full stellar activation. But everybody had their troops in position by that time. So all through, literally, 
from the periods of time when World War II was orchestrated as a territorial conquest and competition between who was going to get what grids activated, it went into series of several types of testing. Now, still throughout this time, the Zetas, on behalf of the, the, dra the draconian agenda, were doing population reduction experiments to see, okay, when it got closer to 2000, what would they use to really, you know, take them out. And the idea was to take them out without getting the surface people all stirred up, because the last thing any of them wanted was for us to realize there was an invasion taking place, because there was enough of us to do something about it. And you had the Guardian groups trying like heck to try to get in here and communicate with any of us. If we started to realize from this level there was an invasion taking place, the Guardians might just get an in and somebody might listen if they could get through to them telepathically or something. So it was always had to be kept hush-hush, make sure the general populations don't know, most of the military and governments don't know. Only head echelons in the Illuminati have had the privilege of knowing that we've had ETs here for 70 years. Okay? So it progressed from World War II drama. Um, let's see. In 1943, this was after like the war stuff had you know, <laughs> begun to cool down. 1943, there was something called the Philadelphia experiment was launched. All right, this was done on August 12th, 1943. And if you'll notice in a lot of things, August 12th comes up all the time. August 12th is an important time in relation to how frequency works in the planetary grids. It's called a magnetic peak point. What that means is the planetary magnetic Merkaba spins at its fastest during that time. It's, I think it starts around the 8th of August. It, it hits its climax point at the 12th and then like still is is still at a peak until I think about the 15th so there's usually activity if they're gonna do sonics or anything they need to amplify them these are the periods of time that they use August 12th Montauk was done August 12th alright there has been August 12th all along has been a point in time when if there were gonna be sonics used in the grids that had to have an extra kick behind them that's when we do them that's why the dimensional blend experiment of 2003 was scheduled for August 12, 2003. That was supposed to be the last phase. First you had Philadelphia Experiment. That did one thing. What the Philadelphia Experiment did was it took the Falcon, the Falcon um, wormhole, which already had some of its APIN systems activated, and it blew open smaller wormholes in the Philadelphia area. These were areas that were already spiked. They were parts of the Falcon grid that had been put in in Atlantis, but they were larger holes. They were wormholes that you could actually use. You could literally go from that wormhole directly into Phantom instead of having to go from the port interface site down back to the main wormhole and in. So these were like direct smaller holes that would lead in. They did the Philadelphia experiment. And what they did in the Philadelphia experiment is they got literally the whole East Coast lineup in. They activated all of those grids, which ran from Portland, I think Portland, Maine, all the way down through Boston, down through New York City. All of our major cities have been built along these lines. It wasn't an accident. They were built along these lines because concentrations of populations were needed there because that's the areas where you need to run the frequency through the DNA templates to have the most effect. So they would set up, literally, the places where major civilizations were going to take place to make sure concentrations of bodies were going to be on those grids. All right, so by the time we did the 1943 experiment, this really gave them an extra, the that is an extra, uh, they, they were really in control of things at this point because they had control of most of the grids. The other matrices, the Falcon matrix and the other competing APIM systems weren't activated yet. And the Anunnaki has still had part of their advantage. They had the Niberian data crystal grid and they had the net, but they were progressively losing control of the sites that they used to have everything under control through the net. They couldn't use that anymore because progressively the Zetas were, the Falcon Matrix, was getting control over the 24 Crystal Temple sites that have talked about, you know, the Niberian Crystal Temple sites. They're getting control over the grids. So this was starting to create an issue. Now that the Drax had come in, on beha you know, the uh, Zeta Regalians on behalf of the Drac agenda, they had come in, and all of a sudden, the Anunnaki realized they weren't getting as far as they wanted to as fast. They thought it would be an easy kill. They thought they'd come in here and just get rid of some, you know, troublesome uh, Illuminati groups that belong to the Drax and belong to the Necromaton, and then they'd just, you know, saunter in and take the place. It wasn't going to go that way because of what happened in the 30s and 40s. Now, in 1951, the Necromaton and Dramis begin to make deals with the Jehovian Anunnaki 
Now, usually the Kramaton don't want to talk to anybody, and the Jehovians don't either. So they had something in common. They didn't like anybody else but themselves. So they decided to make a deal, because they're watching this happen. They're watching the Drax take over, and they don't like the other Anunnaki groups. So they're thinking, you know, by the time we're supposed to activate our APIN systems, we're not going to be able to activate them. They're going to take, over, to take them over. So there were deals made between the Necromaton and Dramis and the Dove Matrix, which are the ones that were associated with the Enoch teachings before, the Jehovian bipedal, bipedal dolphin people of Sirius A, Arcturus, and tra Trapezium Orion. All right. So the Necromaton and Dramis had already gotten control like th this, this happened right before. Uh, this happened in Atlantis, right before the fall of Atlantis. Our grid that was called the Golden Eagle APIN system, that was taken over because the, the temples it was controlled from were taken over by Necromantan Andromi races. Then they had literally held control of our Golden Eagle grid, and they called it the White Eagle, kind of like thumbing their nose at us that oh, we're the Christos Eagle now. These are the, the false um, Melchizedek priesthood guys. <laughs> the, and most of them, a, a lot of them anyway, are Nephilim, which were, if anybody's read Voyagers Volume 2, the original copy, we talked about Nephilim as being a race that during seeding 2 of the angelic human lineage here, they had, there had been Anunnaki invasions and they came in and they forced themselves on women here and they created a race of, in the Bible they're called a race of giants because they were much larger than regular humans. And the Nephilim were kicked off this planet by the guardian races and they were like sent to Nibiru and wherever the heck else they wanted to go but they weren't allowed to be here anymore after we got the territories back at, um, at the beginning for seeding three. So there are all sorts of treaties even then that were going down. This is a very long history of war that we're part of. But so these guys make deals. You have Necromantan and Dramis that have their white eagle grid and you have the Jehovian Anunnaki with their dove grid. So this is where you have the eagle flying with the dove. All right, these are these deals. They started in the 1950s. What they wanted to do was they wanted to be able to open the Phoenix wormhole. That was the one that was positioned below the Falcon wormhole, right literally on the same vertical, but right below it, the one that's right off the coast of Florida where the other one's right off the coast of South Carolina, up a little bit from it. These guys over here. So the, these guys wanted to open this wormhole because this one was already open, and that's the Falcon one that the, the Zeta guys were using. So they wanted to open this one and get their matrices running. If they could get the Phoenix wormhole open, they would be able to start activating the Dove grid and the White Eagle grid. So they could start fighting for dominance of the planetary grids to stop the, to stop the uh, invasion of the draconian agenda Zetas. This continued literally through, through the 50s, through the 60s. The Drax remained in control until 1972. In 1972, it was getting to the point where all the Anunnaki were freaking out because the Drax just had such a hold on things. And they were determined that even if they had to help each other, you know, the groups of Anunnaki that don't like each other, they decided, well, if we have to stick together for a little while just to get rid of these guys, we'll do it. What they wanted to do was they wanted to open that wormhole and close the other one. That was what they were hoping to be able to do. Open the Phoenix, close the Falcon, now we've got it. That kind of thing. And meanwhile, we're all like, you know, by this time, most of us were on planet and, you know, getting raised and watching things like Leave it to Beaver on television. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> you know, being fed this, this illusion of what life is really about. Well, meanwhile, this chaos has taken place underneath the government. In the same time, we're being taught, the pl in America, we're being taught the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag, and we're, we're raised with this wonderful bubble of emotion about being American. You know a song that still just makes me want to cry? Or smack a Zeta? Here's <laughs> 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 the one that goes, I'm proud to be an American, cause at least I know I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least we thought we were free. <laughs> you know, there's something horribly sad about that. And I look at the people, a lot of people that get upset with the work that I bring out are people that have been in the military. How can you say that about our government? Wait a minute. Listen to what I'm saying. Most of you guys are good guys that give your life for that American Constitution. I know that. I didn't say you were doing this. You know what I mean? That, because there's that reaction. There's, America meant something conceptually at least, we were led to believe in America that this was the land of the free and the home of the brave and we stood for freedom and justice and rightness. And what is so sad 
is that's what the people stand for, but it hasn't been the reality of what's been taking place in the governments. So meanwhile, we go and worry about what, who we're going to vote for next November, and we, we worry about watch those you know, returns and see who's going to be the politician up there, when you know it hasn't mattered since the 1930s. Because you're going to have one of two choices. You're going to have Drac, or you're going to have Anunnaki candidate. Pick one. What does it matter? They both want to take over the place. And the people who are the candidates don't know that. Okay, the people who end up playing the puppets to this, they don't know what they're playing the puppet to. They're doing their roles, we're all doing our roles. And meanwhile, there's these little guys directing things behind the scenes. This is what we've been living. This was like devastating to me when I started to see all the pieces. And what really made, really hit home was when they, how they explained that since the 30s and progressively through the 40s, 50s, and in the 60s it even increased, where the draconian races, the, the Zeta races on behalf of the draconians, were progressively playing with technologies to take out large numbers of humans without being detected as the ones who did that. They created ethnic viruses that were to go after just specific types of people, races that had certain gene codes where they would, it wouldn't affect others, but they would affect those. Indigos were on the list. Humans were on the list. Illuminati, only competing types, were on the list. All right. They were using targeted sonics to create earthquakes, to create natural disasters, to see how far they could go with it. This was all being done covertly. And some of the military people that found out that things like this were actually going on and tried to do something about it vanished conveniently. They would be taken out. They would literally disappear. All of a sudden they got assigned in some place on active duty and got killed. Can't find the body. You know, or got blown up in a helicopter. No body left. Just a little bit of ashes or some bones. There have been things going on beneath the surface of this that have been horrendous. They've been really horrible. And we've been living our little American dream bubble as if everything's okay. That's what I think for at least like in Europe and things like that, people from Europe, they've seen a lot. Their, their, their governments have been around for a very, very long time. And the people I've just, like with, with Michael and the people I've met by being over in England with Michael, they're just a lot more aware in certain ways. They're not as easy to put one over on. They don't have any more left of that little bit of innocence that somebody says, oh, well, it's this way. They don't mean it's this way. Okay, is it? All right, I'll listen. What do you have to say? Here, we're going to, okay. And if it's something that sounds good and really plays our heartstrings and our government says it, there's still a, it's like a knee-jerk reaction for a, from a lot of America where because we want to feel that what we're believing in is really true, we will believe it even when it isn't. And that has, it's like taking a child that still trusts you and misleading that child and letting the child think you're doing something good for it when you're really like leading it off a cliff. That's what's been going on here. So it, I think well, this type of material is more, it, it's harder I think, probably for American audiences more than anybody else. Because we've been spared from any visible sign of fighting for a very long time. We've had nothing to worry about except for like becoming 30 something and having a nice house and maybe becoming a yuppie and being able to have a decent job and you know, basic stuff, feeding your kids. You know, what we feed our kids here in a day would support families over in pover you know, impoverished countries for a month. We've had this ability to become very trivial because there was nothing of huge importance that threatened us in any way that we had to do anything but kind of like indulge ourselves which was good. It gave us a time to kind of explore and stretch and learn things. But when you find that, the kid that was allowed to play, and they think they're in a safe playground, and all of a sudden they find out that there's a bunch of terrorists with guns pointing at that playground, who's going to be more prepared to deal with it? The people who have been watching buildings blow up because of the IRA, because of other terrorist groups, they've, they've you know, England has been a target for IRA activity for a long time. So the people get seasoned, and they learn to not crash when it comes to the emotional chaos of, of trauma. Right now, we're facing a situation, we just got our first dose, and I think we went from like grade five to probably a sophomore in college, all in one leap emotionally as far as dealing with how we're going to deal with trauma. We're doing really good, actually. But this kind of stuff, when we start to realize that it can make you very angry, because at least in other places, like in China, people know they're not free. At least they know this. 
They know if they say too much, the government will come make them disappear. They will get put in concentration camps. At least they know the game. It's not better than this. We got to run around thinking we were free. So it's kind of neat. It's kind of like, <laughs> do you ever see those hamster balls? My daughter has hamsters. And they have these little round balls that you can put the hamster in. And it can go exercise. It never leaves the ball, but it can like run around the whole house and not get lost, right? <laughs> I keep wondering, is this exercise or torture? <laughs> the thing seems to like it. We've been like that, in a way. <laughs> We're running around in our little, you know, hamster Happy ball here. Story, right. like, yeah. yeah, and we think it's all cool and all right. We don't even realize we're in a hamster ball <laughs> that we're really not free. So there's been a greater level of deception here. At least the countries who, you know, their people know they're being dominated. They don't like it. But they learn that this is a part of life they're going to deal with. At least it's honest. Here there's a betrayal sense. Because we thought we were dealing with honesty. That it was something that was above the board the whole time. So there's a real sense of... of there's a lot of emotions that when you start to see what's gone on here that can come up in you and don't be surprised if they do the first time you hear it it may be like yeah I could probably feel that way that's very different than when the feeling starts to come up and it'll come up when you hit trigger events when something happens again out there that brings up a whole ball of emotion and you start to get in touch with it there's a part of all of us that are hurting very very deeply it's on the subconscious level right now it's the part that has felt so betrayed like our, our great mommy and daddy government all of a sudden turned out to be child abusers and we were so abused we didn't even know we were abused it's at this point that we move into what became a fiasco from the 70s <laughs> all the way up through to where we are now it became an absolute fiasco between competing groups the draconians were in power and the Anunnaki were really upset about this so people who didn't like each other were starting to make deals with each other which means the Illuminati the human element here they're the ones that look like humans were getting dragged all over the place there were factions here and they'd be working against that faction over there so there was an erosion that was starting to happen by the 70s in the draconian control we had you know big brother Drac was what we had for a long time through the 40s and the 50s you know 30s 40s and 50s there's big brother Drac all of a sudden, um, Big Brother Anunnaki is saying, uh-uh, we're going to get in on the picture. In 1972, the Palladian Nibiru Anunnaki's, now they're the ones that are like the Toth, the Toth Enki group, the uh, uh, Palladian Samjase Luciferian group, these guys that usually don't get along with the Jehovian groups, and sometimes they get along with the, uh, with the White Eagle guys, the Necromaton and Dramis. They decide all right, we've all got to do something about this. So in 1972, the White Eagle, which are the Necromaton and Dramis, and the Dove Alliance, they want to break through the cap on the, on the wormhole, okay, on the Phoenix wormhole. The Palladians agree to help them, and with the combined technologies that they have, when they combined all of their grids that they had activated, like their API and systems, they all had them activated to a small level, but they couldn't get them to activate any further, not enough. Not one of them could have done it by themselves. They all got together, and they did. They, in 1972, they blew the cap off the Phoenix wormhole. Now we had two wormholes running, and two competing groups working with them. It became even stranger. We got, when we got now, now the, you know what's really funny? When you first started to see the Anunnaki infiltration, they didn't have their wormhole activated yet, but they had managed to get some of them through the Falcon wormhole, because that wormhole connects to uh, Phantom Earth, but it also, and Phantom Earth is connected to other star systems there, so they managed to get some of their races in here to start getting control back over, over the place, and, <coughs> wait, uh, la, 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 I was going to say something, I just got sidetracked, I'm getting told to hurry up, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> That was my, when, you know, I might as well introduce you. When you see me do that, like, okay, like somebody just tapped me on the shoulder and said, excuse me, would you mind? This is what happens. I, there's a, a person named, well, his whole name is Ma'ahuate. He's one of the inner earth Yanni guys. This is one of the ones that was assigned to me to assist me with translating this higher level of stuff off the plates because some of this is very difficult to translate into English. And once in a while, he's always with me, he kind of like monitors what's happening here, and we all have a, a, um, groups associated with us, because like I said before, you have an inner earth self, and I have an inner earth self, we have our own incarnations in there, we have them right now in there, and this one isn't mine, but he knows the me that's in there, so we have a whole collective of helpers. <laughs> And they're not helpers that, you know how in the channeling movement they say, go find your guide? No. They don't want to be guides. Helpers are a good thing. But guides tend to be those that come into your field and start messing with your DNA while they're telling you, you know, that they're helping you. You don't need a guide, but it doesn't hurt to have some friends. 
that know what they're talking about and that you can trust. The Iani groups of inner earth are very trustworthy and there's a part of us that knows them and they will contact, if you have a friend there, the you that's there has a friend, it's usually the friend that will contact you and let you know about the you because it could be very confusing if you contacted you and you looked like you do here. You wouldn't know who you were talking to. <laughs> you know, I'm talking to myself. You know? Because what's really funny is ourselves in inner earth do look like we do here. We also have one on parallel earth that looks like we do here. And our other incarnations in the different time vectors have their sets of selves. So anyway, when I have that little, excuse me, <clears throat> it's a frequency that comes in over here. Ma lets me know that he wants to say something and he telepaths to me. And what he's saying tonight is he wants to get down because he wants to get to the, he wants me to move faster. <laughs> because he wants me to get down to what we need to do, which is at the end of this list. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I will do that. All right, I won't go on that tangent. <laughs> all, right, in the, all right, in the 70s. I was just going to say, real quick, in a nutshell, okay, Ma? In the, in the 1960s, that's when you started to see Anunnaki influence come in. You had the real rigid 50s paradigm. Remember how, you know, everything was pretty rigid in the 50s? That was Dracville, all right? That was like, like Pleasantville created by Drac. Then we had the Anunnaki influence starting to come in. And this is where we got wild and crazy, and everybody decided to go do drugs and have sex everywhere. All right, this was the Anunnaki, particularly Pleiadian Nibiruan influence, where they started a counter movement and they literally moved it through people where groups of us were saying, I'm not going to be all rigid and stuffy like my parents were. I'm going to go and love nature and this. Now, these people, these poor people that were loving nature by doing drugs, unfortunately, when you do stuff like LSD and the stuff that was real popular then, opening your fields right up. This was time to start possessing people, getting yourselves into people's bodies, right, into their fields. So the whole 60s movement, at heart it meant something good, but it wasn't used well. It wasn't used for good purposes. There was a lot of lip service to love and to freedom, but it was used in a way that was not about love or freedom. We were taught to use drugs in order to expand our minds. You don't need to use drugs to expand your mind if somebody's not grabbing your DNA and strangling it because you would be able to expand your mind anywhere you want it to without them. So that whole movement was actually implanted. Just like now, there are still movements that are pushing drugs on the streets. These are not just Colombian drug lords that are trying to make a buck. They're part of the chain of command. But who's really up there doing this are whatever fallen angelic group that knows and neutralizes people. It knows that if you do certain types of drugs that make expansions, mind expansions come, you're bringing in frequencies out of sequence, which is crushing your lower strand DNA templates, which is making it so you cannot activate and hold on your own that type of experience. So by getting the false version, the chemically induced version, you're literally, every time you do it, taking away your ability to have it naturally. And this goes for pot, too. A lot of people think, oh, well, the natural stuff's okay. Did you ever think about where those plants might have come from? Who'd they incarnate from? Some of the plants have medicinal purposes. Others, when they are used to create hallucinogenic experiences or even that state of bliss that people can get when they smoke pot or something, when you get that state, it means it's doing something to your DNA to allow more consciousness to come in, which would come in normally if you already had the sequences between where you usually are and where you're going. If they were already filled in, you wouldn't need to take something to get yourself in that state. So. There was a whole trickery that was launched during that period where there's a lot of lip service given to, um, that's where the Christ consciousness stuff started and that's where the drug movement and free love and all of this somehow got woven up with being spiritual. Interesting. That wasn't really spiritual, but it allowed us to stretch in certain ways, which was at least beyond Big Brother Drac's control. Uh, so it could, hmm? was Drac and Roll, wasn't it? Drac and Roll? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like drugs and drag and roll. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so when you start to see the influence behind some of these movements, it's like the romanticism that was attached to the you know, wacky and wild 60s and early 70s where everybody's partying and you had everybody playing music and totally stoned. And wow, it was just amazing how stoned people could be and still like sing and still pick a guitar. It was just really amazing. Some part of the must have kicked in. <laughs> but underneath all that was part of the setup. But that was the Anunnaki setup. These are the same people that have been moved into the more mature now New Age movement. These are the ones that became the channels or their children became the channels. All right. With the Drac end, 
these are the guys that got moved into the UFO movement, what became the UFO movement here. You know, the ones that are too rational for that spiritual fluffy head stuff. They don't listen to that. They don't want to hear about souls and things. What they want to hear about is, where is that saucer land? You know, where, where, where did it go? All right, where, where are they hiding it? What hangar are they hiding that flying saucer in? Or, let's go out and sit in a field until we freeze our butts off all evening, hoping something comes down to visit. Oh, come on. You know, I mean, I don't mean to pick on people that do this, but you don't have to sit in fields and wait for them. Because they're probably not going to come anyway. And if they do, they're not going to be the friendly ones. They'll just pretend. So there's this whole thing that has evolved out of this that took us up just in our culture to where we are now. And then you have basic mainstream people who are caught somewhere between the freedom and the constraint of the 50s and 60s and have tried to like find a little narrow path that became like the 80s where let's focus on business. Let's like start you know, toning down our clothes. We don't wear psychedelics anymore. We're too mature for that now. And everybody became like Wall Street. That's where we all became professionals. You know? The Anunnaki had a lot to do with that, actually. They, the Necromaton, more than anybody, this is where they started to get their influence on the scene, where you had your wild and crazy, psychedelic-clad, druggy uh, Anunnaki people, then you had your very rigid, very afraid of everything, or, uh, people from the 50s type mentality. Then there was this interesting blend of the two. It had kind of the freedom and the creativity of the Anunnaki, but it also had the rigidness and the control of the Drac perfect blend and that's where our 80s came in the cultural mores that have been set here are literally coming out of the agendas that were being run by these fallen angelic groups now once the wormhole was opened the phoenix wormhole was opened in 72 it's like game on guys now at least you you had two balanced forces before the drax had too much control now it was going to go into power struggle okay in the 1980s the zeta regalians make a deal with a group of the Necromaton Andromis. Now you have Drax making deals with the Necromaton, where before the Anunnaki, Jehovians, the Dove, made deals with parts of the Andromi Necromatons. So now you have the Regalians making deals with other parts of the Necromatons that favor the Drax rather than the Anunnaki. So it's getting even more interesting. All right. In, um, well, let's see. Okay. So they make the, you had something called the Regalian Andromi Alliance was formed around 1982-1983. That's where you had Falcon and White Eagle and Dragon Alliance, where before you had White Eagle and Dove Alliance. So you're seeing these guys hooking up as far as who's going to have control by the time we get up here. 1983, the Montauk Project was launched. In this project, basically what was done was, was the Phi, what was called the Phi X wormhole. That's the one that was uh, created through the Philadelphia Experiment in 43, And that was linked into to inner earth. I mean, not inner earth. It was linked into phantom earth. What they did in 1983, this was after the Drac guys of Falcon got involved with the Andromis. Through the Montauk project, they plugged the Phi X into the Andromi holdings, not just into phantom earth, but into phantom alpha and omega centauri, which left all sorts of other doorways open for all sorts of other things to come through. So the Montauk project took place in 83. And at this point, you have two big wormholes open and two smaller ones, the Phi X, which became really the Phi X Montauk. It was like, it really operates as one. Then you have all these APIN systems all over the place with different groups trying to get control of them using as their main access point one of those two wormholes. Okay. 1983, the Guardians finally got in to, to the deal and uh, they, they finally were able. See, what, ha what was happening through this period is Guardians could not get communication lines in here. They couldn't get to people. They'd already tried to come in. The Guardians had tried to come in when the Zetas came in. And they tried to warn the governments here. And they said, look, they're both trying to invade you. All right, you want to get out of this? It's a lot bigger than this. They were trying to tell them about the Stargate opening cycle. They were trying to explain to them that you can't fight this with wars. You can't fight this with weapons. No, we're not going to give you weapons technology. What you need to learn to do is this. They were trying to teach them the mechanics of round tables. And what the governments wanted were weapons to blow up their enemies. So they told the Guardian races repeatedly, there were about six attempts made of physical contact, covert physical contact, with the head guys in the Illuminati that were making the contracts with the others. And repeatedly the Guardian races were told to take a hike. And if they didn't take a hike, that they'd literally blow them out of the sky if they tried to bring their spaceships in <laughs> to warn the public. So the Guardians could have come in anyway. It would have created war in our skies, and we would not be here talking about it at this point. 
And what was happening through the process, there's, there's a lot of indigos here. This was the Guardian's trump card. They knew that the indigo races were born on the planet and that there was a lot of us here now. High Council had come. The indigos one and two were here in force because we had to to open the grids for the star activation cycle. The big thing was going to become, can they wake up fast enough without them getting hijacked by one of the other groups? So there's been a huge hijack the Indigos program going on. Get them into the false Merkaba mechanics. Get them into the UFO movement or the New Age movement. You see, those two movements have one thing in common. They both involve people who have a little bit higher strand activation where they're starting to have interdimensional perception. All right, be it seeing UFOs and having abductions, or be it on the other hand, having spiritual experiences and talking to pretty Palladian Anunnaki. Now, these two things are coming from the same place. They were snares that were set up to catch the people whose DNA was going to be activating. And the first people on that list would be the indigos, because their DNA with the higher strand content would begin to activate first. So th literally, the traps were laid to either get the indigos hijacked over into one of the Anunnaki false ascension programs or over into the UFO movement. And if you couldn't get them either way, then put them in mainstream. And where'd they go? They're having strand activations. They're having visions. They're hearing voices. Oh, boy, you find a lot of them in padded rooms. All right? So these were literally snares that have been set culturally. And it's really nasty when you look at how this was contrived. This wasn't an accident that things evolved this way. It was highly orchestrated from behind the scenes. And it, just the magnitude of it, I get really aggravated when I look at it. Where I really, that's where I get like in that smack a Zeta move, mood, you know? I mean, <laughs> it's not just Zeta. I think it's smacking Anunnaki even harder at this point. But I don't smack people, so I wouldn't do that. But the, you know, the, the urge there is like, how could you? Do, how could you? That's terrible. How could you do that to anybody? You know, they don't look at it that way. They look at us as something to, to move around like they do anything else. If they're bigger and they think they're better, they have a right to do whatever they want to us. So that brings us past the Montauk experiment of uh, 1983. And that, again, was uh, August 12th of 1983 when that was done, using, again, the magnetic peak in the grids. Now, the magnetic peaks work interestingly. You have a yearly magnetic peak at that time. You have, uh, let's see, it's a 20-year magnetic peak, which are the ones they were using for th these experiments. They had the 1943 one, then they did one in 83. There's a 10-year, a 20-year, 20 20-year 20 stronger than the 10-year. Then there's a 100-year peak where, you know, once on that date, once every 100 years, it hits a really peak cycle. That's going to happen on August 12, 2003. So that's the point where they were going to go for their final, you know, like, dominion. They were going to come in here, and whichever race was in control at the time was going to fully begin the process of expanding their wormhole through their APIN system to literally pull its grids down into whatever matrix they were connected to. Now we have a real bizarre situation where all the ones that were going to rip Earth apart literally trying to pull pieces of it, well, at least they'll keep it in one, in one piece if they take it because they're all working together at this point because the Guardian races have made so much headway. They underestimated the indigos. They didn't think they'd wake up enough and they thought they'd be able to hijack them enough to where they wouldn't get to the point where enough would get together, work with the DNA, where enough would listen to the Guardians. I'm glad I did. I had no idea what, what the scenario was, how big it was, and the fact that we were going into literally a war over this if things didn't work out. I would have been scared to death in the early days, you know, when I was first just learning and, you know, being a student of them. But at least at this point, I see why they were gentle with me. If they'd given me the whole thing all at once, I probably would have run for cover and, like, gone and called up an Anunnaki. <laughs> you know, one of them, I would have gone, gone and joined him, maybe, you know, take the Course of Miracles or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, even though I know Jeshua wasn't crucified, I, I can ignore that for a while, and let's just hang out with these guys, because I'm terrified of the other stuff. But fortunately, I was eased into it, which is a luxury that you guys really don't have. Okay? But also, there's more consciousness on the planet here, and you have... Your DNA is beginning to activate now. So you'll be able to understand things faster right now than you would have 10 years ago. So that's something that we all have as a support system. Okay, when we get up to um, 1983, the Guardians initiated the Bridge Zone Project, which was they started to look at what was going down here, and they realized that if they didn't come in and complete uh, and finish the Christos realignment mission that they had, you know, they've been trying to do since 22,003, 26 BC, if they didn't do it now, there wasn't going to be another stellar activation cycle because of what was being done to the planetary grids here in the year uh, 2976 AD, the planet was going to implode because of the stuff the Zetas were doing in the planetary grids. It was literally going to implode in Phantom. There wouldn't even be something to take out of Phantom to rescue. So it was now or never. 
1983, the Guardians created the Bridge Zone Project. The Bridge Zone Project involves activating the old LP, L, LPIN systems and of the Four Faces of Man and getting the Golden Eagle back, its integrity back, which means taking it back from the Necromaton races who turned it into the White Eagle and are misusing it, getting these grids back and anchoring enough frequency into the planetary grids, D12 frequency, and we already got half that accomplished. We've already got the D12 frequency in here for the first time in 200,000 years. So we got half the battle won already. But we need to create these pillars of sound that come out of these particular APIN and LPIN systems that will link Earth's grids into inner Earth and then into this, uh, they call the Miage time cycle. It's like a supporting network that as, these, as the stargates open, and things start to get pulled down into the phantom matrix. There will be enough of the higher frequency holding in the grids because of the, being spliced into these other matrices that it will li literally stop most of the planetary base from being pulled down into phantom, where they will be able to come in and close it. There will only be a small portion of Earth's grids. This is where in the original book, Voyagers Volume 2, they talked about the three tracks of time, three destinies that were going to separate from each other as we moved into this, th through this stellar activation cycle. You had the phantom matrix cycle, the bridge zone cycle, which would take you into a future where we would begin to realize inner Earth exists. And it's not the place you find by digging. It's, it's a different, it's a 45 degree shift in angular rotational particle spin, right? And there was one more, which was the ascension cycle, where there would be certain parts of Earth's grids that would actually fully blend with Tara, its own, that's what it's supposed to do. How, how, we, how Earth would naturally evolve out of density one and into density two would be Earth's grids would raise to a high enough frequency and merge with those of Terra and literally become part of the Terran base. And the people who resonated, whose DNA was activated to those levels, would experience going through portals and ending up on a place that looked like Earth but was a lot nicer and it would actually be in future time from where you started. So there are three tracks of time if the Bridge Zone project works. The planetary grids are such a mess here now because everything that's been done to them there's no way you're going to get the entire planetary grids out of here. The phantom matrix part has never been healed. It's still a piece of the grids that have been sucked into the black hole. And it, if that black hole isn't closed, the rest is going. So what the deal here is, we get, if, if we can accomplish what the guardian races are trying to do, we, the people on the planet right now, will have three different places they can go. Some of them will go to phantom. If they cannot activate DNA, up to a certain level, a 4.5 level of what's called accretion, which is activation. That's fourth strand and half of the fifth. That's what you need to go out, cross over into the inner Earth time cycles and to be able to live there and sustain it. This is why we've been doing DNA activation programs and Cathara healing, because these are the processes that will get your strand activation up. Now, if, things, if, thing, if the Guardians didn't intervene with this and say, we have to do this now, we can't wait till the next stellar activation cycle, there's not going to be one here. If they didn't do it, we wouldn't be having this conversation, and we, the whole planet literally would be on its way, into, heading into phantom, and it would implode from the processes because everybody try, was trying to rip the grids apart. They weren't just trying to pull it in. They were trying to pull it in in six different directions. Okay. So the Guardians got involved doing the Bridge Zone project. That means the Christos realignment mission has to take place now, come hell or high water, because if it doesn't, it's going to, it's going to be both, hell and high water. So they started. This is when I first had contact with, now I had contact with various different groups of the Guardian races since I was four, but in 1983 is when I was assigned to someone named Enoch. I knew I knew the being from other lifetimes, but I'd never heard of him here. I didn't know there was a Keys of Enoch book. I didn't know anything about him, but I had an encounter where I was introduced and I was told by the ones I was used to working with that, you know, this is Enoch, he's going to work with you, he's going to be your guide for a while, he's going to show you some things, and he was teaching me about maps. Didn't know why then. <laughs> now I do. <laughs> yeah. but. So this is, this is the period of time when Enoch went over, when he decided he was entering the Emerald Covenant. When he saw, it was, you know, he saw what was happening here and why the Guardians were intervening, he agreed. He realized that the other agendas were not worth participating in because they were going to be a disaster. So this is when he got in on the Emerald Covenant and they assigned him to assist me and other people too in learning. And he has some specialties that have to do with knowing where Jehovian grids are planted. So he, you know, he, I started working with Enoch there. Now in 1992, the Pleiadian Nibiruans, which again are the, the Samjaze Luciferian ones, from, uh, Anunnaki from the Pleiades, and the Toth Enki 
Zeta and, Odetic uh, and Lil Odetokron Anunnaki from Nibiru. They wanted to cap, and they tried to cap the falcon wormhole because they were still competing with the Drax. They started to get more power since 1972 when they opened their Phoenix wormhole. They're starting to get more power in the Illuminati. They were start like the government flavor was starting to go on in Naki instead of Drac. So what they wanted to do to finally get final dominion over the Illuminati is they were going to they wanted to do what they didn't finish doing in 72. They got theirs open, but they never got the Falcon closed. So they wanted to to close the Falcon wormhole to prevent these groups the the uh, they wanted to prevent not, not just the Zeta Regalians, but also the Zetas at this point were working with that group of the White Eagle ones, the, the Necromaton and Dramis, and the Omicron Draconian groups, the Dragon groups. They wanted to go after them now because, remember the Anunnaki's had the NDC grid, that Nabir and Dada crystal grid system, and the net. Now these were their trump cards that they had been using. Well, once the Necromatons had gotten involved with the with the Zetas and the Drax, they decided they were going to use their Falcon wormhole to take over the Nibiru and Data crystal grid system. And there were certain wars that were being run where they were trying to get a hold of Nibiru to get control over Nibiru and the, what they call what they call worm, Wormwood, which is the, the false Nibiru and um, battle star that's connecting the Nibiru and Data crystal grid to here. So there were these invasions that were taking place that had to do with Nibiru because they were trying to get control over the Iberian data crystal grid here. This is when the Palladians decided they had to, had to, had to close this Falcon Matrix because it was going to be a real problem. If they lost their Nibirian data crystal grid, that was it. That, you know, they lost the game. And they were also going to lose Nibiru in the process. So, then, let's see, what they did here, there's a long, this time I get tired with this. Okay. Now, what the Falcon group decided to do, they wanted to use, they wanted to expand their wormhole to make it bigger while these guys are trying to cap it. So these guys, in 1992, these guys use pulses. They're using Sonics. Everybody's playing Sonic games now, and they have enough of their own AP, APIN systems activated where they can start playing some heavy Sonics games. Now, Plating Nibirans try to use Sonics to cap the hole, and at the same time, because the, uh, the, the Drac Agenda Falcon guys knew that the Anunnaki were going to do this, they at the same time blasted more frequency into the hole, expanding the hole. So the cap went through the hole, so it didn't cap the hole. And they expanded the Falcon wormhole. So this was a big problem for, like, <laughs> the Anunnaki's missed big time on that one. <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> yeah. Now, this was launched, this pulse was launched on August 12th, of course, of 1992. Now remember, these wormholes are right off the coast of, uh, like, Florida, you know, northern, northern, uh, northeastern Florida. August 24th, remember Hurricane Andrew? That was, that was the most devastating hurricane that's ever, you know, hit this place. And it li literally flattened the Dade County, Florida area. And there was some interesting stories in Nexus magazine about some horrible things that happened to people that were in there and about body counts being played with, that it was much, much higher. And, in fact, I read an article in Nexus. I don't know if this is true or not. It's just what I read in Nexus. But... The woman described, she said she had lived there and she was part of this. It took her three and a half weeks to get out where she could get medical treatment because they were not letting people out. They were keeping them quarantined. But she was watching mass grave scenarios being done, like literally bodies being heaped in trucks, just unidentified, that kind of thing. So that was her story. I can't confirm whether or not that's true, and I probably wouldn't want to get into that even if I could. But these are some of the things that sometimes happen. So I, I'm very careful to just skirt sometimes on issues that don't you don't have to go into detail in because sometimes it creates battles where you, you don't win by winning them you know <laughs> but hurricane andrew was a direct result of the 1992 battle over are they going to cap are the are the Nibirians going to get this cap the wormhole capped or, or are the other guys going to get it expanded the Nibirians lost that point and the falcon matrix was expanded even larger the, the wormhole was expanded even larger 1992 hmm this is interesting the Palladian-Syrian agreements. All of a sudden, the Anunnaki groups decide, we're in trouble, we're going to lose our Nibiru and Dadic crystal grid because the Drax were now getting, you know, they, were, they had enough power in their grids and they just expanded their wormhole even more. They were going after the Nibiru and crystal grid. All of a sudden, the Anunnaki wanted to deal. Who'd they come to? The Emerald Covenant groups. We'll help you if you help us. Well, the Palladian-Syrian agreements emerged out of that. They were agreements with... The Pleiadian Nibirans, some groups, not too many, but a few groups of the Jehovian ones that were part of the Dove Matrix, but most of them did not enter those agreements. They didn't want anything to do with the Emerald Covenant. So we started to at least have something to work with. 
where the Palladian Niberian groups had a lot of access. They still had the Niberian data crystal grid. They still had the net. And they still had several of the main control temples in the Niberian crystal temple network. So if they were going to play fair, first they had to agree that they were going to hand all this stuff over to Guardian Protection once the stellar activation, once we knew if it was going to commence. So they promised they'd do that. And what we were going to do to help them, and it would help us too, was we're going to try to cap the Falcon wormhole, which would shut down the Montauk Phi X smaller wormholes and the Falcon Matrix system. Okay, I think I need my next one. I got ten. Okay, I'll go fast. <laughs> Probably not. You know me in time when I get on a roll. Anyway. Is this the next page left? Yes. Do I have these? This looks like there's another page. You yep. tell me to hurry up. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I said, wait a minute. And this is where, when we get into this, these periods, uh, now from 1992 up, this is where the New Age movement went bonkers. All right, because you didn't know who was on whose side. I mean, you'd go to a group, and it, it used to be a nice group, and all of a sudden you go and have some really weird energy. So what is this? People were flipping between Anunnaki. Some were going into the UFO movement. Others would come back out of there. The, new, the UFO mo movement people were taught that not to be bothered with those, the, those wackies you know, that are over the New Age movement. The New Age movement people were taught, oh, you're above that. They're so spiritually immature. They're creating this horrible reality of abduction and stuff for themselves. So they were totally polarized and turned against each other. Meanwhile, you have the New Age crew saying, I'm in Christ consciousness. <laughs> and they're <laughs> walking around judging the hell out of everybody else, you know, pat themselves on the head for being in Christ consciousness when they didn't even know that they had 12 strands or that there was anything called D12 Christos frequency, but they were absolutely certain they already had it, so therefore they didn't need to learn anything about it. So this was going on in the New Age movement. This is a new flavor of things as they really begin to use these movements. The UFO movement got to be a riot. All of a sudden we have Zetas talking, we have all sorts of things where the things that didn't used to channel and talk, they used to, used to like abduct you and do medical experiments on you, all of a sudden they became friendly. It worked for the Anunnaki, why shouldn't they try it? So we started getting Zeta channels, where literally there's one that like talks on, on one of the TV shows, or one of the radio shows on a regular basis, I think they call it Zeta Talk. Um, you know, I, everybody started talking and chatting, and everybody was saying something different. So if you go and look at these things, you go to workshops, like on the UFO Expo circuit, or even the New Age circuit, and you look at this stuff, and what the hell do you believe? Everybody's got a different story. That's the, the thing I walked into in 1999, because I wasn't a part of any of that. I was having contact all of my life, but I was never a part of those movements. In fact, I think it was after the book was written, was, and it, was not, it wasn't published yet, I was just in the process of getting a publisher, and somebody asked me to go to a conference with John Mack and uh, who was the other guy? I forget. Another one of those in the UFO crew, you know, where they're not the New Age guys or the other side, right? Um, no, he's the, Bud, Bud Hopkins. It was a, a thing in Boston that those two guys were hosting. And that was the first time I'd ever gone to any of these things. And I thought, oh, this is good. I'll, I'll meet people like me, you know, that, like, that know these things exist. Oh, boy. It was a war zone the first, as soon as I got into it. So as we're moving through from 92, uh, 92 was interesting. In 1992, the Emerald Covenant races did managed to get a cap on the Falcon wormhole because the Palladian Syrian agreements, because the Anunnaki groups that had entered the Palladian Syrian agreements allowed the Emerald Covenant races to use the Niberian data crystal grid and the grids that they still had control of and we had Stargate 6 in the higher gates. So when you combine them, it made a very powerful frequency that they were able to put a cap on the Falcon wormhole. Now, the Zetas and the Drax were not happy about this at all. And this is when politics got interesting again, because this is where we had a change in office again, where who was the Drac president? Now we have an Anunnaki president. These things were switching back and forth. Once in a while, you'd have like a Drac president and an Anunnaki vice president, where they weren't sure which way it was going to go, so they'd play both sides just to make sure <laughs> they were both represented. But... <laughs> And I don't like to name names, so I won't say which president was which, but I was joking with Michael in the car. I think it would be funny to start from President 1, Washington, and just go up the line and see if there was any humans in there. You know, anybody that was working a human agenda, just to see. Yeah. I heard we had a couple. 
And I think I know it. There's two that I could place that I could think possibly had a human vibe because they had a humanitarian. <laughs> I won't even touch that one. <laughs> um, yeah, to anybody around World War II, I won't even go near that that one. Okay, yeah, that was one of the ones. I mean, I, I didn't, I haven't checked, but I felt this person had a heart that felt different than the others. And way back, not somebody I ever knew, but just getting a feel off a person. I kind of liked Lincoln, but he felt like a Palladian. But he still seemed to have his heart in the right place. So, I don't know. But, anyway, let's get back to this so we can get to the end where it's most important. All right. So we did manage to get, we did manage to get the uh, falcon wormhole closed then. Between 1994 and 1998, um, the Anunnaki gained dominance again. Okay, they, they start taking over the uh, Illuminati. And our guys let them because what they were supposed to do was come in and say, okay, this is how it works, guys. Your little drac buddies are gone now. Now you're dealing with us. We're doing the Emerald Covenant. This is a freedom agenda. This is what needs to be done. They were, going to, they were supposed to get the Illuminati ready for official disclosure of presence, to let the publics know globally the contact had been made, and to come clean about all of it. And they were supposed to begin preparing us for, as a planetary nation, being welcomed into the Emerald Covenant. And once that occurred, there would have been representatives sent the Maharaji from Cirrus B would have been the first guardian context to come in. And it was supposed to be our guys coming in with certain of the Palladian Nibiruan ones that were in the Palladian Syrian you know, uh, agreements. We're going to come in and we were going to take it from there, fix the grids together. They were going to let us, you know, they were going to hand over the Nibiruan data crystal grid technology because that has been messing these grids up for a long time. We were going to be able to recode that technology to a 12 code pulse and use it to heal the grids fast. So this stellar activation cycle would go smooth. It was supposed to be a new age of enlightenment for everybody. Yeah, right. Well, that was all a nice idea until 1998 when the grids raised to a certain degree in frequency and it became apparent that yes, a stellar activation cycle would take place. That meant, oh boy, the last hurrah. They had entered these Syrian played in Syrian agreements only because they were backed up against the wall and they weren't going to win. So they figured, well, we'll side with those guys. Once it came down to, we helped them get back in a position of power over the Drax because they had entered the agreements where if it went into stellar activation, this is what we were all supposed to do. They were immediately supposed to turn over the Niberian data crystal grid to guardian protection and it was going to be used to help people rather than to hurt people. They were going to help us get our DNA ready for what we were going, you know, the stellar activation cycle. Well, when, as they say, the arc sparked, which means a certain set of uh, frequencies was released from the planetary grids that meant stellar activation was occurring, 99% of them bailed out immediately of the Palladian Syrian agreements. They broke them and decided they were going back to the Luciferian Covenant agenda from Atlantis because now they were back in power. We helped them get rid of the Drax and now they're just going to get rid of us. So what they did was all of the line, the, the communication lines and access lines that they had allowed us to have to the Niberian dot at Crystal Grid that we had been using to begin to communicate with people and to begin to wake the indigos up, they shut them down. They shut down our access on them. So it became very difficult for anybody to hear the Guardians when they were coming in. And again, it was back to the old thing. If we come in with spaceships, what's going to happen? Star Wars, and they're going to flatten everybody. So it's been very interesting since 1998. There's been a whole series of almost you step, we step, you step, we step action going down. We've accomplished a lot since that time. That's why we're at the point in time we are now where there is direct, almost head-to-head -head conflict coming down because the Guardians were successful to the point where it doesn't look like they were any of them were going to win this round because we were going to get the D12 frequency seal on the planetary grids, which would neutralize every one of the Illuminati One World Order agendas just like that. Now, in 1999, let's say, we did that. Yeah, we did that. Okay, 1999, I have to go through this one and I go back to the planning agreements. Okay, 1999, our guys were trying to get, trying to negotiate with the Anunnaki races. Come on, guys, you know, you don't want to do this. You really don't want to do this. It's going to be messy. It, you know, you're not going to get what you want anyway. Can't you be nice for once and trustworthy for once? Please, we should have known better because historically they have always gotten in when they could use us and then when it was served, you know, when they got power from being in association with us, then they would turn on us right at the crucial moment and well, they did it again. And at this point, they decided to, the, the one... The ones who, um, let's see, wait a minute, somewhere in here, 1998, in, let's see, I don't know if I have this on the list. 
At one point here, they started activating. Here we go. Yeah, there's the one I'm looking for. All right. Meanwhile, you have the, the Drac agenda guys, the Zetas and the, uh, the Necromaton and Dramis that are working with the Zetas and the Omicron Draconian races. They finally figure out how to get, generate enough frequency from Phantom Earth to blow the, through the, whole, the cap again. So they knock the cap off the falcon wormhole. So we're back to the whole mess again, where we have now the Anunnaki's coming in. We have the uh, Draconian guys coming in. Also got a lot of reinforcement of the Omicron at that point, rather than just having the Zetas be their little foot soldiers. They literally brought presence of the Omicron dragon moths on, on planet. And there, I've seen them walking around in people's fields, some people that are, are working with like the, the uh, Draconian reptilian agenda stuff. <coughs> okay. Um, let's see, anything after me here? I'm going to scan these fast, because if I take this much time on each of them, we won't get where we need to. Uh, okay, so basically, the, the, you know, the stuff was happening through the New Age movement and the UFO movement. You had the Drax go in the New Age movement, I mean the, the UFO movement, and the Anunnaki take in the New Age movement. And everybody's, again, trying to activate their APIN systems. This is where, all through this period, from the 70s on, you had people being guided to sacred sites to do ceremony. You know, it all just became totally, like, everybody, all through the 80s, everybody's doing sacred sites. They didn't know who they were doing them for, whoever they were talking to, whatever angel told them to. I mean, they were being sent in to activate the APIN systems of whatever group was working with them. And they thought they were there to heal the earth and do these kind of things. What they there, excuse me, put your DNA here, would you please? So we can run this frequency through it. This is what was going on. And the people are good hearted people that really just want to help Mother Earth and all that, you know, that nice sweet kind of feeling, that light love and you can't afford to be clueless anymore feeling. <laughs> yeah. All right. In um in nineteen ninety nine we were warned that it might go this bad, but it was not time to start scaring people with information like this, okay? Because there was still a chance that it might go well where we didn't have to have these conversations. In 1999, we were given a classified document of, I forget how many pages, maybe 50 pages, that got into a bunch of stuff, but one of the things it got into was that in 1999, the, uh, I believe it was the Zeta, yeah, the Draconian agenda groups, the Falcon groups, began to use psychotronic pulsing to begin to stir up. There's a way that you can use psychotronics where you can literally stir up the fight or flight instinct in people. You can create conflict between people. We, ha we got whammied with this in Florida when we got hit with psychotronics on the beach down there. The whole group got hit with it. And we tried to absorb it to protect the group. And we ended up screaming at each other. It was bizarre. I mean, so, you know, afterwards, what the hell? What was that? You know, we're sorry. Like, huh? <laughs> <Not yet either. laughs> well, imagine this kind of scenario. Imagine that you're 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 with your brother, or your sister, or your partner, and all of a sudden this frequency gets run through you. Neither of you know a frequency has been run through you, but it hits your second DNA strand, which is connected to your emotional body, and it throws this chaotic frequency up. And what it does is if there's any patterns, any miasmic patterns from your karmic pattern from other lifetimes in there, it blows them right up in your face and they come out your mouth. And it's like really bizarre where you end up and the emotion's right there. Like, why are you mad at me? I don't know. <laughs> if you really stop and think about it. But the thing is, these work so fast that you don't usually stop and think about it. It takes a lot of field control, especially if they're heavy-duty pulses. Now, what was done in 1999, there were three pulses set out. Well, actually, there were three sent to the United States, into areas of the United States. Um, <coughs> that I, let's see if I can remember all of them. One of them was the Sedona Vortis area. One of them, I think, was the, the Gruol. I forget. That, that's in the book, as far as specifically where in the States. But there was three in the United States, one in Jerusalem, and one to China. Now, these are pulses that are meant to stir up issues in people and in collectives of people. These are the things that they were targeted. Now these are slow pulse. It's called a slow pulse technology, which means it hits you, but it doesn't immediately, usually, unless it's a really powerful one like the one we hit on the beach. <laughs> Most of them are made to be sent here and then six months later, a year later, two years later, build in your fields until then they erupt. Now these were scheduled to go off between 2002 and 2003 in the US, China, and Jerusalem. It was meant to set in motion an interesting set of events. But because things were going so well on the Guardian side, they found that they had to ex expedite things because we had made a lot of progress from that time forward. Now in January, uh, January 1st, 2000, 
we had a major victory that we had no idea what a major victory it was until after the fact. A bunch of us got together on the beach in, Sir, in Siesta Key. This is the area of the Gura Point, which is the control point for the planetary shields, for the planetary grids here, Stargate 2. We were asked to do certain things. We, we used the Song of Orion, which are a set of frequencies, and we didn't even know how to do roundtables. They hadn't taught us roundtables yet. But we, we were using... Uh, we, we did a kind of funny little little ritual dance circle thing, singing the Ome Da song around on the beach and running frequency. What we didn't realize how important at the time was we were helping, we knew, to ground the stellar bridge to help bring in that pillar of frequency that was going to come down from, literally it comes out of the solar gate, but it's connected to this whole lineup of stargates that go from the sun you know, up. And we helped to anchor that. And if you well, that's a good thing. We didn't realize that it hadn't been given to us before. This is real important because it hadn't been done in 200,000 years. We had anchored a 12 code pulse in the grids for the first time since 208,216 BC. And I guess they didn't tell us ahead of time how important it was because they probably thought we would have been scared and wouldn't do it right and would mess it up. So they just kind of said, oh, would you help to anchor this? Like, yeah, okay. You know? <laughs> and later, same thing happened on 5.5.2000 when we actually release the codes to bring the Templar, the whole, which is like all of the certain, there's like a connection point, points throughout the planetary grids that go with the Cathara grid, just like you have in the Cathara healing course, we show the 12 points in the body, the Cathara grid in the body, well the planet has its Cathara points, and it was time to wake up the Cathara grid in the planet on 5-5-2000. And again, a whole bunch of us assembled there, I wasn't even doing a workshop, but a whole bunch of people came anyway and decided, well, we're, we're here, it's 5-5-2000, we know that's an important date. So <laughs> I came down the beach, and I, it was one of those workshops that drives me crazy, because I didn't have a workshop, didn't know I was doing a workshop, but then I found out I was doing a workshop. And I was given little blocks of information, okay, now guys, go down the beach and do this. And we'd come back up, and I'd be on the computer again, getting the next batch. The whole weekend went that way. We, that was when we found out later, it was the happy birthday party for the Planetary Templar. We brought it back into 12 code activation. Now it was just a matter of getting critical mass frequency of 12 code in. So we accomplished amazing things there, totally naive, like little kids, not realizing that we were part of something really major that had to do with big scary stuff like these guys either, you know, this stuff. But we had a lot of accomplishment there. This is why there's a chance now. If we can get enough 12 code pulse in these grids, get these things cleared out of the grids by 2003, before 2003, and now, add to the list, if we can stop them from joining those two wormholes together to make a big one, between December, end of December and beginning of January you know, of this year transition, we will be able to fulfill the Christos realignment mission, which means all those horrible things in Revelations don't have to come true as far as the Jehovian seals. As they release, we are clearing them. The round tables are helping to do that. Round tables work because we each have a body that has the ability to run D12 frequency in little nanosecond bursts. It looks like, you know how those little twinkle lights are that you put on Christmas trees and stuff? Well, it just, they flash on. It's not that you run 12, you know, 12 frequent, D12 frequency and it's running through like this. It isn't. Little poof, poof, poof. Enough, little enough flashes. But it's enough to spark it in the grids and to build that frequency in the grids. The solution is so easy compared to the complexity and the hugeness of the problem. Okay, we're right down to the last one here. Not quite the last one. It's not the last one yet. Oh, Lord. Well, if we're going to be here till midnight, I won't do that to any of us because I have more stuff I have to do for you for tomorrow. Okay. Okay, you know what I'll do here? What am I on? I think what I'm going to do, because this is taking us into some stuff that I'd rather, I would like to spend a little bit of time on. So I think I'm going to go back to page 9 tomorrow. What I will do is give, give a summary of what's on the last pages of this that basically gets into the situation that they're going to try to expand these two wormholes into one. There is our eighth planetary natural seal opening and its corresponding unnatural Jehovian seal four opening between the end of December and the first week in January coming up. This is what our tr crew trip is about, to do roundtables there to assist, first of all, in stabilizing these frequencies as they come through the grid and then to get enough D12 frequency and more than D12 we're going to be running um, what they call the Triveca codes we don't know how to do that yet but what they do are the, the Triveca codes are specific mathematical currents or like 
uh, programs that allow the biofields and the planetary grids to open up the pillars of frequency between here, inner Earth, and the Miage Zone time cycle. All right, this wouldn't have been done until probably 2008 going into 2012. I mean, that it, we wouldn't have had to do it if things were going normal. But at this point, if we don't, there is going to be a mess. If this is not successful, it's not going to be a good place to live on the East Coast of the United States. You know, if you, in fact, if you want to live on the East Coast of the United States, you might want to go in one or two states toward the Mississippi because you'll probably have nice coastal property. This is how serious this is. These wormholes are right off the coast of the United States, down in Florida. I mean, I live in Florida. It's like, oh boy, underwater wonderland. You know, we just got a house down there. <laughs> it won't only affect there. There will also be massive quaking down in through Peru and Chile and various other areas, and this will only be the beginning. We didn't even, I didn't even take it in this paperwork as far as, okay, and after that happens, if it goes wrong, because at that point, it's not even worth looking at. Just look at biblical revelations. We have seven angels and seven trumpets, and every time a trumpet blows, something horrible, more horrible happens. Then we have seven more angels, nice angels, these guys, I tell you, with seven with vials, and then we have plagues and the woes. All right? I mean, you go through this whole series of horrible, torturous things, and believe me, if that was the only God to choose from, I'd choose to walk away, because that's not nice stuff. If your God is so judgmental, they're just going to throw this stuff at you just because you didn't know how to serve the way you were supposed to? Give me a break. This isn't about God. It's about real stuff. It's in Revelations. I suggest getting a Bible and checking out the story of Revelation, if you don't have it already. It'll give you an idea. And just remember, when they talk about angels, they're talking about technologies. When they talk about trumpets, this is a specific type of technology I'll talk a little bit more about tomorrow, that creates a waveform. You can literally beam it, light years, and it creates a waveform at the end that spreads out like a trumpet, like the horn of a trumpet. And it has the ability to do this to the molecular structure, to the core template of things, and make it shatter so things can literally disappear if you run the right frequencies. Or you can blow holes in things, which these are the, these are the things that they used to open the uh, spiking grids beneath the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And they're probably still going to go after Philadelphia because it's part of the network. But the main thing, uh, there's also, the, there's spiking grids all through like Philadelphia, Atlanta. But right now what their main concern is, is keeping us distracted, people in general distracted, and working on getting those two wormholes opened into one. So their big events are going to take place at the end of this year and the beginning of next year. There's probably going to be more terrorist activity between now and then. There's probably going to be more grid spiking, but they said something interesting. They said with the grid spiking at this point, they, they couldn't exactly do terrorists every time they needed to spike open one of the grids. See, the, the reason terrorists were used this time was they had to get those things open fast, and they knew that with the type of pulse they had to send, it was a very good chance it was going to make the buildings crumble, or at least partially. And if they did that in Washington and in New York City at the same time with no apparent reason, it would make people think. There's enough people that are aware the government has been testing with sonics out in the Atlantic Ocean because there's been dead things like fish washing up on the beach, like whales getting beached because of it, because it's messing up their, their own you know, sonic radar stuff. Now, there had to be a cover. What's going to be the cover for the other ones are going to be, if they have more time and they know, okay, we have a month and we want to get that one, they are going to go back to the programs that had been testing throughout the 50s, 60s, and uh, actually 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, which were the climate, the climate issues, where if you can flatten some things using a tornado or a hurricane or a localized earthquake, if there's a building or something that's going to go down because we have to activate a site under it and we need to cover, natural disasters are much less obvious. They know how to create these things. They have been practicing and using, you know, doing target practice for 40 or 50 years here. So you will see more of that as the way that, you know, like, you'll see other terrorist things that happen just to keep the battle moving because they want to keep the battle moving. Make, making war hmm? on countries like Iraq, which mm -hmm. is going to happen. Right. We do have to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Doing terrorism oh, yeah. in Iraq. Oh, yeah. Yeah, being official terrorists mm -hmm. is what we're going to be turning into. Michael was just pointing out that another cover for that, we have the natural disasters, and they've already said that that's, they're going to use that quite a lot. So if you see, every time you see like something happen someplace, go, hmm, 
I wonder, you know, if they had a spike grid there, if it was one of the other, which grid was connected to that one? Because that, I, I, when I watch TV, that's what I see anymore. They see it. But he was also pointing out another way to go after grid spaces that might, if you just don't want things tumbling down with no explainable reason for it, war is another good way to do it. Like right now, if they were using sonics in Afghanistan, who the heck would know the difference? Nobody would know the difference. All right? There wasn't a whole lot to knock down there to begin with. But there are political motives on the one level, and they are political, to get control of sites. But you will also see, particularly if you see little skirmishes pop up, a couple little things get bombed, and then like Afghanistan's in a different category. But if you happen to see this war on terrorism move into a place where the, you know, the uh, coalition, the anti-terrorism coalition, goes in and say, somebody was being bad about doing something that could be qualified as terrorists, and they go in, they just bomb a little bit, but then they leave them alone. You'll know that that was a, a site that needed to be activated, so they just used that as a cover. And plus, they want to advance us by 2003 into a global war state. That's what they're hoping to do. Now, our president really doesn't want that. That's really not on his personal agenda. He, you can't say Bush is doing it. He's not. He's just one of the little players on strings. And this applies to all other governments, even the, the, the Taliban. And personally, I think they're absolutely nuts. The way they treat people, they're barbaric. But then you look at what's inside of them, and it makes sense. So anyway, we're tomorrow. With the information I want to cover tomorrow, I'm going to get, those, I'm going to get the, the basic drawings done to show you where these APIN systems are and why they're called, the silly names that they're called, which is also helping to remember. It makes it easier to remember them. We're going to talk a little bit more about the purpose and the function of roundtables. I want to explain, because other people got to explain to you, but I didn't get to explain my version <laughs> of the roundtable talk. So we understand a little bit. What I like to talk about in the roundtables is the pillars that we're building, the pillars of frequency that we're building. I'm, I've also been told we're, I'm going to be given something tonight that's a new technique to be put in with these that will take us to the next level. And it has to do with activating the, um, the four faces of man grid within our own bodies. And it's going to start, we can do this, we can begin to do it now because the guardian groups are starting to do it in the planetary grids. And we're going to help them do it as we help ourselves. It will actually help it to activate in the planetary grids. So we'll talk more about that tomorrow. And tomorrow I also want to, I'm hoping to have done the, there's one uh, diagram, and the diagrams are, are wicked unless you want handwritten stuff. And I tend to be a perfectionist, so I try to have everything typeset and all that. But it takes forever. But there's another diagram I want to show you tomorrow that will show you on the body where the axiotonal lines are. And a lot of you have seen this diagram from uh, either that manual or from the Cathar manual. But I'm going to show you where the Jehovian seals are located in the body. And there is going to be, whatever this technique is that they're going to give me between you know, today and tomorrow, it's going to help us clear out of our bodies these things as they come up. Because they're not just something you can pull out like a psychic surgery. These are things that progressively come back. You'll clear off one level, and then it'll start to run through the planetary grids its next level, and it'll cycle, and it'll come back again. They're meant to keep coming back until they build up such critical mass frequency that they really shut down your body systems. So they're going to give us something to work with the personal issues. Also, to work with strengthening our fields. Because right now, it's like psychotronic pulse city out there. Th everybody's beaming stuff at each other, and most of them, most of the ones, right now you have a lot of sonic, uh, photosonic wars going down, which are a little bit different than plain old sonic pulses. They actually use them along electrical currents, like more light currents than sound currents. There's wars going down in frequency between the Omicron um, draconian matrix, who did not want to join the United Resistance, so they're trying to make a final stand. Like, you know, like the Taliban's attitude? The reason they're taking that attitude is because they're being motivated by that force. They're going to get themselves stomped on because of it, because the United Resistance is much larger. So you're having these fighting things going on between those guys, between the United Resistance, which is the big group of a whole bunch of them, and the drat groups that refused to be a part of that. There's a couple of renegade groups that are Anunnaki, you know, ones that didn't want to get involved with anything, and they're just kind of floating around not really knowing exactly what they're doing and trying to figure it out. So there's all sorts of stuff, frequency, floating through the grids at this point, floating through the atmosphere, floating through our bodies. We'll learn tomorrow some more techniques to strengthen our fields. So when psychotronics hit us, because we're walking through a psychotronic field at this point and it's going to get worse, we need to be able to realize when the emotional stuff comes up, we got a first-hand dose of it. 
how they literally create a static field in your body and it builds and it blows up and you find yourself fighting about it. And if you step, step and say, what the hell are we fighting about? I don't know. Do you know? I don't know. I forgot too. We have something in common. Let's take it from there. You know? <laughs> how this stuff can affect you from a subconscious level is scary. Yeah. <laughs> so they're going to give us some technique to help us learn to process that. There's something in our bodies that has to do with the fight or flight instinct that is not a natural instinct for humans that's being played on. And there's a way to begin to shelter that and heal that so it can't be triggered on us because they're triggering it through the subconscious imprint. So we'll get into that tomorrow. And um, right, because right now, what is going on on the planet? All right, the APIN systems of the fallen angelics are being activated and our guys are going to activate their APIN system. Now I've talked about the fact that we had one called the Great White Lion and we had one called the Gold Eagle and we had one, the most important one, it's an LPIN system, Lumerian technology that's more advanced than the Atlantean ones. It's called the Four Faces of Man. Now I'm going to show you the basic, what this looks like basically on the map and the most important thing to know about the Four Faces of Man is first of all, it has yeah, four faces to it, which you'll see what that means. There are also two other setups just like it, one on parallel earth and one on inner earth. What they do when they're all activated is they create standing pillars of in, in inaudible sound that literally link the three planets together and then those three planets can link into the primal light and sound fields, which gives literally an anchoring rod to the planetary shields, the grids. So these there's going to be a point where after I get to this point, I'm almost starting at the, the end and moving back toward where I would normally begin in order to get the most important stuff covered, you know, covered first. The things that are going to be activating in the planetary grid are also activating in our DNA and in our bodies. And this is why when we get to the Jehovian seals, there's going to be problems if we don't know what to do with the frequency in our bodies because they cause pain and they can cause more than that. What the Jehovian seals were designed to do was if they all activate and nobody knew they were going to do it, they will literally kill you. They'll stop your heart because they're all around here. Now, we don't have to worry about that right now, but that would be like seal seven, which is like next year sometime. But we're going to have it cleared before that. When we're working with the four faces of man grid, we're working with it in the planetary grids, but we're also working with it in our bodies. Just like the Jehovian seals that are in the planetary grids, when they activate, they start to manifest in our bodies, so do the frequencies associated with the guardian grids. What it does on a personal level is, remember I talked about we have incarnations simultaneously in other time vectors, and that's literally our whole avatar self is put in a whole bunch of different bodies at the same time in different space-time places. Well, just like the four faces of man grid will link Earth, parallel Earth, and inner Earth into the primal light and sound fields to give the template support, this will do this on a personal level. It will link you to your inner Earth self. The link between your parallel Earth self has already been made by your inner Earth self because there was a crisis in parallel Earth. I think it was last year, 2003, uh, no, 2001, I think they started in November maybe. 2000, November 2000, I think, is when they started to roll. They went into pole shift on parallel Earth because they did not get these things cleared in time. Now, on parallel Earth, they run ahead of us in the timeline by a little bit. And they were experiencing, I think it was at the end of last year, I have to, I have to look, there's so many dates to remember with all this, but I think it was like the end of last year, or the beginning of this year, they started to go into their 2008. It was their year 2008. And what would happen here in 2008 was we were going to go into pole shift if these grids weren't cleared. In their 2008 timeline, they are rolling and you can't do anything about it at this point. There were huge evacuations done from parallel Earth. People who couldn't make it through with their bodies, their, literally their consciousness, was it moved into their inner Earth bodies. So we don't have to worry about linking. There are some of you that know about the parallel Earth crisis. When I'm saying that we're going to be linking our own biofields and DNA template to the rest of ourselves. We're going to get online with the rest of our avatar consciousness, particularly the aspects in inner earth, because they have the strongest frequency that can hold the rest of us together, which means when the, when the planetary grids start to do weird things and our DNA starts to respond and do similar weird things, it will stabilize our DNA templates, it will stabilize our biofields, so we will be able to continue normal DNA activation and not get caught up in the negative spiral of things that's happening here. If enough of us do these things, it will actually affect the race morphogenetic field, which means if enough of us do it and do it with enough frequency, like enough frequency coming in, I don't mean often enough, <laughs> I mean enough frequency coming in, 
we will literally make a difference in how everybody's bodies responds to what's going on on the planet. We could literally make it so everybody could shift through out of, out of the phantom matrix. Now, the four faces of man grid is, I'll show you the, what it looks like on the map. And these were like just done. I just got finished with this one this morning. And they will be more precise as far as like exactly where are we. We basically have things labeled Asia, North America, South America, Africa. Okay. <laughs> All right. Hmm? I'll get it in focus in a second. That's the first one I had on. I can move this thing. Like, there we go. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Now, they call it the four faces of man because if you look at one of these, right, it's just like the heads on Easter Island. There are four of them. These are grid lines, and they have all sorts of complicated grid lines you know, running through them. These are just the basic outline shapes. What they do is they, they not, the heads don't just end. They actually make pillars that wrap around. If this, was a, if this is the globe, right? You have these continents here. They wrap around, and all four of those, if this kept going around the globe, and this went around the globe, and they did too, those four would meet like this on a place directly opposite here. Now, the point where their chins meet is the zero zero line. That's the uh, zero degrees longitude, zero degrees latitude. And when you go around on the other side, you have um, zero degrees longitude still and 180 degrees latitude. And it's, I think it's called Howland Island. It's somewhere like out off here someplace. They would be in through here someplace. So I have to chart all those things. But at least when I talk about the four faces of man, uh, LPIN grid, you have an idea of what I'm talking about. This, these are the places where all those little microchip implanted crystals are literally run through the planetary grids. And I don't know how far apart each one is, but you know, as far as they'll probably actually give me that kind of data, like whether they're five miles apart or ten miles apart or what. But when you link them all up as if, they were, if, it was a, if, if this was a dot-to-dot -dot drawing you would, and you connected the dots, you would get the lines. So what they really are is they're little dots, which are the crystalline rods that are implanted to hold these frequencies and the programmings that go with them. Now, <coughs> this is the big secret that the fallen angelics didn't want us to figure out because this grid is more powerful than anything that they're working with because it has the ability to link into the primal sound fields. And it does it through linking with something called um, the miage field. A miage field, and that's spelled, I believe, M-E-A-J-H-E, -E, with a little thing over the E. Miage field is actually another time matrix that interfaces with ours every so often and then shifts back out. Because if, if you think about time matrices, most of you have seen the picture of the 15-dimensional matrix, you know, the oval with all the dimensions in it. They don't just sit there and hang there. These are moving frequencies of light. You could picture the 15-dimensional matrix diagram as if it were made out of little um, lights flashing off and on. You know how the Christmas tree lights are, the strings of them, where they, they, you can make them go in syncopation? We call those flash line sequences. So the lines that are drawn on those diagrams are representative of the path that those lines of flashing on and off energy would take. And literally, these are other lines. The Miage zone is a set of other lines and other time matrix flashing through certain coordinate points within hours, certain points of crossover. So right now, the big thing, we've learned a lot of stuff about how horrible things are out there and some of the history that goes along with it, which is really more horrible than the present moment. Right now, we're, we're positioned in a place that is better than we have been in over 200,000 years. We have D12 frequency available, which means the four faces of man grid can be activated. If that can be activated, they're not going to win this. This plant place isn't going to get pulled into phantom. Now, there's another one that, as this activates, it's going to bring this one into activation as well, but this one's going to go first. And this one, I have it backwards, there we go. There. Okay. This one is the great white lion grid. This is why this is why the Sphinx was shaped like a Sphinx and the original Sphinx did not have a man's head. That was done by the Anunnaki after they got control of Egypt. They put their own you know, face of their own likeness on it. Originally, the Sphinx was designed, it was part of the Stargate 4 complex, because Giza, um, the Great Pyramid, is literally over Stargate 4. And 
the Ark of the Covenant, which is a portal passage that goes from Andromeda at D9 all the way down into Earth. This is like the this is where the souls that incarnated in seating three came through the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant wasn't a big gold box. They they called that there was a big old box, but that wasn't the real Ark of the Covenant. The real Ark of the Covenant was a portal passage that led all the way out up into the higher densities. Now, <coughs> the Sphinx was actually positioned as part of a complex of buildings, some of which aren't there anymore, that created a protective field around the Ark of the Covenant that was literally stationed beneath where the Pyramid of Giza is right now. Uh, the reason the the reason it was created as a sphinx and the reason that this grid was put in this way it was because this was the Elohai Elohim grid the Anahazi races which are Leonine they're big cat people literally I mean they, and this is uh, we are descendant out of these we have a few other things mixed in but when you go up to the founders level in the pre-matter density which is the first level where form begins you know where you begin to take on form these beings have they, they are leonine they are hominid as far as they walk upright but many of them have uh, they have very limited ranges of fur color when they have the ones that have fur they're white they have pure white fur and when they come down into the densities they look like large hominid cat people they have the cat shaped eyes and they have cat shaped ears now some of them that were mixed with other things to create the human form progressively evolved down into more hominid there are also some forms of the founders races that look like large birds but they have more homin hominid type faces and they walk upright they don't have that funny little bird posture so the reason that animal forms were chosen for these grids even the negative guys were doing this they they would put their own image into the grid first they'd lay out the mathematical coordinates that they needed to get control of what ley lines that they were trying to to link together because what this is we're all all of these points like here you see that it has little numbers and the maps where if I put them on here it would have been too too complicated and you would have lost the image of you know of the cat but all of these lines here, this would be axiotonal line 12, axiotonal line 11, the A lines are the ones that run vertical, and then the L lines are the ones that run horizontal. These were literally um, linking grids that made very specialized mathematical interrelationships between the ley line and grid line systems that were running through the planet. This guy literally spanned all of the major ones, like when you see like ley line 11, ley line 12, these are major gates. The higher the gate number, the more frequency and the higher frequency that comes through that gate, which means it has control, it has the ability to control the ones below it. So this guy was uh, <coughs> positioned, I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice from, from talking so much. Um, this guy was positioned as the guardian of the verticals, actually. He's positioned where the the lines of the implants that run along these grids are creating a protective network on the vertical lines that means this will link when this one activates this links into the vertical lines of parallel earth because there's one there and there's also one on inner earth all of these the founders have the three of them on the three planets because they are intimately intertwined later on if if there's time we'll go through I have a couple diagrams on the relationship between Earth, inner Earth, and parallel. And that's in the Templar book, if anybody cares. It's not that important you know, to stress it in this workshop. It's, simply, it's simple to understand it if you can understand that the relationship between them is about angular rotation of particle spin, not about is this over there or where is it up there. It's in relation to particle spin angle. So you have Earth at one particle spin angle. At a 90 degree forward angle to that, you would have the um, matter base of parallel Earth and then come back to a 45 degree angle from the original which was Earth 45 degrees that's where you have inner Earth these are the angles of interface between the different time matrices so these are all these were all created on the three places simultaneously very intricately mathematically positioned in order to link specifically into the planetary grids of those three areas. So as we activate the four faces of man, we're going to be activating this also. Now, these were stabilizing grids. They were put in after 5.5 5 .5 million years ago. There was a major mess that took place on the planet. It was after seeding one ended seeding one. It's called the Electric Wars. And it nearly ripped the planetary grids apart, what took place here. It became a founder's war because the fallen angelics had gotten in and they were taken over the place and they had started to raid the halls of Amente. And it literally became like 
the thing is they don't even have spaceships they're from such a high level they come down as literal light balls plasma balls and zap things you know it, it became an out and out combat because this whole time matrix would have been destroyed if the founders hadn't intervened directly because of what the fallen angelics the Anunnaki particularly were doing <laughs> now after that happened earth was almost pulled that at that point into phantom matrix that's when part of our grids did go down and that's when they put up the wall in time to separate that portion of earth's template that did go phantom and keep it separate from here so it didn't pull the rest in now when it was when the 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 grids of the planet that stayed on this side the part of the planet that stayed on this side of the phantom matrix they were still shredded they couldn't go through a stellar activation cycle because as soon as the stargates would try to open if you look at frequencies coming in as flash lines again, they, and they're supposed to come in at a very set rhythm and pattern, they would have been all over the place, and it would have blown the planet up. So they had to put in the LPIN systems, uh, well, actually, these are APIN systems, the APIN systems, to create a network, almost like a Band-Aids, frequency Band-Aids, that would allow frequency to run in very specific ways that would hold the grids together. They did this one, and they did the Eagle, which I don't have finished yet. I have it scribbled on a piece of paper. I'll show you a little bit of how the eagle goes. This one where it runs this way. The eagle's head is over here. And I'll do it up here. The eagle's head would be over here. And it comes like this. The eagle's wings come like that. And the eagle's feet are down here. That one was the guardian of the horizontals, which means that was the, the grid that held together the um, ley line system. And this one was the one that held together the, the vertical axiotonal line system and it wove them together literally like a series of band-aids or like a series of stitches like doctors use when you have a cut and you have to hold those two pieces together until they heal that's what these systems were about they were they were like um, stitches to hold together the planetary template so the planet didn't end it didn't end up destroyed now these were deactivated and couldn't function anymore after um, uh, 208,216 BC when that when, when the events of that time period occurred it was called the fall of Brennaway that's when we were invaded by the draconian races and the grids got activated on a 10 code rather than a 12 code pulse both the lion and the eagle APIN systems ran on a 12 code so it literally disabled them if you know if you couldn't run D12 frequency through here and that's what happened they were disabled for a long period of time now we didn't go through a stellar activation that was the last time that a stellar activation actually started to commence was 210,216 years ago <laughs> I get my years ago and BC is mixed up I have to remember which one it is yeah 210,216 years ago um, <laughs> I just lost my thought pattern on that I'm listening to people chuckle and I got sidetracked anyway when, when we tried to go through the stellar activation in that time period um, the grids went down into a, you know, into a 10 code pulse. These guys couldn't activate anymore, and we went into pole shift. It was, there was like you know, disasters, and there was periods of ice following it. And then they, the, the guardian races, the one, most of the ones that interact directly here are the ones from inner Earth that we're all connected to, and the ones from Cirrus B, the Maharaji, because they have the closest, fastest access to getting here compared to anybody else. The portal links are almost instantaneous to get them here. <coughs> what they did was they tried to, after the disasters, they tried to activate portions of these grids that would begin to sustain because the weather patterns were going crazy here and there was, you know, there was tectonic shifting and all sorts of things and it was going to get worse. They did manage to activate parts of them on a 10 code, just enough to hold together the grids, and, you know, through the cataclysm that followed the fall of Brenoy. Now, the next stellar active, there are several other periods where stellar activation cycles could have occurred from that period because they can occur once every 26,556 years. If the planetary frequency is too low, it can't plug into the gates and the gates will not open. It won't plug into that thing I, I talk, talked about before, the stellar bridge, the frequency spirals coming down through the solar gates. There were several periods of time that mo there's, this, this period of time is going to be detailed in the, the new book that hopefully is going to be out by the end of the year, the Forbidden, for, Forbidden Testaments of Revelation. It explains a whole bunch of the middle history where I have little bits of it in, in that book, but that explains some of the things that happened. That every time a stellar activation cycle was due where it could possibly occur, 
there was an invasion again. And it always ended up in fights between, you know, the Guardians trying to hold down the grids and the humans trying to, you know, do their work as planetary guardians. And both the Anunnaki and Draconian forces coming in, fighting with each other, and fighting with us trying to get control of things. So the last time that it actually almost went into stellar activation was 22,326 B.C. It was known that that was going to happen, and there had already been a mess that was created in Atlantis in 25,500 B.C. That was that Niberian dotted crystal grid that was put in and linked to the Wormwood, um, Battlestar Wormwood satellite thing that's connected to the planet Nibiru. That's when our grid started to be totally controlled by the Anunnaki. Because that was going to cause pole shift and a whole mess, and it was going to, what we're facing now would have happened in 22,326 BC if the Guardians didn't do something. See, this is a very old plan. It's not as if the, the uh, Anunnaki and Draconians just came up with this idea to pull this planet into Phantom. They've been trying to do it for a long, long time. In the 22,326 BC period, in preparation for what was going to be the final conflict battle then, the Iani races, which are, are the indigo races, the, the indigo children. They're actually, indigo children are, are ascendant masters that come down in. Some of them are ascendant masters, some of them are rishi, which come in from density five. They literally incarnate from there so they can hold the frequencies of that information that's stored there. Their cellular memory can hold the information from the primal sound fields, which means they can also run the frequency from the primal sound fields. So the indigo teams came in to literally create this... Um, Christos realignment. In 22,326 BC, the Iani he were already on planet. I believe they came in about, mm, I think it was 22,500. They came in in small collectives. They didn't get involved with the other people here. You have Atlanteans and Lemurians and all sorts of other people on planet. They didn't get involved with them. They have what were called hidden cities, where they literally put force fields up over them and you couldn't see them unless you had the access codes to get in them. They had come for one reason. They had come to finish the Christos realignment mission. And they were going to do that by putting a very specialized technology into the grids that would restore both the lion and the eagle, but it would also give even more power and strength to the planetary grids to absolutely um, be able to pull the templates away from the Phantom Matrix so the Phantom Matrix could be closed permanently. And that grid was this one. That was the four faces of man, 22,500, I believe. They began to put this one in so it would be ready for 22,326 B.C. When 22,326 20, 22, B.C. came around, we were invaded again. This is where the Toth group uh, decided they weren't going to do Emerald Covenant anymore. And because Toth had been trusted, he was allowed to come in and like into one of the hidden cities and he literally led an invasion in and they massacred the Iani so we never got to activate the grids yeah this is why if like yeah when, there's a lot of people that like Toth out there and like you know you have I mean yeah, God bless him John Velo has been trained by him and so has Alton and a whole bunch of other Melchizedek's well if they knew perhaps who they were dealing with they might think twice about putting in an application for a, a, um, a little more respectable teacher because Toth may be intelligent and may be smart but it was because of the actions of Toth and a group and a couple other groups but primarily that one it was because Toth had allowed the Anunnaki rebellion people to come in literally into the hidden cities where these grids were held and being protected where the, like the key activation points of them were being protected and we were all you know, decimated and they, they were trying to get the implants out like to destroy the grids but they didn't have the maps to them so they didn't know how to find them or access them and we managed to they destroyed a couple of main sites main there are certain sites on the planet that are like triggers where if we start running frequency that frequency would be drawn to those triggers and those triggers would activate the whole grid they haven't released exactly where they are yet I know where one was it was on Kauai Hawaii and we were working with that site when, when we went to Kauai in May. Now, this grid was not able to be activated then because of what happened with the Anunnaki invasion. This is the first time since that period where it can be. And it's going to be the last time that it can be. Because if it isn't, things are going to be very different here. And um, basically, it, we're going to see cataclysm, is what they're telling me. It is at the point where I never wanted to teach scary stuff. You know, even when I came in as an indigo, knowing I had a planetary service mission, I, I, I remember saying, okay, well, yeah, I'll go, I'll be on that team, I'll be a speaker, 
but it's supposed to go this way, right? <laughs> like, the chances of it going really bad aren't, they're, they're just really, really small, right? Because I don't want to, you know, there's other people that are better at combat than I am. There's people, <laughs> really, I was never oriented to that. I was very good at negotiating. <laughs> you know, I was a negotiator and um, kind of like, I, I, I wouldn't like to, maybe I should insult myself by saying I didn't like to get my hands dirty with, you know, mean stuff. And when people were being mean and nasty and they didn't want to negotiate, what do you do with that? I don't know. So <laughs> even though, you know, I came, I came in from the sound fields, the primal sound fields, and kind of like, this is my first, I, I had ascended all the way up, and it was my first time coming back in. It was, getting, it was going to be to come back in and prepare for this particular time frame. And I know what my, my levels of skill were as far as, okay, if events go a certain way, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I'm good at that. I trained for a long time for that. Okay, got that. I had training as far as where you could say military training as far as when things go bad, how do you handle things. But I didn't opt for that. It, the chances of things going bad here didn't look that severe. The Anunnaki looked like they had for quite a while in certain groups of them made it, let it be known that they were tired of the game too. That, you know, we could work this out together and that the big problem were the Drax because the Drax just did not talk to anybody, they just want to take over the place. So it looked like it was going to be a very nice New Age movement, a very nice um, awakening cycle for everybody where Anunnaki and humans would hold hands and we'd all do the Christos realignment together and that didn't happen. And it was only recently that all hope on that was given up. So right now, we're in a position that how bad could it go? If it goes bad at all, it will be bad. You know, like really yucky. You don't want to be here. But we also have more of a chance than we've had for over 200,000 years for it not to. So it kind of balances out what could be terrifying once you realize that, oh, we don't have But we also have more of a chance than we've had for over 200,000 years for it not to. So it kind of balances out what could be terrifying once you realize that, oh, we don't have to be terrified because we have the tools. If we had had the 12 code, if we had activated the grids on a 12 code 200,000 years ago, we wouldn't be having this problem right now. Those wormholes wouldn't have been made. All of that history, we wouldn't have had to worry about or have to clean up. But we didn't have the D12 frequency available. D12 frequency isn't the most powerful on its own. It's more powerful than those below it. But what it is is the linking frequency that allows us to run what's called the Kirache and the Kundare, which are the Kirache are the primal light field currents from dimension 13, 14, and 15, and the Kundare are the primal sound field currents. This is before sound became light. You have source, and then source created the void, and then in the void there was vibration or sound, and out of the sound came the light, and then out of the light came the dimensions and the world we know down here. So to be able, the most powerful currents are the standing wave patterns of sound that exist in the primal sound fields. We are able, once you can activate D12 frequency in a planetary grid or in your body, it enables you to begin plugging in directly to those eternal light and sound fields. That's what the mission is here at this point. We're going to create what's called a try-on field. We've talked about that, that, that was just introduced in the Sarasota, Florida workshop, and it was as new, new to me as it was to anybody else, because literally they didn't give me any paperwork on that one. I literally had to go through that workshop. It was all in security clearance data, because I guess they knew something was up. That's the, we we ad, ended up in the middle of a psychotronic attack on the beach that night. But everything was done verbal. They would give me something, I'd be scribbling notes on napkins, or, you know, going through the workshop, and I still don't even have paperwork done for those of you who were there. We're working on getting it done. But at least we have some paperwork this time. What, was, what we're in the middle of is simply anchoring frequencies from the uh, primal light and primal sound fields. They'll anchor through our bodies, if we can activate it in our bodies, which we can't until the grids start activating from what the guardians are doing on parallel earth and inner earth, but this is starting. Why we can get this information now? If they gave this to us a year ago, it would be useless. It might have been nice to know <laughs> what the plan was, but the reason we can begin to use the four faces of man grids is because, I'll show you over in the corner here, there's a little thing, and you're going to get, you'll have a copy of, of this in the packet that's coming. Down here in the corner, it says Earth four faces, and it shows a little cross where they're positioned. One, two, three, four. That's these guys. One, two, three, four. The ones on parallel Earth run on the same axis, but it's actually a 45-degree shift, so one is over here. You have one, two, three, four. 
and then you have the inner earth four faces. There's literally, the, these constructions are on all, in all three of those planets, and there's also a lot more of those head monuments in the other places. They took most of ours down because they were the Iani's, you know, place markers. So it's amazing that the ones over on Easter Island even survived because of all the rating that's been done here. But this one runs on uh, a 45 degree angle, which makes it at this axis. The one for inner earth would run this way and this way. The one for parallel Earth would run the same, but the numbers would be reversed. Like the code, like they all each have different type of frequency coding. They would be reversed, and actually, this one on parallel Earth would be over where our other point is, where their heads meet on that other side of the globe. That's where this would be on parallel Earth. So that's the access point to this one on parallel Earth. Now, <coughs> I'm sorry, we we were not able to activate any of this. The Guardians couldn't even do it until these two activated. When you look at Earth, parallel Earth, and inner Earth, you have a set of frequency step-downs where it, it goes into the dimensional structure where inner Earth vibrates a little bit higher than Earth, or has, not vibrates, oscillates a little bit higher than inner Earth, and parallel Earth oscillates a little bit higher than inner Earth. So there's this chain of frequency. It has to start at the highest point and activate going down. So first, parallel Earth had to activate its grid. Then inner Earth had to activate its grid. And now we can activate ours because the frequencies from these guys on those other planets will now start to, you can pull them through now to run into this grid. Normally, it would take about 25 years to activate that whole thing. Because, I mean, if you just blew it into activation really fast, you could blow up the planet by accident. They won't let that happen. We don't have 25 years to activate this grid. So it's going to be activated quickly, but in a balanced way, which means using specific symbols and sequences of mathematical coding to make sure the frequency blend is the right one. So each, you know, there'll be parts that will activate. It's not going to be as easy as like, oh, do we have head one done yet? <laughs> you know? It's not going to go like that. It'll be like a piece of this one, and then a piece of that one, and a piece of that one will activate. And progressively, we will be able to activate we need about, they said about 35 to 40 percent of it activated by 2003, by August 12th, 2003, if we're going to be able to go through the stellar activation cycle with, without major messes. So, that, 30, that just came through, 30 to 30, what did I say, 35 to 40 percent, did I just say that? Okay, that came through so fast, I didn't know it was there. Yeah, they didn't tell me that before. All right. Okay, somebody write that down. Will you, will you write that down for me, Michael, so I don't forget that? Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, now, we're going to go begin the process of working with this. How this grid will get activated quickly, usually the grid would activate and it would help humans to activate, right? And indigos to activate. Well, you can do it the other way around as well. You can expedite the activation of this by activating humans and indigos, where they're running the frequency and they're putting more of it into the planetary grids. That's what we're going to be doing. And while we do it, we're also going to be progressively creating that, that connection, a living energy connection between ourselves here, our inner Earth selves, and we're not going to have our parallel Earth selves because they are already evac out, so they're with our inner Earth selves. But we're going to be bringing that trinity of self together through activation of this. There's the corresponding coordinates in our DNA. And I, how this looks in the body, I don't know. I've been asking them, can you, know, can you take the drawing of a body and show where this goes? And I think it's a little more complicated than that. But the coding that corresponds to each mathematical coordinate in the four faces of man grid is also coded in the DNA. So there was a code, and this is why I wanted to do this, uh, this stuff first, because I did not want people to have to leave early to not have access to this. You also have this in the, in the pack that's coming that's over being printed right now. This was a new code called the QVECA. QVECA, K-H-U-VECA. Now, for anybody that's taken, you know, has studied this work, K-H-U is indicative of a word, the Kundara, which is the name of what they call the primal sound fields. It's called the Kundara because each of those sounds, or the, actually the vibration, the, the sound of the vibration of that particular level of the sound fields, and you have three levels of the sound fields. You have the K sound, and they kind of throw the N in because it kind of, when you say it, it kind of comes out that way, but it's actually K-H-U, and then DA, and then RA. That would be the sound equivalence of the vibrations of the primal sound fields. All right. The KHU VECA. Now, VECA codes correspond to vectors, time vectors. 
lifetime coding, which we all have in our DNA and everything on the planet has and everything manifest has sets of vector codes that are really how you get into a specific space-time location because you have that location literally mathematically encoded into your body. The QVECA corresponds to the first level of the primal sound fields. There will be two more codes after this that we can't use yet because they're not activated in the planetary grids. And these have to be, they have to be, sending, the frequency has to be coming down from inner Earth. These are the ones that are coming through, whoops, not up there anymore, coming through the grids from the four faces of man down from parallel to inner to here. So we can use this because this is what's beginning to activate in the planetary grids now. This QVECA code will amplify all of the other things that we've been working with as far as protection, as far as expediting DNA activation, as far as balancing DNA activation, and what this one will do that the others won't. It will begin to break up the Jehovian implants in the planetary grids and also in our bodies. So this is the one, this and the other two, that as soon as we can use them, they'll give them to us. We can use these and there's certain times where we'll use the other VECA codes that were just introduced literally in uh, Sarasota. We had the BiVECA and the TriVECA. I don't have a Mylar with those on them, but I think, um, is there, does everybody, has everybody seen those? Okay. Yeah, I wonder if the new people have, have seen them. Okay. Yeah, all right. Let me hold that up. <laughs> okay. Don't pull that, though. Yeah, okay. Well, you're going to get a copy of it. It's coming in the... The, there's like 30 pages stapled is together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're coming. I'm not going to leave you like, you know, trying to remember all this stuff and trying to, you know, scribble down notes. There's at least, yeah, 30 pages of stuff coming, including these things. All right, but before, in Sarasota, Florida, they just introduced these. This was called the BiVECA code, and that was the TriVECA code. What the BiVECA code does is it plugs you into the D12, D13 space. So it anchors, you're already running when you're doing Maharata frequency, when you're running Maharic seal, you're already running D12 frequency. This takes the step up in to density 5, where you begin making the D12-13 connection. This one takes you to, through D13-14 and from 15 up into the beginning of the sound fields. And this one takes you from the first level of the sound fields, the Q, the, um, Q level of the sound fields and begins to make the bridge into the next level of the sound field. So literally, by using these codes, and again, they're mathematical codings, they correspond to what scalar wave templates are doing in your body and in the planetary grids. This is how we very, very quickly expedite m building those creation currents all the way down. And I think I can use, there's a graph in here someplace that I can, it will help to s illustrate what I'm talking about. Somewhere, I don't know if I have it in here or not. It's the one that has the 15 dimensional time matrix with the thingies coming down. The currents coming down. Is that over there? No, I don't think it's over there. Yeah, wait, it's a, no, it's not there. Let me see if I can find this or not. I wasn't planning on using this one. No. No, the one that goes into the 15 dimensional time matrix. Okay, hold on a second. See, I can't even see these. Though. See if you can find anything that had... Oh, okay. wait a minute. I think I just found it. There we go. Divine intervention. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now, for we're going to learn by before 5 o'clock how to use this. They literally just gave this to me. And with these notes, 1, chakra 8, thyroid. 2, tailbone, D12 access. 3, heart chakra, 4, chakra. And 4, pineal. Now, I said, okay. <laughs> what do we do with them? <laughs> All right, that's good. They said, we'll tell you when we get to the workshop. So we're going, when we get into using this code, these are the areas that we're going to affect. And it has something to do with, you can draw it on the body. And they didn't tell me where the best place is yet. And I'm hoping it's not um, at the pineal because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, definitely get the reputation as being a cult if everybody's walking around with this funny little thing on their head. You know what I mean? And the tailbone one might be a little hard to do. <laughs> this is like a code that you have to have a friend to help with. <laughs> Um, the heart chakra may be the easiest one. They're, they'll let me know. He's not going to let me know yet. Because before, like as we move through some other stuff and come back to this, they'll let, we're going to they're going to run us through actually a meditation with it. Now you can use this with or without doing the salutations and things. You need to activate the the Maharata current, you know, the D12 current. Which if you if you use the Maharic seal technique, 
If you notice, there are several techniques for the people who've been following this. First was the real long one. That by the time, if you can stay awake to the time you get done, you deserve a medal. Right? <laughs> That's the one that programs the thing into the DNA, so your DNA remembers that it knows how to do this. Once you use that for a while, it's like it starts to remember. Your body starts to remember. So then there was like the quick seal, the Bahar quick seal, which was still too many steps to try to remember, but it was a whole lot better than the whole bunch of them that was in the first level. We'd start using the quick seal. At this point, we have enough support in the race morphogenetic field because enough of us had been running the Maharata current where we can do the, I like to call it the insta seal. <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, it, still, it doesn't mean just because we can get an insta seal, doesn't mean that you never ever do the techniques with the steps again because eventually, if you just do the insta seal, you're not going to pull up as much frequency when you do that. Okay? You won't get as much D12 in. So it is still worth, you know, at times, you know, once or twice a week, do at least the quick seal and once or twice a month, do at least the long version. Even if you just put it on a tape and, you know, go to sleep with it, your body consciousness is still listening. So you can, like, use it subliminally if you want to. The quick seal is really cool. <coughs> what I do and what you can do is simply ask your avatar self, say, okay, what number star do I use? Because we started with the Hierophant symbol, which was a flat six-pointed star David. That, was, that would re release certain amounts of D12 frequency. We've moved up, and uh, uh, there's a lot of people using different numbers as far as how many points on that star, and it's also gone three-dimensional, where we started with, instead of a six-point flat star that we're vi in visu you know, visu visualizing, I can't talk today, um, <laughs> we, we start with like a 12-point star that's three-dimensional. And this is where you find it becomes interesting to try to visualize, because you're kind of going, one, two, three, four. What's on the other side of that? If it's three-dimensional, right? So what you do is you give the intention of the number, and it literally just becomes like a ball of light at, with, you know, rays shooting out. We've gone up to like, I, well, I forget what the last we used, Michael. What was that? It was like, you know, we, we've been playing. Um, what was it, like 9,000-something? <laughs> yeah. I forget what the exact numbers were, but we've been increasing progressively, and every time you increase how many points are on that star, what you're doing is giving instructions for more subharmonics of the D12 to be activated in the body. So you, at this point, there's enough support in the planetary grids, enough D12 here, that we can begin to let our own higher self have a little, you know, ha have some in input in it. So if you want to run the, the Maharata current, ask and see if a number comes to you. What number should I use? Most often, it'll be increments of 12. You know, 12, 24, 36, 48, you know, all the way up into thousands and thousands sometimes. It doesn't always have to be. It may be that you need to get some of the smaller frequencies, but you're not ready yet for the other half of that 12 or whatever. Let a number come to you and start with anything that's over 60. Because at this point, everybody can handle at least a 60 code. Hierophant is what they call it. That's the official name of the thing you use to activate your Maharata. Okay? And the quick, the insta seal would simply be invi visualizing it here in the pineal, giving it the command, like a little ball of light that has all these rays shooting out that you know is going to have a n the number of rays will be the number you're going to give it. All right? And even if you can't see them because they all blur into a mess when you try to visualize them, even when you try to draw them, they blur into a mess. Try 9,000 points. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> you see here the next, next Tuesday trying to just count them and visualize it. Just simply hold it there. Take an inhale breath and hold it for a second because it builds a little bit more charge when you hold it and then throw it down into Earth's core. Inhale it up just to below your feet. Don't pull it all the way up yet. Just to blow your feet and then push out your Maharak seal with it. Feel the star thing still rotating in, in um, you know, it's at about six inches, six inches below the feet. And feel your uh, disc around you. Take a few more breaths, just bring more frequency up. And you're not going to bring the frequency up into the body yet. The idea is to get that shield activated first. So you went down, up only to where the Maharak shield is. And spread it out. A few more breaths. You, you can like do it just with just one, but you'll strengthen how much D12 current you get the more breaths you use. So you can just... Remember, you're still blowing it out beneath your feet. You're expanding the disc around you. Once you get to a feel like, yeah, I can feel it there. There's a, some frequency there. Then simply put your attention back on the star that's in the center of the heart shield and pull it up to the heart chakra and blow it out this way. Take another breath to... 
with that. You're actually actually activating another shield that comes out this way, your turic shield that goes with your oversoul level. That'll kick in your telluric shield down here into activation. And then just inhale and it went all the way out the top of your head to the 14th chakra and then and you'll see it go into a burst of light and anchor at the 14th chakra. You can get to the point where you can do it really, really fast. You just simply, you know, if you come up on something, if you, if you start to feel funny, if you walk into a room and there's some funny energy there, simply... <laughs> <laughs> it really does. <laughs> it works. It works. Yeah, now, if you try to do that and you've never done Maharic Seal before, you're not going to hardly get any frequency coming up because you need to train your body to, to know what it's doing with these frequencies. It's been like 200,000 years since bodies on this planet knew how, you know, remembered how to do this. But it becomes, it, it's really nice since everything is being accelerated. We don't have time to stand at a site for a half an hour doing 26 steps to get our Maharic seals up, right? <laughs> so fortunately there's enough frequency in the planetary grids and in the indigo and human morph field at this point where we can just run the insta seal and we will get enough of a pillar to move through whatever we have to. Now that pillar is not going to last a real long time because you didn't get a whole lot of frequency. When you take time to even do the quick seal, you know, we have the long seal, the quick seal, now the insta seal. If you do the one in the middle, the quick seal, and really just take the time to move through the steps of that. I mean, is there anybody that doesn't have that? Because it's in these books, in the field guides. You don't have that one? The, the quick seal technique? Okay. Okay. They okay, because I know they come with just about everything at this point. <laughs> I think they're in Cathara and they're in that now. And um, they're going to be in the Voyagers 2 book, second printing that's coming out. So, if there's anybody that doesn't have, like, the instructions for the quick seal, um, we can, we can, like, we'll probably send them to you, or maybe They're figure out website. something to get to the thing down the street that They're prints. On the it's on the website. It is on the yeah. website now? Okay. I haven't even got the chance to look at the website. Yeah, so, that's good. As long as you have the, the quick seal, you can begin working with that, and it's still worthwhile for people who really care about how much frequency can I generate. It's still worth, once in a while, doing the long version of it. Use it as a meditation. You know, put it on before you go to sleep or before you take a nap or something. Or, you know, like while you're under a hairdryer at the hairdressers or something like that. Just put it on and listen to it. You know? Okay. You need to use that frequency to run any of these codes. They're not going to do anything if you haven't activated the Maharic Seal. You can play with the, the codes all you want. And this is kind of neat. It's like a, a built-in safety. It's like, oh gosh, if these seals are so, if these symbols are so, you know, so important, why, how can you let them go out to the general public? Because the Illuminati will get them. Yeah, they will, but you can't use them unless you run a Maharic Seal. It requires having a 12-strand template to run a Maharic Seal. Now, they can get that template by having a Melchizedek ordination where it's transferred to them from somebody who has it. But if they are not running their full D12 Christos current, they cannot use the symbols. They can play with them, but they're not going to do much of anything for them. There are certain ones that you can bend light through and you can make messes with, but they can always be reset by using the Maharic Seal. That's why, at this point, there's no, we, we don't do closed circle stuff, you know, where we don't let other people know. I mean, if you want to become a Freemason, it'll probably take you about 50 years before you get to, like, level 33 is where they, that's their last level they really talk about, you know, is having, where it says inner circle, inner circle, inner circle. And by the time you get here, you might figure out what the first five levels were about. But you're not, you know, they hold, they hoard information. They keep it away from the public. They do that on purpose. And there's lots of so societies like that. The Toth schools all worked like that. You'd find, you'd read a passage in one of their things, and you'd find at level one, it meant one thing. At level two, you'd be told, this word means that, this word means that, this word means that. And you'd find out the thing meant a whole different thing. Interestingly, the Bible is written that way as well. Okay, these were ways of coding information where it would, where other people could see it, but they wouldn't. It, you put it right under their nose, and they wouldn't know what it was. We ha we are not doing that. We are simply putting it in. Well, English is the only language I know how to translate in, but we're putting it in English, clear as it's coming off the plates. And it's because the stuff that's most powerful that we're going to be using, the people who really care are going to be using, can't be used unless you're running D12 Christos frequency, which means unless you are 
willingly entering a state of Christ consciousness by bringing your Maharata current through you're not going to be able to do damage with those codes. So it's kind of nice. We don't have to play the game of, you know, the mystical school game that it takes you forever to get to the center to find out what anybody is really doing. It's all open, you know, to the public. Now, what we're doing when we use codes like these, we're building this bridge of frequency. Okay. Now, this is a diagram of a 15-dimensional time matrix. Most of you have seen this. If you've had any of the classes before, you're probably so sick of looking at this one. <laughs> Because this is like this 15-dimensional time matrix shape, this oval shape, is used to display all sorts of information and show relationships and things. Now, what this one does is it shows you have your primal sound fields out here. Okay, that's what these three outer bands are, called the triadic, the polaric, and the acadic level, the primal sound fields. You come in here. This is where sound begins to become light. Dimensions 13, 14, and 15. That's called density uh, 5. And it's... The, it, your, the density 5 is a waveform. It's anti-matter, A-N-T-E matter. And it's a waveform where, like, consciousness, when it comes in, first consciousness becomes sound vibration. Then it begins to interact with itself and becomes light. This is anti-matter light fields. They're standing light fields, like lights that never go off. All right? They're just constant fields of light. And these would be constant fields of dark. Actually, there's no, you would not see light because it's before light occurs because you don't have the same interreactions of vibration, um, points of vibration. What creates from sound to light is you have sound, units of sound, which are fixed points of vibration. And they begin to interact with each other by syncopating those vibrations. So there's a syncopation factor that takes place where things that are just standing units of sound here start to interact with each other because there's a pulse that's sent through and you could call it the breathing rhythm of source there is a pulse that is sent through as consciousness moves it's like the inhale and outhale there's a pulse to the consciousness of source that actually keeps these primal light and sound fields and everything else in them in motion so it is the pulse from source this consciousness that takes these vibrations and begins to make them move where they interact with each other and they interact with each other following very specific mathematical geometrical interrelationships that create the bending of frequency which creates light so you have your primal sound fields primal light fields now these primal sound fields are what collectively are called the kundare currents they are the primal sound currents the first currents emanating from source the first levels of individuation from source source isn't somewhere over here away from this source would be the boundaryless thing all around here as if the paper went off for forever. So this is taking place within source. This is why it can never be separate from God. Because there is no place to go besides in here. If you're in manifest form, you have to manifest through the structure. This is the structure of dimensionalization that allows for consciousness to bend itself in ways where it becomes light and sound that interacts in ways that allows a three-dimensional hologram to be created. So we're all in hologram that we create ourselves. Now, we are in our at one moment with source all the time. There's always a part of ourselves that are here, up in, beyond, before sound. There's always a part of ourselves here in the primal sound fields. That part is called our ascended master levels of self. There are three levels of that. And they are existing with us simultaneously. This is why the, any, any systems out there that teach you to follow and give your power to somebody else because they're more important than you. Now, there might be somebody that has learned more and, and grounded more information here than you have right now. But we are all equal when it comes to this because we all have these simultaneous stations of identity. Even once upon a time, the fallen angelics, they have their levels up there. What they have done in the Phantom Matrix is sever their connection down here at D11. So they cannot access those primal sound fields or the levels of consciousness to go with them. And it creates, it's a distortion in consciousness that makes them feel very alone. So they try to take energy from everything, you know, other systems because they feel they don't have any, because they feel they're not connected. This is, with, with people that have this, the 12-strand template, what it means is you have the ability to, you're down here in these dimensional fields, to have these currents connect through the primal light fields and into the primal sound fields, which means you have the ability, if you activate it, in your templates. Now, humans on a 12 strand can bring in 12 dimensions of consciousness, one for each strand template. Okay? Indigos 
if they have 48 strands, can bring in the whole thing from the acadic level down. Indigos that have, I think it's, uh, it's 37 down to something or other. Um, I, forget, I forget what the numbers are. We, I haven't taught that yet, but basically 24 to 48 strands will take you from where you can go through here or up through there. It means you can anchor that consciousness in the body if you choose. also means you can run that consciousness, that frequency into the planetary grids. All right, this is what we're going to be doing. What indigos are going to be doing in round tables is running that whole current of energy. What 12 strand humans are going to be doing is running their D12 Maharata current. Because when we look at the dimensional structure, primal sound fields, primal light fields, then we get into here, dimensions 12, 11, and 10. That is density 4. It's called pre-matter. That's the divine blueprint. That's where you start to have large amounts of form individuation, where you're not just in the primal light fields as waveform anymore. This is where forms, where you start to take on form. It's a pale silver liquid light is what it looks like. It kind of reminds you of liquid mercury that can take on forms and then melt them down and take on other forms. The founders races are made of this stuff. We are the founders races there. This is one of the things that is kind of interesting about the whole game of creation here. We have simultaneous incarnations in other time vectors, right? We have them all the way down. Because to get down here, where we are right now, experiencing reality, implies that you've had to leave or park parts of your consciousness in each station. We all have a level of ourselves that's part of the Christos Founders races. So the Founders aren't somebody separate from us. We go, how do we know you're our Founders? You know, the Founders we're talking about are the ones... <laughs> yeah. They're the ones that we, we've literally come out of them. Just like with the fallen angelics. They'll have like a, a dark avatar collective up in D11. And it fragments itself down and creates races and individuals and sets of individuals. And then when they get down here, then they can look back up and say, well, what if I don't like you? I don't have to listen to you. <laughs> when it, most, of, most beings that have their templates intact and their consciousness is balanced have a good relationship with the parts up here but down on this planet we have been cut off from our awareness of this because our DNA it's all it all connects to the DNA template if you have 12 strands of DNA but you only activate three how many dimensions are you going to perceive right right if you have six strands activated how many dimensions would you perceive right it's that simple so if we have three strands, and we do have three strands activated now, the chemical components that are in what our scientists look at and say, oh, that's a two-strand, it has a double helix. A double helix equals one strand. You will not see them separate and spread out like this. We have three strands worth of coding right now, chemical coding in the DNA template, chemically. So there are three overlaid strands. Imagine what the chemical coding might look like once we have 12 strands activated. And what's interesting, there's, I, I keep telling Michael, I said, you know, I think it'd be really cool, it's, it's not practical, but it would be really neat to be able to see when we really get the frequency running and we're doing rounds or something, we can feel that frequency for the round tables running. If somebody did a DNA test right there, like took a sample there of the DNA, right, and then waited till later, we're just like hanging out watching television or whatever, and took a sample of the DNA there, the chemical DNA, I wonder if it would show already, because I think it would. But you'd have to catch, you know, the frequencies when they're active. Because when we activate 12 strands or more if you're indigo during round tables, they don't just flash on and stay on and your chemicals go crazy because your body would like literally morph before your eyes and you'd probably be about 12 feet tall and you scare yourself to death. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd probably blow up your matter form is what you'd do. But what they do is they give little bursts of the frequency. And I think at this point, I, because I felt the frequency in groups increasing, the more we've done this, every round table seems to carry more frequency with it. And that means we're getting closer to hitting critical mass where that frequency in the template is going to start making differences in the chemicals. Because ideally, if we want to ascend, actually be able to take our bodies through a stargate, we have to be able to change the chemicals in the body. And that's what happens when the templates activate properly. There are certain parts of the DNA that science hasn't found yet. They, they found parts of them and they call them junk DNA. They have, um, in, what are they called? intron sequences, I believe, are the, they call them intron sequences of DNA. They're dormant sequences. They don't produce amino acids or, or protein bases. So they're considered junk, like they're not doing anything in there. These have a purpose. There's also spacer DNA. And it, it operates, it's the same type of thing, but it's between, I think, different genes where the intron sequences are within a single gene. They're these blank spots, literally like blank spots in a pattern. And 
these blank spots, if the DNA is working properly, do stuff when frequency hits the DNA template. They would create certain chemicals that would bring into life something called the um, turnstile DNA sequences. Turnstile DNA sequences emerge as chemical changes within the hydrogen bonds. Now, DNA strands have you know, one helix, then another helix, then these little ladder rungs that go across. The little ladder rungs are held together by hydrogen bonds, ha hydrogen atoms that are, are bonding them together, and it's a very weak bond. When the body begins a transmutation process, those hydrogen bonds start to change. They're, the hydrogen atoms start to become something else, and they create, they, literally another sequence of DNA chemicals comes into activation. They're called turnstile DNA because it allows the body the chemical realities that allow it to switch time vectors because that's what your body needs to be able to do right now. It's phase-locked into the timeline, which is a rhythm of frequency pulsation that goes with the Earth. So there is, the, when the hydrogen bonds in the DNA begin to change, they create a substance called celestiline which is an element that our scientists don't know about because they haven't seen anybody turn on their, spa their, their uh, uh, turnstile DNA. These are physical changes that are going to be happening. If we get to the point where we can actually go through the gates and not blow ourselves up, <laughs> our bodies would have to go, and it goes rapidly. These things, that for a certain level of frequency hits in the DNA template. You hit a critical mass of frequency with a minimum of six strands because you have to activate strands one, two, and three, and then the harmonic above, strands four, five, and six. And what begins to happen is the templates start to do braiding. They start to braid because the fire codes in between them release. I'll show you some diagrams in a minute. The fire codes release, strands one and two braid, strands one, two, and three braid, and they progressively braid up to the next level. This creates the turning on of the turnstile DNA within the hydrogen bonds. And that begins a chemical change in the hydrogen bonds that sets off chemical changes within the whole DNA chain. These chemical changes begin to affect how molecules themselves, how atoms start to behave. There's a fascinating process by which um, the protons that are inside of a nucleus and the electrons that are outside, the electrons actually reverse polarity, turn into protons and pull into the nucleus, and we begin to fuse with our antiparticle double. Literally, where they are and where we are, which is 45 degree shift and 90 degree shift in angular rotation of particle spin, our particles come together. And it creates, literally, hyperspace of the particles. There's a little bit of stuff left that can't make the transmutation process. And the, the, all of these things are set in motion by the DNA creating the chemical celestiline. Celestiline begins to change how all of the chemicals and hormones in the body work. It, effect, it, it starts to change the way the thyroid works. It changes the way the brain works. And it allows for the body matter to go through the process of shifting timeline sequences. And it happens like that. Gosh, in the old days, we used to be able to literally, you know, we knew where the portals were, you go, oh, bye, you know, boom, and you pop up someplace else. It was that fast. Your body would literally turn into a flash of light, and actually it turns into sound. This is called going into Merkaba, okay, where the Merkaba vehicle fits in is these are the energy fields that your body literally turns itself into to get itself from one space-time place to another. So there's a whole fascinating process that we go through as we you know, progressively work with these currents. How the DNA activates is the templates get hit with progressively higher sequences of frequency in the right order, preferably, because if it's not in the right order, that's when you can get hurt. That's when people run Kundalini energies and they don't do it the right way and they don't clear the DNA template. They can have horrible experiences with it. Well, our programs make sure you, are, you understand, first of all, what a kundalini energy is, what it's connected to, realizing the DNA template has to be handled with the D12 frequency or it's not going to be clear enough to run kundalini. Now, these are the currents, the frequency currents from the primal sound, primal light, pre-matter fields. Down here you get into the etheric matter fields, semi-etheric matter fields, and down here are the matter fields that we're in. These are literally frequencies of energy that progressively activate in the DNA template that once the critical mass of them activates, that level of the strand templates will activate. And then that level of the turnstile DNA will turn on. And that will affect that level of the hydrogen bonds. So there's a whole process. It's not like you have esoteric over here and physical over here and there's nothing in between. They go very much together. This is part of the missing links that are in a lot of metaphysical teachings. They'll make you all sorts of promises about God and ascension and if you're good and you do certain things and follow this book or that book, you're going to get to heaven. Well, heaven happens to be being able to go into any of the other reality fields, the house of many mansions. This is the house of many mansions. There are many, many reality fields that we can experience. What mastery is, what Christ consciousness is, is getting to the point where you have your 12 strands turned on 
where you have all of this consciousness available to you and you have the ability, you have mastery over those dimensions of frequency, which means you can choose to put yourself in any place you want. You can also choose to put yourself simultaneously in several places. People that get good, even if you get up to six-strand activation, you can start playing with things like bilocation, where you can actually make a hologram of your body, put part of your consciousness in it, and send it someplace else. There's all sorts of things that avatars learn to do. And what we all are, are sleeping avatars. And if we're indigos, indigos are not just avatars. They're sleeping rishi, which go up into this area, or they're sleeping ascended masters. And we just need to wake up. So all the processes we're involved with are the process of getting this part of ourselves back by running these creation currents. When we do round tables, what we're doing is progressively building this chain of frequency. Right now, most people are running on these frequencies, the one, two, three frequency. It's called the telluric frequency. All right. There's another set of currents here that are called the duratic currents, which are the dimension four, five, and six currents. Most people don't have those turned on at all because their, their DNA is not activated to the fourth or higher strand. Then up here, you have the um, mm, turic currents, the seven, eight, and nine. These are the currents when we teach Cathara healing. We teach you to run frequency. We teach you how to open the seals in the body so you can get these currents in. Every healing system on the planet right now doesn't do that. What they're doing is using the telluric currents down here. So they get moderate effects, but you're not going to get permanent and lasting effects. The reason we can use these higher currents is because we're using the D12 frequency now that it's available on planet. We can use that to release the seals in the body that allow the frequency to come through. When we do round tables, we are creating a pillar. Each one of us becomes a pillar of light and sound. And that's what we leave behind. After we leave a round table, like the round table you did this morning, now, you may not see anything out there on the D3 level, but if you looked at it from D6, or if you were, coming, if you were looking at it from, say, the astral plane, it would look like, literally, the design that you see on the little diagram that you know, shows the, the little circles, you know, the, the geometrical shape, you would see pillars of standing light left where everybody stood. Yeah. And what those pillars do is they don't just stand there on the ground, they go into the ground and they connect in to the Earth's core. And they send frequencies out and make all sorts of little tiny tributary lines out into the grids that they're connected to. Now, if you were running reverse current like the people who are being trained in the Anunnaki mode are doing, what your pillars of reversed light and sound would do would go in and trigger activation of their APIN systems. What our pillars do is they go in and trigger activation of the APIN systems and the natural seals. So actually the seals start to release, they help us to activate our seals, we run more current and it helps the seals to release more and we get to balance the frequency by doing it. We're doing major work with energy when we do these round tables. And it's kind of funny because they just gave us the, these technologies not too long ago, it was this year that they gave them to us. Mm -hmm. um, the round tables, <coughs> Actually, it's good to move them around too, but what in, I remember times when we used the round tables. I have like kind of postcard memory snaps from when we used to do them. And we, I mean, there'd be thousands of people doing them. It was awesome watching like a field of like 5,000 people doing sets of round tables all together. But we would do them very often all in the same place. You don't have to, but you keep building and building and building. If we wanted to set areas where, say, we wanted to be able to take a whole bunch of people through, that might not have the DNA activation level we, you know, where they could normally go through. We would create a really strong field and it creates like a, a Q-zone field but a major one. And it would create a support field for people. We could then take people through that didn't have DNA activation. They couldn't stay but they could like go in to visit inner earth or something like that. In the old days before they had to literally shut down the, the portals to inner earth because they were being invaded all the time by you know, the fallen angelics. We would do things like this. Round tables had very, very practical purposes. There's, you know, it's kind of funny. It reminds, me, it reminds me of the idea. I saw a little film one day about a, a guy who was living out on the land and he made his own electricity. And he made his own electricity by sitting on a stationary bicycle <laughs> and pedaling away and pedaling away. And if he did this for so many hours a day, he'd generate so much power that could be stored, right? Well, in the old days, we didn't sit on bicycles and pedal. We would do round tables every so often. And what it did was there was literally a global network of electricity that 
with, it works different than the electrical currents do here. We were able to generate a standing field of electricity that could be drawn on. You could literally use your, there, there were times when if you needed light, you would simply either pull it from inside of you and pop it out and have a little light ball or hang one out in front of you, or you could literally run systems. We didn't have light bulbs in those days. We didn't need light bulbs in those days because you could literally fix pillars of sound that would bring in as much frequency as you wanted from the standing light field that was created in the atmosphere. So we would literally do round tables, just like, you know, you have generation plants that burn coal and stuff to, well, it was just us. We would simply do our dances every once in a while, and you have a big group get together, and they would do it, and it would poof, and it would like leave a whole huge amount of energy that could then be directed through crystalline technologies into usable energy forms, free energy forms. So when we do roundtables, this is just the beginning of an awesome, awesome level of technology, a technology that is a Christos technology that doesn't require artificial things that mess up other things without knowing it. It's a natural technology. It's also the way that eventually we will be able to evolve ourselves back into what we originally were. The angelic human form was an immortal form. It was not a form that death was natural to. Death is not a natural condition for human bodies. If human bodies have 12-strand minimum DNA templates. Anything with 12-strand DNA template is meant to ascend. It's meant to take its body out of here when it's done. We've been stuck here for so long because the grids have been messed up which messed up our DNA and our bodies so when we there's a lot of exciting stuff we learn scary stuff about oh my god the Illuminati is doing this and they're trying to suck us into these two black holes and it's like really right down to the wire right now and it's like yeah it is a crisis situation <laughs> but we have the answer to the crisis so it's not a crisis where you have to go collapse and have like get you really scared and you need to take it seriously or then you might have to go into the other reaction because nobody will do anything and it will not go pleasant but there is so, a huge amount of data on the other end of this that once we get through these challenges, there's no turning back once this stuff is released on the planet. Once this knowledge is out, whoever's left standing is going to be able to learn it. And this is the kindergarten level. Right? We've, we can do amazing things with it. So there's a lot of happy things to think about, too, as far as what we're moving into. When we're working with the techniques, with the symbols, we're working with these frequencies right here we're building that bridge when I talk about the Antankarana D9 down to D1 that's the Antankarana right there it's nine dimensional dimensionalized levels of frequency when we get up to here D10, 11 and 12 to, collectively are the Maharada so when you run the pale silver of the D12 and it's actually D12 and D11 combined you're running the full Maharada because it'll bring the D10 in with it up here you have the Kirache primal light fields and up there you have the Kundare primal sound fields. It's progressively building your body's ability to hold this pillar of light and sound. And as you do, you bring more and more of your self-awareness in because you have portions of yourself that you're literally, you're made of frequency. Even here, your consciousness that you're aware of, this is mostly your D3 consciousness. As far as the self that you know, that you have right now, I say, okay, I look in the mirror, this is me. That's your D3 consciousness. Now, you also have your D2 consciousness, which most people on D3 don't really know it too well yet. They're just getting to know it. That's what we call the emotional body. That's a part of your focus that's stationed in the D2 frequency bands, and it's perceiving in its way and understanding in its way. And we have some genetic problems right now that make it very difficult for that part of you to communicate with this part of you fully clearly, so we get a feeling. And sometimes we don't know what that feeling is or what to do with it. Then we have another part of ourselves, the D1 level of self. That is literally your subatomic self, your molecules, the elements your body is made out of. This is you too. This is a part of your consciousness that takes on that form. Most people don't realize they're thinking as, um, as subatomic particles as well as thinking here. As we progressively integrate the higher frequencies, it loosens up the relationship between those separate levels of our bodies where we start to know our emotional selves as ourselves and we begin to know our physical selves as ourselves as well. It's really neat when you can flip into microvision. There's a thing that comes when you start to integrate where you can start to literally see things from the microscopic perspective because you're starting to integrate your D1 level of consciousness. I flip into that sometimes and sometimes you're better off not because you can see all the bacteria on stuff and if your D3 mind knows it doesn't want to eat stuff that's contaminated or has bacteria on it, um, it can be a real nuisance, like you can see mold before it's visible. Things like that, you know, you go in the refrigerator, try to get a slice of bread, take it out, and your microvision kicks in. <laughs> yeah. 
My revision will be very useful as we move through the challenges that these times present. Because if we know it's there, <coughs> we can set the intention that we would like to develop this skill as soon as possible. If you get the ability to be able to see the microscopic level without a microscope, you'll be able to look at water and see if it's contaminated or not. You'll be able to look at food, and this will scare you to death when you see what food looks like at, from that level. Now, because what we see, if it's the organic stuff, it's washed in dirty water, you'll see all the little things roaming around on it. You know what it reminds me of? Did you ever see those photographs, and they use them for like vacuum cleaner ads to show you all the things that the vacuum cleaner is going to suck up that you can't see? And they take like dust particles, like little tiny dust particles, and they blow them up like a million times. And they look like these monsters, you know? <laughs> they have little dust mites that look like, like really horrible things from outer space that are going to eat you alive. So you do have a level of your consciousness that can perceive these things. You also have a level that can perceive in every one of those dimensions. So as we work with the round tables, we're not just helping the planet. We're not just going to get those wormholes closed and finish the Christos realignment mission. We're going to find progressively more and more of ourselves. It doesn't happen overnight. It's progressive. The more you work with the energy, bringing it in, the more you work with the techniques and bring it in, the more of you, you get back. And it changes your life. When you start to make leaps, and it's always, there's a, there's a place you go into, and it hits, the, the, it goes in cycles. Like you'll go through an activation cycle of the DNA, and you'll start to know it. If you start to get a, a period where you start to go into heat flashes, and you just notice, God, what's wrong with me? My hormones doing weird stuff or something? You know, am I, getting, am I crossing that age barrier or what? You know? If you start to get little periods of where all of a sudden your muscles ache or you're getting like little shooting pains in your bones, it won't last forever. Now, there are other periods where you're clearing Jehovian implants before you have the things to release them, like, like Michael and I have been doing, especially Michael. And you, this is really hard. You know, you will feel pain in those areas. But we're, we're getting the, the symbol codes now to work with where we don't have to feel the pain. But as we work with this, there, there's real physical things you'll feel as your DNA activates. You'll feel sometimes heat rushes. Sometimes you'll feel numbness in like... Like I, I was getting it here. Just that part of my leg would just go numb. Not sitting on it for, or anything, you know, I wasn't sitting cross legged. It. it would just happen to go numb and tingly. These are new portions of the axiotonal lines and the ley lines in your body, you know, your meridian lines, waking up to hold a new frequency. So there are changes that you'll feel in your body. Some people get bumps on their head. I've, I saw a few people that had that, where literally they'd either get bumps or not cysts. They would just, the skull would change a little, a little bit. The shape of the bone would change a little bit. And then it'd go back down to normal after a couple of weeks. But it was reacting. The, the body reacts to the chemicals. So I think it's pretty... Uh, we haven't had anybody analyze DNA. And personally, I don't think right now with who's running science laboratories and things, I would want them to analyze my DNA because if they found out it was different than what they thought it should be, we'd all be in trouble because they'd try to put us someplace as guinea pigs. <laughs> but I, there are things that you're going to feel. And the more you work with these techniques, the more you will move into these cycles. And it is a cycle. You might go through a cycle where for like three months you're just getting these heat flashes now and then they come you don't know what they are we'll know what they are they have to do with DNA activation you might go through a cycle where you start getting not severe but you might start getting headaches you're on a pineal activation cycle if that happens you might feel pressure in the head and it'll bring on headaches sometimes you might go through a cycle where your vision goes blurry this is associated with pineal activation as well now, when we're going through DNA activation, it's not just something fun you do on weekends, you know, when you go to a workshop. It's something that everybody's going to start going through, but at least we know what it means. The people out there are going to start running to the doctor to give them medicine for heat flashes. They're going to start running to the doctor for the eye problems, for ear problems, because there's periods of time where ears do weird stuff too. And the one that really drives me crazy is the memory. There are times, I don't know if anybody has noticed this yet, but there will be times when literally you walk from one room to the other and then you stand there and go... <laughs> and then, you know what helps with that? Literally backtrack. Go right back to where you were when you had that thought because you left it there. <laughs> okay? But you'll be doing clearing. Your cellular memory is going to be clearing as you do this. It's making room for more higher frequency and stuff that's really not pertinent to your growth. Your higher levels of consciousness are going to say, excuse me, that's going to go. And it's like that may be really inconvenient at work if you have to remember a lot of statistics and numbers and things like that. And all of a sudden, where is that file? <laughs> you know, I know I used to know this. Where did it go? So it balances out after a while. It comes down to the stuff that's important for you to know is there. And then you get to a point where you might get so much information coming in, you realize you just can't hold it. There's nowhere to put it in your cellular memory. What I've learned to do is to trust that whatever it is will be there when I need it. 
And that goes for your physical parts as well, too. Mm -hmm. If you really, really need it, it will be there. If you're going through a purging cycle and it feels awful, because some of us will, you know, there are, there are distortions in the DNA templates, miasms from the karmic imprint that we're going to be clearing progressively. But if you can realize that even though you're going through a yucky cycle, there's another part of you that knows exactly what it is, even though at that point your head is probably, you know, where you get, if your body's doing stuff and it doesn't feel good, it tends to drag your emotional body and your mental body right with it. I'm sick of this. I don't, get me away from this. And you just want to go around you know, and bite somebody, mostly yourself. You know, you're like, geez, get me out of this body. If you can realize at those times, there's a part of you, your soul level, your over-soul level, your avatar level, that understands very much the discomfort you're going through. It's doing its part to help you get through this as comfortably as possible. And even if you lose focus and it made sense to you two weeks ago, but all of a sudden you don't know what the heck you're doing with your life and you don't know what to do and nothing just seems to work and you just feel like you're not connected to anything, that's a shifting place here. You're, you're moving into a higher space. And your avatar self already knows that. So it's comforting to know that there's some part of you that already got the plan. All right? Even if you don't know what you're doing, that part of you does. So you can trust it. Right? These are things that are like survival skills when you go into rapid DNA activation. And right now is going to be very interesting because this is one of the things I wanted to get to is rapid DNA activation. We are going through... I'm going to do the seals first. This is, you, you have these in your books, too. This is what took me forever to compile this. this is one of the charts that took a long time. Um, this is a place that talks about the planetary seals. Okay, This is a, a diagram that puts it all kind of in one place for you. You can probably read it better in your own uh, books because the print is offset from the one behind it on this. And I, I don't know what page it is because these weren't page numbered yet. Page four? Four. Okay. You know, you talk about you losing your memory. I, I've had so much of this happening where I'll put something down mm -hmm. and I'll go back and it just will not be there. I will rip it apart. The next day I wake up and it's sitting in that spot. What has been happening to me? That's more than memory, usually. I, it's happening so much this year that she thinks we're shifting. To, uh, I don't know. I can't That's explain it, but I'm not losing my mind. No, you're not. You know, we, my you're not the only the one brain. that has that. <laughs> She was just describing an interesting phenomenon. I was wondering if it had to do with memory or what. She said, it's happening so often these days that she'll like, put something down and then go away, come back, and it's just not there. But then the next day it will be. I think it jumps dimensions. It does. We're going into dimensional blend now. As these stargates open, we're starting to interface with what are called probabilities, probable reality fields. And... There's all sorts of strange things happening. Sometimes, depending on what the frequency of the thing is that you put down, it went somewhere else for a while, and then it came back, literally. But if I've, that shift, I'm not shifting. Those well, shifting. you're kind of both shifting. Okay, you go into a space of frequency, and it's in a space of frequency, and you're both changing frequency, and you literally move out of each other's perception for a while. And then you go back into the same frequency again, and you're seeing each other again. It might be an object you put down on the table, but it also might be a person. It may be half a planet's worth of people. They usually come back. Part of what? <laughs> Part of what we're going to be seeing as we move through this is something... It was very good that you brought up that example. Part of what we're going to be seeing as we move through this stellar activation cycle, particularly if it goes well, because if it doesn't go well, we're going to be so distracted by the mess that's falling apart around us that we're not going to have much time to enjoy the strange scenery that happens when stellar activation cycles go normal. There's some really interesting things that happen. Now, what we're going through is literally the planetary grids... All of the planetary grids aren't going to be able to make the full shift. That was known in 22,326 BC. That's when the original, what was called the Bridge Zone Project, was created. The Bridge Zone Project has three time vectors. That means the planetary shields are literally going to separate into three different areas of frequency, which is three different time cycles. There's a part that we can't stop from going into phantom. It's, the part, it's connected to the part that's already in there. There's a part that's going to do the blend or anchoring through, through the four faces of man grid to the inner earth time cycle. And there's a part that's going to link to the time cycle of this planet, but on its next harmonic up, Terra, but in the Miage time vector, 
which is a time vector where everything has gone all right. Their history line is different. So we're going into a, a position here, if this works, called the Bridge Zone Project. We're three tracks of time. Right now we're on one track of time. And as we move through now, it was supposed to be between now and 2017 was when this was supposed to go down. The three vectors were going to separate. One was going to go down in frequency into phantom. One was going to go in the middle frequency band where we would begin to interface with inner Earth. And the portals would open and we would realize there's whole civilizations here and we'd start to learn a lot of stuff. And then there's another one that would go into the miage zone, which is another time vector that pops in and out of this time matrix. Um, what's going to happen? What some of this will look like if we get far enough, which I'm, I'll say when we get far enough, because I'm not going to leave if as an option. When we get far enough in to the transitions that are taking place on this planet, there's literally going to be things that disappear permanently from each other. There are going to be groups of people, depending on where your DNA is activated. Now, the more of us that work with the really intense techniques to get our DNA activated, we're helping everybody else. There is a chance that most of us could shift into the bridge zone where we won't go into phantom. And there's only a few of us that once we get everybody into the bridge zone, then we'll like go on to the next one because that's a little higher frequency. That, re that would require like activating the DNA, I think, to full 12 strand to make a full leap to stay up in the miage vector. So there's literally going to be three reality fields that have been running together. Now, reality fields are composed of molecules that take on the form of things, people, plants, rocks, all that kind of stuff, all right? <laughs> These fields are going to separate, and we may begin to see, even in the, in the biblical story, it, it told you that you know, certain ones would li literally disappear as God took them up. <laughs> you know? Actually, they were talking about the team that's going to get hijacked by Jehovah, but the concept is true. All right? The concept in a stellar activation cycle, that if there's a huge difference in the frequency levels of the people on the planet, which means a huge difference in their DNA activation levels, they will literally go in to three different time bands, three, di three different time continuums. And what we may begin to see, and people are seeing it already, where certain things, like she said, you know, I put something down, I go away and uh, come back, it's not there, then the next day it'll be there again. You're seeing the oscillation in frequency. You're literally, those timelines aren't fully separated yet, but they're starting to. So things are falling into this one, but then they come back in when you get into alignment with them. The whole planet's going to be going through this. So if you start to have weird things happen, like things disappear, and then come back again. And you know you didn't do it. I've had stuff appear someplace else. It is. Yeah, what's going to be really freaky is when buildings start to do it. When what? When buildings start to do it. That's when it's going to get really interesting. Because when you go through the full, when it really starts to separate, you're re literally going to see that. Now, some of what you will see is buildings disappearing like the trade centers just did. It will appear to have an outside cause. And it does. But it's also about timelines separating. All right, so there are cover events that we will see that cover a lot of this up. But there will also be blatant events that we will see where there may come a time when we're walking down the street and we watch a part of the street disappear. But something else reappeared in its place. Like you might be aiming. I had, they showed me this once, and once was enough. <laughs> I was walking down the street, and I happened to have my daughter with me. She was an infant, and I was pushing her in the, in the carriage. And we were aiming for, we were on this end of the block, we were aiming for a store that was on the, you know, the other end of the block. So I'm walking with her, and I had you know, one of the ones that communicate with me telepathically saying, okay, we're going to show you something about time here, how time works. And it'll be many years before you understand it, but just remember this. Now I'm coming into, oh, I'm starting to understand how that could happen. I was walking, saw the store. I, I, tend to, I looked over to the side, something seemed to distract me, and I looked back, and I did one of these. It was a whole different street. And I kind of went... <laughs> and it was the same where I came from. But the, it was like other people put other businesses there in two seconds flat, because the, st the store I was aiming for didn't exist there. <laughs> it was really, really bizarre. And then they flipped it back, where I literally didn't see it. But I noticed, I felt like... I, I felt like I closed my eyes, but I didn't. I, they were still open, but there was like a blank. My consciousness blanked for a second, and there it was again. And I felt much better because my street came back. Because I didn't know where to go. <laughs> you know? It's like, well, well, where do I go? I'm supposed to turn right down there, and then my house is over there. Where is it? Yeah. 
<laughs> so these are some of the weird things that happen. Yeah, you can also have, I've had little hints at it where going into a store, I remember I went into a store to buy a pack of cigarettes, and one day they were like um, $2.10, and literally, at, that was like at 8 o'clock in the morning, and at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, they were like $3.50, and I said, so, what do they do, just put a you know a price hike on them, or what? Just, no, they've been this way for a month and a half. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So if you have weird experiences like this, realize you're starting to perceive the changes that the planet is going through. And we're going to see all sorts of wild stuff. But it won't be too wild and freaky if we get what are called the miage zones set or miage fields. Miage fields are frequency fields, like a frequency blanket that will cover this planet if we were able to get the full four faces of man grid in like fully fully activated and there weren't the other problems there would be like this blanket of what looks like pale indigo blue light that would surround the planet you wouldn't see it with instruments here but if you were looking at the planet from a higher dimensional frequency band it would look like a pale blue mist surrounding the planet that is a miage field that is the frequencies that are going to be generated by plugging this planet's four faces in to parallel and into inner earth and then running the primal light and sound field currents that will create that buffer around the planet now in that buffer you will be able to maintain something called a form constant which means the form of things that you're seeing will stay relatively constant in other words you're not going to watch reality melt before your eyes and turn into something else if you remember this is all energy and frequency and you start moving frequency around literally there are reality systems where you walk out your door and fall off because the road isn't there anymore, you know? There's really some strange spaces that can happen in, in places that are messed up. Now, this place will get, we probably won't have the benefit, there's not enough time, probably, we could try, to generate a full miage field blanket. It's a miage field, a try-on field. That's another word for it, try-on field or trinity field, because it's utilizing the three, the parallel, the inner, and the uh, and earth, to anchor the full it's not up there anymore, Kundere and Kirishe spectrum. <clears throat> if we got a full blanket around the planet, we would literally, nice and smoothly, without violence, without people fighting with each other, without the Illuminati doing their thing, we would literally move through a harmonious stellar activation cycle. The chances of that happening are slim to none. All right? What's going to happen instead is if we're successful with the work that we're doing, we will build enough areas of this miage field, the trion field, in certain areas. The areas that are able to hold it, it will be as if, if you looked at it from above, like a nice pale blue clouds were over that area, but then you will have holes in those clouds or over these areas, there's nothing. There's only the regular frequency that was there. Those areas that aren't under that cloud of the miage field frequencies are the areas you're going to see the most disturbances, where you're going to see natural disaster type stuff come up, where you're going to see warring and issues like that. And literally, there's going to be a time when, this is why they're starting to give us maps with actual coordinates on them, so we know what we can track, where the miage fields are building, so we know where the safe places are to live, all right? Because there will come time, you know, even if we move through this and we're doing well, the Illumina Illuminati guys are still using sonics. They're still using things that are compromising the planetary grids. And even if we get those wormholes closed, which we're intending to do, they're still going to be because there's so much of a frequency difference. It isn't, we're not moving into stellar activation on a nice even keel. It's like going, into a, going in on a tidal wave. There are going to be areas that are going to see disturbance. But if we do our job well, we're not going to see, the whole planet's not going to be like that. If nobody, do, if no, if nobody works to do these try-on fields, the whole planet's going to go into that mess because you have to be able to set the trion field which holds the polarities in like a suspension field so they don't crash into each other and create messes. When we work with the techniques that we have, and particularly when we begin working with the uh, QVECA code, this is going to create these in and around our bodies as well. So when, we're, when the Jehovian implants start to activate because they're activating in the grids, that field will purge it and heal it. When we get natural activations, even if we didn't have any yucky seals in our DNA, we still have some distortions in the DNA that we've had for thousands of years. You know, they call it the karmic imprint. It's the miasmic imprint, where it's, it's literally a physical construct made of um, myon units, which I won't get into now. It'll take too long to talk about. But when we activate DNA and when we integrate spiritually, in order to get that higher frequency consciousness in, it has to transmute those lower distorted patterns. So it will bring 
conflict up in the body. Sometimes that's expressed physically as far as illnesses that are there to purge out the distortion pattern. Sometimes it'll come up in the form of, you know, mental issues or issues with somebody that was from your lifetime before, you know, that you <laughs> had issues to resolve with. When we use the trion field, the miage field, with the body by using the VECA codes, it's literally creating a field that these things can harmonize in much better. So it will protect your health more, it'll protect your mental balance and your emotional happiness a lot more than if you don't use it while we're going through stellar activation. But on a planetary level, the best visualization to see is to literally picture the Earth as if you're looking at it from like out in space and see this beautiful pale blue cloud of energy, a blanket surrounding it that's literally going to buffer anything that's too harsh that's coming in through the stargates and anything that's coming up from the planetary templates. Okay? Now, we can all envision it being a perfect blanket, as if it all worked absolutely perfectly. We can hold that image, but know while we're holding it that it is an unrealistic outcome. It's a good objective, but where we are now and the amount of time we have to get that frequency field set it is, it's more accurate if instead of using a visualization where you see the whole planet surrounded in this blue field, let the planet tell you where it's surrounded. Simply say, I see the miage field now and let it come to you where the areas actually have it. If you interact with the image of just the planet, right? You can do a meditation every once in a while to see where things are. Imagine the planet as if you're viewing it from outer space and imagine that there is going to be a blue mist, but the blue mist is only going to appear in truth, which means where it really is. You're not going to force your idea on it. You're going to let it tell you where it is, because then you'll find out where it's most needed as well. All right? When you're doing rounds or when you're doing salutations or working with any of this as an individual or with groups, you can use this image of seeing the earth and saying, I will see the miage field now. And where you see, if you look at it and you see like, two clouds in the whole sky on the whole planet, you get an idea of what we're starting with, okay? It's going to take a while to build this, but we can do it by the end of 2002. Now, when you go into doing a group or something, if you want to do some energy, you want to know where to put it, this is the best visualization you can use unless you happen to get some other things for very specific, put it here, put it there. You visualize the planet, say, I see the miage field now. And try to get an idea, okay, like this is Africa over here, this is the United States. You know, just basic, like if you're seeing land under there, you know what land it is. So you can tell if there's areas of Africa that need it, or if there's areas of the United States that need it. Focus at home right now, because it could use a whole lot. Um, this is where you could literally direct the intention of a round table. And simply, you hold the intention, tell the group about the intention, say, we're directing this one here. And when you run the round table, send it down with the intention, it goes into Earth's core, and it will go where you sent it. There will also be a part of it that goes into, if we're using, if we're using the uh, Quebeca code, it will go right into the four faces of man grid as well. But you can target where it's needed, where you feel it's needed. If, you're going, if you go to New York City, where they had this literal huge hole ripped in the astral field up there now, where this took place, this didn't just affect this level of, of you know, New York. It affected literally the astral level, it ripped a major hole in it. And you could do, you don't, they won't let you on the site, but you can go, or even if you live in Florida, you can go and send miage fields up over to that site and to the Pentagon site. But the one that's really in need of it right now, it's almost like a gaping hole, like if it was a balloon that's losing helium. New York is using, losing a huge amount of energy right now out of its grids because of that hole. And that's going to be a primary place that they're aiming to take down in the phantom. So that's a good place to begin. If you're going to do energy work that you want to do for planetary healing, like any, anything, any of the techniques in the field guide that goes with that book, you can use them. You can use your salutations. You can just run your Maharic shield and simply visualize that area and visualize the pale blue going. Now, what will activate this very strongly is when we begin to use this code. Again, I'm going to put this back up for just for a second. Maybe I will. This, this one is the key to setting very quick and strong uh, miage fields, try-on fields. All right, so that's the code we're going to use. You all should have that in, in the books that were just passed out, the handbooks that were just passed out. Hmm? Oops, yeah, there we go. Yeah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> okay. Again, if we can remember, they're not just little things to play with. They're mathematical encodings that direct energy and frequency and blend it in very specific ways. You can make a huge difference here. 
You can make a difference for the people in New York City right now. You could also make a difference for the people in Afghanistan right now. And even if you don't like Saddam Hussein, there is Stargate 10 and QSite 10 over there. You could send some over that way before they start getting bombed. <laughs> you know, there's a way to target. You, you could target areas that really need assistance. And it will help you. The more you run this, the more you're building your own field. So it's like in helping others and helping the planet, you're helping yourself. And every time you run your own just to help you, it's actually helping the planet. But if you're not directing it someplace, it'll kind of like find its own direction to go. You know, once you set miage field in yourself, once you set a trion field, you are bringing that frequency into your body, and that is going to communicate with the Earth's body. So these, it all comes down to, no matter how sophisticated the um, Illuminati program, the Fallen Angelic program is, this is more sophisticated, but how to do it is easy. It's really, really simple. We don't have to worry about figuring out how to design machines that will project the right types of frequency and how to get our little weapons lined up to blow trumpet fields when we need to zap things. This is very natural, and it's not hard to learn. Okay, now this. This is going to be really important in, your, in those packets that you have. This sheet shows you where the organic seals are, the 12 organic seals. It has exactly the like the... Uh, the longitude latitude coordinates that go with them so you can find them on a map so you, you can get an idea and it also has just the name if you don't want to look up exact longitude and latitude it gives you like where's close to it like you know that Nantes or however you say it France for you know for number one it shows you where they are now these are the natural seals the areas of the natural seals as soon as they start to open are going to start to go through a grid acceleration so you're going to see things like this would naturally happen, even if there were no Jehovian seals. If there's any um, miasms in the planetary body or in the bodies of people in those areas, this is when they'll start to stir up and get agitated. Now, that would be temporary in, under normal circumstances. That would be a temporary purging as the frequencies are running and straightening out anything disharmonic below them. You'll find that in the areas of the seal. We also find it from each seal. They literally have a radius of about 1,000 miles. So they all, you know, by, by the time you get all of them done, you look at them on the globe, they all overlap. You know, there's overlaps all over the place. The most concentrated area of impact, let's say, from the frequencies that get released from a seal are ground zero, which is where the seal is located, then the first hundred miles and the second hundred miles. They are the strongest effect zones. Now, you also see positive things happening. This is where the people's DNA is going to be activating faster. All right, I'm going to get into a minute. Once we see, go through this a little bit, I'm going to show you where this chart corresponds to your DNA as well. Because there's, time, there's a timeline on here. It already shows seal 1, seal 2, seal 3. They have been activated already. Seal 4 has been activated already. Now we're looking at these over here. These two here are just to indicate which ones had Jehovian seals with them. And down here I get into more of the Jehovian seals. I hope yours is more clear than this is because it's pretty blurry. All right, so we already have one, two, three, and four activated. Look at the look at the timeline on this. Okay, that, the last one activated in September. This one's December of 2001. This one's January in the first week of January in 2002. August, September 2002. November, December 2002. Look at this. August 12, 2003. They're all done by then. They've all activated by then. Now the effects start to happen within three to twelve months depending on a lot of factors depending on whether there's a, a Jehovian seal attached depending on whether there's grid distortions or not but be, within three to twelve months usually within three to six you will start to have the effects of those frequencies running through the grids showing themselves which means that's when the people's DNA will start to activate and that means if they have a lot of messed up DNA because they haven't they don't know about running you know, how to clear their DNA template, this is when you'll find all sorts of gook coming up for people and for races, as far as races that have problems with each other. There's conflicts there that those races haven't healed with each other. This stuff will come up, so you'll see more conflicts. But a lot of times you can send miage fields to those areas. In fact, it's a good idea to send miage fields to all these areas, especially the areas that have the J's, the J seals with them, okay? This is exciting, because what this is telling us, and this, this would have taken literally until, I believe, 2012 or 2017 to finish all of this, but because they had to activate Stargate 6 early, or this wormhole nonsense was going to pull us in and there was no way they were going to be able to save it, they activated uh, Stargate 6 in May. 
the, the Guardian races did. That has set this all in motion. And since then, the grids are accelerating so rapidly that we're not making these seals open. They're opening on their own because it was always when a certain frequency was hit, that's when the seals would start to go. And the frequency is climbing very, very rapidly now. So what we were going to see between the year 2000 and then uh, 2012 and then 2017, which was the original ascension schedule that was in Voyager's volume two, the first printing, that has literally all been pushed up to the point where what we were gonna see between like 2012 and 2017, we're gonna see between 2003 and 2006, it's gonna start. So literally the halls of Amente, Stargate's opening, which was due for 20, uh, 2012, is going to probably begin uh, so it might begin as early as 2003. It may begin in 2006, which will be better, because it gives the grids more time to, to learn to balance these energies. It gives all of us more time to learn to balance these energies. The Guardians are going to try <coughs> their best <coughs> to modulate the frequencies here so that we don't have to have all that happen until 2006. But there's no way they can hold it past then. They don't even think they can hold this, this accelerated activation even up to 2006. This is why. These are the dates. They couldn't give us these before because they were tracking the grids and finding out how fast they were increasing per day or per whatever before they could do a, a projection to tell us when the seals were going. And they've got the projection now. And it's going really, really fast. Okay? Now, the Jehovian seals are the problem. They're the ones... If I could, I'm going to have to move this up because I can't read this thing. Okay. Now, what's interesting is after we get to here, and if you notice, I have on those lists... Machu Picchu in December, Lake Titicaca, Peru in January. These are our trips where we're going to the areas that we need to go to to run the frequency of the round tables to stabilize and clear these things. These things are going to activate whether or not we go, but our presence there, running the frequencies the right way, will create a stabilizing field that will progressively help to not have these cause earth changes. Because basically what's going to happen is these, these seals open. Even the natural ones, <laughs> I know. As these seals open, even the natural ones would create some type of, of climate disturbance and sometimes tectonic disturbance, depending on how clear the grids are in the areas. The grids are a mess on this planet. So if, there were, if we weren't be, being given techniques to help you know, stabilize this energy. We would be seeing all sorts of wild stuff whipping up. Storms, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, the usual bunch of yucky stuff. There's going to be volcanoes that are going off. I'm very concerned about the people in Mexico because they said two years ago that, that Popo was going to be one of the first to go. I can't pronounce the whole thing, but they call it Popo for short, and so do I. <laughs> you know? Yeah, anybody know how to pronounce that one? You know the one in Mexico. Popo Catepel. There we go. I'll, you know, I'll remember that for about four seconds and then it'll be out again. <laughs> so the work that we're doing is literally going to be able to change what would appear here if we didn't do it. What, if we didn't do it, we would be seeing a very dramatic and rapid increase of chaos. We would also be seeing things like, you know, the federal relief funds that people, you know, our country has and like other countries have, their disaster relief funds, insurance companies, all of that. You would see very rapidly all of these things go bankrupt and broke because there were so many things that hit in so many areas and so many people that needed money and help that there just wasn't enough to cover it. So the potential is that what this could go into, it could be a real, real mess. I mean, politically, economically, it could affect every area of your life, even if you don't live in one of the areas that will be affected. Now, what's interesting about having this chart is you not only know when the seal is going to go, you know where the seal is. So it gives you an idea of the area that's going to be affected. These will be the areas where you will see some type of reaction to the seal releasing. Now it may be a large one or it may be a small one depending on how the grids are stabilized there. Number one, two, and three seals that are already released, which we should be seeing the results of uh, the beginning result of those when, May, May, June, July, August, as early as August, which we are already through, <laughs> okay, because anywhere from three to three to twelve months after the seal releases. So you look at those dates that are there. And three to 12 months after those dates is the time frame you're going to see, you know, the effect of the seal. Some of them have already opened. You know, we're already into that three-month period. So, you know, heads up <laughs> any time now. Okay. When we get down here, we're on what are called galactic and universal trinity seals. This is after the Earth's natural 12 seals open. These are ones that literally begin to open up, and these are the ones that make it possible 
to do the for, to activate the fully activate the four faces of man grid where we be, we can make those standing pillars of sound to connect the three planets then into the primal light fields and into the sound fields these are the ones the univer the gal galactic and universal seals the t there's three of them they correspond to um, dimension 12 1 and 13 and then the next one is to dimension 13 and 14 and then 14 and 15 once those seals release they will w they they will allow the full Kundare frequencies to come down. Kundare, Kirishe, Maharada. This is the anchoring of the Christos template on a planetary level. So there will be, out there, they just released the, when, where this trip would be too in the last month. Um, when we go, we're gonna, we knew we were going to France in uh, like somewhere between November and December. They're going to let us know when is the, you know, the better time. 2002. Now we get into seal 14 and 15. One is in uh, Jaipur, India. And at the same time, we're going to be doing, as soon as, like, as soon as we get back, we won't be doing them exactly on that date, but these are the dates that they're going to activate, because we can't be in two places at the same time unless we split the group in two, which isn't a good idea. All right, so we're going to do this one and this one. They're going to go, actually, at the same time, but we're going to be doing them from here if we can. I mean, hopefully the politics of things will hold out well enough. In August 2003, we'll be able to do a trip. To India. That's what we're hoping. But you never know what, with how crazy things are getting over there. If not, we would do it at the other location. But these two seals are going to go. And while we're, if we're over here, this one's going to go anyway. Then we'd come, when we come home, we'd balance the frequencies of it there. Because especially Sarasota, we've been doing a lot of work on, you know, at the grids there. But we got hit pretty good with psychotronics the last time we were there. So anyway, <laughs> these two will be the final ones. This is, if we get to the point where we, um, let's see, with the Machu Picchu trip, we'll get through those natural seals. If we get through the Titicaca trip, and we actually get to where, well, it's time to do the Tibet trip, we know we're going to make it, <laughs> okay? It's what happens at Titicaca that's going to make the difference, whether or not they're going to be able to get the four faces of man grid activated. And if they can't, then there's literally going to be a different type of program set up that will teach us how to work with our DNA and I think, I don't know how they're going to arrange it, but I know there would be initial contact with group leaders. They would, you know, you'd, you'd be contacted probably not by us. It would be, I have a feeling that Iani would somehow contact you know, the people who they who probably have contracts, soul contracts to be group leaders in that event and you would literally be given instruction on where, when and who you could get through. And I'm talking about large groups. All right. There, mo the people that respond to this program, which is the Master's Planetary Stewardship Initiative, Master's Templar Planetary Stewardship Initiative, this long, people that are part of this program, people who decide that they want to become what's called uh, Regent Consulates, they will be the first ones that, if it goes into Plan B EVACs, they would be the ones that would be approached by the IANI in some form or another and explain what had to be done next, which means we would get to see some interesting stuff. From the time I was small, I had the experiences of being taken periodically into inner earth. I've, had the, I've even gone to Tara, what is called Tara, density two, with the physical body. Now, you know, some people call that abduction. Um, <laughs> it's not abduction if you wanted to go. <laughs> <You know? laughs> There's abductions by the negative guys, but then you have invitations by the positive ones. If it goes into plan B, your life may get very magical very quickly because it will, be, it will mean there's no more time for a slow wake-up cycle and eventually you'll get to meet somebody from the other side. It's like, don't want to scare you to death and terrify you, but excuse me, um, would you mind your like, commission to get like 20,000 people out, so I'd like to show you how to start doing that. <laughs> now, if you're going to get anybody out, I don't know how they will do this. They may prepare us in a way where we have groups and certain people would literally be drawn to us, which it may go that way. We won't even have to say anything to them, but they'll, like, they, we will end up with these groups. It might be for a workshop or it might be for something. We think we're doing one thing, but it turns out that, oh, this is the group that's going through. I don't know if you will get to go through first, where they literally take you through and say, sit you down in one of the crystal temples and say, okay, guys, this is the plan, and you'll know, pull out the maps and that kind of stuff. <laughs> they might. I've, I mean, I've had those experiences. I, I've, I've been there. I don't know if there's time or if they would take everybody that way or if they give us the per how, to, how to prepare and then tell us basically when and where, and we'd know that, okay, that workshop coming up, that's a, that's a, a, a field trip, let's say. <laughs> it would not be something done publicly. I mean, there, you can't take this many billion people 
who don't have their DNA activated high enough through. You can take them through if you want to have them spontaneously combust and fragment their consciousness. What's worse? Leaving them here, even if the place was going into, you know, if it goes into phantom, they will try. I mean, if it, if it goes, you don't want to be here because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be messy. It's going to be like it said in Revelations where there's plagues and there's you know, people wanting to be dead and they can't die and that kind of stuff. Hopefully we won't have to see any of that. But if we do, we'll be helping not only people whose bodies can come through, We'll also be showed how to help people who aren't going to be able to take their bodies, which means they're going to leave their bodies. They're going to transition. They'll choose whatever way they want to transition, be it, you know, natural, natural disaster, you know, plague, whatever. But we'll be able to help their consciousness through. I started getting training, get training in that without even realizing I was getting training. When I would find things, it started with things would drop dead in front of me, like birds. It used to scare me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the death touch. What am I, the angel of death here or what? Because <laughs> you know? literally, I'd be like, uh, a couple times I was literally, and it happened like twice in the exact same way, like months apart, where I'd walk under this one underpass, and I had my old daughter with me at the time at her stroller, and literally the first time I walked under, and I'm glad I had the roof on the stroller, like the little thing you pull over, because this bird went poof and landed and died on top of the stroller. And I was going, kind of jeez. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized I wasn't supposed to react that way. <laughs> okay, don't just poke it and get it off the stroller. You know, okay, oh yeah, something just died. Oh, oh, I get it. Okay, I'm supposed to do something spiritual here. <laughs> so I remember tuning into it. Okay, is there anything I can do to help you, bird? <laughs> yeah. And I just remember feeling just my paying attention to it created a thing, and I could feel this whoosh. It used my biofield to step up in frequency so it could get its consciousness out to a higher level. Yeah. It, it, it's like it waited for me because it knew I, I passed through that place a lot. It waited for me to come by. I had, another, I had that happen a couple times. Um, I've had animals do that. And the big one was when I ended up on a bus going, and I never like go to, it was to Atlantic City. I never go on these things. I'm not a gambling person. You know, I, I'm like, no, I'm, I'll use my money in pot, you know, ways that I can be sure what I'm going to get on the other end of it. I got this, I had to go on this stupid bus trip. And I didn't really want to, was, I don't know why, but I have to, I have to go. So I went, I lived in uh, Pennsylvania at the time, so I went down to Atlantic City, New Jersey, on the bus, you know, I won $100, you know, with the quarter machines, and I said, that's enough, I'm not gonna play anymore. <laughs> and coming back on the bus, this bizarre set of events happened. Uh, a car engine exploded in front of the bus, and the, the car that was in front of the bus exploded. The bus had to swerve to get out of the way. So did a bunch of other cars. It was on, like, you know, a couple lanes. And you just saw, I'm, I'm sitting in the window going, because <laughs> I got jolted awake. I'd been sleeping. And I'm seeing cars. They, they looked like little matchbox cars bouncing off each other. And there were several of them, and they were, you know, spinning off this way. The bus managed to stay straight. Nobody was hurt on our bus. But there was one car that was hit with the back of the bus when he got out of the way, so the bus didn't roll over the car in front of it that had blown up. Um, it hit another car, and that car went literally this way, got hit about four times until it stopped on the side, and then he drove back. The bus driver made sure we were okay, and then he you know, drove back to a certain point, parked, got out, and he said, everybody stay on the bus. And I don't know what was, I usually follow instructions. Something moved through me, and I did this really weird thing that I didn't know I could do. I stayed invisible by I linked into his field. The bus driver was going to go. He knew it was bad. And he was going to go run down to see what happened to the people in the car that he knew he had hit you know, with the back end of the bus. And I got behind him, and I knew he couldn't see me. I was like in his field in a certain way where he couldn't see me. And I literally tracked him all the way down. And he ordered everybody, stay on the bus. You know? I ended up standing down there with him next to the car, and I saw these two black vortices up over the car roof. I knew that the car roof was flat. I mean, wh wherever the heads were, they weren't there anymore. Couldn't see in. But I saw the black vortices up over the top. And I realized what was going on. Oh, God, it's just like the birds used to be, that the people had died. But my field was brought there, not because on this level I understood it was going to be, but it was brought there to assist. By having a field that has these frequencies activated in it, you're like the stairway to heaven. Yeah. Something that would be able to, would get stuck down here otherwise, by being in your presence of your field, just by being there, you would be able to help them transition. So you may find yourself in strange situations like that. But literally, it was funny. I saw the vortices, and I said, what's that? And then some part of me knew. It was, oh, 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 dear. You know, like the people were dead. And it's like, don't think about that right now. Watch. You know? And I saw these two little kind of sparks come up out of the car through the vortices and a whole bunch of other ones. There's like three each waiting for them at the top. 
And I knew I could feel these frequencies in my field making this bridge so the little stars at the top would be able to reach the little ones that were coming up. And I knew that we'd help them get up to their soul levels. So it was amazing. You, we'll be going through things like this. If you find yourself in, in a situation where things are dying around you, don't let it scare you, okay? It doesn't mean you're the angel of death or you're dealing with something negative. It means you must be very valuable frequency-wise because you're being asked to help just by being there, okay? Yes. Yes, yes. If you have that stairway to heaven, see, normally you'd have your own, but because the grids are so messed up here and they have the phantom matrix pulling, they've been literally siphoning souls off when they try to get out of body. They've been stuck in the incarnational cycles in phantom, a lot of them. Some of them end up back here, but they can't get out of here because they do. Right when the sparks are coming up out of the body, they hijack them and pull them with frequency. And people that have frequency that's able to span those dimensions and you know and hold the integrity of the field you literally give them a, a safe bubble to pass through so you may find this happening and if you do try to, if we if you find yourself or if we all find ourselves confronting issues of death like watching lots of things around us deciding to check out whether or not I mean it might be terrorist activity it might be plagues it might be weather things it might be earthquakes whatever it is realize there's another side to that that it's not always a negative thing. It may appear to be negative out here, but there are a whole bunch of souls that want to get out here that can't take their bodies because their DNA won't activate fast enough. All right. When you see that, send try-on fields to them because those fields will literally surround them and buffer them. This is why it needs, we need help in New York City to close that hole because right now, those people that, that left in that accident, a lot of them are being hijacked in the Phantom. We, we immediately, uh, Michael and I did work, we were sent to do work uh, in a certain location down in Florida, and, we, and it was sent up there to literally create a blue cloud over the thing. And it needs help to reinforce that cloud. But if you can realize that when you're working with the, with the try-on fields, that you're, you're doing amazing things, not just little things, you're, you're doing amazing things. I also want you to be prepared emotionally if it gets rough out there. We're the team. The people who sit here and listen to this stuff and care enough to learn it. We're the team that everybody else is counting on. Because most people fall apart when stuff starts to get rough. You know, they, get, they fall into depression and they can't get themselves back out. And if it gets really politically unstable, things go absolutely nuts. You have people fighting with each other in the streets and looting. I mean, look at what they're doing in, in Palestine and Pakistan and all those places. And they happen to do it because they don't like Americans right now. Any excuse will do, I guess. <coughs> We're going to be the rocks of Gibraltar. And it's, it doesn't have to be scary because you wouldn't have been drawn into wanting to find out about what this workshop was about. You wouldn't be associated with even coming into the frequency where you could look at this work if you didn't have what it takes. If you didn't have an avatar that says, yep, I came to be there. That's why I ended up here. So what this thing, like if you don't save the whole packet or if you just stick it in a drawer, this is one of the ones you may want to keep out so you can keep track of what's going off when or when you're watching the TV and you start to see storms brewing up someplace, check it out. Does it have something to do with that? So you start to get an idea. You can start to get a feel for how fast things are going and what is it, what's attached to this seal release and what isn't. You'll be able to start to get a feel if you're in a danger zone. So if maybe it's a good time to leave or convince your family to go on a long vacation or something. You know, this, these charts will help you to do that because you will be able to chart the basic flow of action. Now there's another one that goes with this, the DNA one. Yeah, this guy. Is it backwards? No, that's not words. All right. This is a diagram of a 12-strand DNA pattern, okay? That's in the Cathar manual, and I think it's also in the Templar book. But I've added some things here that are in chicken scratch right now because I didn't have time to typeset them. That takes forever to put these little paste-ups on. <laughs> but what I have added to this, these are the star crystal seal, uh, the fire codes in between the DNA strands that I've been talking about. These are the DNA strands. The strands are numbered. And in between each, you have a fire code. Now, these are the fire code numbers. These are on the diagrams before. Okay, these are the fire code numbers. What I've added are the seal numbers. The seal numbers and the fire code numbers are different. Okay? The seal numbers mean 
When this fire code goes, this is the seal it corresponds to. That's the seal that's going to be releasing in the DNA and in the body. Uh, there's another uh, diagram in there. It shows you the, the chakras. It's like a skinny body standing there with like the main vertical current and the chakras. It also shows you the star crystal seals. When these things fire in the DNA, that's when the corresponding ones that have the same... If you look at the frequencies involved, because again, they're just numbered like, I think, uh, star crystal seals. We didn't have the seal activation sequence then, so we just literally listed them. Yeah, one, I think one was probably uh, the, the red crystal seal, etc. Yeah, it's on the charts. There, there's a chart in, I think it's toward the back of those books. But, anyway, with this, you're I've also put the dates, all right? Now, we've already begun this process. May 2000, okay? Seal number two, May 2000. Seal number one. These are the things. Seal number three is over here. July 2000. These have begun to activate. Three. These usually go three to six months, but it's three, three to 12 months, but three to six is really more in the time frame you're going to start to see activation. So these are the things that are going to start to be activating in, in your body, literally, because the planetary grids are activating these things. So when the grids go, it triggers it in the body. Now, as we're working with the techniques that we have, even the ones that, are all, you, know, that you guys already have, we are helping to balance this process. All right. Now, if we look here, see these little guys here? These little strange-shaped black things? And they have the numbers, the J3, J1, J2. This shows you what seals have the uh, Jehovian seals attached to them. They're the ones that are, you, it's important to when they're, they're going off that you use this particular code. And I'll show you how to do it because there's a real easy way. They're gonna sh uh, before, before it gets too late, what time is it? Okay, because I want to make sure the people who have to leave real early are going to get the technique. Well, I'll, what I'll go to right after... I explain this is what to do with that symbol okay it's real important for the ones who have the little Jehovian seals marked with them these are the times you really really need to use this particular um, Qveca code all right you can use the tribe tribecas and bivecas with them but first start with this one because this will do the most harmonizing and balancing all right I'll tell you how to use it in a minute but you have this right in that little packet that you know the information you just got and this is why I, I was late, but I said I, I don't want them to leave without having this because this shows you. You can look at it. What, what's going off when in your body? Okay. <clears throat> also, want you to see this one. And I'll explain this. You have this in there too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Right. Okay. This is a diagram from the Cathar book and it appears a couple other places too. But what this one is doing, on, what the information on this is showing you, is where the Jehovian seals are located in the body. All right? These are the areas of the body that become affected. Now, Jehovian seal 5, for example, is here, but it's rear. So it means it's like here, but back here. So when that goes, you would be getting pain in through here. All right? There's ones that would have pain in through here. It affects the left side of the body. These, when they, these up here, you have seal four, seal six. Um, J1 is up there. They affect the brain as well, which affects, can affect the eyesight, the jaw, the hearing, all sorts of things. These are blockages, reversals, where the way your currents are supposed to be running actually gets inverted and reversed because they're trying to drag your astral body down into phantom. All right. Now, these are the things that we will be able to heal by using the uh, Qveca code. And now, we were given exercises before of using the Biveca and Triveca together with a salutation. So people who have, ha who have that one, you can use that too. They do something else that's just as important. But right now, the crisis point is going to be getting these things broken up, where they literally kind of break up and, and just purge in little pieces so they don't devastate the frequencies trying to come through and that's what this code will do it'll also do it in the planetary grids that's why they're giving it to us now begins the process of activating in our bodies in our ley line system the uh, four faces of man grid but these are the areas that would be affected I know that I've been having trouble with these up here all right this one up here and some of these are in the rear I've been getting pain like in here and really sore. It's like really stiff and just sometimes it even clicks. I go clink, clink, and what is in there? You know? Um, Michael has been having a terrible time with this one, the one that runs down in through here. 
and it affects like the whole uh, seven axiotonal line. And just like on um, the maps that we saw, the Jehovian seals on the planet were placed on axiotonal line seven, planetary axiotonal line seven. That was that 70 degree west, west, yeah, longitude. <laughs> well, it's axiotonal line seven that they're on in the body too. These lines in your body correspond to the axiotonal line system on the planet, which means when certain things are running through certain axiotonal lines on the planet, they're going to be running through your body too. We're going to be experiencing a couple different things in the body. One is the purging of these Jehovian seals, which isn't particularly fun sometimes, but you can get through it, particularly when you have the secret weapon now, <laughs> the secret medicine, which is the mathematical coding that allows you to bring the, uh, the primal sound field frequencies into the body to break those up. We're also going to be experiencing, and this, this started in Kauai actually, these axiotonal lines, there's a bunch of them that haven't been operational because of the way, what the DNA is doing. Because of the planetary grids being activated in the early activation of Stargate 6, that started in the planet doing something called opening the, inner, or opening the halls of Amorea. The halls of Amorea are a passage of frequency that goes from D12 to D9 to D6 to D3 to D1. It jumps down instead of going through like D, D12, 11, 10, 9. It, runs down and it runs down the cathara grid but what it'll do it's going to open up the corresponding um, number 12 number 9 number 6 number 3 and number 1 and most of those like 3 6 and 9 are here these have been blocked and running on lower low d3 current for a very long time so you may start to get effects they're usually not painful but i've been getting stiffness lately a little bit like you know we're stiff like the cells are going enough already i can't handle any more frequency coming through that, when you get the pains over there, it's not, that's not like a crisis. You don't have to get scared about that. It, if it hurts, it, you can clear it mostly, usually by running Maharic frequency and resting. All right? It just means that you have frequency coming through that your molecules aren't used to processing and they're stretching and try it. Like, kind of like you're, you know, when you're small and you get growing pains in your leg bones. Did you ever get that? I used to get that. And it was just literally the legs are growing and the molecules are stretching and it doesn't feel too great sometimes. You'll get a little bit of that within the right side of the body. But the ones that we really need to do something with in ourselves so they don't begin to harm us. And if we do it in ourselves and enough of us do it, it will start to clear it out of, uh, out of the mass you know, body patterns. So it will literally help to save people's lives and help them to come through the stellar activation cycle. Once we get a critical mass in the planetary grids clearing those Jehovian seals, then we won't have to work directly with our own. But in the meantime, we're more activated right now than the planetary grids are. All right, we, we're, we're holding more frequency. We're consciously running frequency. So right now we need to, just like we need to, activate a Maharic seal if we expect D12 current to come through our bodies. We also need to run a very simple, and thank God with this one, it's simple. The exercise is not hard. <laughs> now you can amplify this if you want to. You can, you know, uh, in Sarasota we learned how to use the Biveca and Triveca by literally drawing the symbol on the bottom of our feet and then doing the salutation, where you can, you know, doing the conscious Merkaba spin to get the spins going in the right direction. You can use this code that way. You can use this code in round tables, but you can also just use it sitting or laying there. And it will still, you know, work. As long as you activate, do your Insta Seal, you know, Insta Maharic Seal, get your D12 frequency running. And then there's four places you need to move the image of this symbol to and just literally breathe it in and out. And I'll show you what they are in a minute. But what they'll do is progressively begin to hit these things with sound tones from the primal sound fields. And because these are like disharmonic sound tones, but they're not as loud, let's say. It's not sound to hear, but if one sound was louder, it would be the louder one that would eventually override the one that wasn't as loud. These might be nasty, but they're not as loud. So when the frequencies of the primal sound fields come through, because you're activating them with that template, you know, with that, because that is a template. That's a, a mathematical template. When you activate them, it will progressively break them up. And you'll, you might even find, it's kind of interesting, if you're a person who is used to looking into bodies, like with psychic healing, so I know some of you do that, uh, you will actually see what looks like soot coming down in, in the energy lines in the body. Or sometimes it'll like hang out here, like in the etheric body, right outside the body, literally as they're breaking up. One of the things I just noticed, and I, I noticed it by observing it, and it was not in a, 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 a bad state, but I realized what the Jehovian seals did if they were left unattended, what they do. And it was one of the nastiest things, that, like the potential of what I saw. I saw one of them activating, and you know how you have your Maharic seal and you have your astral field around you, you know, these energy fields around you? Well, right where this one was, there was 
it looked like a burn mark in the astral bubble. It had a hole in the astral field. And it hadn't gone all the way through yet with the person who I saw it. But this is what they can do if you're not running the freak, you know, the D12 frequency and higher, and if you don't clear them. And it was not only through the, it could, not only could go through the astral field, it can burn itself right through from the inside, the Maharic killer. All right, they could literally push their way through, and they're like, it's almost like acid burning through. I, I had no idea about it, but I, I happened to catch one in the field, and I've, I've been looking over my shoulder, huh, what's it doing? You know what I mean? What this, I mean, if, you're, if people are going through this without realizing they're going through it, they're feeling a little pain here or something. But what's really happening is eating a hole in their astral field, and even people that are using the Maharic seal alone, these have enough power, because I guess they're being generated by this, I think it's a, a false D11.5 uh, reverse current that they use over in the in the phantom matrix they're connected to that and they literally have the ability if you don't have a real strong maharic seal which you'd have it, you wouldn't be able to do it if you had 12 strand activation full activation it wouldn't be able to affect the maharic seal but right now we're just learning to build that maharic pillar of frequency around us it could literally burn right through it and leave holes and where there's holes there's doorways and that's where they you know things like to come up and it's also where they were literally are trying to have our bodies die and take the astral bodies and our consciousness down in the phantom. This is how nasty these things are. You know what I mean? It makes me look at the Bible a whole lot different. I mean, I always used to try to keep a level of respect because it once started as a good book. All right, even if you know it's been twisted and distorted because originally it was you know the Essene teachings and the ones that came from Atlantis before that. It was good stuff. But I, when I started to see what this stuff can do, this is mean. The people who come up with this stuff, these are mean beings. They are really twisted. So it's important that we begin to use the tools that we're given. And thank God they're easy. Thank God you don't have to go and get like rabies shots for it. You know what I mean? It's a whole lot less pleasant. This is just simply using, I'm going to put this code back up here again. If I can find it, there we go. Find it. There it is. Okay. Cubica code. Okay. Now, down here, it, sh it lists the four points that it needs to go, that this frequency pattern needs to be activated in. One is chakra eight, the thyroid, which would be right here, right around here. On the chakra chart, it shows you about where chakra eight comes out. Okay, there's a chakra chart in that little you know, packet that you have somewhere toward the back, I think. Okay. Now, part of the problem that we, we start to have thyroid problems when we activate DNA because of these Jehovian seals, what this will begin to do is clear the ones that are affecting the thyroid. This will also, I've been told, I hope, affect weight gain. If, for people who are having problems with either weight gain or weight loss, a lot of times that's because of what the thyroid is doing in relation to the rest of the energies in the body. Because of these Jehovian seals, particularly when you start to go through DNA activation, it can, I mean, I'm, I'm watching my, my closet and they're saying, I wish I could fit into those things right now. Because it's going, mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. And females seem to go this way, or I've noticed males seem to go this way. So it seems to affect the male and female body differently. Yeah, I, I think it can go either way with either, but it, and there's probably a lot more factors as far as your own chemistry that affects that. But it's playing with how much body weight you have or don't have. And it's because these seals are beginning to release on the mass level because of the frequencies we're hitting. If you go through DNA activation levels that are a little faster and higher and, you know, before the planet grids activate, you're activating them in you. I've actually met people who do healing work who have been guided to use certain sound tones that they think are helping, but they've actually been guided to use the sound tones that will set early activation of them, to activate them early, and they don't know it. You know, so there's, there's things that can activate these things prematurely. People can have problems with their thyroid without these activating, but these tend to kick it up as if it's like everybody's got this problem. So when we use this here, and the way we're going to use it, you can draw it on the area, but you can do it with oil, essence oil. That actually helps electrical transmission. The oil kind of lubricates and helps the frequencies to pass through. You don't have to use a pen, so you don't have to have <laughs> see symbols drawn all over you. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Or what I find is easiest because it's hard to figure out where it goes where, especially when you're looking down at it. You're looking at the paper this way, going, "How do I draw this?" <laughs> right? Because you don't want to get it upside down or backwards. The easiest way to do it is to take it on a piece of paper or on a stamper, like those other things were. But if you don't want to mark your skin, do it on a piece of paper or take a stamper, put it on a piece of paper, take the piece of paper and just put a bit of oil 
and stick the thing on. But the idea is to have it where it's sitting here. This is where you get, well, do I put it this way or do I put it this way? <laughs> As if you were wearing it on, fr on the front of you, where the person looking at you would see the seal like you're seeing it. Yeah. Okay? So you draw it on a piece of paper, cut the piece of paper out, turn it away from you, right? Yeah, yeah. As if you were whole, if, as if you glued that on your chest, right? Mm -hmm. And it's right about here. Who makes jewelry? <laughs> yeah, a, ne a necklace would be, yeah, there's a lot you could do with this. You could do necklace with, um, actually they're saying, if anybody wants to do the jewelry stuff, selenite, um, what? What is that? I'm getting, I'm getting something shown to me, but I'm not getting the, the word translation on it. It's, it reminds me of azurite, which is blue and kind of dense looking, but it's purple. It's, it's not. It's purple. It's not blue, but it has that density of azurite. Hmm? Hmm. No, it has a funny name to it. What? That's it. Sugilite. That's it. Okay. So, um, yeah, somebody better write these down too because they're coming through and I'm going to forget them when they come through like that. I tend to, like, don't remember them. Okay, sugalite and what did I say for a selenite? Selenite, selenite sugalite, and there's one more. What is it? Yeah, amethyst. They said yeah, just like amethyst, am like yeah, basic amethyst. That's simple. That was the easy one. That is the, that's the beginning to play with, they said. <laughs> Everybody will get guided with their own way with that if they want to work with it. Hmm? What? That, that was in response to people said, hmm, how about the, you know, like jewelry, you could make a necklace. If anybody wants to do that, they were the recommended stones. You could also, therefore, work with those stones, just holding them when you're doing a meditation with this. It would also help to bring those frequencies in. They obviously have, I don't know what yet, but they obviously have something to do with assisting the frequencies in this code to activate in the body. So, you know, if you want to, get, you know, a little bit of selenite and sugalite, and I thought you had the name of that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't, they're, they're showing me this purple stuff. I <laughs> yeah. Okay, selenite, sugalite, and amethyst. Okay. Yeah, and they said that from there, take it from there. You'll get your own feel. Like, it'll be different for everybody. Like, once you have those three, and you're basically working with purple and white. They're the frequencies, violet and white frequencies. So you're working with D12 and D7 frequencies, technically. Okay? So anyway, you put first here. Like, if you just, this, this would be really short. You can even do it once you get these symbols put in, where the body is used to it. And this will take about three weeks of maybe once or twice a week running the exercise. And the exercise isn't written yet because they're giving it to me now. Um, <laughs> the exercise is simply you can sit down or lay down. First, put the drawing of it here, like on a piece of paper is okay. Put it here. Activate your Maharic seal. And it's real simple, thank God, finally a simple technique. Um, <laughs> bring up the pale silver frequency from the Maharic seal from below your feet. Bring it up to there and <sighs> exhale it through. Out the, out the chakra because you have an eighth chakra that comes out here as if you brought it up with an inhale breath and then <sighs> exhaled it out now you're just simply going to breathe through the eighth chakra you're going to inhale and every time you inhale you're imagining pale silver coming up to there and then you're going to exhale but every other exhale that you instead not the first one you don't have to worry about it but the second one chakras have go through the body remember like there's a front end and then there's a back end of the chakra. The eighth chakra is a tricky one, okay? That's one that runs through with the pineal seals, like the ninth one does. It goes through an angle up through the head. The eighth one goes up through the head and comes out back here. You have seventh chakra up here. This one comes out in an angle up here. The ninth one actually comes this way, okay? But you're doing with the eighth right now, the eighth chakra. So you'd... And imagine this line of light Literally, pale silver light. Right? Inhale up. Hold it there a minute. And then you're going to exhale a line of light that goes for the center point where you are going. And then inhale more. You're just going to breathe out through that chakra. You're going to breathe the silver light with the symbol on it for a few minutes. Just play with it. And they, they're saying that you will be able to feel after, after you play with this for a while, you'll be able to feel what it's in, what, when it's enough. You don't have to take 20 minutes for each station. There's four stations that you need to breathe this frequency through with this coat on it. And they're the ones that will go, it's, they'll, they'll explain more. Uh, we'll get this in writing at some point. But, um, so I say start there. Bring the Maharic frequency up. And just let it go. 
through the eighth chakra. And then put, put the attention back down the feet. <sighs> through the eighth chakra. Then, yeah, at the same time. So you're exhaling, but it's going out both directions, like that. Like the chakra's like that, and you're at the center. Your exhale goes out both sides. It's like you're, you're literally giving a, a, a cleansing to the chakra, but you're doing it with that medical, mathematical coding going with it. Okay. They said use your preference of essence oil. Like if you can use essence oil rather than like cooking oil, it's better. You can use cooking oil. You can also use hand lotion. But the essence oils that have like a, a, an aroma to them, like yeah. So they're saying use what what smells good to you. Now sm they used to tell me that smell is a form of sound. All right. Now I won't even go into explaining why that is. They're, they were trying to explain that to me too, and I'm going okay. I almost get you. But aromatherapy oils, the, you know, the kinds you can get in you know, some new age stores and health stores and sometimes bath stores have them. Whatever smells like it's right for you, use that. Now, I want to get through this in case anybody's leaving because I'm seeing people having to get out. Um, next place you're going to do it. After you do that for a few minutes, right, go to number two, tailbone, okay? That's where you're going to take your little paper and stick it to your tailbone, Okay? Facing out, okay, with the, you know, the drawing facing out. I figure once they get through and give us the real highest one, I'm just going to get it tattooed there. <laughs> um, they said, hold on a minute, we'll get to that in a second, but they want to finish this. Okay. That's why I said we get the final big one, like the final, I know there's one for the Akkadic code. And they, it, they, can't, they can't use it yet, so they're not giving it to us until it can activate in the grids. Okay, all right, the tailbone is the next spot. You do the same thing there. The tailbone now is connected to, actually two chakras, it's connected to the second chakra that runs this way, the sacral chakra, and to the base chakra that runs down between your legs. But you already have pale silver coming up. And when that, that pale silver, when you get done with this, you're going to send it all back down. So you don't need to worry about the base chakra now because you're going to get that code through the whole vertical current later. So what you're going to do on step two, the tailbone, you're going to go and do the same breathing through chakra two. Okay? Just through here. You're going to have the drawing here and simply bring up Mahatic frequency from here, you know, into, into this space and then it's really easy. It's a lot easier than trying to figure out what way to spin. <laughs> then we're going to move it again, and it's going to be up to you to decide, is this enough? Did I breathe enough in yet? You might want to try before you even use the code what it feels like to breathe the energy through the chakras. All right, you're simply bringing it up to, you know, activating your Maharak seal and bringing up that cord of light to that area and breathing it out. Next one is the heart chakra, which this will clear the astral field and it will encode the astral field. Okay, bring it up to the heart chakra, the energy, the pale silver energy. You have your little paper, you take it off your tailbone and... Stick it on your chest down here. Now remember, the eighth chakra is up here a little higher. Okay, it's between chakra five and chakra four, so it's in this space in here. Now the next, the third step is to put the symbol here on the heart chakra. Okay, and then again, breathe the energy up and front and back at the same time. And I would spend a little bit of time. They're saying you can go as quick or as long as you want to. I would suggest breathing and don't like if you do this too fast you'll hyperventilate and then like feel dizzy and stuff you don't have to do it fast just regular breathing but try to do like maybe two minutes of breathing for each one like you know even time it just to make sure you know, for the first few times just to see so you build some frequency on that on that energy signature and then the last one you're going to take a little paper Stick it on your forehead. And I'm so glad we don't have to draw these on ourselves or anything with marker. <laughs> we'll be walking around. Yeah, like, yeah exactly. You know? <laughs> what are you calling us that stuff? All right. This one, it's on the pineal. So you just run the D12 frequency out. And you can do it out the sixth chakra, in and out. Out the sixth chakra. And then after you're done, without, or it feels like it's done, it's time to close down this operation where you're done with the exercise. The last step is you still have the thing here. You clear the sixth chakra. Now at the pineal, the sixth chakra and the seventh intersect. The seventh comes up vertically and the sixth is running through horizontally. So what you're going to do is imagine that code and it, it's going to ride on the pale silver light. You have the pale silver light already up here. 
Imagine the code coming from your forehead and making a ball that has that code on it. Just imagine the codes in it, a silver ball on the end of the current of pale silver light that's coming in. Then you're gonna go, inhale, and <laughs> inhale it up with a kind of <laughs> popping thing to the 14th chakra. So, inhale to gain momentum and energy. You're, when you inhale and hold for a little bit, you're actually building energy. And then when you, <laughs> you'll have more to pop with. Okay, pop it out to the 14th chakra and then simply close the whole thing down by taking that, imagine it's still up there, has a little ball on it with a symbol code in it. Simply inhale and you're going to throw it all the way down your main vertical current down into the earth's core again. Let it go into earth's core. That's it. You've sealed the main points in your field with it. This, these points will start taking it through your whole system. If you're feeling sick or if you're feeling areas, these areas of the body, starting to kick up, which means the Jehovian seals are starting to activate and they're giving you problems. <laughs> like if you're getting headaches or any, you know, the, the left side stuff. They're saying you can actually take this and run it on every one of the chakras if you want to help yourself heal faster. And once you're done with all the chakras, you're literally clearing the chakras and coding them to this. You can do this even if you're not sick. Yeah, but a lot of people get bored doing the, you know, the mind gets bored <laughs> even if it's doing what it's supposed to. They're also saying the area, after you open the chakras and clear them with this pattern, then the area that's hurting, literally put the little drawing of it over the area. And they're saying it will work better with a little oil. So you're going to have, like make a lot of these little drawings, get them photocopied, right? <laughs> because the oil will soak through and you have to throw them away after you're done with an exercise. But stick it over the area and just still have your current running. And it will literally send from your main vertical current send the pale silver energy over to it like a ball and then blow the energy through the area that's hurting taking in that pattern so you can spot treat where there's areas of difficulty it's with that pattern yeah and always use the symbol like you know when you draw it on a paper and then you're looking at the back the back sticks to you as if it's part of your body as if it grew there okay as if the symbol's right on you that way okay that you, now you can use these in any combination, you can use your imagination of how you would use these with salutations. You can put them on the bottom of the feet for those chakras. You can put it at the tailbone for D12 access. That's stronger programming than the bottom of the feet. You can use it with salutation exercises, with the round tables, or simply laying or sitting there, which means you can also use it on people who are sick. You can, you know, if, if you're working with healing, you can transmit this through your hands. You could literally draw the symbol on your hand or hold the paper with it on it, like stick it to your hand while you're transmitting frequency and you can help other people as well. Okay, yeah? If we use a rubber stamp, can uh -huh. we make a little blotter with oil and just uh, stamp the oil? That's a good idea. That's a real good idea. Yeah. I would think so, probably. Yeah. The oil would dissolve the rubber. The oil would dissolve the rubber. Really? Yes, it would. Oh. oh, shoot, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, they just had an idea that, like, it, um, it was really neat. The stampers that, I, I didn't even see them, but I guess they were here and some people bought them. That was an idea of uh, Florence and Nirvana. It was a wonderful idea as far as, because we were drawing the Vega codes on, like, you know, on our feet. And so like that. that was a good idea. Um, we don't have one for this yet. And this is, this is going to be tricky. It's going to have to be a big one. If we're going to get them, if we're going to get them done that way, I don't know. But you don't have to have a stamper to do it. They're saying you could like take the stamper and use like take a, a clean ink pad and put oil in it, the essence oil. So you're just stamping the oil symbol. That would work, but then uh, Ivan said it would de um, deteriorate the stamp. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good idea. That sounds like a really good idea. What? Plastic stamper? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. We don't have them, but if you know anybody wants to take the code and take it to those guys who do those, whatever they do to make them on stampers. <laughs> okay, yeah. Could you please just describe that, the last part, the, uh, the ball part? I didn't quite get the ball. Okay. Okay, with the ball. Now, you've already, you had the thing on here. You got your chakra, your sixth chakra cleared and programmed with it, right? Then you're going to imagine that the thing on your forehead, that symbol, is going to go in. You have your Maharata current up here, right, at the pineal, because you just got done using it in the sixth chakra. Take the end of that current as if it's an end of a string, and then imagine that, that symbol code that's on your forehead 
Imagine going into your sixth chakra and going right under the end of that string like a ball. Okay? And then you're going to inhale to gain momentum. So we can make this a sphere. Yeah, a sphere or a ball, something. Okay. Yeah, just see it as a ball that holds the, the, the code. Okay? And then if, up to the 14th, and then you're closing your circuits with the programming. Okay? And you send down into Earth's core, 13th chakra. Yeah. Sir, could you explain what the codes are? As soon as they explain them to me, I will. <laughs> okay. Then what they told me about what these codes are, first of all, this is our A. Okay, that's we call it the Azurite A. But what it really is, it's not. The, it, it is for Azurite Temple, but it doesn't stay A for Azurite. That's the the uh, um, primary gate access code for the halls of Amoraya. That's that one three six nine twelve lineup. Okay, so that's coding it to those particular frequencies in those particular gates, which is also a protection thing. It also codes it to um, the Maharaji used that symbol, the Cirrus B, Stargate 6 guys. That's like the gate 6 symbol code that's used there as well. Now, these symbols here, they haven't explained exactly what they are. I drew them bigger over here so you could you know, see them clear. Actually, Michael drew this one. I drew a sketchy looking one. He was nice enough to draw it over for me. You know what? I just noticed this on here. And it's probably, I don't know if that did that on... Okay, it's, it's all right on your copies? Yeah. That's supposed to be another one of these, but laying on its side. Okay, good. Okay. This is a, a language form. I know that, and I think it's um, from the Mua races, the Muravi races. It's, it's very ancient, but I looked at that and said, ooh, that strikes a chord. I remember a whole alphabet like this. I don't remember what it says. But what they said, what these codes are, are these are the activation, level one activation codes, okay, for the four faces of man grid. Okay, on Earth. Now there would be a set of four different ones for the one on parallel Earth and for the one on inner Earth. But these are the programming codes that go with the first level of activation for the four faces of man grid in the planet and in your body. And that's what they told me so far. They literally gave me this like 20 minutes before I was trying to get here. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, like I said, where, where is it, guys? You said you were going to give me, you know, the next step in this. Where is it? Just be patient. Finish what you're doing. All right. You know? So this is, this is what I, it has been explained to me so far about them. I'm sure we'll get more. I know this is, um, they use this in the exercise called the Epsilon Sequence. It's the Theta Code. And it's key to um, a planet Epsilon. It actually has the, planet, the normal planetary codes for Epsilon, and Epsilon is associated with, I think, Alnatak, or Alnalam, I forget which one, one of the Orion systems that have messed up grids here, and this is the original pattern that they're supposed to hold, and their bodies carry some of that. So I know that has to do with the Orion system and its natural coding, which is a D8 system. So this would have something to do with the D8 program. Okay, so I would have to get more on specifics if they ever give me, you know, where it's not really important that we understand what that is. I mean, I don't, I'm the kind of person that I'll try to find answers to stuff like that, even if we don't need them, just because I don't, I, I, know, I don't like this, oh, just do this, you don't need to worry about what it is, right? I don't like that stuff. If somebody wants to know, you know, and I, I, I ask them to. So if, as I find out more about these codes, I will be glad to share that with you. But I do know that this one corresponds to, if you looked at um, a Cathara grid, you know that thing with the 12 spheres on it? You have um, the 12th uh, Cathara center on the top, or which would be Stargate 12, if you looked at those as Stargates, right? The 12th one transitioning into 13. There's another Cathara grid that goes up from D13 all the way up to Source, right? These are the codes that correspond to the process of going up in that second Cathara grid. All right, and I don't have the diagram of this here. It's in the Cathara manual. I don't think I have that here, do I? Do I have that here? That would be a miracle. I don't know. Uh, I don't have it here. But picture one, um, the 15-dimensional time matrix, a Cathara grid running from D1 to D12, okay? You still have D13, 14, and 15, and you still have the three levels of primal sound fields. So you actually have one Cathara grid that controls the 12-dimensional levels of your avatar self and your, your uh, physical matter all the way up to pre-matter body. There's another Cathara grid that connects at Cathara Center 12, starts number one for the next one. That takes you up into D13, 14, and 15, would be the first three, and then there's three more each for each of the three levels of the primary sound fields. 
when we got into the Biveca and Triveca codes, the Biveca code would correspond to that first link where you're linking Cathara Center 12 at the top of the first tree to the Cathara Center 1 at the bottom of the next tree. That would be your Biveca. Your Triveca would link that to the next series all the way up to D15. Okay? From D13, 14, and 15. That would link those. We are starting to make the link out of the time matrix into the into, out of the light fields into the primal sound fields. This one links that part, the primal sound fields, uh, level one. It spans um, D15 to the first level of level two of the sound fields. So this technically goes with level one of the primal sound fields. All right, there would be two more codes higher than that that would correspond to level two and three of the primal sound fields. So in this, you'd actually have three smaller codes that would correspond to each of the three levels of the primal sound fields. Like you have three levels that each have three levels. So <clears throat> this is a primal sound field code. That's the first primal sound field code we've been, we've been given. And the Biveca and Triveca are primal light field codes. Okay. okay. I'm, so, I'm learning this too. I mean, I remember using these symbols, but it's been a long time since I read these textbooks, probably about 20,000 years, bless you. So I'm learning this with you, but it's, you know, the more I get on it, we'll, we'll be learning a lot more about the VECA codes, as they're called. There's a whole alphabet of VECA codes, and they've been protected for a very long time where they just didn't allow them on planet because there's ways they can't fully use them because you can't, if, they, if you don't run D12 frequency, you can't fully activate them, but you can play with them in certain ways and bend things in them and then use them. And that's why the books that hold these alphabets have been hidden, like literally taken off planet while the invasions were taking place here. At this point, and this is one of the reasons I know it's right down to the wire, they're releasing it all. They're not holding anything back because they're going to give us as much as we could possibly use and to, to get this set right because it's going to go in a very bad way if, if they don't. So they're not, they're, there's no use of hiding the knowledge and protecting it from what's on planet if on planet is not going to be here anymore, basically. So we're, they're giving us the, these codes so we have the ability. It doesn't matter. You don't have to hide them. You don't have to memorize them and then rip it up and throw it away so nobody ever sees it. Put them anywhere you want to, right? because they won't have time to figure out how to use them wrong, and maybe a lot of them will decide to use them right. So, okay, yes? Um, for group activity, could it, could it possibly be just like pin, a straight pin or safety pin, or right over the area overflows? Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Maybe we could put a little bit of light oil on the body, but then just pin the thing, the paper, and then we could reuse it. So. Right. Yeah, that will work. I just, I just got commentary on this one. Oh, this has to do with Sid. <laughs> Sydney. <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> we were talking a while back about, I kept having these visions. Remember I told you about for healing purposes? Siesta Key Sand, which is that 99% crushed quartz crystal. I, I just got a vision. What you were saying, I just got it flashed in front of me. Seeing like little pouches, right? thin pouches with a bit of this powdered quartz sand in them, or you could use powdered selenite if you want to grind your own or whatever, with the symbol on it. If you're going to pin something on, do that. You know, it'll amplify. You could use the paper. If you, in fact, you could use this as the one you move around on your body, then you don't have to, you know, keep using the Xerox machine, which just probably has energy in it that we wouldn't really want on there anyway. The symbol in the pouch? Yeah. Yeah, you could literally like paint or, or stamp the symbol on the pouch. Yeah, and then you could put it anywhere. That's an excellent. Yeah. Yeah, that that would work. That would work, but you could get more, you, you could make a sand pack better. I'm getting that this is worth, like if anybody likes to play with this kind of stuff, this is something, this is a product that could be very useful. You know, you, you had said, is there anything that could, we can make to help with these processes? They're saying that this, hmm? Fill in the pouch up, yeah. So you get like some kind of fabric that powdered sand doesn't leak out of. You know, and siesta key sand like leaks out of everything because it's like really fine. But that that's real special sand. That's grew all point sand. So anyway, the idea is to get this, you know, you, you, yes, you could use it on paper, taped to you, just like we can draw it on paper here. 
but I don't know if we'll ever have time to do it, but if there's anybody that wants to do it, that it would be amplified if we use the little pouches of charged, particularly siesta key sand. Now, I'm, we can't be, you know, borrowing sand from Siesta Key, so the idea is to get, uh, to get crushed like quartz or selenite, because that's what Siesta Key sand is, okay? I'll, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, hmm? No, they're saying just, just use one and just move it, all right, yeah. That would do something else. That would, like, quadruple the coating or something and make it mean something else yeah and he's, he's, you don't want to do that <laughs> have Ma, Ma's with us by the way he's telepathing here I hope you guys get to meet him someday we <laughs> go through the gates okay. anyway okay uh, yes uh, is it an equilateral triangle in a circle or is it uh, because this uh, this triangle is not completely equilateral it's not exactly in the center of the circle. That's because I drew it by hand and okay. I didn't measure okay. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really great with numbers. If anybody okay. likes to make very precise geometrical figures. Was it equilateral triangle? Yeah, it, it should be an equilateral it's triangle that fits that in. Form. Yeah. I mean, that was just sketching it out freehand. No, it isn't. You know, neither are the Vecca ones that I've done because I, I don't measure them. I, I, would, I, I like it when Michael does them because they're much better. In fact, that looks better than the one that I did. I think he might have adjusted it a little. <laughs> did you make it better? It looks clearer than the one I did. <laughs> yeah. No? Really? Mine came out that good? Amazing. Okay. Anyway, let me see if there's anything remaining that needs to be addressed. I think there was one more thing. I'm not going to get into a lot of this stuff. That's in the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we got everything we need on that. But that's the most important stuff. Is that? Um, yeah, there is. I just want to see if there's anything more I wanted to put in on the history. Let me see what this is. Yeah. There's one part I didn't quite finish yesterday. I got the idea because I talked about it. I got, I got talked about it at the end. Okay, what time? Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay, I think. I think I've got it pretty well. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, I'm just checking through here to make sure I didn't forget anything that's really important. Yeah, you know, because it's starting to like, you know, people, it's getting close to where people have to go and some people already have. Um, this was the most important, like, thing that they have given us recently. And the reason this has been such a, a wacky workshop is not as bad as the one in Sarasota where I just, they didn't even give me any time to get anything on paper. I had to literally, I learned it as it came this way. It would come this way, okay? And it would come out my mouth. <laughs> okay, I get it. You know, this... This is the reason we end up with a. We, there should be a motto to, to to our workshops, like like if time bothers you, don't come because you'll go crazy <laughs> with this. I appreciate the the flexibility that you guys have, and the reason sometimes I'm very glad there are people that could help. You know, to to part, do the parts of the presentation that I could. You know, I would usually do. It's it's really nice to know that there's people in the group now that are getting to the point where they can give those kind of presentations because they understand the work enough. And I'm glad that that wasn't a problem, you know, for for the new people or whatever. Because I had one experience with a lady in um, bless her, she came to one workshop in New York City. I'd never been to a workshop before, and I don't think she'd even read any of the books. And I they had given me new information to the point where I was literally I was an hour late. Okay, but. We had people come in. Mac came in, and she, you know, was doing stuff with the group and everything. And all the only thing the lady had to say to me was, um, and the whole time, it's like she didn't listen to any of the other stuff and decided she wasn't going to come back the second day because I'd probably be late. Was if you can't get out of bed in time, why don't you have, you know, why don't you do it? I'm uh, thinking, you know, I'd love to get out of bed in time if I had the, pl you know, the privilege of going to bed. You know, so it's not that that I shirk my duties, okay? When I'm when, when there's situations where somebody has to come in and assist with the presentation, it's because I'm stuck in a corner with a computer someplace trying to get the next level down. I was happy with the fact that for this workshop, 
this is just going to be a roundtable workshop, you know, working out of the things that are already in the book. We got the whole next wave of information, and it came out here, just like the last next wave came out in Sarasota. So I, I hope it's been a good experience for you. There's a, for the new people, there's a million more things to learn. Those, I, I do recommend the books because they cover like four workshops worth of things, and they get you up where you understand the planetary grid mechanics, you understand the Nibiruan stuff, what's happening with Wormwood, and there's going to be a lot more that comes after it. Everything basically that comes like from this point on is going to become supplements to that text and at some point there's going to be probably a second binder but it all goes as part of this course so if you want to know what came before that will make what this was make more sense to you it is in that manual and there's huge stuff in, in there it's not just about grids it's also about who is God what is God who are ETs what are angels I mean it gets into the spiritual stuff as well so it's, it's, it's well rounded yes what you say? Yeah, Ooh. if you're going to show them, I, I didn't have time to even stick it on here. These are going to be in, like, print, published in Voyager's Volume 2. And my publisher gets really hyper if I don't put on it excerpt from Voyager's Volume 2. Yeah, Secrets of Amente. Yeah, he because I tend to let things go all over the place but he, he even tells me if you're going to use our material you need to put the reference on it it's like I write yeah yeah that's all right yeah that's off to the publisher which is oh no, that's going to be probably fine-tuned and like things that are hit, written in longhand are going to be typeset and it's going to be integrated into something larger probably. Yeah. Yeah, you can introduce some of it, but again, it's it's just new data that it's going to fit into a bigger, you know, bigger picture. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, that's just what I was getting to. That's just what I was getting to. Yep. <laughs> That's where I was going. That was what I was going to close with. Okay? I'm going to turn this off for now. I seem to get a lot of periphery frequency from that. It's making my eyes burn even when I'm not in front of it. Okay. Now, this was an interesting little thingy. <laughs> Oy. This came through maybe um, two weeks ago. And it came through really fast with other stuff that I was doing a totally other project. This is the next level. We had, uh, the new people, I don't know if you know the uh, Song of Orion, the Omeda, as it's come to be known, but this was the next level. That the, There are certain combinations of sound frequencies, just like we have the sacred songs that are the tribe names that activate things in the DNA template. There are other larger combinations of sound tones that are songs that activate very specific parts of the planetary grids and also of your ley line system in your body, of your axiotonal lines and your, um, your meridians and your DNA strands. Now, a while back, gosh, probably in the beginning of 2000 or something, we were given um, something called the Song of Orion, and it was a you know, particular song that's in, that's in that manual, too, I think, and it, it seems to be floating around everywhere. I don't know. We didn't have that this time. We got the next level up. Now, it doesn't mean that people that know the Song of Orion don't do that. That is a D8 Song of Orion, okay? That, that works with the 8th DNA strand, the 8th Stargate, the Orion Stargates. It works with the 8th the eighth dimensional grids in the planet. Now, this one is the D12 one, okay? This is the Christos one. And it is, it's really pretty, and I hope I can sing it right. I'm not going to sing it quite yet. And I don't actually, I'm going to try to put this on tape, all right, for for future reference to people that want it on tape because I'm not going to expect you to, to remember all of it because there's some words here that take a while <laughs> you know, to get to, used to saying. But first, I'd like to like you to read over just a bit of the front where it says the vectus invocations. Okay? Now, vectus is referring to the bivectus is the D12 level. That's where the biveca code goes with. It's referring to your D12 avatar level of self. And this is an intention decree that if you want to run certain frequency and you want to bring the Christos presence that you are in right now, right here, this is a statement that you kind of are making to yourself. Now, if you read this over, you don't have to make this to yourself every time you decide you want to anchor your Christos right now, right? This is something that 
it gets to the point where if you are in a situation where you really feel you need reinforcement and you need the more of you in now, you can, once you understand this and you kind of like, you know, let your mind absorb what this is all about, it doesn't hurt to read this to yourself once in a while. It's a nice little thing to read before you go to bed even, you know, like a little prayer, sort of. But this is all encoded in the song, okay? So once the song is learned, simply even like in times of crisis or where you're feeling icky, just sing it to yourself in your head. And it begins to bring in, I started, I could only remember the first like two or three lines and I would start to do that when I was getting like fatigued or tired or something. And it shifted my energy. I could, I felt better. So th there's some real power to this when I felt even more in this than I had with working with the D8 song. Um, it's, I won't take the time to read this because you can, all have a copy so you can read it, okay? It's about invoking I am. The, the words that you're saying here, you're saying it as your avatar. You are saying, I am my avatar, and as me, my avatar, I am saying these things and I am decreeing them. And it is rallying all of your other 1728 cells or more if you're an indigo. It is sending out a frequency throughout time to those other time vectors where you're literally mobilizing all of the energy of all of you. You are speaking as the avatar that is all of them. You are linking yourself with and being as. So you are making a decree whether you're saying, I, I, I decree this healed, or I decree this. This is something, if you were going to do a healing, or if you found yourself, there's just a little example, on a plane, and a terrorist started to do stuff on that plane. This little song, you start singing it to yourself. You can even start singing it out loud and really make the guy nervous. And hold an intention. Now, if you're in a situation like that, you could hold an intention that peace be restored, you know, peace and the highest Christos good be restored right now, immediately. You can say that from D3 personhood level and hope it happens. You can say it from a soul level, a D6, you have a better chance of knowing that you have something to do with the event shifting. This is a decree from yourself as avatar level. And what it means is that level of you is going to push the energy into the pattern that you have set. This is why you need to leave a little leeway. You don't say, well, uh, I want the terrorist to fall down and his gun goes off and like he shoots himself and then he can't shoot anybody else. <laughs> Let the Christos level figure out what precisely is the best way to get the outcome you desire. You could hold, I want the plane, you know, I intend the plane will be, you know, land safely where it's supposed to be, no one hurt, you know, perfect ending, perfect solution to this drama. You can affect change. The more you work with this, the more you'll, I think, find out for yourself there is a shift in the energy that happens. I mean, I remember feeling it, and I become, I feel like I become a different person sometimes. I was like, oh, I forgot I was that. You know, I forgot I was that me. There's a level of expansion where we tend to be focused down here doing our, you know, little 3D things and our work and things. But there's this other spot of us that's up here someplace that always hangs out. And every once in a while, when you really relax, you can find that expansion. You, you, know, you might be driving your car, that's where I get it. If I'm driving or riding in a car, you kind of expand and relax. There's a state of consciousness that you can start to feel in yourself. That's your wholeness. It's your eternal self. And it's like really beyond the drama, even though it's in it. It's not of it, and it knows it. But when you're down here focusing on things in the drama, it's kind of, you know you have one somewhere, but it's not here right now. And you can feel that separation. This seems to bring in that state and it's linking you closer with your avatar. Now the song, I will try, <laughs> I will try to sing this. <coughs> what I'll first do is I will pronounce the words, okay? And I will get this on tape, you know, so if anybody needs the audio to, to listen to, so what is that? I still need to. I, when it first came through, I had to um, sit down and literally sing it into the tape recorder to, to get it so I didn't forget it, you know? So I said, how do you pronounce that? <laughs> okay, now, what the intention is, and really, once you're kind of saying this to yourself from the still point of my wholeness, wholeness in manifest decision, I decree in sovereign knowing, here expressed at my command, the divine will and intention of the one self that is one God, the one self that is one God, this I am. So you kind of know that goes with it, and you say that to yourself, you don't even have to sing it. But the words, and the word translations are down here. They're showing you what these words of a foreign language that you're singing mean. This is the Anahazi language, the Elohai Elohim language, the first spoken language in this time matrix. And it hits the core templates of literally, you know, like down to the core of your being, your tribal shield core, your personal shield core, 
all of it. And the words are Maharata Kum Bivectus. And right there you'd say your name or your spiritual name. Okay? Like I say, Maharata Kum Bivectus Ashana Tu. That would be me, because I use Ashana Tu is my spiritual name when I'm talking up there. Okay? You could use, you know, George. It doesn't matter. Okay? <laughs> You know, you know, whatever your name happens to be, whoever you know yourself as. And what that means is, I, as D12 Christos Avatar Self, and you named yourself, right? So the translations are right under there. The next part is, Inevukai Uniblium Bivectai. That means, invoke by divine loving command now, by the power of the universal Christos. The next line is, Ma'a Bivectai Un Ure. Ornem Ur. That means the D12 Divine Christos Blueprint Past, Present, Future. Sounds a lot better in that language. Now, and the Divine Sea of Liquid Light anchors in this moment. This is what you're doing. You're literally pulling in not just personal Christos, but you're pulling in the Christos template that belongs with the space-time that you're in. Then it goes, Iste unta isa trasja he era he era Patate um a ashelom trajja wait tra tra eja inta doe um shadai ure akum ton which if the people that have worked with this before the um shadai ure song that was part of this this was, this was the end of it actually it sounds a lot nicer when you sing it and if I get tongue tied while I do this pardon me <laughs> this is new we just got this okay it goes. Maharaja Kumbai Vectas Ashona Tu in Nevu Gayuni Bliyum Bai Vectai Maa Bai Vectai Un Ure Honem Hur Iste Yunde Isa Trajda Eheva Patate Umma Ashelam Traaje In Tatohe Um Shara Yure Yakum Don yeah, that's the basic sound tones. Does that that makes me prickle? I mean, I just get all my little hairs stand up, you know. <laughs> but it's a mouthful when you're first starting to learn it. I just yeah, did you do what? You know. <laughs> so it's kind of like, and it, like the melody that I didn't do too bad on the melody. I didn't kill it too bad. It's very close. The uh, there's a, a transition, and I, I put it on guitar because I play basic, you know, some basic twelve string guitar. I had put it on guitar. So I'd remember the chord changes in case I forgot the melody, you know, and I didn't have the tape. Um, there's some changes in there. It's a little different when you go uh, the Maha by Vectas and Urne Urnam Ur part, and when you get in the Iste Unta Isa Trajda Heera. There's a shift there, but even if you don't get the shift, and even if you don't get the melody perfectly right, it still works. I'll sing it one more time if you want to try singing it with me. Okay. And remember, we, after we do Maharata Kumbai Vectas, that's where you say your name or sing your name. Okay, right there? And then it's, you're saying, me, Christo, self, me, right? And there's a jet, uh, an attitude that goes with this. And when you get, this is the one that I feel the power come in on when you go, Inevukai Uniblium by Vectai. Just that line itself makes my hair stand on end. Okay, when, you, when you're singing it, I'll just sing these first two lines so you get an idea of what I mean. Here you go. Maharata Kumbai Vectors Ashana Tu That's me, okay In Evukayu Nibli Yumbai Vectai You are making a statement, a declaration, a command Try to feel that, it's not just Nibli Yumbai Vectai You know, it's like It's saying, I invoke by divine command Is what it's saying And there is a power to that and you're using the ancient language, the first language, to get the sound tones the way they were originally intended. So, okay, we'll take it from the beginning, and I'll stop right after we all say our names, because we'll all be off on a different pattern if <laughs> we say our names. Okay. Maharata Kumbai Vectas Ashana Tu Inevukai Un Iblium Bai Vectai Maha by Vectai Un Urne Ornem Ur Iste Unte Isa Trajda Eheva Patate Uma Ashelom 
Tra eja in ta dohe Um shadai hobe ya kum tan Good. Do you feel the energy with that? I wonder if we could sing it faster. Like as if we're standing up there declaring it. I remember whole, I, could, I could feel whole huge groups doing it over and over and building and building and you could feel the energy. You might want to stand up for this to see if you can feel it running. <laughs> and if you can't remember anything else, just remember that one thing. In evukai un imblium by vectai. You know? In fact, you can yell it at a terrorist if you have to. <laughs> no. Yeah, th these were, were power commands when we all were remembering we were avatars. And it will take us into spaces where we learn how to use that power and learn how to use the power of decree as an avatar here. This is the beginning. And this is the language that it goes in. I was so excited when this came down. It was so pretty. It sounds really nice when you get the flow of it. You know? <laughs> okay? I haven't quite got that yet, but it, you know, we're getting there. Okay. Okay, do an insta seal, right? Insta Maharg seal. <laughs> I'm getting silly, I must be tired. Okay, now. Mahavata kumbai vectas ashane tu in evukayun ibliyum by vectai mahabai vectai un ure hornem ur iste unte satraja eva Pratate uma ashelom traeja inta doe um sharai ure ya kum tan a kum tan um sharai ure ya kum tan a kum tan um sharai ure ya kum tan See, there would be harmonies that certain people would feel kick in and move it. And the speed that it kind of needs to go at is this. I'll sing it once so you get this the speed because we have to go a little slower. We're all trying to, like, you know, learn it. It goes, Maharata kumbai vectas ashanatu in evukai uniblium by vectai maabai vectai un ure honem ur iste un te ista trashta hehera Patate uma shelam traje in te dohe Um shada yore ya kum tan a kum tan Um shada yore ya kum tan a kum tan Um shada yore ya kum tan Alright, so it goes fast like that, you see? The, the power that that builds? <laughs> Yeah, you get a collective of avatars singing that thing at the right pace for the right cool. Oh, you know? So we're going to be learning to integrate this into the round tables as well. All right, and I will try to get this on tape because I know that's a lot, of, a lot to to remember as far as like, okay, I think I have the pronunciation down. How fast did that go? What got strung together? You know. All right, so I will try to you know get them on tape. Or if anybody has them on tape, that's good. If people are taping, at least you got it. Okay, the translations of what you just sung are there, so you know what you're singing. And as soon as we have time, we're going to get the English translations on the Ome Da song for anybody who, who wants that. Anybody want to do the Ome Da while we're here? Okay, yes, since you did that. Okay. okay. Anybody that doesn't have it, just kind of hum along, okay? Because <laughs> we didn't, we weren't going to use that in this one. Okay. Ome Da E Patama Ome Da E patama patama he dita he kumna o me da e patama dre la 
e durum na tre ti la e durum na durum na e henta e kuna o me da e patama one more o me da keep going o me da e patama patama e kuna o me da e patama tre ti la e tu rum na tre ti la e tu rum na tu rum na e kenta e kuna o me da e patama <laughs> I was doing the overtone sequences with it. Because eventually we'd all, we'll get to a point where we can do these with the overtones to go with them. Because you're, they're the, the ones that go with antiparticle. Okay? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I'm trying to get like weave that in a little bit so we can start to hear how we modulate it. Yeah, even when we do round tables, you know how you can get like the do ra do ra ra you go you can move with the sounds there's a you, the, the sound is to play with learn the tone that needs it that needs to be done but then move with it let it become alive in your body right like oh me da you gotta let it move through you the way you need to while still keeping the beat with the group you can do it it's really neat. That started to come through in the round tables. I started to find this other part of me wanting to go, no, okay, they're doing that. You do this, right? Yeah. Okay, you need to feel free with yourself to let that start to happen. Because that's where the sounds are coming alive in your body. <laughs> what are you laughing at me? What? Well, some of the round tables, we, we sound like the, the, the mournful love. I know. I know. <laughs> Oh, before we before we break up, can we do one more thing? Yes. The Tribe 13... <laughs> song you know araya zutawa izu to isu wa 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 araya zutawa See what you can do with the song? You know, it's just, I rise, I rise, I rise. Let it move, okay? You can do this, and this makes powerful, powerful round tables. When you get a whole group where they start to feel that sound alive in them, you know? So it, and just have fun with the songs. The songs are very, very sacred, and they are all the stuff we talked about in technical terms. They are amplifying and helping you to do this, okay? Sing the songs while you're playing with the, uh, the, the Qveca code and the Biveca and Triveca, all right? Okay, um, I think... That might be a good place to, to wrap it up. Is that a good place? Because we lost people already. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Did you do this with your teachers all through grade school? I know. <laughs> no, I'm not picking on you. I think it's great. That shows you're interested and you want it. You know, I like that. that you.